Book One, Chapter One of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth R. Moorfield. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. To the memory of the man who stands highest in the oratory of my memory, Alexander John Scott, I, daring, presume to dedicate this book. Countryman, my heart doth joy that yet, in all my life, I found no man but he was true to me. Brutus in Julius Caesar the author desires to have it understood that not a single poem in this tale is of his own composition the poems are however his property and appear for the first time in print the careless work of a friend of his boyhood he has not even trimmed them robert falconer by george macdonald part one his boyhood Chapter One A Recollection Robert Falconer, schoolboy, aged fourteen, thought he had never seen his father. That is, thought he had no recollection of having never seen him. But the moment when my story begins, he had begun to doubt whether his belief in the matter was correct. And as he went on thinking, he became more and more assured that he had seen his father somewhere about six years before as near as a thoughtful boy of his age could judge of the lapse of a period that would form half of that portion of his existence which was bound into one by the reticulations of memory for there dawned upon his mind the vision of one sunday afternoon betty had gone to church and he was alone with his grandmother reading the pilgrim's progress to her when just as christian knocked at the wicket gate a tap came to the street door and he went to open it there he saw a tall, somewhat haggard-looking man in a shabby black coat. The vision gradually dawned upon him till it reached the minuteness of all these particulars. His hat pulled down onto his projecting eyebrows, and his shoes very dusty, as with a long journey on foot. It was a hot Sunday, he remembered that. Who looked at him very strangely, and without a word, pushed him aside and went straight into his grandmother's parlour, shutting the door behind him. He followed, not doubting that the man must have a right to go there, but questioning very much his right to shut him out. When he reached the door, however, he found it bolted, and outside he had to stay all alone in the desolate remainder of the house till Betty came home from church. He could recall, as he thought about it, how drearily the afternoon had passed. First he had opened the street door and stood in it. There was nothing alive to be seen except a sparrow picking up crumbs, and he would not stop till he was tired of him. The royal oak down the street to the right had not even a horseless gig or a cart standing before it, and King Charles, grinning awfully in its branches on the signboard, was invisible from the distance at which he stood. In at the other end of the empty street, looked the distant uplands, whose waving corn and grass were likewise invisible, and beyond them rose one blue truncated peak in the distance, all of them wearily at rest this weary Sabbath day. However, there was one thing, then, which this was better, and that was being at church, which, to this boy at least, was the very fifth essence of dreariness. He closed the door and went into the kitchen. That was nearly as bad. The kettle was on the fire, to be sure, in anticipation of tea, but the coals under it were black on the top, and it made only faint efforts, after immeasurable intervals of silence, to break into a song, giving a hum like that of a bee a mile off, and then relapsing into hopeless inactivity. Having just had his dinner, he was not hungry enough to find any resource in the drawer where the oat cakes lay, and unfortunately the old wooden clock in the corner was going else there would have been some amusement in trying to torment it into demonstrations of life, as he had often done in less desperate circumstances than the present. 
At last he went upstairs to the very room in which he now was, and sat down upon the floor, just as he was sitting now. He had not even brought his pilgrim's progress with him from his grandmother's room. But searching about in all holes and corners, he at length found Klopstock's Messiah translated into English, and took refuge there till Betty came home. Nor did he go down till she called him to tea, when, expecting to join his grandmother and the stranger, he found, on the contrary, that he was to have his tea with Betty in the kitchen, after which he again took refuge with Klopstock in the garret, and remained there till it grew dark, when Betty came in search of him and put him to bed in the gable room, and not in his usual chamber. In the morning every trace of the visitor had vanished, even to the thorn stick which he had set down behind the door as he entered. All of this Robert Falconer saw slowly revive on the palimpsest of his memory, as he washed it with the vivifying waters of recollection. End of Book One Chapter One Book One, Chapter Two of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Book One, Chapter Two A Visitor. It was a very bare little room in which the boy sat, but it was his favorite retreat. Behind the door, in a recess, stood an empty bedstead, without even a mattress upon it. This was the only piece of furniture in the room, unless some shelves crowded with papers tied up in bundles, and in a cupboard in the wall likewise filled with papers, could be called furniture. There was no carpet on the floor, no windows in the walls. The only light came from the door, and from a small skylight in the sloping roof, which showed that it was a garret room. Nor did much light come from the open door, for there was no window on the walled stair to which it opened, only, opposite the door, a few steps led up into another garret, larger but with a lower roof, unsealed and perforated, with two or three holes, the panes of glass filling which were no larger than the small blue slates which covered the roof. From these panes a little dim brown light tumbled into the room where the boy sat on the floor, with his head almost between his knees, thinking. But there was less light than usual in the room now, though it was only half-past two o'clock, and the sun would not set for more than half an hour yet. For if Robert had lifted his head and looked up, it would have been at, not through the skylight. No sky was to be seen. A thick covering of snow lay over the glass. A partial thaw followed by frost had fixed it there, a mass of imperfect cells and confused crystals. It was a cold place to sit in, but the boy had some faculty for enduring cold when it was the price to be paid for solitude. And besides, when he fell into one of his thinking moods, he forgot for a season cold and everything else but what he was thinking about, a faculty for which he was to be envied. If he had gone down the stair which described half the turn of a screw in its descent, and had crossed the landing to which it brought him, he could have entered another bedroom, called the gable, or rather the gale, room, equally at his service for retirement. But, though carpeted and comfortably furnished, and having two windows at right angles commanding two streets, for it was a corner house, the boy preferred the garret room. He could not tell why. Possibly windows to the streets were not congenial to the meditations in which even now, as I have said, the boy indulged. These meditations, however, though sometimes as obtruse, if not so continuous as those of a metaphysician, for boys are not unfrequently more given to metaphysics than older people are able or, perhaps willing, to believe, were not by any means confined to such subjects, Castle building had its full share in the occupation of those lonely hours, and for this exercise of the constructive faculty, what he knew, or rather what he did not know, of his own history, gave him scope enough. Nor was his brain slow in supplying him with material corresponding in quantity to the space afforded. His mother had been dead for so many years that he had only the vaguest recollections 
of her tenderness, and none of her person. All he was told of his father was that he had gone abroad. His grandmother would never talk about him, although he was her own son. When the boy ventured to ask a question about where he was, or when he would return, she always replied, "'Bairns should hold their tongues.' nor would she vouchsafe another answer to any question that seemed to her from the farthest distance to bear upon that subject. Bairns Mount learned to hold their tongues, was the sole variation of which the response admitted. And the boy did learn to hold his tongue. Perhaps he would have thought less about his father if he had had brothers or sisters, or even if the nature of his grandmother had been such as to admit of their relationship being drawn closer, into personal confidence or some measure of familiarity how they stood with regard to each other will soon appear whether the visions vanished from his brain because of the thickening of his blood with cold or he merely acted from one of those undefined and inexplicable impulses which occasion not a few of our actions i cannot tell but all at once robert started to his feet and hurried from the room at the foot of the garret stair between it and the door of the gable room already mentioned stood another door at right angles to both of the existence of which the boy was scarcely aware simply because he had seen it all his life and had never seen it open turning his back on this last door which he took for a blind one he went down a short broad stair at the foot of which was a window he then turned to the left into a long flagged passage or trans past the kitchen door on the one hand and the double-leaved street door on the other but instead of going into the parlour, the door of which closed the trans, he stopped at the passage window on the right, and there stood looking out. What might be seen from this window certainly could not be called a very pleasant prospect. A broad street with low houses of cold grey stone is perhaps as uninteresting a form of street as any to be found in the world, and such was the street Robert looked out upon. Not a single member of the animal creation was to be seen in it, not a pair of eyes to be discovered looking out at any of the windows opposite. The sole motion was the occasional drift of a vapor-like film of white powder, which the wind would lift like dust from the snowy carpet that covered the street, and wafting it along for a few yards drop again to its repose, till another, stronger gust, prelusive of the wind about to rise at sundown, a wind cold and bitter as death, would rush over the street, raise a denser cloud of the white water dust to sting the face of any improbable person who might meet it in its passage it was a keen knife-edged frost even in the house and what robert saw to make him stand at the desolate window i do not know and i believe he could not himself have told there he did stand however for the space of five minutes or so with nothing better filling his outer eyes at least than a bald spot on the crown of the street whence the wind had swept away the snow leaving it brown and bare a spot of march in the middle of january he heard the town drummer in the distance and let the sound invade his passive ears till it crossed the opening of the street and vanished down the town there's dubal sanny he said to himself with such cold hands as he's playing upon the drumhead as if he was leaping in a cask then he stood silent once more with a look as if anything would be welcome to break the monotony while he stood a gentle timorous tap came to the door so gentle indeed that betty in the kitchen did not hear it or she tall and roman nosed as she was would have answered it before the long-legged dreamer could have reached the door though he was not above three yards from it in lack of anything better to do robert stalked to the summons as he opened the door these words greeted him is robert at eh it's bob himsel bob i'm exceedingly cold what for didn't ye gone home then what for was not ye at the school the day i put one question at you and ye answer me with another well i have no home to go on till well and i had a headache but where's your home gone till then the hoose is there all right but where my mother is i dinna ken the doors lock it and jeems jowp they tell me is turn away the key i doot my mother's always upon the tramp again and what's to come of me the lord kens what's this of it 
interposed a severe but not unmelodious voice, breaking into the conversation between the two boys, for the parlour door had opened without Robert's hearing it, and Mrs. Falconer, his grandmother, had drawn near to the speakers. "'What's this o' it?' she asked again. "'What's that you're conversin' with at the door, Robert? Given it be only decent laddie, tell him to come in, and no stand at the door in such a day as this.' As Robert hesitated with his reply, she looked round the open half of the door, but no sooner saw with whom he was talking than her tone changed. By this time Betty, wiping her hands in her apron, had completed the group by taking her stand in the kitchen door. "'Na, na,' said Mrs. Falconer. "'We want none sitch like here. "'What does he want with you, Robert? "'Give him a piece, Betty, and let him go on. "'Eh, sirs, the lad has not a stocking fit upon him.' and in such weather. For before she had finished her speech, the visitor, as if in terror of her nearer approach, had turned his back and literally showed her, if not a clean pair of heels, yet a pair of naked heels from between the soles and uppers of his shoes. If he had any stockings at all, they ceased before they reached his ankles. "'What ails him at me?' continued Mrs. Falconer, "'that he rins as if I were a booty.' but it's nae wonder he cannot bide the sight of a decent body, for he no use till it. What does he want with you, Robert? But Robert had a reason for not telling his grandmother what the boy had told him. He thought the news about his mother would only make her disapprove of him the more. In this he judged wrong. He did not know his grandmother yet. He's in my class at the school, said Robert evasively. Him? What class knew? Robert hesitated one moment, but compelled to give some answer, said with confidence, "'The Bible class?' "'I thought as muckle. What gars ye play at hide-and-seek with me? Do ye think I do not ken weel enough there's no a lad or a lass at the school but as in the Bible class? What wants ye here?' "'He hardly gave him time to tell me, Granny. He frightened him.' "'Me fright him? What force did I fright him, laddie?' I'm no such wonder that anybody needs to be frightened at me. The old lady turned with visible, though by no means profound, offence upon her calm forehead, and walking back into her parlour, where Robert could see the fire burning right cheerily, shut the door and left him and Betty standing together in the trans. The latter returned to the kitchen to resume the washing of the dinner dishes, and the former returned to his post at the window. He had not stood more than half a minute, thinking what was to be done with his schoolfellow deserted of his mother, when the sound of a coach-horn drew his attention to the right, down the street where he could see part of the other street which crossed it at right angles, and in which the gable of the house stood. A minute after, the mail came in sight, scarlet spotted with snow, and disappeared going up the hill towards the chief hostelry of the town, as fast as four horses, tired with the bad footing they had had through the whole of the stage, could draw it after them. By this time the twilight was falling, for though the sun had not yet set, miles of frozen vapour came between him and this part of the world, and his light was never very powerful so far north at this season of the year. Robert turned into the kitchen and began to put on his shoes. He had made up his mind what to do. "'You're never gone oot at Robert,' said Betty, in a hoarse tone of expostulation. "'Deed am I, Betty. What for no? "'You had been in all day with a headache. "'I'll just go on and tell the mistress, "'and sign we'll see what she'll please to say till it. "'You'll do naething of the kind, Betty. "'Are you going to turn tell-tale at your age?' "'What can ye aboot my age? "'There's never a man-body at the tune kens aught aboot my age.' Sore muckle for anybody to remember, is it, Betty? It's not be ill-tongued, Robert, or I'll just go on to the mistress. Betty, what began with being ill-tongued? You and you tell my grandmother what I go out to the night. I'll go on to the schoolmaster of Muckledrum and get a sight of the Kirsten and book, and given your name been not there, I'll tell ilka buddy I meet at our Betty was never christened, and that'll be a sore affront, Betty. Hoot, was there ever such a laddie? said Betty, attempting to laugh it off. Be sure ye be back afore tay time, cause your granny'll ill be spirin' after ye, and ye would not want me lie boot ye. 
I would have naebody lie about me. Ye just need not let on at ye hears her. Ye can be deaf enough when ye like, Betty. But I'll be back afore tay time, or come on the war. Betty, who was in far greater fear of her age being discovered than of being unchristianized in the search, though the fact was that she knew nothing certain about the matter, and had no desire to be enlightened, feeling as if she was thus left at liberty to hint what she pleased. Betty, I say, never had any intention of going to the mistress, for the threat was merely the rod of terror which she thought it convenient to hold over the back of the boy, whom she always supposed to be in some mischief unless he were in her own presence, and visibly reading a book. If he were reading aloud, so much the better. But Robert likewise kept a rod for his defence, and that was Betty's age, which he had discovered to be such a precious secret that one would have thought her virtue depended in some cabalistic manner upon the concealment of it. And certainly nature herself seemed to favour Betty's weakness, casting such a mist about the number of her years as the goddesses of old were wont to cast about a wounded favourite. For some said Betty was forty, others said she was sixty-five, and in fact almost everybody who knew her had a different belief on the matter. By this time Robert had conquered the difficulty of enduing boots as hard as a thorough wetting, and as thorough as a drying could make them, and now stood prepared to go. His object in setting out was to find the boy whom his grandmother had driven from the door with a hastier and more abject flight than she had in the least intended. But if his grandmother should miss him, as Betty suggested, and inquire where he had been, what was he to say? He did not mind misleading his grandmother, but he had a great objection to telling her a lie. His grandmother herself delivered him from this difficulty. "'Robert, come here,' she called from the parlour door, and Robert obeyed. "'Is it dingin' on, Robert?' she asked. "'No, Granny, it's only a starny old drift.' The meaning of this was that there was no fresh snow falling, or beating on, only a little surface snow blowing about. "'Weel, just put your shoon on, man, and run up to Miss Napier's upon the squire, and say to Miss Napier, with my compliments, that I would be sore obliged till her, given she would lend me that fine receipt of hers for crappet heads, and I'll send it back safe the morn's morning. Rin nu. This commission fell in admirably with Robert's plans, and he started at once. End Book One Chapter Two Book One Chapter Three of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Book One Chapter Three The Boar's Head. Miss Napier was the eldest of three maiden sisters who kept the principal hostelry of Rothieden, called the Boar's Head, from which, as Robert reached the square in the dusk, the mail-coach was moving away with the fresh quaternion of horses. He found a good many boxes upon the pavement close by the archway that led to the inn-yard, and around them had gathered a group of loungers, not too cold to be interested. These were looking towards the windows of the inn, where the owner of the boxes had evidently disappeared. "'Saw ye ever sich a sight in old town afore?' said Dubal Sanny, as people generally called him, his name being Alexander Alexander, pronounced by those who chose to speak of him with the ordinary respect due from one mortal to another, Sandy Elshender. Double Sandy was a shoemaker, remarkable for his love of sweet sounds and whisky. He was, besides, the town crier, who went about with a drum at certain hours of the morning and evening, like a perambulating clock, and also made public announcements of sales, losses, etc. For the rest, a fierce fighting fellow when in anger or in drink, which latter included the former. "'What's the sixth, Sandy?' asked Robert, coming up with his hands in his pockets of his trousers. "'Sich a sick as ye never saw, man,' returned Sandy. "'The bonniest laddie ever man set his eye upon. I could nae have thought there had been such a woman in this world.' "'Hoot, Sandy,' said Robert. 
A body would think she was lost, and ye had the crying of her. Speak lower, man. She'll maybe hear ye. Is she in the inn there? Ay, is she, answered Sandy. See such a whirl of kiss as she brought with her. He continued, pointing toward the pile of luggage. Saw ye ever such a heap? It just beats me to think that a body can do with so many kissed. For I may not do it, but there is something or other in ilka one of them. Naebody would carry a boot empty kiss with them. I cannot make it oot. The boxes might well surprise Sandy, if we may draw any conclusions from the fact that the sole implement of personal adornment which he possessed was two inches of a broken comb for which he had to search when he happened to want it in the drawer of his stool among all the lumps of rosin for his violin masses of the same substance wrought into shoemaker's wax for his ends and packets of boar's bristles commonly called bursts for the same are they and all's bodies asked robert troth are they they're all hers i wot you would have thought she had been given to the bothy but given she had been there, there would have been a carriage to meet her, said Crooked Camel, the ostler. The Bothy was the name facetiously given by Alexander Baron Rothy, son of the Marquis of Boarshead, to a house he had built in the neighbourhood, chiefly for the accommodation of his bachelor friends from London during the shooting season. Hold your tongue, Camel, said the shoemaker. She's nae such cattle, you. Hold up the bit stable lantern, man, and let Robert here see the direction upon them. Maybe he'll make something of it. He's a fine scholar, ye can, said another of the bystanders. The ostler held the lantern to the card upon one of the boxes, but Robert found only an M, followed by something not very definite, and a J, which might have been an I. Rothidon, Dresshire, Scotland. As he was not immediate with his answer, Peter Lumley, one of the group, a lazy ne'er-do-well, who had known better days, but never better manners, and was seldom quite drunk, and seldom or still quite sober, struck in with, "'Ye do not ken a thing yet, ye see, Robbie.' From Sandy this would have been nothing but a good-humoured attempt at facetiousness. From Lumley it meant spite, because Robert's praise was in his ears. I do not pretend to ken all more than ye do yourself, Mr. Lumley, and that's nae saying muckle, surely, returned Robert, irritated at his tone more than at his words. The bystanders laughed, and Lumley flew into a rage. Hold your ill tongue, ye brat, he said. What are ye to make such remarks upon your betters? Anybody kens your grandfather was nothing but the blind piper of Portalady. This was news to Robert probably false considering the quarter whence it came but his mother wit did not forsake him weel mr lumley he answered did not he pipe weel dar ye tell me at he did not pipe weel and weels ye could have done it yourself knew mr lumley the laugh again rose at lumley's expense who was well known to have tried his hand at most things and succeeded in nothing dubal sanny was especially delighted devil have ye for the devil's brat and i should swear was all lumley's reply as he sought to conceal his mortification by attempting to join in the laugh against himself robert seized the opportunity of turning away and entering the house that un's no to be drunt or burnt either said lumley as he disappeared he'll no be hanged for closing your mouth mr lumley said the shoemaker Thereupon Lumley turned and followed Robert into the inn. Robert had delivered his message to Miss Napier, who sat in an armchair by the fire, in a little comfortable parlour, held sacred by all about the house. She was paralytic and unable to attend to her guests further than by giving orders when anything especial was referred to her decision. She was an old lady, nearly as old as Mrs. Falconer, and wore glasses, but they could not conceal the kindness of her kindly eyes. Probably from giving less heed to a systematic theology, she had nothing of that sternness which first struck a stranger on seeing Robert's grandmother. But then she did not know what it was to be contradicted, and if she had been married and had had sons, perhaps a sternness not dissimilar might have shown itself in her nature. 
No, ye mauna gang awa' till ye get something," she said, after taking the receipt in request from a drawer within her reach and laying it upon the table. But ere she could ring the bell which stood by her side, one of the servants came in. "Please, ma'am," she said, "Miss Letty and Miss Lizzie's seen after the bonny laddie, and so I mount come to you." "Is she all that bonny, Meg?" asked her mistress. "Na, na, she's na so fearsome bonny, but Miss Letty's unco taken with her, ye ken. And we all say as Miss Letty says in this hoose, but that's no the print. Mr. Lumley's here, seeking a gill. Is he to have it? Has he had enough already, do you think, Meg? I do not ken about enough, ma'am. That's ill to miser. But I do not think he's had o'er muckle. Well, let him take it, but do not let him sit doon. Very well, ma'am, said Meg, and departed. What gars Mr. Lumley say at my grandfather was the blind piper of poor Claudie? Can you tell me, Miss Napier? asked Robert. When said he that, Robert? Just as I came in. Miss Napier rang the bell. Another maid appeared. Send Meg here directly. Meg came, her eyes full of interrogation. Do not give Lumley a drop. Set him up to insult a young gentleman at my door check. He's no had a drop here the night. He's had ore muckle. Meg already, and ye ought to have seen that. Deed, ma'am, he's had more than ore muckle then, for there's another gill o'er the trapple of em. I div my best, ma'am, but never tasting myself, I cannot I tell who's muckle and the warm of anybody at comes in. You're no fit for the place, Meg, that's a fact. At this charge Meg took no offence, for she had been in the place for twenty years, and both mistress and maid laughed the moment they parted company. "'What's this that comes the next, Miss Napier, as they're so taken with?' asked Robert. "'Atweel, I did not ken yet. She's our bonny by a coonst to be going about alone. It's a mercy the barons know at home, and would have to lock her up with the forks and spoons.' "'What for that?' asked Robert. But Miss Napier vouchsafed no further explanation. She stuffed his pockets with sweet biscuits instead, dismissed him in haste, and rang the bell. "'Meg, whar have they put in the stranger, laddie?' "'She's no going to bide at our house, ma'am.' "'What, say ye, lass? She's never going o'er to Lucky Happits, is she?' "'Oh, na, ma'am. She's a lady, ilka inch of her.' But she's some relation to the old captain, and she's gone doon the street as soon as Cammel's ready to take her bit boxes in the barrow. But I doot there'll be most three barrowfuls of them. At will, ye can go on. End Book One, Chapter Three. Book One, Chapter Four of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Chapter Four, Shargar. Robert went out into the thin drift and again crossing the wide, desolate looking square, turned down an entry leading to a kind of court which had once been inhabited by a well to do class of the townspeople but had now fallen in estimation. Upon a stone at the door of what seemed an outhouse, he discovered the object of his search. What are you sitting there for, Shargar? Shargar is a word of Gaelic origin, applied with some sense of the ridiculous, to a thin, wasted, dried-up creature. In the present case, it was the nickname by which the boy was known at school, and indeed where he was known at all. What are you sitting there for, Shargar? Did nobody offer to take ye in? Nay, none of them. I think they maun be all in their beds. A most dreadful cold. The fact was that Shargar's character, whether by imputation from his mother or derived from his own actions, was none of the best. The consequence was that, although scarcely one of the neighbors would have allowed him to sit there all night, each was willing to wait yet a while, in the hope that somebody else's humanity would give in first, 
and save her from the necessity of offering him a seat by the fireside and a share of the oatmeal porridge which probably would be scanty enough for her own household for it must be borne in mind that all the houses in the place were occupied by poor people with whom the one virtue charity was in a measure at home and amidst many sins cardinal and other managed to live in even some degree of comfort get up then shargar ye lazy beggar or are ye frozen to the door stand i was away for a kettle of boiling water to louse ye na na bob i'm no stookin i'm only some stiff with the cold for well but i am cold said shargar rising with difficulty give us a hold of your hand bob robert gave him his hand and shargar was straight away upon his feet come away noo as fast and as quiet as ye can what are ye going to do with me bob what's that to you shargar nathan only i would like to ken have patience and ye will ken only mind ye do as i tell ye and do not speak a word shargar followed in silence on the way robert remembered that miss napier had not after all given him the receipt for which his grandmother had sent him so he returned to the boar's head and while he went in left shargar in the archway to shiver and try in vain to warm his hands by the alternate plans of slapping them on the opposite arms and hiding them under them when robert came out he saw a man talking to him under the lamp the moment his eyes fell upon the two he was struck by a resemblance between them shargar was right under the lamp the man to the side of it so that shargar was shadowed by its frame and the man was in its full light the latter turned away and passing robert went into the inn what's that asked robert and did not ken answered shargar he spake to me or ever i kent he was there and guard my heart gives sich a lelp at it most fell into my breeks and what said he to ye he said was the devil at my lug that i did naften but cow my hands to bits upon my shoulders and what said ye to that i said i wist he was for he would ablins have some spare heat about him and i had not quite enough weel done shargar what said he to that he laugh and sport given i would list and give me a shillin he did not take it shargar asked robert in some alarm ay did i catch me no take a shillin but they'll hold ye till it na na i'm more in need for a sodger but that man was nae sodger and what more said he he spurt what i would do with the shillin and what said ye ow sang ye came oot and he got away and ye did not ken what it was repeated robert it was some like my brother lord sandy but i did not ken said shargar by this time they had arrived at yule the baker's shop bide ye here said robert who happened to possess a few coppers till i go on in the yields shargar stood again and shivered at the door till robert came out with a penny loaf in one hand and a two penny loaf in the other give us a bit bob said shargar i'm as hungry as i am cold bide ye still returned robert there's a time for all things and your time's no come to foregather with their loaf yet does not it smell fine it's new from the bakehouse no ten minutes ago i can by the feel of it let me feel said shargar stretching out one hand and feeling his shilling with the other nay nah, your hands cannot be clean and folks should i eat clean whether they go on clean or no i'll away in and buy one oot of my own shillin said shargar in a tone of resolute eagerness you'll do nothing of the kind returned robert darting his hand at his collar give me the shillin you'll want it all or long shargar yielded the coin and slunk behind while robert again led the way till they came to his grandmother's door go on to the gal of the hoose there shargar and just keek round the nook at me and given i whustle upon ye come up as quiet ye can even i do not bide till i come to ye robert opened the door cautiously it was never locked except at night or when betty had gone to the well for water or to the butcher's or baker's or the prayer meeting upon which occasion she put the key in her pocket and left her mistress a prisoner he looked first to the right along the passage and saw that his grandmother's door was shut then across the passage to the left and saw that the kitchen door was likewise shut because of the cold for its normal position was against the wall thereupon closing the door but keeping the handle in his hand and the bolt drawn back he turned to the street and whistled soft and low 
Shargar had in a moment dragged his heavy feet ready to part company with their shoes at any instant to Robert's side. He bent his ear to Robert's whisper. Go on in there and creep like a mouse to the fit of the stair. I mount close the door, Highness, said he, opening the door as he spoke. I'm frightened, Robert. Do not be a fool. Granny will not bite off your head. She had one till her dinner the day, and it was ill singed. What on of? A sheep's head, ye fool. Go on in directly. Shargar persisted no longer, but, taking about four steps a minute, slunk past the kitchen like a thief. Not so carefully, however, but that one of his soles, yet looser than the other, gave one clap upon the flagged passage, when Betty straight away stood in the kitchen door, a fierce pitcher in a deal frame. By this time Robert had closed the outer door and was following at Shargar's heels. "'What's this?' she cried, but not so loud as to reach the ears of Mrs. Falconer, for, with true Scotch foresight, she would not willingly call in another power before the situation clearly demanded it. "'Why Shargar go on that gate? With me. Did not you see me with him? I'm nae a thief, nor yet Shargar. There may be two opinions upon that, Robert. I was just away to the mistress. I was no how such doings in my hoose. It's nae your hoose, Betty. Do not lee. Well, I's have no such thing going by my kitchen door. There, Robert, what do you make of that? There's nae offence there, I hope, give it should not be altogether my own hoose. Take Shargar oot of that, or I's away, as I tell ye. Meantime, Shargar was standing on the stones, looking like a terrified white rabbit, and shaking from head to foot with cold and fright combined. I'll take him out of this, but it's up the stair, Betty, and if ye speak about it, I swear to ye, as sure as death, I'll go on doing to the muckle drum upon Saturday in the afternoon. Gone away with your havers, only given the mistress spares on thing about it, what am I to say? Bye till she spares, old Spunky says. Ready-made answers are I to seek. And I say, Betty, have you a cold potato? I'll look and see. Would not you like it het up? Oh, I, given you be not long about it. Suddenly a bell rang, shrill and peremptory, right above Shargar's head, causing in him a responsive increase of trembling. Hold out of my gate. There's the mistress's bell, said Betty. Just by till we're round the nook and on the stair, said Robert, now leading the way. Betty watched them safe round the corner before she made for the parlour, little thinking to what she had become an unwilling accomplice, for she never imagined that more than an evening's visit was intended by Shargar, which in itself seemed to her strange and improper enough, even for such an eccentric boy as Robert to encourage. Shargar followed in mortal terror, for like Christian in the Pilgrim's Progress, he had no armour to his back. Once round the corner, two strides of three steps each took them to the top of the first stair, Shargar knocking his head in the darkness against the never-opened door. Again, three strides brought them to the top of the second flight, and turning once more still to the right, Robert led Shargar up the few steps into the higher of the two garrets. Here there was just glimmer enough from the sky to discover the hollow of a close bedstead, built in under the sloping roof which served it for a tester, while the two ends and most of the frost were boarded up to the roof. This bedstead, fortunately, was not so bare as the one in the other room, although it had not been used for many years, for an old mattress covered the boards with which it was bottomed. Gone in there, Shargar. You'll be warmer there than upon the doorstep any gate. Put off your shoon. Shargar obeyed full of delight at finding himself in such good quarters. Robert went to a forsaken press in the room, and brought out an ancient cloak of tartan, of the same form as what is now called an Inverness cape, a blue dress coat with plain gilt buttons, which shone even now in the all but darkness, and several other garments, amongst them a kilt, and heaped them over Shargar as he lay on the mattress. He then handed him the two penny and the penny loaves, which were all his stock had reached to the purchase of, and left him saying, I'm on a way to my tay, Shargar. I'll fess you a cold potato hot again, given Betty has ony. Lie still, and whatever you do, do not come out of that. The last injunction was entirely unnecessary. Eh, hey, Bob, I'm just in heaven, said the poor creature, 
for his skin began to feel the precious possibility of reviving warmth in the distance. Now that he had gained a new burrow, the human animal soon recovered from his fears as well. It seemed to him, in the novelty of the place, that he had made so many doublings to reach it, that there could be no danger of even the mistress of the house finding him out, for she could hardly be supposed to look after such a remote corner of her dominions. And then he was boxed in with the bed, and covered with no end of warm garments, while the friendly darkness closed him in his shelter all round except the faintest blue gleam from one of the panes in the roof there was soon no hint of light anywhere and this was only sufficient to make the darkness visible and thus add artistic effect to the operation of it upon shargar's imagination a faculty certainly uneducated in shargar but far very far from being therefore non-existent it was indeed actively operative although like that of many a fine lady and gentleman only in relation to such primary questions as what shall we eat and what shall we drink and wherewithal shall we be clothed but as he lay and devoured the new white bread his satisfaction the bare delight of his animal existence reached a pitch such as even this imagination stinted with poverty and frostbitten with maternal oppression had never conceived possible the power of enjoying the present without anticipation of the future or regard of the past is the especial privilege of the animal nature and of the human nature in proportion as it has not been developed beyond the animal herein lies the happiness of cab horses and of tramps to them the gift of forgetfulness is of worth inestimable shargar's heaven was for the present gained End. chapter four Book One, Chapter Five of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Chapter Five The Symposium. Robert had scarcely turned out of the square on his way to find Shargar when a horseman entered it. His horse and he were both apparently black on one side and grey on the other from the snowdrift settling to windward. The animal looked tired, but the rider sat as easy as if he were riding to cover. The reins hung loose, and the horse went in a straight line for the boar's head, stopping under the archway only when his master drew bridle at the door of the inn. At that moment Miss Letty was standing at the back of Miss Napier's chair, leaning her arms upon it as she talked to her. This was her way of resting as often as occasion arose from a chat with her elder sister. Miss Letty's hair was gathered in a great knot at the top of her head, and little ringlets hung like tendrils down the sides of her face, the benevolence of which was less immediately striking than that of her sister's, because of the constant play of humour upon it, especially about the mouth. If a spirit of satire could be supposed converted into something Christian by an infusion of the tenderest loving-kindness and humanity, remaining still recognizable, notwithstanding that all its bitterness was gone. Such was the expression of Miss Letty's mouth. It was always half-puckered, as if in resistance to a comic smile, which showed itself at the window of the keen grey eyes, however the mouth might be able to keep it within doors. She was neatly dressed in black silk, with a lace collar, her hands were small and white. The moment the traveller stopped at the door, Miss Napier started. Letty, she said, what's that? I could almost swear to Black Geordie's fit. Ah, four of them, I think, returned Miss Letty, as the horse, notwithstanding, or perhaps in consequence of his fatigue, began to paw and move about on the stones impatiently. The rider had not yet spoken. He'll be after some of his devil make care skulduddery, but just run to the door, Letty, or Lizzie'll be there afore ye, and maybe she would not be o'er civil. What can he be after noo? What would the greyhound be after but hare? returned Miss Letty. Who oh, it's nonsense. He kens naething aboot her. Go on to the door, lassie. Miss Letty obeyed. What's there? she asked, somewhat sharply as she opened it that neither knocks nor calls preserve us all is it you my lord 
Hoo ken ye me, Miss Letty, without seeing my face? A body at the boar's head kens Black Geordie as well as your lordship's in own. But where comes your lordship from in such a nick as this? From Russia, never dismounted between Moscow and Aberdeen, the ice is bearing tonight. And the baron laughed inside the upturned collar of his cloak, for he knew that strangely exaggerated stories were current about his feats in the saddle. That's a long ride, my lord, and a slittery. And what's your lordship's will? Muckle ye care aboot my lordship to stand jawing there in a night like this. Is nobody going to take my horse? I beg your lordship's pardon. Come, ill. Your lordship never said you wanted your lordship's horse taken. I thought you might be gone on to the bothy. Take Black Geordie here, Camel. Come into the parlour, my lord. How do you do, Miss Napier? said Lord Rothie as he entered the room. Here's this jade of a sister of yours asking me why I don't go home to the bothy when I choose to stop and water here. What'll ye take, my lord? Let ye fess the brandy. Oh, curse your brandy. Bring me a gill of good Glendronach. Rin, Letty, his lordship's cold. I could not rise to offer ye the armchair, my lord. I can get one for myself, thank heaven. Long may your lordship return such thanks. For I'm only new begun, ye think, Miss Napier. Well, I don't often trouble heaven with my affairs. By Jove, I ought to be heard when I do. Ne do it ye will, my lord, when ye seek anything that's fit to be given ye. True. Heaven's gifts are seldom much worth the asking. Hold your tongue, my lord, and do not bring down a judgment upon my house, for it would be missed out of the Ruthiden. You're right there, Miss Napier, and here comes the whisky to stop my mouth. The Baron of Rothy sat for a few minutes with his feet on the fender before Miss Letty's blazing fire without speaking. While he sipped the whisky neat from a wine glass, he was a man about the middle height rather full-figured muscular and active with a small head and an eye whose brightness had not yet been dimmed by the sensuality which might be read in the condition rather than frame of his countenance but while he spoke so pleasantly to the miss napiers and his forehead spread broad and smooth over the twinkle of his hazel eye there was a sharp curve on each side of his upper lip half-way between the corner and the middle which reminded one of the same curves in the lip of his ancestral boar's head, where it was lifted up by the protruding tusks. These curves disappeared, of course, when he smiled, and his smile, being a lord's, was generally pronounced irresistible. He was good-natured and no wise inclined to stand upon his rank, so long as he had his own way. "'Any customers by the mail tonight, Miss Napier?' he asked in a careless tone. "'Naybody particular, my lord.' I thought you never let anybody in that wasn't particularly particular. No foot passengers, eh? Hoot, my lord, that's twa year ago. Given I had jaloosed him to be a friend of your lordship's, for by being a lord himself, he ken as well as I do that I would not have sent him o'er the gate to Lucky Happits, where he would not have even be o'er sure of getting clean sheets. But given lords and lords' sons will walk a fit like other folk, What's to ken them from other folk? Well, Miss Napier, he was no lord at all. He was nothing but a factor body, doing from Glenbucket. There was small harm done then, my lord. I'm glad to hear it. But what'll your lordship have to your supper? I would like a dish of your sweetbreads and kidneys. No, think of that, returned the landlady, laughing. Ye great folk would have the very course of nature turned upside down to shoot yourselves. Whatever heard of cows at this time of the year? Real anything you like. Who was it came by the mail, did you say? I said nobody particular, my lord. Well, I'll just go and have a look at Black Geordie. Very well, my lord. Letty, run and look after him. And as sure as he's run the nook, Tell Lizzie not to say a word about the laddie, and sure as death he's after her. Where could he have heard tell of her? Lord Rothie came a moment after sauntering into the bar parlour, where Lizzie, the third Miss Napier, a red-haired, round-eyed, white-toothed woman of forty, was making entries in a book. 
She's a bonny lassie, that, that came in the coach to-night, they say, Miss Lizzie. It's ugly as sin, my lord, answered Lizzie. I have seen some sin at was no so ugly, Miss Lizzie. She would have clean disgusted you, my lord. It's a mercy you did not see her. If she be as ugly as all that, I would just like to see her. Miss Lizzie saw she had gone too far. Ow, deed, even your lordship wants to see her, he may see her at her will. I was gone and tell her. And she rose as if to go. No, no, nothing of the sort, Miss Lizzie. Only I heard that she was bonny, and I wanted to see her. You know I like to look at a pretty girl. That's our will, can't, my lord. Well, there's no harm in that, Miss Lizzie. There's no harm in that, my lord, though your lordship says it. The facts were that his lordship had been to the country town some forty miles off, and Black Geordie had been sent to Hillno to meet him, for in any weather that would let him sit he preferred horseback to every other mode of travelling, though he seldom would be followed by a groom. He had posted to Hillno, and had dined with a friend at the inn. The coach stopping to change horses, he had caught a glimpse of a pretty face, as he thought, from its window, and had hoped to overtake the coach before it reached Rothedon. But stopping to drink another bottle, he had failed, and it was on the merest chance of seeing that pretty face that he stopped at the boar's head. In all probability, had the Marquis seen the lady, he would not have thought her at all such a beauty as she appeared in the eyes of Dubal Sanny, nor, I venture to think, had he thought as the shoemaker did, would he yet have dared to address her in other than the words of such respect as he could still feel in the presence of that which was more noble than himself. Whether or not his visit to the stable he found anything amiss with Black Geordie, I cannot tell, but he now begged Miss Lizzie to have a bedroom prepared for him. It happened to be the evening of Friday, one devoted by some of the town people to a club. To this, knowing that the talk will throw a glimmer on several matters, I will now introduce my reader as a spectator through the reversed telescope of my history. A few of the more influential of the inhabitants had grown, rather than formed themselves, into a kind of club which met weekly at the boar's head. Although they had no exclusive right to the room in which they sat, they generally managed to retain exclusive possession of it. For any supposed objectionable person entered, they always got rid of him, sometimes without his being aware of how they had contrived to make him so uncomfortable. They began to gather about seven o'clock, when it was expected that boiling water would be in readiness for the compound generally called toddy, sometimes punch. As soon as six were assembled, one was always voted into the chair. On the present occasion, Mr. Innes, the schoolmaster, was unanimously elected to that honour. He was a hard-featured, sententious, snuffy individual, of some learning and great respectability. I omit the political talk with which their intercommunications began, for however interesting at the time is the scaffolding by which existing institutions arise, the poles and beams when gathered again in the builder's yard are scarcely a subject for the artist. The first to lead the way towards matters of nearer personality was William MacGregor, the linen manufacturer, a man who possessed a score of hand-looms or so, half of which, from the advance of cotton and the decline of linen wear, now stood idle, but who had already a sufficient deposit in the hands of Mr. Thompson, the banker, agent, that is, for the county bank, to secure him against any necessity for taking the cotton shirts himself, which were an abomination and offence unpardonable in his eyes. "'Can you tell me, Mr. Cocker,' he said, "'what makes Sandy Lord Rothy, or Rathy, or what should he be called?' Take to the bothy at a time like this, when there's neither hunting nor fishing nor shooting nor anything the kind aboot him hand to be play axe, till him the bonny baron, septed otters and such like. William was a shrunken old man with white whiskers and a black wig, a keen black eye, always in search of the ludicrous in other people, and a mouth ever on the move as if masticating something comical. "'You know just as well as I do,' answered Mr. Cocker, "'the Marquis of Boarshead's factor for the surrounding estate. "'He never was in the way of giving a reason for anything, "'least of all for his own movements. "'Somebody was saying to me,' resumed MacGregor, "'who in all probability invented the story at the moment, "'that the prince took him kissing on of his servant lasses "'and kicked him out of Carlton House into the street, "'and he cannot whine o'er the disgrace of it, 
indeed for the kissin said mr thompson a portly comfortable man that's neither here nor there though it might have been a duchess or twa but for the kickin my word but lord sandy was more likely to kick with the prince do you mind who he did when the marquis taxed him with hold a quiet soft interposed mr crookshank the solicitor there's a drop in the house this was a phrase well understood by the company indicating the presence of some one unknown or unfit to be trusted as he spoke he looked toward the further end of the room which lay in obscurity for it was a large room lighted only by the four candles on the table at which the company sat war mr crookshank asked the dominie in a whisper there answered sampson petty the bookseller who seized the opportunity of saying something and pointed furtively where the solicitor had only looked a dim figure was decried at a table in the farthest corner of the room and they proceeded to carry out the plan they generally adopted to get rid of a stranger you made use of a curious old scots phrase this moment mr kershank can you explain who it comes to bear the meaning that it will can't to bear said the manufacturer not i mr macgregor answered the solicitor i'm no philologist or antiquarian ask the chairman gentlemen responded mr innes taking a huge pinch of snuff after the word and then passing the box to mr cocker a sip from his glass before he went on the phrase gentlemen a drop in the house no doubt refers to an undesirable presence for you are well aware that it's most un pleasing discovery in winter especially to find a drop of water hanging from your ceiling ah something in short where it has no business to be and is not accordingly looked for or prepared against it seems to me mr innes said macgregor that ye have hit the nail but no upon the head what make ye of the phrase no confined to the scots tongue i believe of an eavesdropper the whilk no doubt represents a body that hangs about your winnock like a drop hanging o'er a bonnet from the eaves therefore called an eavesdropper but the sort of whilk we no speak are a war sort altogether for they come to the inside of your hoose or your very chammer or hang out their long ears to hear where there cannot be hard save by a douce friend or two or a het tumbler at the same moment the door opened and a man entered who was received with unusual welcome bless my soul said the president rising it's mr lammy come away mr lammy sit doon sit doon where have you been this money a day like a pelican in the wilderness mr lammy was a large mild man with florid cheeks no whiskers and a prominent black eye he was characterized by a certain simple alacrity a gentle but outspeaking readiness which made him a favourite i did not rightly make oot where ye are he answered ye have unco little light here who are ye all gentlemen i said uh, discover ye by degrees and pay my respects accordin and he drew a chair to the table deed i wish ye would returned macgregor in a voice pretentiously hushed but none the less audible there's a drop in yon in of the hoose mr lamney oh it's never mind the man said lamney looking round in the directions indicated as warrant he cares as little about his as we care about him there's no treason nowadays i care not who hears what i say for my part said mr petty i cannot help wondering given it could be or old friend mr falconer spake of the devil said mr lammie hut now returned petty interrupting he was not altogether the devil hold your tongue of ye retorted lammie did not ye ken a proverb when ye hear it the devil have ye ye're as sharp as says a missionary i was only going on to say that i'm doot and andrew's dead ay ay commenced the chorus of questioning mm, ay what guards ye think that and so he's dead he was a great favourite andrew war died he ay some upsettin though ay he was ay to be somebody with his tail a good-hearted crater but ye could not lip in till him speak no ill of the dead maybe they'll hear ye and turn ruined in their coffins and that'll wummel ye in your beds said macgregor with a twinkle in his eye ring the bell for another tumbler samson said the chairman 
It'll be done with the factory place new. It'll be in the market. It's been in the market for many a year, but it's no his of all. It belongs to the old lady, his mother, said the weaver. Why don't you buy it, Mr. McGregor, and set up a cotton mill? There's not much doing with the linen now, said Mr. Cocker. Me, returned McGregor with indignation. The Lord forgive ye for hinting at such a thing, Mr. Cocker. Me take the cotton. I would as soon spin the hair from Sotton's hurdies, short, fashionless dirt, and I cannot grow straight out of the hustle yard like the bonny lint bells, but mount stick itself upon a bus, set it up, coarse, vulgar stuff, and naebody would wear but low counter lads that would fain look like gentlemen by means of the collars and ruffles, and a coming from the old loom, they may well afford seventeen hundred linen to set it off with as have nothing but cotton inside the brooks of them but dr wagstaff says it's healthier interposed petty a wag a staff till him devil a bit of it's healthier and that he kens it's no so healthy and such makes him more mark with his polars and his droughts and other stuff healthier what's neist somebody tell it me said the bookseller inwardly conscious of offence at who lord sandy himself wears cotton ow deed may be and he sets many a worthy example forby how many can tell me mr petty has he pulled doon from honest if no from high estate and sent oot to seek their living as he taught them how many hoot hoot mr macgregor his lordship hasn't a cotton shirt in his possession i'll be bound said mr cocker and besides you have not to wash his dirty linen or cotton either that's as muckle as to say according to cocker that i'm no to speak a word against him but i'll say what i like he's no my master said macgregor who could drink very little without suffering in his temper and manners and who besides had a certain shrewd suspicion as to the person who still sat in the dark end of the room possibly because the entrance of mr lammy had interrupted the exorcism the chairman interposed with soothing words and the whole company cocker included did its best to pacify the manufacturer for they all knew what would be the penalty if they failed a good deal of talk followed and a great deal of whisky was drunk they were waited upon by meg who without their being aware of it cast a keen parting glance at them every time she left the room at length the conversation had turned again to andrew falconer's death where said ye he died mr lammy i never said he was dead I said I was feared that he was dead. And what guards ye say that? It might of consequence to have it correct, said the solicitor. I had a letter from my old friend and his, Dr. Anderson. Ye might upon him, Mr. Innes, don't I ye? He's head of the medical board at Calcutta, new. He says nothing but that he's doots he's gone. He goed up to the country, and he has not heard of him so long. We have keep it up a correspondence for many a year new, Dr. Anderson and me. He was a relation of Andrew's, ye ken, a second cousin or something. He'll be home or long, I'm thinking, with a fine pension. He would not wear a cotton sark, I'll be boon, said MacGregor. What's the old lady going to do with that long-legged grandson of hers, Andrew's son? asked Samson. Ow, oh, he'll be going to the college, I'm thinking. He's a fine lad and a clever, they tell me, said Mr. Thompson. Indeed, he's all that and more too," said the schoolmaster. "There's nothing all do but the college knew," said MacGregor, whom nobody heeded for fear of again arousing his anger. "Who'll she manage that honest woman? She mount have but little to spare from the cleading of him. She's a good manager, Mistress Falconer, and you see she has the bleach green yet. She does not wear cotton sarks," growled MacGregor. Money the wob of mine she bleached and bought, too. Nobody's heeding him yet, he began to feel insulted, and broke in upon the conversation with intent. You have not tell us yet, Cocker, he said, what the master of yours is doing here at the time of year. I would ken that, given ye please. How should I know, Mr. MacGregor, returned the factor, taking no notice of the offensive manner in which the question was put. He's no hair better nor on of the Algerine pirates at Lord Exmouth's hat of the hips of, and that's my opinion. He's nay among your feet, Mr. MacGregor, said the balker. You might just let him lie. 
Given I had him doon faith, given I would not let him lie, I'll just tell ye a thing, gentlemen, that came to my knowledge no a hundred year ago, and it's as true as gospel, though I have I held my tongue aboot it all this very night. I ye'll hearken new, but it's no lochin, though there was skulduddery enough, ne doot afore it came that length. And many a het drop did the poor lassie greet, I can tell ye. Faith, it was no lochin to her. She was a servant of oars, and a tight bonny lass she was. They called her the Waver's Bonny Mary. That's the name she goed by. Well, you see. MacGregor was interrupted by a sound from the further end of the room. The stranger, whom most of them had by this time forgotten, had risen and was approaching the table where they sat. Good God, us, interrupted several under their breaths as all rose. It's Lord Sandy himself. I thank you, gentlemen, he said with a mixture of irony and contempt, for the interest you take in my private history. I should have thought it had been as little to the taste as it is to the honour of some of you to listen to such a farrago of lies. Lies, my lord, said MacGregor, starting to his feet. Mr. Cocker looked dismayed, and Mr. Lammy sheepish, all of them dazed and dumbfounded, except the old weaver, who, as his lordship turned to leave the room, added, Long ears should be made of leather, my lord, for fear they grow wit het with what they hear. Lord Rothy turned in a rage. He, too, had been drinking. Kick that toad into the street, or by heaven, it's the last drop any of you drink in this house, he cried. The toad may tell the frog what the rat did if the tod's hole, my lord, said MacGregor, whom independence, honesty, bile, and drink combined to render fearless. Lord Sandy left the room without another word. His factor took his hat and followed him. The rest dropped into their seats in silence. Mr. Lammy was the first to speak. "'There's a plisky,' he said. "'I could just say the word after all, Simeon,' said MacGregor. "'I never thought to be so forward. Ah, but I have longed, and knew I have spoken.' With which words he sat down, contented. When Mr. Cocker overtook his master, as MacGregor had not unfitly styled him, he only got a damning for his pains, and went home considerably crestfallen. Lord Rothie returned to the landlady in her parlour. "'What's the matter with ye, my lord? What's vexed ye?' asked Miss Napier, with a twinkle in her eye. For she thought, from the baron's mortification, he must have received some rebuff, and now that the bonny laddie was safe, at Captain Forsyth's enjoyed the idea of it. "'You keep an ill-tongued hoose, Miss Napier,' answered his lordship. Miss Napier guessed at the truth at once, that he had overheard some free remarks on his well-known license of behaviour. "'Weel, my lord, I do my best. A body cannot keep an inn and spare the catechism at the door of it. But I believe you're in the right, my lord, for I heard an awful off gone of swearing in the yard just afore your lordship came in.' and no i think of it it was not that unlike your lordship's own word lord sandy broke into a loud laugh he could enjoy a joke against himself when it came from a woman and was founded on such a trifle as a personal vice i think i'll go to bed he said when his laugh was over i believe it's the only safe place from your tongue miss napier letty cried miss napier fess a candle and show his lordship to the red room Till Miss Letty appeared, the baron sat and stretched himself. He then rose and followed her into the archway and up an outside stair to a door which opened immediately upon a handsome old-fashioned room where a blazing fire lighted up the red hangings. Miss Letty sat down the candle and, bidding his lordship good night, turned and left the room, shutting the door and locking it behind her, a proceeding of which his lordship took no notice for however especially suitable it might be in his case it was only from whatever ancient source derived the custom of the house in regard to this particular room and corresponding chamber on the opposite side of the archway meantime the consternation amongst the members of the club was not so great as not to be talked over or to prevent the call for whisky and hot water all but MacGregor, however, regretted what had occurred. He was so elevated with his victory in a sense of courage and prowess that he became more and more facetious and overbearing. "'It's all very well for you, Mr. MacGregor,' said the 
dominie with dignity you have nothing to lose troth he cannot break the bank ah mr tamson he may give me a hint to make you withdraw your money though mr macgregor devil care you and i do returned the weaver i can make better of it ony day but there's your hoose and kail yard suggested petty there my own all's my own he cannot lay a finger on anything of mine but my servant lass cried the weaver slapping his thigh bone for there was little else to slap meg at the moment was taking her exit glance she went straight to miss napier willie macgregor's had enough mem and a drappy o'er send comel doon to mrs macgregor to say with my compliments that she would do well to send for him was the response meantime he grew more than troublesome ever on the outlook when sober after the foibles of others he laid himself open to endless ridicule when in drink which to tell the truth was a rare occurrence he was in the midst of a prophetic denunciation of the vices of the nobility and especially of lord rothie when meg entering the room went quietly behind his chair and whispered master macgregor there's a lassie come for ye i'm now in he answered magnificently but it's the mistress that sent for ye somebody's wantin ye somebody maun want me then i was saying mr cheerman and gentlemen mr macgregor will be after ye herself given ye do not go on said meg let her come do you think i'm flight at her devil will stop i'm gone till i please tell her that meg meg left the room with a broad grin on her good-humoured face what's that fool laughing at exclaimed macgregor starting to his feet the whole company rose likewise using their endeavour to persuade him to go home do ye think i'm drunk sirs i'll let ye ken i'm no drunk i have a will of my own yet am i gone home with the lassie to hold me out of the gutters giving ye dar to allude that i'm drunk ye ken who you'll fear for devil a fit i'll go on oot out of this till i have another tumbler i'm thinking there's more of just want a one more said petty a confirmatory murmur arose as each looked into the bottom of his tumbler and the bell was instantly rung but it only brought meg back with the message that it was time for them all to go every eye turned upon macgregor reproachfully you need not look at me that gate sirs i'm no fall said he deed no nobody takes ye to be answered the chairman maggie there's nobody had or muckle yet and two or three of us has not had freely enough just go on and fess a muchkin mare and there'll be a shilling of it to your lass meg retired but straightway returned miss napier says there's no a drop more drink to be had in this hoose the night here maggie said the chairman there's your shillin and you'll just go on to miss letty and give her my compliments and say that mr lammie's here and we have not seen him for a long time and the rest was spoken in a whisper i'll swear to you maggie the waver bodies shall not have any drop of it meg withdrew once more and returned miss letty's compliments sir miss napier has the keys and she's gone till her bed and we maun not disturb her and it's time at all honest folk was in their beds too and given mr lammy wants a bed in the house he maun go on till it and here's his candle good night to ye all gentlemen so saying meg set the lighted candle on the sideboard and finally vanished the good-tempered who formed the greater part of the company smiled to each other and emptied the last drops of their toddy first into their glasses and thence into their mouths the ill-tempered numbering but one more than macgregor growled and swore a little the latter declaring that he would not go home but the rest walked out and left him and at last appalled by the silence he rose with his wig awry and trotted he always trotted when he was tipsy home to his wife End Book One Chapter Five Chapter Six of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by george macdonald chapter six mrs falconer 
Meantime, Robert was seated in the parlour at the little dark mahogany table, in which the lamp shaded towards his grandmother's side shone brilliantly reflected. Her face being thus hidden both by the light and the shadow, he could not observe the keen look of stern benevolence with which, knowing that he could not see her, she regarded him as he ate his thick oat cake of Betty's skilled manufacture well loaded with the sweetest butter, and drank the tea which she had poured out and sugared for him with liberal hand. It was a comfortable little room, though its inlaid mahogany chairs and ancient sofa, covered with horsehair, had a certain look of hardness, no doubt. A shepherdess and lamb, worked in silks whose brilliance had now faded halfway to neutrality, hung in a black frame with brass rosettes at the corners, over the chimney-piece the sole approach to the luxury of art in the homely little place. Besides the muslin stretched across the lower part of the window, it was undefended by curtains. There was no cat in the room, nor was there one in the kitchen even, for Mrs. Falconer had such a respect for humanity that she grudged every morsel consumed by the lower creation. She sat in one of the armchairs belonging to the hairy set, leaning back in contemplation of her grandson, as she took her tea. She was a handsome old lady, little, but had once been taller, for she was more than seventy now. She wore a plain cap of muslin, lying close to her face and bordered a little way from the edge with a broad black ribbon, which went round her face and then, turning at right angles, went round the back of her neck. Her grey hair peeped a little way from under this cap, a clear but short-sighted eye of a light hazel shone under a smooth, thoughtful forehead, a straight and well-elevated but rather short nose which left the firm upper lip long and capable of expressing a world of dignified offence, rose over a well-formed mouth, revealing more moral than temperamental sweetness, while the chin was rather deficient than otherwise, and took little share in indicating the remarkable character possessed by the old lady. After gazing at Robert for some time, she took a piece of oat-cake from a plate by her side, the only luxury in which she indulged, for it was made with cream instead of water. It was very little she ate of anything, and held it out to Robert in a hand white, soft, and smooth, but with square finger-tips and squat, though pearly nails. "'Have, Robert,' she said, and Robert received it with a, "'Thank you, Granny.' but when he thought she did not see him, slipped it under the table and into his pocket. She saw him well enough, however, and although she would not condescend to ask him why he put it away instead of eating it, the endeavour to discover what could have been his reason for so doing cost her two hours of sleep that night. She would always be at the bottom of a thing if reflection could reach it, but she generally declined taking the most ordinary measures to expedite the process. When Robert had finished his tea, instead of rising to get his books and betake himself to his lessons, in regard to which his grandmother had seldom any cause to complain, although she would have considered herself guilty of high treason against the boy's future, if she had allowed herself once to acknowledge as much, he drew his chair toward the fire and said, "'Grandmamma, he's going to tell me something,' said Mrs. Falconer to herself." Will it be about the poor barefoot creature that they call Shargar, or will it be about the piece he put into his pooch? We a laddie, she said aloud, willing to encourage him. Is it true that my grandfather was the blind piper of Port Cloddy? Ay, laddie, true enough. Hoots now, nay, your grandfather, but your grandfather's laddie, my husband's father. Who came that about? Well, ye see, he was oot in the forty-five, and after the battle of Culloden, he had to run for it. He was not with his own clan at the battle, for his father had brought him to the lawlands when he was a lad. But he played the pipes till a regiment raised by the laird of Port Cloddy, and for weeks he had to hide among the rocks, and they took all his property from him. It was not muckle, a wean horses in a kale yard or twa, with a bit farmy on the tap of a cold hill near the seashore, but it was enough and to spare, and when they took it from him he had nothing left in the world but his sons. 
Your grandfather was born the very day of the battle, and the very day at the news came the mother died. But your great-grandfather was not long or he married another wife. He was such a man as only woman might have been proved to marry. She was the daughter of an Episcopalian minister, and she keeped a school in Port Cloddy. I saw him first myself when I was about twenty. That was just the year afore I was married. He was a considerably old man then, but as straught and as el wand and just poorful beyond belief. His wrist was as thick as both mine, and years and years after that, when he took his son, my husband, and his grandson, my Andrew. What ails ye, Granny? What for did not ye go on with the story? After a somewhat lengthened pause, Mrs. Falconer resumed, as if she had not stopped at all. And in ilka hand, just for the fun of it, he kneeped it their heads together, as given they had been two stalks of rib grass. But maybe it was the laughing of the two lads, for they thought it unco fun. They were most killed with laughing. But the last time he did it, the poor old man coughed sore after him, and had to go on and lay doon. He did not live long after that, but it was not that it killed him, you can. But who came he to play the pipes? He liked the pipes, and your grandfather he took to the fiddle. But what for did they call him the blind piper of Port Cloddy? Because he turned blind long afore his end came, and there was naething other he could do, and he would aye make an honest bow be when he could, for siller was fell scarce at that time of day among the falconers. So he got through the tune at five o'clock ilka morning, playing his pipes, to let them at were up ken they were up in time, and them at were not that it was time to rise. And syne he played them again aboot aught o'clock at nicht, to let them ken at it was time for decent folk to go on to their beds. Ye see, there was not so money clocks and watches by half then as there is new. Was he a good piper, Granny? What well, for spare ye that? Because I told that sunk lumly. Call naebody names, Robert. But what right had ye to be speaking to a man like that? He spake to me first. Where saw ye him? At the boar's head? And what right had ye to go on standing aboot? Ye ought to have gone in at once. There was a half dozen of folks standing aboot, and I behooved to spake when I was spoken to. But ye boot and not stop and make a fool more. It's not that calling names, Granny. Deed, laddie, I doot ye have me there. But what said that fellow Lumley to ye? He cast up to me that my grandfather was nothing but a blind piper. And what said ye? I darred him to say it he did not pipe well. Well done, laddie, and ye might say it with a good conscience, for he would not have been piper till his regiment at the Battle of Culloden, given he had not piped it well. Yon's his kilt hanging up in the press in the garret. You'll have to grow, Robert, my man, afore ye fill that. And was was that blue coat with the bonny gowd buttons upon it? asked Robert, who thought he had discovered a new approach to an impregnable hold, which he would gladly storm if he could. Let the coat sit. What has that to do with the kilt? A blue coat and a tartan kilt go on no well together. Except in an old press where nobody sees them. You would not care, Granny, would ye, given I was to cut off the bonny buttons? To not lay a finger upon them. You would be gone playing at pitch and toss or other such ploys with them. Nay, nay, let them sit. I would only exchange them for marbles. I dar ye to touch the coat or anything other that's in that press. Weel, weel, Granny, I was go on and get my lessons for the morn. It's time, laddie. Ye have been jabbering or muckle. Tell Betty to come and take away the tay things. Robert went to the kitchen, got a couple of hot potatoes and a candle, and carried them upstairs to Shargar, who was fast asleep. But the moment the light shone upon his face, he started up, with his eyes, if not his senses, wide awake. It was not me, mother. I tell you, it was not me. And he covered his head with both arms, as if to defend it from a shower of blows. Hold your tongue, Shargar, it's me. But before Shargar could come to his senses, 
The light of the candle falling upon the blue coat made the buttons flash confused suspicions into his mind. "'Mother, mother,' he said, "'ye have gone o'er far this time. There's o'er money of them, and they're no the safe colour. We'll be both hang it, as sure as there's a devil in hell.' As he said thus, he went on trying to pick the buttons from the coat, taking them for sovereigns, though how he could have seen a sovereign at this time in Scotland I can only conjecture. But Robert caught him by the shoulders, and shook him awake with no gentle hands, upon which he began to rub his eyes and mutter sleepily, "'Is that you, Bob? I have been dreaming, I do it. Given ye did not learn to dream quieter, ye'll get you and me to in more trouble.' nor I care to have a boat ye, ye rascal. Hold your tongue of ye, and eat this potato, given you want anything more, and here's a bit of reamy cake to ye. You will not get that in the Ilka house in the tune. It's my granny's especial. Robert felt relieved after this, for he had eaten all the cakes Miss Napier had given him, and had had a pain in his conscience ever since. Who got ye a hold of it? asked Shargar, evidently supposing he had stolen it. She gives me a bit now and then. And you did not eat it yourself, eh, Bob? Shargar was somewhat overpowered at this fresh proof of Robert's friendship, but Robert was still more ashamed of what he had not done. He took the blue coat carefully from the bed and hung it in its place again, satisfied now from the way his granny had spoken or rather declined to speak about it, that it had belonged to his father. "'Am I to rise?' asked Shargar, not understanding the action. "'Na, na, lie still. You'll be warm enough wanting the sovereigns. I'll let ye out in the morning afore Granny's up, and ye mount make the best of it after that, till it's dark again. We'll settle aboot it at the school the morn. Only we mount be circumspect, ye can.' You could not lay your hands upon a drop of whisky, could you, Bob? Robert stared in horror. A boy like that, asking for whisky, and in his grandmother's house, too. Shargar, he said solemnly, there's no a drop of whisky in this hoose. It's awful to hear ye mention sich a thing. My granny would smell the very name of it a mile away. I do it that that's her fit upon the stair already. Robert crept to the door, and Shargar sat staring with horror, his eyes looking from the gloom of the bed like those of a half-strangled dog. But it was a false alarm, as Robert presently returned to announce. Given ever ye so muckle as mention whisky again, no to say drink a drop of it, you and me part company, and that I tell you, Shargar, said he emphatically. I'll never look at it, I'll never mint at dreamin of it answered shargar coweringly given she puts it into my mouth i'll spit it oot but given ye strive with me bob i'll cut my throat i will and that'll be seen and heard tell of all this time save during the alarm of mrs falconer's approach when he sat with a mouthful of hot potato unable to move his jaws for terror and the remnant arrested halfway in its progress from his mouth after the bite all this time Shargar had been devouring the provisions Robert had brought him, as if he had not seen food that day. As soon as they were finished, he begged for a drink of water, which Robert managed to procure for him. He then left him for the night, for his longer absence might have brought his grandmother after him, who had perhaps only two good reasons for being doubtful, if not suspicious, about boys in general, though certainly not about Robert in particular. He carried with him his books from the other garret room where he kept them, and sat down at the table by his grandmother, preparing his Latin and geography by her lamp, while she sat knitting at white stocking with fingers as rapid as thought, never looking at her work but staring into the fire, and seeing visions there which Robert would have given everything he could call his own to see, and then would have given his life to blot out of the world if he had seen them. Quietly the evening passed by the peaceful lamp and the cheerful fire, with the Latin on the one side of the table and the stockings on the other, as if ripe and purified old age and hopeful, unstained youth had been the only extremes of humanity known to the world. But the bitter wind was howling by fits in the chimney, and the offspring of a nobleman and a gypsy lay asleep in the garret covered with the cloak of an old highland rebel. 
At nine o'clock Mrs. Falconer rang the bell for Betty, and they had worship. Robert read a chapter, and his grandmother prayed an extempore prayer, in which they that looked at the wine when it is red in the cup, and they that worshipped the woman clothed in scarlet and seated upon the seven hills, came in for a strange mixture, in which the vengeance yielded only to the pity. "'Lord, lead them to see the error of their ways,' she cried. "'Let the rod of thy wrath awake the worm of their conscience, "'that they may know verily that there is a God that ruleth in the earth. "'Did not let them go on to hell, O Lord, we beseech thee.' "'As soon as prayers were over, Robert had a tumbler of milk "'and some more oat-cake, and was sent to bed, "'after which it was impossible for him to hold any further communication with Shargar.' For his grandmother, little as one might suspect it, who entered the parlour in the daytime, always slept in that same room, in a bed closed in with doors like those of a large press in the wall, while Robert slept in a little closet looking into the garden at the back of the house, the door of which opened from the parlour close to the head of his grandmother's bed. It was just large enough to hold a good-sized bed with curtains, a chest of drawers, a bureau, a large eight-day clock, and one chair, leaving in the centre about five feet square for him to move about in. There was more room as well as more comfort in the bed. He was never allowed a candle, for light enough came through from the parlour, his grandmother thought, so he was soon extended between the widest of cold sheets, with his knees up to his chin, and his thoughts following his lost father over all spaces of the earth with which his geography book had made him acquainted. He was in the habit of leaving his closet and creeping through his grandmother's room before she was awake, or at least before she had given any signs to the small household that she was restored to consciousness, and that the life of the house must proceed. He therefore found no difficulty in liberating Shargar from his prison, except what arose from the boy's own unwillingness to forsake his comfortable quarters for the fierce encounter of the January blast which awaited him. But Robert did not turn him out before the last moment of safety had arrived, for by the aid of signs known to himself, he watched the progress of his grandmother's dressing, an operation which did not consume much of the morning, scrupulous as she was with regard to neatness and cleanliness, until Betty was called in to give her careful assistance to the final disposition of the bed, when Shargar's exit could be delayed no longer. Then he mounted to the foot of the second stair, and called in a keen whisper, "'No, Shargar, cut for the life of ye!' And down came the poor fellow, with long, gliding steps, ragged and reluctant, and without a word or a look, launched himself out into the cold, and sped away he knew not whither. As he left the door, the only suspicion of light was the dull and doubtful shimmer of the snow that covered the street, keen particles of which were blown in his face by the wind, which, having been up all night, had grown very cold, and seemed delighted to find one unprotected human being whom it might badger at its own bitter will. Outcast Shargar, where he spent the interval between Mrs. Falconer's door and that of the school, I do not know. There was a report amongst his schoolfellows that he had been found by Scroggy, the fish-cadger, lying at full length upon the back of his old horse, which, either from compassion or indifference, had not cared to rise up under the burden. They said likewise that when accused by Scroggy of housebreaking, though nothing had to be broken to get in, only a string with the peculiar knot on the invention of which the cadger prided himself, to be undone, all that Shargar had to say in his self-defence was that he had a terrible sore whelm, and that the horse was warmer nor the stints in the yard, and he had done him no ill, nay even drawn a hair from his tail, which would have been a difficult feat, seeing the horse's tail was as bare as his hoof. End chapter 6this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald Chapter 7 Robert to the Rescue That Shargar was a parish scholar, which means that the parish paid his fees, 
although indeed they were hardly worth paying, made very little difference to his portion amongst his schoolfellows. Nor did the fact of his being ragged and dirty affect his social reception to his discomfort. But the accumulated facts of the oddity of his personal appearance, his supposed imbecility, and the bad character borne by his mother, placed him in a very unenviable relation to the tyrannical and vulgar-minded amongst them. Concerning his person he was long, and, as his name implied, lean, with pale red hair, reddish eyes, no visible eyebrows or eyelashes, and very pale face. In fact, he was halfway to an albino. His arms and legs seemed of equal length, both exceedingly long. The handsomeness of his mother appeared only in his nose and mouth, which were regular and good, though expressionless, and the birth of his father only in his small, delicate hands and feet, of which any girl who cared only for smallness, and he did neither character nor strength, might have been proud. His feet, however, were supposed to be enormous, from the difficulty with which he dragged after him the huge shoes in which in winter they were generally encased. The imbecility, like the large feet, was only imputed. He certainly was not brilliant, but neither did he make a fool of himself in any of the few branches of learning of which the Paris scholar came in for a share. That which gained him the imputation was the fact that his nature was without a particle of the aggressive, and all its defensive of a purely negative a character as was possible. Had he been a dog, he would never have thought of doing anything for his own protection beyond turning up his forelegs in silent appeal to the mercy of the heavens. He was an absolute sepulchre in the swallowing of oppression and ill-usage. It vanished in him. There was no echo of complaint, no murmur of resentment from the hollows of that soul. The blows that fell upon him resounded not, and no one but God remembered them. His mother made her living, as she herself best knew, with occasional well-begrudged assistance from the parish. Her chief resource was no doubt begging from house to house for the handful of oatmeal which was the recognized and, in the court of custom-taught conscience, the legalized dole upon which every beggar had a claim. And if she picked up at the same time a chicken, or a boy's rabbit, or any other stray luxury, she was only following the general rule of society that your first duty is to take care of yourself. She was generally regarded as a gypsy, but I doubt if she had any gypsy blood in her veins. She was simply a tramper, with occasional fits of localization. Her worst fault was the way she treated her son, whom she starved apparently that she might continue able to beat him. The particular occasion which led to the recognition of the growing relation between Robert and Shargar was the following. Upon a certain Saturday, some sidereal power inimical to the boys must have been in the ascendant, a Saturday of brilliant but intermittent sunshine, the white clouds seen from the school windows indicating by their rapid transit across those fields of vision that fresh breezes, friendly to kites, or dragons, as they were called at the Rotherden, were frolicking in the upper regions. Nearly a dozen boys were kept in for not being able to pay down from memory the usual installment of shorter catechism always due at the close of the week. Amongst these boys were Robert and Shargar. Sky-revealing windows and locked door were too painful, and in proportion as the feeling of having nothing to do increased, the more uneasy did the active element in the boys become, and the more ready to break out into some abnormal manifestation. Everything, sun, wind, clouds, was busy out of doors, and calling to them to come and join the fun, and activity at the same moment excited and restrained naturally turns to mischief. Most of them had already learned the obnoxious task. One quarter of an hour was enough for that. And now what should they do next? The eyes of three or four of the eldest of them fell simultaneously upon Shargar. Robert was sitting plunged in one of his daydreams, for he too had learned his catechism when he was roused from his reverie by a question from a pale-faced little boy who looked up to him as a great authority. What for is it called the shorter catechism, Bob? Because it's no fully so long as the Bible, answered Robert, 
without giving the question the consideration due to it, and was proceeding to turn the matter over in his mind, when the mental process was arrested by a shout of laughter. The other boys had tied Shargar's feet to the desk at which he sat, likewise his hands at full stretch. Then, having attached about a dozen strings to as many elf-locks of his pale red hair, which was never cut or trimmed, had tied them to various pegs in the wall behind him, so that the poor fellow could not stir. They were now crushing up pieces of waste paper, not a few leaves of stray school-books being regarded in that light into bullets, dipping them in ink and aiming them at Shargar's face. For some time Shargar did not utter a word, and Robert, although somewhat indignant at the treatment he was receiving, felt as yet no impulse to interfere, for success was doubtful. But indeed he was not very easily roused to action of any kind, for he was as yet mostly in the larva condition of character, when everything is transacted inside. But the fun grew more furious, and spot after spot of ink bloomed upon Shargar's white face. Still Robert took no notice, for they did not seem to be hurting him much. But when he saw the tears stealing down the patient cheeks, making channels through the ink which now nearly covered them, he could bear it no longer. He took out his knife, and under pretense of joining in the sport, drew near to Shargar, and with rapid hand cut the cords, all but those that bound his feet, which were less easy to reach without exposing himself defenseless. The boys, of course, turned upon Robert, but ere they came to more than abusive words, a diversion took place. Mrs. Innes, the schoolmaster's wife, a stout, kind-hearted woman, the fine condition of whose temperament was clearly the result of her physical prosperity, appeared at the door which led to the dwelling-house above, bearing in her hands a huge turian of potato soup, for her motherly heart could not longer endure the thought of dinnerless boys. Her husband being engaged at a parish meeting, she had a chance of interfering with success. But ere Nancy the servant could follow with the spoons and plates, Waddy Morrison had taken the turian, and out of spite at Robert had emptied its contents on the head of Shargar, who was still tied by the feet with the words, Shargar, I anoint thee king over us, and here is thy crown giving the Turin, as he said so, a push on to his head, where it remained. Shargar did not move, and for one moment could not speak, but the next he gave a shriek that made Robert think he was far worse scalded than turned out to be the case. He darted to him in rage, took the Turin from his head, and, his blood being fairly up now, flung it with all his force at Morrison, and felled him to the earth. At the same moment the master entered by the street door, and his wife by the house-door, which was directly opposite. In the middle of the room the prisoners surrounded the fallen tyrant, Robert with the red face of wrath, and Shargar with the complexion that mingled result of tears, ink, and soup, which latter clothed him from head to foot beside, standing on the outskirts of the group. I need not follow the story further. Both Robert and Morrison got a lickin, and if Mr. Innes had been like some schoolmasters of those times, Shargar would not have escaped his share of the evil things going. From that day Robert assumed the acknowledged position of Shargar's defender, and if there was pride and a sense of propriety mingled with his advocacy of Shargar's rights, nay, even if the relation was not altogether free from some amount of show-off on Robert's part, I cannot yet help thinking that it had its share in that development of the character of Falconer which has chiefly attracted me to the office of his biographer. There may have been in it the exercise of some patronage. Probably it was not pure from the pride of beneficence, but at least it was a loving patronage and a vigorous beneficence, and under the reaction of these, the good, which in Robert's nature was as yet only in a state of solution, began to crystallize into character. But the effect of the new relation was far more remarkable on Shargar. As incapable of self-defense as ever, he was yet in a moment roused to fury by any attack upon the person or the dignity of Robert, so that indeed it became a new and favorite mode of teasing Shargar to heap abuse, real or pretended, upon his friend. From the day when Robert thus espoused his part, Shargar was Robert's dog, that very evening, when she went to take a parting peep at the external before locking the door for the night, 
Betty found him sitting upon the doorstep, only, however, to send him off, as she described it, with a flea in his ear. For the character of the mother was always associated with the boy and avenged upon him. I must, however, allow that those delicate, dirty fingers of his could not with safety be warranted from occasional picking and stealing. At this period of my story Robert himself was rather a grotesque-looking animal, very tall and lanky, with especially long arms, which excess of length they retained after he was full-grown. In this respect Shargar and he were alike, but the long legs of Shargar were unmatched in Robert, for at this time his body was peculiarly long. He had large black eyes, deep sunk even then, and a Roman nose the size of which in a boy of his years looked portentous. For the rest he was dark-complexioned, with dark hair destined to grow darker still, with hands and feet well modelled, but which would have made four feet and four hands such as Shargar's. When his mind was not oppressed, with the consideration of any important metaphysical question, he learned his lessons well. When such was present, the Latin grammar, with all its attendant servilities, was driven from the presence of the lordly need. That, once satisfied in spite of pandies and imprisonments, he returned with fresh zest, and indeed with some ephemeral ardor to the rules of syntax or prosody, though the latter, in the mode in which it was then and there taught, was almost as useless as the task set himself by a worthy lay preacher in the neighborhood of learning the first nine chapters of the book of Chronicles, in atonement for having, in an evil hour of freedom of spirit, ventured to suggest that such lists of names, even although forming a portion of the Holy Writ, could scarcely be reckoned of equally divine authority with St. Paul's epistle to the Romans. End Chapter 7book one chapter eight of robert falconer this librivox recording is in the public domain robert falconer by george macdonald chapter eight the angel unawares although betty seemed to hold little communication with the outer world she yet contrived somehow or other to bring home what gossip was going to the ears of her mistress who had very few visitors, for while her neighbours held Mrs. Falconer in great and evident respect, she was not the sort of person to sit down and have a news with. There was a certain sedate, self-contained dignity about her, which the common mind felt to be chilling and repellent, and from any gossip of a personal nature, what Betty brought her always accepted, she would turn away generally with the words, Hoots, I cannot bide clashes. On the evening following that of Shargar's introduction to Mrs. Falconer's home, Betty came home from the butcher's, for it was Saturday night and she had gone to fetch the beef for their Sunday's broth, with the news that the people next door, that is, round the corner in the next street, had a visitor. The house in question had been built by Robert's father, and was, compared with Mrs. Falconer's one-story house, large and handsome. Robert had been born and had spent a few years of his life in it, but could recall nothing of the facets of those early days. Some time before the period at which my history commences, it had passed into other hands, and it was now quite strange to him. It had been bought by a retired naval officer who lived in it with his wife, the only Englishwoman in the place, until the arrival at the boar's head of the lady so much admired by Dubal Sanny. Robert was upstairs when Betty emptied her news-bag, and so heard nothing of this bit of gossip. He had just assured Shargar that as soon as his grandmother was asleep, he would look about for what he could find and carry it up to him in the garret. As yet he had confined the expenditure out of Shargar's shilling to two pence. The household always retired early, earlier on Saturday night in preparation for the Sabbath, and by ten o'clock Granny and Betty were in bed. Robert indeed was in bed too, but he had laid down in his clothes, waiting for such time as might afford reasonable hope of his grandmother being asleep, when he might both ease Shargar's hunger and get to sleep himself. Several times he got up, resolved to make his attempt, but as often his courage failed and he lay down again, 
sure that granny could not be asleep yet when the clock beside him struck eleven he could bear it no longer and finally rose to do his endeavour opening the door of the closet slowly and softly he crept upon his hands and knees into the middle of the parlour feeling very much like a thief as indeed in a measure he was though from a blameless motive but just as he had accomplished half the distance to the door he was arrested and fixed with terror for a deep sigh came from granny's bed followed by the voice of words he thought at first that she had heard him but he soon found that he was mistaken still the fear of discovery held him there on all fours like a chained animal a dull red gleam faint and dull from the embers of the fire was the sole light in the room everything so common to his eyes in the daylight seemed now strange and eerie in the dying coals and at what was to the boy the unearthly hour of the night he felt that he ought not to listen to granny but terror made him unable to move ach hon ach hon said granny from the bed i've a sore sore heart i've a sore heart in my breast o oh lord thou knowest my own andrew to think of my barony that i carriest and look in that my face to think of him being a reprobate o oh lord could not he be elected yet is there nae turning of thy decrees nay nay that would not do at all but while there's life there's hope but what kens whether he be alive or no naebody can tell gladly would i look upon his dead face given i could believe that his soul was not among the lost but to ask the torments of that place and the rook that gangs up for ever and ever smothering the stars and my andrew doon in the heart of it crying and me no able to win till him o oh lord i cannot say thy will be done but did not lay it to my charge for given ye was a mother yourself ye you would not put him there o oh lord i'm very ill-fashioned i beg your pardon i'm near out of my mind forgive me o oh lord for i hardly ken what i'm saying he was my own babe my own andrew and ye gave him to me yourself and knew he's for the finger of scorn to pint at an ucast and a wanderer from his own country and dare not come within sight of it for them it would take the law of him and it's all drink drink and ill company he would have done well enough given they would only have latin him be what for mount men be i drink drinkin at something or other i never want it eh given i were as young as when he was born i would be up and away this very night to look for him but it's no use me trying it o oh god once more i pray thee to turn him from the error of his ways afore he goes hence and is na more and oh do not let robert go on after him as he's lack enough to do give me grace to hold him tight that he may be to the praise of thy glory for ever and ever amen whether it was that the weary woman here fell asleep or that she was too exhausted for further speech robert heard no more though he remained there frozen with horror for some minutes after his grandmother had ceased this then was the reason why she would never speak about his father she kept all her thoughts about him for the silence of the night and loneliness with the god who never sleeps but watches the wicked all through the dark and his father was one of the wicked and god was against him and when he died he would go to hell but he was not dead yet robert was sure of that and when he grew a man he would go and seek him and beg him on his knees to repent and come back to god who would forgive him then and take him to heaven when he died and there he would be good and good people would love him something like this passed through the boy's mind ere he moved to creep from the room for his was one of those natures which are active in the generation of hope he had almost forgotten what he came there for and had it not been that he had promised shargar he would have crept back to his bed and left him to bear his hunger as best he could but now first his right hand then his left knee like any other quadruped he crawled to the door rose only to his knees to open it took almost a minute to the operation then dropped and crawled again till he had passed out turned and drawn the door to leaving it slightly ajar then it struck him awfully that the same terrible passage must be gone through again 
but he rose to his feet for he had no shoes on and there was little danger of making any noise although it was pitch dark he knew the house so well with gathering courage he felt his way to the kitchen and there groped about but he could find nothing beyond a few quarters of oat cake which with a mug of water he proceeded to carry up to shargar in the garret when he reached the kitchen door he was struck with amazement and for a moment with fresh fear a light was shining into the trans from the stair which went up at right angles from the end of it he knew it could not be granny and he heard betty snoring in her own den which opened from the kitchen he thought it must be shargar who had grown impatient but how he got hold of a light he could not think as soon as he turned the corner however the doubt was changed into mystery at the top of the broad low stair stood a woman form with a candle in her hand gazing about her as if wondering which way to go the light fell full upon her face the beauty of which was such that with her dress which was white being in fact a nightgown and her hair which was hanging loose about her shoulders and down to her waist it led robert at once to the conclusion his reasoning faculties already shaking by the events of the night that she was an angel come down to comfort his granny and he kneeled involuntarily at the foot of the stair and gazed up at her with the cakes in one hand and the mug of water in the other like a meat and drink offering whether he had closed his eyes or bowed his head he could not say but he became suddenly aware that the angel had vanished he knew not when how or whither this for a time confirmed his assurance that it was an angel and although he was undeceived before long the impression made upon him that night was never effaced but indeed whatever falconer heard or saw was something more to him than it would have been to anybody else elated though awed by the vision he felt his way up the stair in the new darkness as if walking in a holy dream trod as if upon sacred ground as he crossed the landing where the angel had stood went up and up and found shargar wide awake with expectant hunger he too had caught a glimmer of the light but robert did not tell him what he had seen that was too sacred a subject to enter upon with shargar and he was intent enough upon his supper not to be inquisitive robert left him to finish it at his leisure and returned to cross his grandmother's room once more half expecting to find the angel standing by her bedside but all was dark and still creeping back as he had come he heard her quiet though deep breathing and his mind was at ease about her for the night what if the angel he had surprised had only come to appear to granny in her sleep why not there were such stories in the bible and granny was certainly as good as some of the people in the bible that saw angels sarah for instance and if the angels came to see granny why should they not have some care over his father as well it might be who could tell it is perhaps necessary to explain robert's vision the angel was the owner of the boxes he had seen at the boar's head looking around her room before going to bed she had seen a trap in the floor near the wall and raising it had discovered a few steps of a stair leading down to a door curiosity naturally led her to examine it the key was in the lock it opened outwards and there she found herself to her surprise in the heart of another dwelling of lowlier aspect she never saw robert for while he approached with shoeless feet she had been glancing through the open door of the gable room and when he knelt the light which she held in her hand had i presume hidden him from her he on his part had not observed that the moveless door stood open at last i have already said that the house adjoining had been built by robert's father the lady's room was that which he had occupied with his wife and in it robert had been born the door with its trap stairs was a natural invention for uniting the levels of the two houses and a desirable one in not a few of the forms which the weather assumed in that region when the larger house passed into other hands it had never entered the minds of the simple people who occupied the contiguous dwelling to build up the doorway between end of book one chapter eight book one chapter nine 
of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Chapter Nine, A Discovery. The friendship of Robert had gained Shargar the favorable notice of others of the school public. These were chiefly of those who came from the country ready to follow an example set them by a town boy. When his desertion was known, moved both by their compassion for him and their respect for Robert, they began to give him some portion of the dinner they brought with them, and never in his life had Shargar fared so well as for the first week after he had been cast upon the world. But in proportion as their interest faded with the novelty, so their appetites reasserted former claims of use and want, and Shargar began once more to feel the pangs of hunger. For all that Robert could manage to procure for him, without attracting the attention he was so anxious to avoid, was little more than sufficient to keep his hunger alive, Shargar being gifted with a great appetite, and Robert having no allowance of pocket-money from his grandmother. The three pence he had been able to spend on him were what remained of six pence Mr. Innes had given him for an exercise which he wrote in blank verse instead of in prose, an achievement of which the schoolmaster was proud, both from his reverence for Milton and from his inability to compose a metrical line himself, and how and when he should ever possess another penny was even unimaginable. Shargar's shilling was likewise spent, so Robert could but go on pocketing instead of eating all that he dared, watching anxiously for opportunity of evading the eyes of his grandmother. On her dimness of sight, however, he depended too confidently after all, for either she was not so blind as he thought she was, or she made up for the defect of her vision by the keenness of her observation. She saw enough to cause her considerable annoyance, though it suggested nothing inconsistent with rectitude on the part of the boy further than that there was something underhand going on one supposition after another arose in the old lady's brain and one after another was dismissed as improbable first she tried to persuade herself that he wanted to take the provisions to school with him and eat them there a proceeding of which she certainly did not approve but for the reproof of which she was unwilling to betray the loopholes of her eyes Next, she concluded for half a day that he must have a pair of rabbits hidden away in some nook or other, possibly in the little strip of garden belonging to the house, and so conjecture followed conjecture for a whole week, during which, strange to say, not even Betty knew that Shargar slept in the house. For so careful and watchful were the two boys that although she could not help suspecting something from the expression and behaviour of Robert, what that something might be she could not imagine nor had she and her mistress as yet exchanged confidences on the subject. Her observation coincided with that of her mistress as to the disappearance of odds and ends of eatables, potatoes, cold porridge, bits of oat cake, and even on one occasion when Shargar happened to be especially ravenous, a yellow or cured and half-dried haddock, which the lad devoured raw, vanished from her domain. He went to school in the morning smelling so strong, in consequence, that they told him he must have been passing the night in Scroggy's cart, and not on his horse's back this time. The boys kept their secret well. One evening, towards the end of the week, Robert, after seeing Shargar disposed of for the night, proceeded to carry out a project which had grown in his brain within the last two days, in consequence of an occurrence with which his relation to Shargar had had something to do. It was this. The housing of Shargar in the garret had led Robert to make a close acquaintance with the place. He was familiar with all the outs and ins of the little room which he considered his own, for that was a civilized, being a plastered, sealed, and comparatively well-lighted little room, but not with the other, which was three times its size, very badly lighted, and showing the naked couples from the roof-tree to floor. Besides, it contained no end of dark corners, with which his childish imagination had associated undefined horrors, assuming now one shape, now another. Also, there were several closets in it, constructed in the angles of the place, and several chests, two of which he had ventured to peep into. But although he had found them filled, 
not with bones as he had expected but one with papers and one with garments he had yet dared to carry his researches no farther one evening however when betty was out and he had got hold of her candle and gone up to keep shargar company for a few minutes a sudden impulse seized him to have a peep into all the closets one of them he knew a little about as containing amongst other things his father's coat with the gilt buttons and his great-grandfather's kilt as well as other garments useful to shargar now he would see what was in the rest he did not find anything very interesting however till he arrived at the last out of it he drew a long queer-shaped box into the light of betty's dip look here shargar he said under his breath for they never dared to speak aloud in these precincts look here what can there be in this box is it a bairnie's coffin do you think look at it in this case shargar having roamed the country a good deal more than robert and having been present at some merry-makings with his mother of which there were comparatively few in that countryside was better informed than his friend eh hey, bob do not ye ken what that is i thought ye kent all thing that's a fiddle that's stuff and nonsense shargar do you think i dinna ken a fiddle when i see on stuff and nonsense yourself cried shargar in indignation from the bed give us a hold of it robert handed him the case shargar undid the hooks in a moment and revealed the creature lying in its shell like a boiled bivalve i tell you so he exclaimed triumphantly maybe you'll trust me next time and i tell to you retorted robert with an equivocation altogether unworthy of his growing honesty i was sure that could not be a fiddle there's the fiddle in the heart of it losh i mind new it mount be my grandfather's fiddle as i have heard tell of not to know a fiddle case reflected shargar with as much of contempt as it was possible for him to show i tell you what shargar returned robert indignantly ye may know the box of a fiddle better nor i do but devil have me given i do not know the fiddle itself rather better nor ye do in a fortnight from this time i's take it to dooble sanny and he can play the fiddle fine and i'll play it too or the devil's be in it hey man that'll be grand cried shargar incapable of jealousy we can go on to make all the markets together and gather halfpence to this anticipation robert returned no reply for hearing betty come in he judged it time to restore the violin to its case and betty's candle to the kitchen lest she should invade the upper regions in search of it but that very night he managed to have an interview with dubal sanny the shoemaker and it was arranged between them that robert should bring his violin on the evening at which my story has now arrived whatever motive he had for seeking to commence the study of music it holds even in more important matters that if the thing pursued be good there is a hope of the pursuit purifying the motive and robert no sooner heard the fiddle utter a few mournful sounds in the hands of the shoemaker who was no contemptible performer than he longed to establish such a relation between himself and the strange instrument that dumb and deaf as it had been to him hitherto it would respond to his touch also and tell him the secrets of its queerly twisted skull full of sweet sounds instead of brains from that moment he would be a musician for music's own sake and forget utterly what had appeared to him though i doubt if it was the sole motive of his desire to learn namely the necessity of retaining his superiority over shargar what added considerably to the excitement of his feelings on the occasion was the expression of reverence almost of awe with which the shoemaker took the instrument from its case and the tenderness with which he handled it the fact was that he had not had a violin in his hands for nearly a year having been compelled to pawn his own in order to alleviate the sickness brought on his wife by his own ill-treatment of her once that he had come home drunk from a wedding it was strange to think that such dirty hands should be able to bring such sounds out of the instrument the moment he got it safely cuddled under his cheek so dirty were they that it was said dubal sanny never required to carry any rosin with him for fiddler's need his own fingers having always enough upon them for one bow at least yet the points of those fingers never lost the delicacy of their touch some people thought this was in virtue of their being washed only once a week a custom alexander justified on the ground that 
in a trade like his, it was of no use to wash oftener, for he would be just as dirty again before night. The moment he began to play, the face of the shoemaker grew ecstatic. He stopped at the very first note, notwithstanding, let fall his arms, the one with the bow, the other with the violin at his sides, and said with a deep-drawn respiration and lengthened utterance, Eh! Then after a pause, during which he stood motionless, The crater mount be a cry mony, here till her, he added, drawing another long note. Then after another pause, She's a straddle varius, at least, here till her. I never had such a com combination of timber and catgut atween my claws afore. As to its being a Stradivarius, or even a Cremona at all, the testimony of Dubal Sandy was not worth much on the point, but the shoemaker's admiration roused in the boy's mind a reverence for the individual instrument which he never lost. From that day the two were friends. Suddenly the shoemaker started off at full speed in a Strathsby, which was soon lost in the wail of a highland psalm tune, giving place to such a wife as Willie had, and on he went without pause till Robert dared not stop any longer. The fiddle had betwitched the fiddler. "'Come as often as ye like, Robert, giving ye fest the lady with you,' said the shoemaker. And he stroked the back of the violin tenderly with his open palm. "'But would ye have any objection to the let it lie aside ye?' and let me come when I can. Objection, laddie, I would as soon object to letting my own wife lie aside me. I said Robert, seized with some anxiety about the violin as he remembered the fate of the wife, but ye ken Elspet comes off of the war sometimes. Softened by the proximity of the wonderful violin, and stung afresh by the boy's words, as his conscience had often stung him before, for he loved his wife dearly, save when the demon of drink possessed him, the tears rose in Elshender's eyes. He held out the violin to Robert, saying with unsteady voice, Ha, take her away. I did not deserve to have such a thing in my hoose. But hear me, Robert, and let herein be believing. I never was so drunk but I could tune my fiddle. More by token aunts, they found me lying on my back in the quarry, and the water, they say, was o'er all but the mound of me, but I was holding my fiddle up aboon my head, and the devil a spark of water upon her. It's a pity your wife was not your fiddle, then, Sanny, said Robert, with more presumption than wit. Deed, you're in the right there, Robert. Here, take your fiddle. Deed, no, returned Robert. I mount just trust to you, Sanders. I cannot bide longer the night, but maybe you'll tell me who to hold her the next time at I come, will ye? That I will, Robert. Come when ye like. And given ye come all on and could play this fiddle, as this fiddle deserves to be played, you'll do me credit. Ye mind what that sump Lumley said to me the other night, Sanders, about my grandfather? Ay, well enough, a dish of drucken havers. It was true enough about my great-grandfather, though. No, was it really? Ay, he was the best piper in the regiment at Culloden, Given they had a fountain as he piped it, there would have been another tale to tell. And he was tune-piper forby, just like you, Sanders, after they took from him at all he had. Nah, heard ye ever the like of that? Well, what would have thought it? Faith, me mount have you fiddle as well as your looky daddy pippet. But here's the king of Bashan coming after his boots, and them no half done yet, exclaimed Dubal Sanny, settling in haste to his all. He'll be roaring more like a bull of the country than the king of it. As Robert departed, Peter Og came in, and as he passed the window he heard the shoemaker averring, I have not risen from my stool since on a clock, but there's a sight to be done to them, Mr. Og. Indeed, Alexander Ab Alexandro, as Mr. Innes facetiously styled him, was, in more ways than one, worthy of the name Dubal. There seemed to be two natures in the man, which all his music had not yet been able to blend. End. Book 1. Chapter 9. Book 1. Chapter 10. Of Robert Falconer. By George MacDonald. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Chapter Ten. Another discovery in the garret. Little did Robert dream of the reception that awaited him at home. Almost as soon as he had left the house, the following events began to take place. The mistress's bell rang, and Betty God bend the horse to see what she could be wanting, whereupon a conversation ensued. "'What was that at the door, Betty?' asked Mrs. Falconer, for Robert had not shut the door so carefully as he ought, seeing that the deafness of his grandmother was of much the same faculty as her blindness. Had Robert not had a hold of Betty by the forelock of her years, he would have been unable to steal any liberty at all. Still, Betty had a conscience, and although she would not offend Robert if she could help it, yet she would not lie. "'Deed, ma'am, I cannot just distinctly say, and I heard the door,' she answered. "'Where's Robert?' was her next question. "'He's generally up the stair about this oar, ma'am. That is, when he's no in the parlour at his lessons.' "'What gangs he so muckle up the stair for, Betty, do ye ken?' It's something by ordinary with him. Deed I did not ken, ma'am. I never took it into my head to gone considerin' about it. He'll have some ploy of his on, nae doubt. Laddies will be laddies, ye ken, ma'am. I do it, Betty, you'll be aidin' and abedin, and it does not become your ears, Betty. My ears are not to find fault with, ma'am. They're well enough. That's nothing to the pint, Betty. What's the laddie aboot? Do you mean when he gongs up the stair, ma'am? Ah, uh, ye ken weel enough what I mean. Weel, ma'am, I tell ye I did not ken, and ye never heard me tell ye a lee sin ever I was in your service, ma'am. Na, na, don't recht. Ye go on aboot it and aboot it, and at last ye come say near lean that given you spake another word, you would be at it, and it just frights me from sparing uh, other question at ye. And that's who ye went out of it. But no at it's about my own grandson, I'm no going to lose him to save a woman of your years, what ought to know better, and say I'll spare at ye, though ye should be driven to lee like Sotten himself. What's he about when he gones up the stairs? No. Well, as sure as death, I did not ken. You drive me to swearing, ma'am, and no to lean. I care not. Have you no idea about it, then, Betty? Weel, ma'am, I think sometimes he cannot be well, and mount have a fox in his stomach, or something of that nature, for what he eats is awful, and I think whiles he just gones up the stair to eat at his own will. That jumps with my own observations, Betty. Do you think he might have a rabbit, or maybe a power of them, in some boxy in the garret, new? And what for no, given he had, ma'am? What for no, nesty things? But that's no the pint. I, I have to hold ye to the point, Betty. The pint is whether he has rabbits or no. Or guinea pigs, suggested Betty. Well, or maybe a pup or twa. Or I can't a laddie aunts at keep it a whole family of kitlins, or maybe he might have a bit lammy. There was an uncle of mine on. Hold your tongue, Betty. Ye have o'er muckle to say for all the sense there's into it. Well, ma'am, ye spared questions at me. Well, I have had enough of your answers, Betty. Go on and tell Robert to come here directly. Betty went, knowing perfectly that Robert had gone out, and returned with the information. Her mistress searched her face with a keen eye. That mount have been himself after all one ye thought ye heard the door gone, said Betty. It's a strange thing that I should hear him clear here with the door steeked and your door open at the very door check of the other, and you no hear him, Betty, and me so deaf as will. Deed, ma'am, retorted Betty, losing her temper a little, I can be as deaf as other folk myself whiles. When Betty grew angry, Mrs. Falconer invariably grew calm, or at least put her temper out of sight. She was silent now, and continued silent till Betty moved to return to her kitchen, when she said, in a tone of one who had just arrived at an important resolution, 
Betty, we'll just away up the stair and look. Well, ma'am, I have no objections. No objections? What for should you or any other body have any objections to me going where I like in my own house? Humph! exclaimed Mrs. Falconer, turning and facing her maid. In course, ma'am, I only meant I had no objections to gone with ye. And what for should ye or any other woman that I paid twa pon five in the half year till dar to have objections to go on where I wanted ye to go in my own house? Hoot, ma'am, it was but a slip of the tongue, nothing more. Slip me nae such slips, or ye'll come by a fall at last. I do it, Betty, concluded Mrs. Falconer, in a mollified tone, as she turned and led the way from the room. They got a candle in the kitchen, and proceeded upstairs, Mrs. Falconer still leading, and Betty following. They did not even look into the gale room, not doubting that the dignity of the best bedroom was in no danger of being violated, even by Robert, but took their way upwards to the room in which he kept his school books, almost the only articles of property which the boy possessed. Here they found nothing suspicious. All was even in the best possible order. Not a very wonderful fact, seeing a few books and a slate were the only things there besides the papers on the shelves. What the feelings of Shargar must have been when he heard the steps and voices, and saw the light approaching his place of refuge, we will not change our point of view to inquire. He certainly was as little to be envied at that moment as at any moment during the whole of his existence. The first sense Mrs. Falconer made use of in the search after possible animals lay in her nose. She kept snuffing constantly, but beyond the usual musty smell of neglected apartments, had as yet discovered nothing. The moment she entered the upper garret, however, "'There's an elfard smell here, Betty,' she said, believing that they had at last found the trail of the mystery. "'But it's no like the smell of rabbits. Just look in the nook there behind the door.' "'There's naething here,' responded Betty. "'Ruin the end of that kiss there. I was looking into the press.' As Betty rose from her search behind the chest and turned towards her mistress, her eyes crossed the cavernous opening of the bed. There, to her horror, she beheld a face like that of a galvanized corpse staring at her from the darkness. Shargar was in a sitting posture, paralyzed with terror, waiting like a fascinated bird till Mrs. Falconer and Betty should make the final spring upon him, and do whatever was equivalent to devouring him upon the spot. He had sat up to listen to the noise of their ascending footsteps, and fear had so overmastered him that he either could not, or forgot that he could, lie down, and cover his head with some of the many garments scattered around him. "'I did not say wusky, did I?' he kept repeating to himself, in utter imbecility of fear. "'The Lord preserve us!' exclaimed Betty, the moment she could speak, for during the first few seconds, having caught the infection of Shargar's expression, she stood equally paralyzed. "'The Lord preserve us!' she repeated. "'Aunts is enough,' said Mrs. Falconer sharply, turning round to see what the cause of Betty's ejaculation might be. "'I have said that she was dim-sighted. The candle they had was little better than a penny dip. The bed was darker than the rest of the room. Shargar's face had many of the more distinctive characteristics of manhood upon it. "'Good preserve us!' exclaimed Mrs. Falconer in her turn. "'It's a woman!' Poor deluded Shargar, thinking himself safer under any form than that which he actually bore, attempted no protest against the mistake. But indeed he was incapable of speech. The two women flew upon him to drag him out of the bed. Then, first recovering his powers of motion, he sprang up in an agony of terror and darted out between them, overturning Betty in his course. "'Ye raw slimmer!' cried Betty from the floor. "'Ye long-legged jowd! she added as she rose and at the same moment shargar banged the street door behind him in his terror a what ye did not carry your coats too long for shargar having discovered that the way to get the most warmth from robert's great-grandfather's kilt was to wear it in the manner for which it had been fabricated was in the habit of fastening it round his waist before he got into bed and the eye of betty as she fell had caught the swing of this portion of his attire but poor Mrs. Falconer, with sunken head, walked out of the garret in the silence of despair. 
She went slowly down the steep stair, supporting herself against the wall, her round-toed shoes creaking solemnly as she went, took refuge in the gale room, and burst into a violent fit of weeping. For such depravity she was not prepared. What a terrible curse hung over her family! Surely they were all reprobate from the birth, not one elected for salvation from the guilt of Adam's fall, and therefore abandoned to Satan as his natural prey, to be led captive of him at his will. She threw herself on her knees at the side of the bed, and prayed heartbrokenly. Betty heard her as she limped past the door on her way back to her kitchen. Meantime, Shargar had rushed across the next street on his bare feet into the crooked wind, terrifying poor old Kirstan Peary, the divisions betwixt the compartments of whose memory had broken down into the exclamation to her next neighbour, Tam Rim, with whom she was trying to gossip. Eh, Thomas, that'll be on of the slaughter at Culloden. He never stopped till he reached his mother's deserted abode. Strange instinct. There he ran to earth like a hunted fox. Rushing at the door, forgetful of everything but refuge, he found it unlocked, and closing it behind him, stood panting like the heart that has found the water brooks. The owner had looked in one day to see whether the place was worth repairing, for it was a mere outhouse, and had forgotten to turn the key when he left it. Poor Shargar! Was it more or less of a refuge that the mother that bore him was not there either to curse or welcome his return? less if we may judge from a remark he once made in my hearing many long years after for you see he said a mother's a mother be she the very devil searching about in the dark he found the one article unsold by the landlord a stool with but two of its natural three legs on this he balanced himself and waited simply for what robert would do for his faith in robert was unbounded and he had no other hope on earth. But Shargar was not miserable. In that wretched hovel, his bare feet clasping the clay floor in constant search of a waving equilibrium, with pitch darkness around him, and incapable of the simplest philosophical or religious reflection, he yet found life good. For it had interest, nay more, it had hope. I doubt, however, whether there is any interest at all without hope. While he sat there, Robert, thinking him snug in the garret, was walking quietly home from the shoemaker's, and his first impulse on entering was to run up and recount the particulars of his interview with Alexander. Arrived in the dark garret, he called Shargar, as usual, in a whisper, received no reply, thought he was asleep, called louder, for he had a penny from his grandmother that day for bringing home two pails of water for Betty, and had just spent it upon a loaf for him but no Shargar replied. Thereupon he went to the bed to lay hold of him and shake him. But his searching hands found no Shargar. Becoming alarmed, he ran downstairs to beg a light from Betty. When he reached the kitchen, he found Betty's nose as much in the air as its construction would permit. For a hook-nosed body, she certainly was the most harmless and ovine creature in the world. But this was a case in which feminine modesty was both concerned and aggrieved. She showed her resentment no further, however, than by simply returning no answer in syllable or sound or motion to Robert's request. She was washing up the tea-things, and went on with her work as if she had been in absolute solitude, saving that her countenance could hardly have kept up that expression of injured dignity, had such been the case. Robert plainly saw, to his great concern, that his secret had been discovered in his absence, and that Shargar had been expelled with contumely. But, with an instinct of facing the worst at once, which accompanied him through life, he went straight to his grandmother's parlour. "'Well, Grandmamma," he said, trying to speak as cheerfully as he could. Granny's prayers had softened her a little, else she would have been as silent as Betty, for it was from her mistress that Betty had learned this mode of torturing a criminal. So she was just able to return his greeting in the words, "'Well, Robert,' pronounced with the finality of tone that indicated she had done her utmost and had nothing to add. "'Here's a brewage, thought Robert to himself, and still, on the principle of flying at the first of mischief he saw, the best mode of meeting it, no doubt, addressed his grandmother at once. The effort necessary gave a tone of defiance to his words. 
"'What for will not you speak to me, Granny?' he said. "'I'm no haythen, nor yet a papist.' "'You're war nor both in one, Robert.' "'Hoots, you will not say both, Granny,' returned Robert, who even at the age of fourteen, when once compelled to assert himself, assumed a modest superiority. "'None of such impudence,' retorted Mrs. Falconer. "'I wonder where you learn that. But it's nae wonder. Evil communications corrupt good manners.' You're a lost prodigal, Robert, like your father afore ye. I have just been sitting here thinking with myself whether it would not be better for both of us to let ye go on and reap the fruit of your doings at once. For the hard ways is the best road for transgressors. I'm no bond to keep ye. Well, well, I was away to Shargar. Him and me'll hold on together better nor you and me, Granny. He's a poor crater, but he can stick to a body. What are ye haverin' about Shargar for, ye hypocrite loon? You'll no go on to Shargar's, I warrant. You'll be after that vile limmer that's turned my honest hoose into a sty this last fortnight. Granny, I dinna ken what ye mean. She kens, then. I sent her off like one of Samson's foxes with the firebrand at her tail. It's a pity it was not tied atween the two of you. Preserve us, Granny. Is it possible ye have taken Shargar for one of womankind? I ken naething aboot Shargar, I tell ye. I ken that Betty and me took an ill-fard dame in the bed in the garret. Could it be his mother? thought Robert, in bewilderment. But he recovered himself in a moment and answered, Shargar may be a queen after all for anything at I ken to the contrary, but I took him for a loon, face such a queen as he'd make and careless to resist the ludicrousness of the idea, he burst into a loud fit of laughter, which did more to reassure his granny than any amount of protestation could have done, however she pretended to take offence at his ill-timed merriment. Seeing his grandmother staggered, Robert gathered courage to assume the offensive. But granny, whoever Betty, no to say you, could have driven out a poor half-starved creature like Shargar, even supposing he ought to have been in coaties and no in trousers, and the mother of him run away and left him, it's more nor I can understand. I must do it me sore, but he's gone and drowned himself. Robert knew well enough that Shargar would not drown himself without at least bidding him good-bye, but he knew, too, that his grandmother could be wrought upon. Her conscience was more tender than her feelings, and this peculiarly occasioned part of the mutual non-understanding rather than misunderstanding between her grandson and herself. The first relation she bore to most that came near her was one of severity and rebuke, but underneath her cold outside lay a warm heart to which conscience acted the part of a somewhat capricious stoker, now quenching its heat with the cold water of duty, now stirring it up with the poker of reproach, and ever treating it as an inferior and a slave. But her conscience was, on the whole, a better friend to her race than her heart, and indeed the conscience is always a better friend than a heart whose motions are undirected by it. From Falconer's account of her, however, I cannot help thinking that she not unfrequently took refuge in severity of tone and manner from the threatened ebullition of a feeling which she could not otherwise control, and which she was ashamed to manifest. Possibly conscience had spoken more and more gently, as its behests were more and more readily obeyed, till the heart began to gather courage, and at last, as in many old people, took the upper hand, which was outwardly inconvenient to one of Mrs. Falconer's temperament. Hence, in doing the kindest thing in the world, she would speak in a tone of command, even of rebuke, as if she were compelling the performance of the most unpleasant duty in the person who received the kindness. But the human heart is hard to analyze, and indeed will not submit quietly to the operation however gently performed, nor is the result at all easy to put into words. It is best shown in actions. Again, it may appear rather strange that Robert should be able to talk in such an easy manner to his grandmother, seeing he had been guilty of concealment, if not of deception. But she had never been so actively severe towards Robert as she had been towards her own children. To him she was wonderfully gentle for her nature, and sought to exercise the saving harshness which she still believed necessary, solely in keeping from him every enjoyment of life which the narrowest theories as to the rule and will of God could set down as worldly. 
Frivolity, of which there was little in this sober boy, was in her eyes a vice, loud laughter almost a crime. Cards and novels, as she called them, were such in her estimation as to be beyond my powers of characterization. Her commonest injunction was, no be dus, that is, sober, uttered to the soberest boy she could ever have known. But Robert was a large-hearted boy, else this life would never have had to be written. And so, through all this, his deepest nature came into unconscious contact with that of his noble old grandmother. There was nothing small about either of them. Hence, Robert was not afraid of her. He had got more of her nature in him than of her son's. She and his own mother had more share in him than his father, though from him he inherited good qualities likewise. He had concealed his doings with Shargar simply because he believed that they could not be done if his grandmother knew of his plans. Herein he did her less than justice. But so unpleasant was concealment to his nature, and so much did the dread of discovery press upon him, that the moment he saw the thing had come out into the daylight of her knowledge, such a reaction of relief took place as, operating along with his deep natural humour and the comical circumstance of the case, gave him an ease and freedom of communication which he had never before enjoyed with her. Likewise there was a certain courage in the boy which, if his own natural disposition had not been so quiet that he felt the negations of her rule the less, might have resulted in underhand doings of a very different kind, possibly from those of benevolence. He must have been a strange being to look at, I always think, at this point of his development, with his huge nose, his black eyes, his lanky figure, and his sober countenance, on which a smile was rarely visible, but from which burst occasional guffaws of laughter. At the words droned himself, Mrs. Falconer started. "'Run, laddie, run!' she said, and fess him back directly. "'Betty, Betty, go on with Robert, and help him to look for Shargar, ye old blind doited body it says ye can see and cannot tell a lad from a lass nay nay granny i'm no goin out with a dame like her trailin at my foot she would be a sore hindrance to me given shargar be to be gotten that is given he be in life i's get him wantin betty and given ye did not ken him for the creature ye found in the garret he mount be sore changed since i left him there well well robert go on your ways but given ye be deceiving me may the lord forgive ye robert for sore ye'll need it nay fear that granny returned robert from the street door and vanished mrs falconer stalked no i will not use that word of the gait of a woman like my friend's grandmother stately stepped she put the hoose to betty she felt strangely soft at the heart robert not being yet proved a reprobate but she was not, therefore, prepared to drop one atom of the dignity of her relation to her servant. Betty, she said, you have made a mistake. What's that, ma'am? returned Betty. It was not a lass of all. It was that crater Sargar. You said it was a lass yourself first, ma'am. You ken well enough that I'm short-sighted and have been from the day of my birth. I'm no old enough to mind upon that, ma'am, returned Betty revengefully but in an undertone as if she did not intend her mistress to hear. And although she heard well enough, her mistress adopted the subterfuge. But I'll swear the creature I saw was in petticoats. Swear not at all, Betty. Ye have made a mistake on the gate. Wha says that, ma'am? Robert? I will, given he be telling the trowth. Dar ye insinuate to me that a son of mine would tell anything but the trowth? nay nay ma'am but given that was not a queen ye cannot deny but she looked uncle one and no a bashful one either given he was a loon he would not look like a bashful lass anyway betty and there you're wrong well well ma'am have it your own way muttered betty i will have it my own way retorted her mistress because it's the right way betty and no ye maun just go on up the stair and get the place cleaned out and put in order I will do that, ma'am. I will ye, and look well aboot, Betty, you that can see so well in case there should be ony cattle aboot, for he's none of the cleanest, yon dame. I will do that, ma'am. And go on directly afore he comes back. What comes back? Robert, of course. 
What for that? Because he's coming with him. What he's coming with him? Call it she, given you like. It's Shargar. What says that? exclaimed Betty, sniffing and starting at once. I say that, and you go on and do what I tell you this minute. Betty obeyed instantly, for the tone in which the last words were spoken was one she was not accustomed to dispute. She only muttered as she went, It'll all come upon me as usual. Betty's job was long ended before Robert returned. Never dreaming that Shargar could have gone back to the old haunt, he had looked for him everywhere before that occurred to him as a last chance. Nor would he have found him even then for he would not have thought of his being inside the deserted house, had not Shargar heard his footsteps in the street. He started up from his stool, saying, That's Bob, but was not sure enough to go to the door. He might be mistaken. It might be the landlord. He heard the feet stop, and did not move, but when he heard them begin to go away again, he rushed to the door and bawled on the chance at the top of his voice, Bob! Bob! Eh, hey, ye crater, said Robert, ere ye there after all eh bob exclaimed shargar and burst into tears i thought you would come after me of course answered robert coolly come away home where till asked shargar in dismay home to your own bed at my granny's nay nay said shargar hurriedly retreating within the door of the hovel nay nay bob lad i no do that She's an awful woman, that granny of yours. I cannot think who ye can bide with her. I'm well out of her grups, I can tell ye. It required a good deal of persuasion, but at last Robert prevailed upon Shargar to return. For was not Robert his tower of strength? And if Robert was not frightened at his granny, or at Betty, why should he be? At length they entered Mrs. Falconer's parlour, Robert dragging in Shargar after him, having failed altogether in encouraging him to enter after a more dignified fashion. It must be remembered that although Shargar was still kilted, he was not the less trousered, such as the trousers were. It makes my heart ache to think of these trousers, not believing trousers essential to blessedness either, but knowing the superiority of the old Roman costume of the kilt. No sooner had Mrs. Falconer cast her eyes upon him then she could not but be convinced of the truth of Robert's averment. Here he is, Granny, and given ye be not satisfied yet. Hold your tongue, laddie. Ye have given me ne cause to do your word. Indeed, during Robert's absence, his grandmother had had leisure to perceive of what an absurd folly she had been guilty. She had also had time to make up her mind as to her duty with regard to Shargar, and the more she thought about it, the more she admired the conduct of her grandson, and the better she saw that it would be right to follow his example. No doubt she was the more inclined to this benevolence that she had, as it were, received her grandson back from the jaws of death. When the two lads entered from her armchair, Mrs. Falconer examined Shargar from head to foot with the eye of a queen on her throne, and a countenance immovable in stern gentleness till Shargar would gladly have sunk into the shelter of the voluminous kilt from the gaze of those quiet hazel eyes. At length she spoke. Robert, take him away. Well, I take him till Granny. Take him up to the garret. Bet he'll have taken a tub of hot water up there given this time, and you mount see that he washes himself from head to foot, or he's no bide and oor in my house. Go on away and see till it this minute but she detained them yet a while with various directions in regard of cleaning, for the carrying out of which Robert was only too glad to give his word. She dismissed them at last, and Shargar by and by found himself in bed, clean, and for the first time in his life, between a pair of linen sheets, not altogether to his satisfaction, for mere order and comfort were substituted for adventure and success. But greater trials awaited him. In the morning he was visited by Brody, the tailor, and Elshender, the shoemaker, both of whom he held in awe as his superiors in the social scale, and by them handled and measured from head to feet, the latter included after which he had to lie in bed for three days till his clothes came home, for Betty had carefully committed every article of his former dress to the kitchen fire, not without a sense of pollution to the bottom of her kettle. Nor would he have got them for double the time, had not Robert haunted the tailor as well as the shoemaker, like an evil conscience, till they had finished them. 
Thus grievous was Shargar's introduction to the comforts of respectability. Nor did he like it much better when he was dressed and able to go about. For not only was he uncomfortable in his new clothes, which, after the very easy fit of the old ones, felt like a suit of plate armour, but he was liable to be sent for at any moment by the awful sovereignty in whose dominions he found himself, and which, of course, proceeded to instruct him not merely in his own religious duties, but in the religious theories of his ancestors, if, indeed, Shargar's ancestors ever had any. And now the shorter catechism seemed likely to be changed into the longer catechism, for he had its Sundays as well as Saturdays, besides Elaine's Alarm to the Unconverted, Baxter's Saint's Rest, Erskine's Gospel Sonnets, and other books of a like kind. Nor was it any relief to Shargar that the gloom was broken by the incomparable Pilgrim's Progress and the Holy War, for he cared for none of these things. Indeed, so dreary did he find it all, that his love to Robert was never put to such a severe test. But for that he would have run for it. Twenty times a day was he so tempted. At school, though, it was better, yet it was bad, for he was ten times as much laughed at for his new clothes, though they were of the plainest, as he had been for his old rags. Still he bore all the pangs of unwelcome advancement, without a grumble for the sake of his friend alone, whose dog he remained as much as ever. But his past life of cold and neglect, and hunger and blows, and homelessness and rags, began to glimmer as in the distance of a vaporous sunset, and the loveless freedom he had then enjoyed gave it a bloom as of summer roses. I wonder whether there may not have been in some unknown corner of the old lady's mind this lingering remnant of paganism, that in reclaiming the outcast from the error of his ways, she was making an offering acceptable to that God whom her mere prayers could not move to look with favour upon her prodigal son, Andrew. Nor from her own acknowledged religious belief as a background would it have stuck so fiery off either. Indeed, it might have been a partial corrective of some yet more dreadful articles of her creed, which she held, be it remembered, because she could not help it. End. Chapter 10. Book One, Chapter Eleven, of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald, Chapter Eleven, Private Interviews. The winter passed slowly away. Robert and Shargar went to school together and learned their lessons together at Mrs. Falconer's table. Shargar soon learned to behave with tolerable propriety, was obedient as far as eye service went, looked as queer as ever, did what he pleased, which was no wise very wicked, the moment he was out of the old lady's sight, was well fed and well cared for, and when he was asked how he was, gave the invariable answer, Midlin. He was not very happy. There was little communication in words between the two boys, for the one had not much to say, and the pondering fits of the other grew rather than relaxed in frequency and intensity. Yet amongst chanced acquaintances in the town, Robert had the character of a wag, of which he was totally unaware himself. Indeed, although he had more than the ordinary share of humour, I suspect it was not so much his fun as his earnest that got him the character, for he would say such altogether unheard of and strange things, that the only way they were capable of accounting for him was as a humorist. Eh, he said once to Elshender, during a pause common to a thunderstorm, and a lesson on the violin, eh, would not ye like to be up in the clude with the spawed turning o'er the divots, and catching the flashes lying beneath them like long red fiery worms? Ay, man, but given you look up to the cludes, that gate, you'll never be muckle of a fiddler. This was merely an outbreak of that insolence of advice so often shown to the young from no vantage ground, but that of age and faithlessness, reminding one of the jiggling fool who interfered between Brutus and Cassius on the sole ground that he had seen more years than they. 
as if ever a fiddler that did not look up to the clouds would be anything but a catgut scraper. Even Elshender's fiddle was the one angel that held back the heavy curtain of his gross nature and let the sky shine through. He ought to have been set fiddling every Sunday morning and from his fiddling dragged straight to church. It was the only thing man could have done for his conversion, for then his heart was open. But I fear the prayers would have closed it before the sermon came. He should rather have been compelled to take his fiddle to church with him and have a gentle scrape at it in the pauses of the service. Only there are no such pauses in the service, alas, and Dubal Sanny, though not too religious to get drunk occasionally, was a great deal too religious to play his fiddle on the Sabbath. He would not willingly anger the powers above, but it was sometimes a sore temptation, especially after he got possession of old Mrs. Falconer's wonderful instrument. Hoots, man, he would say to Robert, did not handle her as given she were an egg-box. Take hold of her as given she were a leaving crater. Ye mind just stroke her canny, and while the music oot of her, for she's like other women, given ye be rough with her, ye will not get a word oot of her, and do not handle her that gate. She cannot bide to be contrad and pulled this gate and that gate. Come to me, my bonny laddie. Ye'll tell me your story, will na ye, my pet? And with every gesture, as if he were humouring a shy and invalid girl, he would, as he said, while the music out of her in sobs and wailing till the instrument, gathering courage in his embrace, grew gently merry in its confidence, and broke at last into airy laughter. He always spoke, and apparently thought, of his violin as a woman, just as a sailor does of his craft. But there was nothing about him, except his love for music and its instruments, to suggest other than a most uncivilized nature. That which was fine in him was constantly checked and held down by the gross. The merely animal overpowered the spiritual, and it was only upon occasion that his heavenly companion, the violin, could raise him a few feet above the mire and the clay. She never succeeded in setting his feet on a rock, while, on the contrary, he often dragged her with him into the mire of questionable company and circumstances. Worthy Mr. Falconer would have been horrified to see his unquilly modest companion in such society as that into which she was now introduced at times. But nevertheless the shoemaker was a good and patient teacher, and although it took Robert rather more than a fortnight to redeem his pledge to Shargar, he did make progress. It could not, however, be rapid, seeing that an hour at a time, two evenings in the week, was all that he could give to the violin. Even with this moderation, the risk of his absence exciting his grandmother's suspicion and inquiry was far from small. And now, were those really faded old memories of his grandfather, and his merry kindness, all so different from the solemn benevolence of his grandmother, which seemed to revive in his bosom with the revivification of the violin? The instrument had surely laid up a story in its hollow breast, had been dreaming over it all the time it lay hidden away in the closet, and was now telling out its dreams about the old times in the ear of the listening boy. To him also it began to assume something of that majesty in life which had such a softening, and for the moment at least elevating influence on his master. At length the love of the violin had grown upon him so, that he could not but cast about how he might enjoy more of its company. It would not do, for many reasons, to go oftener to the shoemakers, especially now that the days were getting longer. Nor was that what he wanted. He wanted opportunity for practice. He wanted to be alone with the creature, to see if she would not say something more to him than she had ever said yet wafts and odours of melodies began to steal upon him ere he was aware in the half-lights between sleeping and waking if he could only entice them to creep out of the violin and once bless his humble ears with the bodily hearing of them perhaps he might who could tell but how but where there was a building in rothedon not old yet so deserted that its very history seemed to have come to a standstill 
and the dust that filled it to have fallen from the plumes of passing centuries. It was the property of Mrs. Falconer, left her by her husband. Trade had gradually ebbed away from the town till the thread factory stood unoccupied, with all its machinery rusting and mouldering, just as the workpeople had risen and left it one hot midsummer day when they were told that their services were no longer required. Some of the thread even remained upon the spools, and in the hollows of some of the sockets the oil had as yet dried only into a paste, although to Robert the desertion of the place appeared immemorial. It stood at a furlong's distance from the house, on the outskirt of the town. There was a large neglected garden behind it, with some good fruit trees and plenty of the bushes which boys love for the sake of their berries. After Granny's jam pots were properly filled, the remnant of these, a gleaming far greater than the gathering, was at the disposal of Robert, and, philosopher although in some measure he was already, he appreciated the privilege. Haunting this garden in the previous summer, he had, for the first time, made acquaintance with the interior of the deserted factory. The door to the road was always kept locked, and the key of it lay in one of Granny's drawers but he had then discovered a back entrance less securely fastened, and with a strange mingling of fear and curiosity, had from time to time extended his rambles over what seemed to him the huge desolation of the place. Half of it was well built of stone and lime, but of the other half, the upper part was built of wood, which now showed signs of considerable decay. One room opened into another, through the length of the place, revealing a vista of machines, standing with an air of the last folding of the wings of silence over them, and the sense of a deeper and deeper sinking into the soundless abyss. But their activity was not so vanished, but that by degrees Robert came to fancy that he had some time or other seen a woman seated at each of those silent powers, whose single hand set the whole frame in motion, with its numberless spindles and spools rapidly revolving a vague mystery of endless threads in orderly complication out of which came some desire to him unknown result so that the whole place was full of a bewildering tumult of work every little reel contributing its share as the water drops clashing together make the roar of a tempest now all was still as the church on a weekday still as the school on a saturday afternoon Nay, the silence seemed to have settled down like the dust, and grown old and thick, so dead and old that the ghost of the ancient noise had arisen to haunt the place. Thither would Robert carry his violin, and there would he woo her. I'm thinking I mount take her with me the night, Sanders, he said, holding the fiddle lovingly to his bosom, after he had finished his next lesson. The shoemaker looked blank. "'You're no going to desert me, are ye?' "'Nay, well, I wot,' returned Robert. "'But I want to try her at home. "'I mount get used till her a hitty ye can, "'afore I can do anything with her. "'I wish ye had nay brought her here, then. "'What am I to do wantin' her? "'What for did not ye get your own back? "'I have not the siller, man, "'and for by a doot I would not be that sore content with her "'no given I had her.' I used to think her grand, but I'm clean out of conceit of her. That bonny laddie's taken clean out of me. But you cannot have her eye, yea, can, Sanders. She's no mine. She's my granny's, you can. What's the use of her to her? She pits nae value upon her. And, eh, man, given she would give her to me, I would hold her in the best of shown all the lave of her days. I would not be muckle, Sanders, for she has not had a new pyre sin ever I mind. But I would hold Betty in shoon as well. Betty pays her for her own shoon, I reckon. Well, I would hold you in shoon, and your barons, and your barons, barons, cried the shoemaker with enthusiasm. Hut tut, man, long or that you'll be fiddling in the new Jerusalem. Hey, man, said Alexander, looking up. He had just cracked the roset ends off his hands, for he had the upper leather of a boot in the grasp of the clamps, and his right hand hung arrested on its blind way to the all. Do ye think there'll be fiddles there? I thought they were all harps all things, and I never saw, but it could not be up till a fiddle. 
I dinna ken,' answered Robert. 'But ye should mak a point o' seein' for yersel'. Gin I thought there wad be fiddles there, faith I wad hae a try. It wadna be muckle o' a Jerusalem to me wantin' my fiddle. But gin there be fiddles, I daur say there'll be grand ane. I daur say they wad gie me a new one. I mean on old as Noah's at he played in the ark when the devil came in by to hearken. I would fain have a try. Ye can all aboot it with that granny of yours. Who's a body to begin? I given up the drink, man. Ay, ay, ay. I reckon you're right. Well, I'll think aboot it when once I'm through with this job. It'll be next week or thereabouts or Ablin's twa days after. I'll have some laser then. Before he had finished speaking, he had caught up his awl and began to work vigorously, boring his holes as if the nerves of feeling were continued to the point of the tool, inserting the bristles that served him for needles with a delicacy worthy of soft-skinned fingers, drawing through the rosin threads with a whisk, and untwining them with a crack from the leather that guarded his hands. "'Good neck to ye,' said Robert, with the fiddle-case under his arm. The shoemaker looked up, with his hands bound in his threads. "'You're nae going to take her from me the night. "'I am I, but I'll fess her back again. "'I'm no going to Jericho with her. "'Going to Heckleburny with her, and that's three miles o' yon tell. "'Nay, we maun win farther nor that. "'There cannot be muckle fiddlin' there. "'Well, take her to the New Jerusalem. "'I was going doon to Lucky Leary's and fill myself roaring foul, and it'll be all your blame. I do it you'll get the blows, though, or maybe ye think Bell will take them for ye. Dubble Sandy caught up a huge boot, the sole of which was filled with broad-headed nails as thick as they could be driven, and in a rage threw it at Robert as he darted out. Through its clang against the door-check, the shoemaker heard a cry from the instrument. He cast everything from him and sprang after Robert, but Robert was down the wine like a long-legged greyhound, and Elshender could only follow like a fierce mastiff. It was love and grief, though, and apprehension and remorse, not vengeance, that winged his heels. He soon saw that pursuit was in vain. "'Robert! Robert!' he cried. "'I cannot win up with ye. Stop, for God's sakes! Is she hurt it?' Robert stopped at once. "'Ye have made a bonny leddy of her, a cripple, I doot, like your wife,' he answered, with indignation. "'Do not be I flinging a man's faults in his face. "'It just makes him at he cannot bide himself, or you either. "'Let's see the bonny crater.' "'Robert complied, for he, too, was anxious. "'They were now standing in the space in front of Shargar's old abode, "'and there was no one to be seen. "'Elshender took the box, opened it carefully, and peeped in.' with a face of great apprehension. "'I thought that was all,' he said, with some satisfaction. "'I kent the string when I heard it. "'But we'll soon get a new tharn tiller he added in a tone of sorrowful commiseration and condolence, as he took the violin from the case tenderly, as if it had been a hurt child. One touch of the bow, drawing out a gowl of grief, satisfied him that she was uninjured. Next, a hurried inspection showed him that there was enough of the catgut twisted round the peg to make up for the part that was broken off. In a moment he had fastened it to the tail-piece, tightened and tuned it. Forthwith he took the bow from the case-lid, and in jubilant guise he expatiated upon the wrong he had done his bonny laddie, till the doors and windows around were crowded with heads, peering through the dark to see whence the sounds came and a little child toddled across from one of the lowliest houses with a halfpenny for the fiddler. Gladly would Robert have restored it with interest, but alas, there was no interest in his bank, for not a halfpenny had he in the world. The incident recalled Sandy de Rothedon and its cares. He restored the violin to its case, and while Robert was fearing he would take it under his arm and walk away with it, handed it back with a humble sigh and a praise be thank it, then, without another word, turned and went to his lonely stool and home, untreasured of its mistress. Robert went home, too, and stole like a thief to his room. The next day was a Saturday, which indeed was the real old Sabbath, or at least the half of it, to the schoolboys of Rothedon. 
Even Robert's granny was Jew enough, or rather Christian enough, to respect this remnant of the fourth commandment, divine antidote to the rest of the godless money-making and soul-saving week, and he had the half-day to himself. So as soon as he had had his dinner, he managed to give Shargar the slip, left him to the inroads of a desolate despondency, and stole away to the old factory garden. The key of that he had managed to purloin from the kitchen where it hung, nor was there much danger of its absence being discovered, seeing that in winter no one thought of the garden. The smuggling of the violin out of the house was the dearest danger, the more so that he would not run the risk of carrying her out unprotected, and it was altogether a bulky venture with the case. But by spying and speeding he managed it, and soon found himself safe within the high walls of the garden. It was early spring, there had been a heavy fall of sleet in the morning, and now the wind blew gustfully about the place. The neglected trees shook showers upon him as he passed under them, trampling down the rank growth of the grass walks. The long twigs of the wall trees, which had never been nailed up or had been torn down by the snow and the blasts of winter, went trailing away in the moan of the fitful wind and swung back as it sunk to a sigh. The current and gooseberry bushes, bare and leafless and shivering all for cold, neither reminded him of the feasts of the past summer, nor gave him any hope for the next. He strode careless through it all to gain the door at the bottom. It yielded to a push, and the long grass streamed in over the threshold as he entered. He mounted by a broad stair in the main part of the house, passing the silent clock in one of its corners now expiating in motionlessness the false accusations it had brought against the workpeople and turned into the chaos of machinery i fear that my readers will expect from the minuteness with which i recount these particulars that after all i am going to describe a rendezvous with a lady or a ghost at least i will not plead in excuse that i too have been infected with sandy's mode of regarding her but I plead that in the mind of Robert the proceeding was involved in something of that awe and mystery with which a youth approaches the woman he loves. He had not yet arrived at the period when the feminine assumes its paramount influence, combining in itself all that music, color, form, odor can suggest, with something infinitely higher and more divine. But he had begun to be haunted with some vague aspirations toward the infinite, of which his attempts on the violin were the outcome and now that he was to be alone for the first time with this wonderful realizer of dreams and awakener of visions to do with her as he would to hint by gentle touches at the thoughts that were fluttering in his soul and listen for her voice that by the echoes in which she strove to respond he might know that she understood him it was no wonder if he felt an ethereal foretaste of the expectation that haunts the approach of souls. But I am not even going to describe his first tete-a-tete with his violin. Perhaps he returned from it somewhat disappointed. Probably he found her coy, unready to acknowledge his demands on her attention. But not the less willingly did he return with her to the solitude of the ruinous factory. On every safe occasion, becoming more and more frequent as the days grew longer, he repaired thither, and every time returned more capable of drawing the coherence of melody from that matrix of sweet sounds. At length the people about began to say that the factory was haunted, that the ghost of old Mr. Falconer, unable to repose while neglect was ruining the precious results of his industry, visited the place night after night and solaced his disappointment by renewing on his favorite violin strains not yet forgotten by him in his grave, and remembered well by those who had been in his service, not a few of whom lived in the neighborhood of the forsaken building. One gusty afternoon, like the first, but late in the spring, Robert repaired as usual to his secret haunt. He had played for some time, and now, from a sudden pause of impulse, had ceased and begun to look around him. The only light came from two long pale cracks in the rain clouds of the west, the wind was blowing through the broken windows which stretched away on either hand. A dreary windy gloom therefore pervaded the desolate place, and in the dusk and their settled order the machines looked multitudinous. An eerie sense of discomfort came over him as he gazed, 
and he lifted his violin to dispel the strange, unpleasant feeling that grew upon him. But at the first long stroke across the strings, an awful sound arose in a further room, a sound that made him all but drop the bow and cling to his violin. It went on. It was the old, all but forgotten whir of bobbins mingled with the gentle groans of the revolving horizontal wheel, but magnified in the silence of the place and the echoing imagination of the boy into something preternaturally awful. Yielding for a moment to the growth of goose-skin and the insurrection of hair, he recovered himself by a violent effort and walked to the door that connected the two compartments. Was it more or less fearful than the jenny was not going of itself? that the figure of an old woman sat solemnly turning and turning the hand-wheel. Not without calling in the jury of his senses, however, would he yield to the special plea of his imagination, but went nearer, half expecting to find that the much, with its big flapping borders glimmering white in the gloom across many a machine, surrounded the face of a skull. But he was soon satisfied that it was only a blind woman everybody knew, so old that she had become childish. She had heard the reports of the factory being haunted, and, groping about with her half-withered brain, full of them, had found the garden and the back door open, and had climbed to the first floor by a farther stair, well known to her when she used to work that very machine. She had seated herself instinctively, according to ancient wont, and had set it in motion once more. Yielding to an impulse of experiment, Robert began to play again. Thereupon her disordered ideas broke out in words, and Robert soon began to feel that it could hardly be more ghastly to look upon a ghost than to be taken for one. "'Ay, ay, sir,' said the old woman, in a tone of commiseration. "'It mount be sore to bide. I do not wonder at ye cannot lie still. But what gars ye go on dowering about this place? It's no yours any longer. Ye can when folks dead, they lose the grip. You should go on home to your wife. She might say a word to quiet your old bones, for she's a douse and a wise woman, the mistress. Then followed a pause. There was a horror about the old woman's voice, already half dissolved by death in the desolate place, that almost took from Robert the power of motion. But his violin sent forth an accidental twang, and that set her going again. You was I a douse honest gentleman yourself, and I did not wonder you cannot bide it, but I would have thought glory might have holden ye in, to your own son, ha hey, high, and a bra lad and a bonny. It's a sod thing ye bood to go on the wrong gate, and it's no wonder, as I say, that ye lead the worms to come and look after him. I do it, I do it. It would not be to you, he'll go on at the long last. There would not be room for him aside ye in Abraham's bosom, and signed to behave so ill to that winsome wife of his. I did not wonder at ye mount be up, and now. But, sir, since ye are up, I wish ye would spake to John Thomason no to take off the day at I was away last wake, for deed I was very unwell, and would to keep my bed. Robert was beginning to feel uneasy as to how he should get rid of her, when she rose and saying, Ay, ay, I can, at six o'clock, went out as she had come in. Robert followed and saw her safe out of the garden, but did not return to the factory. So, his father had behaved ill to his mother, too. But what for hearken to the havers of a dawdled old wife, he said to himself, pondering as he walked home. Old Janet told a strange story of how she had seen the ghost, and had had a long talk with him, and of what he said, and of how he groaned and played the fiddle between. And finding that the report had reached his grandmother's ears, Robert thought it prudent much to his discontent to intermit his visits to the factory. Mrs. Falconer, of course, received the rumor with indignant scorn, and peremptorily refused to allow any examination of the premises. But how have the violin by him, and not hear her speak? One evening the longing after her voice grew upon him till he could resist it no longer. He shut the door of his garret room, and with Shargar by him, took her out and began to play softly, gently, oh so softly, so gently. 
Shargar was enraptured. Robert went on playing. Suddenly the door opened, and his granny stood awfully revealed before them. Betty had heard the violin, and had flown to the parlour in the belief that, unable to get any one to heed him at the factory, the ghost had taken Janet's advice and come home. But his wife smiled a smile of contempt, went with Betty to the kitchen, over which Robert's room lay, heard the sounds, put off her creaking shoes, stole upstairs on her soft white lamb's wool stockings, and caught the pair. The violin was seized, put in the case, and carried off, and Mrs. Falconer rejoiced to think she had broken a trap set by Satan for the unwary feet of her poor Robert. Little she knew the wonder of that violin, how it had kept the soul of her husband alive, Little she knew how dangerous it is to shut an open door, with ever so narrow a peep into the eternal, in the face of a son of Adam. And little she knew how determinedly and restlessly a nature like Robert's would search for another, to open one, possibly, which she might consider ten times more dangerous than that which she had closed. When Alexander heard of the affair, he was at first overwhelmed with the misfortune, but, gathering a little heart, at last, he set to workin', as he said himself, like a vera devil. And as he was the best shoemaker in the town, and for the time abstained utterly from whisky, and all sorts of drink but well water, he soon managed to save the money necessary and redeem the old fiddle. But whether it was from fancy, or habit, or what, even Robert's inexperienced ear could not accommodate itself, save under protest to the instrument which once his teacher had considered all but perfect, and it needed the master's finest touch to make its tone other than painful to the sense of the neophyte. No one can estimate too highly the value of such a resource to a man like the shoemaker or a boy like Robert. Whatever it be that keeps the finer faculties of the mind awake, wonder alive, and the interest above mere eating and drinking, money-making and money-saving, Whatever it be that gives gladness or sorrow or hope, this be it violin, pencil, pen, or highest of all the love of a woman, is simply a divine gift of holy influence for the salvation of that being to whom it comes, for the lifting of him out of the mire and up on the rock. For it keeps a way open for the entrance of deeper, holier, grander influences, emanating from the same riches of the Godhead, and though many have genius that have no grace, they will only be so much the worse, so much the nearer to the brute, if you take from them that which corresponds to Dubal Sani's fiddle. End chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of Robert Falcon by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Chapter Twelve Robert's Plan of Salvation. For some time after the loss of his friend, Robert went loitering and mooning about quite neglecting the lessons to which he had not, it must be confessed, paid much attention for many weeks. Even when seated at his granny's table, he could do no more than fix his eyes on his book. To learn was impossible. It was even disgusting to him. But his was a nature which, foiled in one direction, must, absolutely helpless against its own vitality, straightway send out its searching roots in another. Of all forces, that of growth is the one irresistible, for it is the creating power of God, the law of life and of being. Therefore no accumulation of refusals and checks and turnings and forbiddings from all the good old grannies in the world could have prevented Robert from striking root downward and bearing fruit upward, though, as in all higher natures, the fruit was a long way off yet. But his soul was only sad and hungry. He was not unhappy, for he had been guilty of nothing that weighed on his conscience. He had been doing many things of late, it is true, without asking leave of his grandmother. But wherever prayer is felt to be of no avail, there cannot be the sense of obligation, save on compulsion. Even direct disobedience, in such case, will generally leave little soreness, 
except the thing forbidden should be in its own nature wrong and then indeed dawn worm the conscience may begin to bite but robert felt nothing immoral in playing upon his grandfather's violin nor even in taking liberties with the piece of lumber for which nobody cared but possibly the dead therefore he was not unhappy only much disappointed very empty and somewhat gloomy there was nothing to look forward to now no secret full of riches and endless in hope in short no violin to feel the full force of his loss my reader must remember that around the childhood of robert which he was fast leaving behind him there had gathered no tenderness none at least by him recognizable as such all the women he came in contact with were his grandmother and betty he had no recollection of having ever been kissed from the darkness and negation of such an embryo existence his nature had been unconsciously striving to escape struggling to get from below ground into the sunlit air sighing after a freedom he could not have defined the freedom that comes not of independence but of love not of lawlessness but of the perfection of law of this beauty of life with its wonder and its deepness this unknown glory his fiddle had been the type it had been the ark that held if not the tables of the covenant yet the golden pot of angels food and the rod that budded in death and now that it was gone the gloomier aspect of things began to lay hold upon him his soul turned itself away from the sun and entered into the shadow of the underworld like the white horse twins of lake regillus like phoebe the queen of skyey plain and earthly forest every boy and girl every man and woman that lives at all has to divide many a year between tartarus and olympus for now rose within him not without ultimate good the evil phantasms of a theology which would explain all god's doings by low conceptions low i mean for humanity even of right and law and justice then only taking refuge in the fact of the incapacity of the human understanding when its own inventions are impugned as undivine in such a system hell is invariably the deepest truth and the love of god is not so deep as hell hence as foundations must be laid in the deepest the system is founded in hell and the first article in the creed that robert falconer learned was i believe in hell practically i mean it was so else how should it be that as often as a thought of religious duty arose in his mind it appeared in the form of escaping hell of fleeing from the wrath to come for his very nature was hell being not born in sin and brought forth in iniquity but born sin and brought forth iniquity and yet god made him he must believe that and he must believe too that god was just awfully just punishing with fearful pains those who did not go through a certain process of mind which it was utterly impossible they should go through without a help which he would give to some and withhold from others the reason of the difference not being such to say the least of it as to come within the reach of the person's concern and this god they said was love it was logically absurd of course yet thank god they did say that god was love and many of them succeeded in believing it too and in ordering their ways as if the first article of their creed had been i believe in god whence in truth we are bound to say it was the first in power and reality if not in order for what are we to say a man believes if not what he acts upon still the former article was the one they brought chiefly to bear upon their children this mortar probably they thought threw the shell straighter than any of the other field pieces of the church militant hence it was even in justification of god himself that a party arose to say that a man could believe without the help of god at all and after believing only began to receive god's help a heresy all but as dreary and barren as the former not one dreamed of saying at least such a glad word of prophecy never reached the rotherden that while nobody can do without the help of the father any more than a new-born babe could of itself live and grow to a man yet that in the giving of that help the very fatherhood of the father finds its one gladsome labour that for the lord came for that the world was made for that we were born into it 
for that God lives and loves like the most loving man or woman on earth, only infinitely more, and in other ways and kinds besides, which we cannot understand, and that therefore to be a man is the soul of eternal jubilation. Robert consequently began to take fits of soul-saving, a most rational exercise, worldly wise and prudent, right, too, on the principles he had received, but not in the least Christian in its nature, or even God-fearing. His imagination began to busy itself in representing the dire consequences of not entering into the one refuge of faith. He made many frantic efforts to believe that he believed, took to keeping the Sabbath very carefully, that is, by going to church three times, and to Sunday school as well, by never walking a step save to or from church, by never saying a word upon any subject unconnected with religion, chiefly theoretical, by never reading any but religious books, by never whistling, by never thinking of his lost fiddle, and so on, all the time feeling that God was ready to pounce upon him if he failed once, till again and again the intensity of his efforts utterly defeated their object, by destroying for the time the desire to prosecute them with the power to will them. But through the horrible vapours of these vain endeavours, which denied God altogether as the maker of the world, and the former of his soul and heart and brain, and sought to worship him as a capricious demon, there broke a little light, a little soothing, soft twilight from the dim windows of such literature as came in his way. Besides the Pilgrim's Progress, there were several books which shone moonlike on his darkness, and lifted something of the weight of that Egyptian gloom off his spirits. One of these, strange to say, was Defoe's Religious Courtship, and one Young's Night Thoughts. But there was another which deserves particular notice, inasmuch as it did far more than merely interest or amuse him, raising a deep question in his mind, and one worthy to be asked. This book was the translation of Klopstock's Messiah, to which I have already referred. It was not one of his grandmother's books, but had probably belonged to his father. He had found it in his little garret room, but as often as she saw him reading it, she seemed rather pleased, he thought. As to the book itself, its florid expiation could neither offend nor injure a boy like Robert, while its representation of our Lord was to him a wonderful relief from that given in the pulpit and in all the religious books he knew. But the point for the sake of which I refer to it in particular is this. Amongst the rebel angels who are of the actors in the story, one of the principal is a cherub who repents of making his choice with Satan, mourns over his apostasy, haunts unseen the steps of our Saviour, wheels lamenting about the cross, and would gladly return to his lost duties in heaven, if only he might, a doubt which I believe is left unsolved in the volume, and naturally enough remained unsolved in Robert's mind. Would poor Abaddon be forgiven and taken home again? For although naturally, that is, to judge by his own instincts, there could be no question of his forgiveness, according to what he had been taught, there could be no question of his perdition. Having no one to talk to, he divided himself and went to Buffett's on the subject, siding, of course, with the better half of himself, which supported the merciful view of the matter. For all his efforts at keeping the Sabbath had, in his own honest judgment, failed so entirely that he had no ground for believing himself one of the elect. Had he succeeded in persuading himself that he was, there is no saying to what lengths of indifference about others the chosen prig might have advanced by this time. He made one attempt to open the subject with Shargar. Shargar, what think ye? he said suddenly one day. Given a devil war to repent, would God forgive him? There's no saying what folk would do till once they're tried, replied Shargar cautiously. Robert did not care to resume the question with one who so circumspectly refused to take a metaphysical or a priori view of the matter. He made an attempt with his grandmother. One Sunday his thoughts, after trying for a time to revolve in due orbit around the mind of Rev. Hugh MacClary, as projected in a sermon which he had botched up out of a commentary, failed at last, 
and flew off into what said gentleman would have pronounced very dangerous speculation seeing no man is to go beyond what is written in the bible which contains not only the truth but the whole truth and nothing but the truth for this time and for all future time both here and in the world to come some such sentence at least was in his sermon that day and the preacher no doubt supposed st matthew not st matthew henry accountable for its origination in the limbo into which robert's spirit then flew it had been sorely exercised about the substitution of the sufferings of christ for those which humanity must else have endured while ages rolled on mere ripples on the ocean of eternity no be quiet said mrs falconer solemnly as robert a trifle lighter at heart from the result of his cogitations than usual sat down to dinner he had happened to smile across the table to shargar and he was quiet and smiled no more they ate their broth or more properly supped it with horn spoons in absolute silence after which mrs falconer put a large piece of meat on the plate of each with the same formula have yees get nay more the allowance was ample in the extreme bearing a relation to her words similar to that which her practice bore to her theology a piece of cheese because it was the sabbath followed and dinner was over when the table had been cleared by betty they drew their chairs to the fire and robert had to read to his grandmother while shargar sat listening he had not read long however before he looked up from his bible and began the following conversation was not it an ill trick of joseph grandmother to put that cup and a cellar on too into the mouth of benjamin's sack what for that laddie he wanted to gar them come back again ye ken but he need not have kin aboot it in such a play actor like gait he need not have letten them away without telling them that he was their brother they had behaved very ill till him he used to tell tales upon them though laddie take ye care what ye say about joseph for he was a type of christ who was that grandmother they sell it him to the ishmaelites for silver as judas did to him did he bear the sins of them at selt him ye may say in a manner at he did for he was sore afflicted afore he wound up to be the king's right hand and sign he keepeth a hantle of ill off of his brethren say grandmother other folk nor christ might suffer for the sins of their neighbours ay laddie many a one has to do that but no to make atonement ye can nothing but the suffering of the spotless could do that the lord would not be satisfied with less nor that it mount be the innocent to suffer for the guilty i understand that said robert who had heard it so often that he had not yet thought of trying to understand it but given we gone to the good place we'll be all innocent will not we granny ay that we will wash spotless and pure and clean and dressed in the weeding garment and set doing at the table with him and with his father that's them that believes in him ye can of course granny well you see i have been thinking of a plan for almost emptying hell what's in the baron's head newel trowth you're no blate in meddling with such subjects laddie i did not want to say anything to vex you granny i was go on with the chapter i'll say away ye cannot say muckle at's wrong afore i cry hold said mrs falconer curious to know what had been moving in the boy's mind but watching him like a cat ready to spring upon the first visible hair of the old adam and robert recalling the outbreak of terrible grief which he had heard on that memorable night really thought that his project would bring comfort to a mind burdened with such care and went on with the exposition of his plan all them at sits doing to the supper of the lamb will sit there because christ suffered the punishment due to their sins will not they granny doubtless laddie but it'll be some sore upon them to sit there often and drinking and talking away and enjoying themselves when ilka new and then there'll be some a soft o wailing up from the ill place and a smell of burning it'll to bide we'll put that in your head laddie 
There's no reason to think at hell's so near heaven as all that. The Lord forbid it. Well, but, Granny, they'll know all the same whether they smell it or new. And I cannot help thinking that the farther away I thought they were, the were I would like to think upon them. Deed it would be war. What are ye driving at, laddie? I cannot understand ye, said Mrs. Falconer, feeling very uncomfortable, and yet curious, almost anxious to hear what would come next. I trust we will not have to think muckle. But here I presume the thought of the added desolation of her Andrew, if she too were to forget him, as well as his father in heaven, checked the flow of her words. She paused, and Robert took up his parable and went on, first with yet another question. Dov ye think, Granny, that a body would be allude to spake a word in public, like there, at the long table, like I mean? Well, for no, if it was done with modesty, and for good reason. But, Raleigh, laddie, I doot your haverin altogether. You heard nothing like that, I'm sure, the day from Mr. McCleary. Nay, nay, he said nothing about it. But maybe I'll go on and spare at him, though. What aboot? What I'm going to tell you, Granny. Well, tell away and have done with it. I'm growing tired of it. It was something else than tired she was growing. Well, I was going to try all that I can to win in there. I hope you will. Strive and pray. Resist the devil. Walk in the lake. Lippin' not to yourself, but trust in Christ and his salvation. Ay, ay, Granny. Well, are ye no done yet? Nay, I'm but just beginning. Beginning, are ye? Humph. Well, if I win in there, the very first night I sit down with the love of them, I'm going to rise up and say, that is, if the masty at the head of the table does not bid me sit down, and say, Brothers and sisters, the whole of ye, hearken to me for a minute, and, O oh Lord, if I say wrong, just take the speech from me, and I'll sit down dumb and rebuke it. We're a here by grace, and no by merit, save his, as ye all can better nor I can tell ye, for ye have been longer here nor me. But it's just ruggin' and riven at my heart to think of them at's doin' there. Maybe ye can hear them. I cannot. No, we have no merit, and they have no merit. And what for are we here and them there? But we're washed clean and innocent new, and new, when there's no white line upon ourselves, it seems to me that we might bear some of the sins of them and have or many. I call upon ilk one of ye, and has a friend or a neighbor down yonder, to rise up and taste, nor bite, nor sup more, till we go on up altogether to the foot of the throne, and pray the Lord to let's go on and do as the Master did afore us, and bear their griefs, and carry their sorrows doing in hell there, if it may be that they may repent and get remission of their sins, and come up here with us at the long last, and sit doing with us at the table, and throw the merits of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, at the head of the table there. Amen. Half ashamed of his long speech, half overcome by the feelings fighting within him, and altogether bewildered, Robert burst out crying like a baby, and ran out of the room, up to his own place of meditation, where he threw himself on the floor. Shargar, who had made neither head nor tail of it all, as he said afterward, sat staring at Mrs. Falconer. She rose, and going into Robert's little bedroom, closed the door, and what she did there is not far to seek. When she came out, she rang the bell for tea, and sent Shargar to look for Robert. When he appeared, she was so gentle to him that it woke quite a new sensation in him. But after tea was over, she said, "'No, Robert, let's have nae more of this. Ye kens as well as I do that them at gone's there, their doom is fixed, and nothing can alter it. And we're not to allow our own fancies to carry us ayont the scripture. We have our own salvation to work out with fear and trembling. We have nothing to do with what's hidden. Look ye till it at ye win in yourself. That's enough for you to mind. Shargar, ye can go on to the kirk. Robert's to bide with me the night. Mrs. Falconer very rarely went to church, for she could not hear a word, and found it irksome. When Robert and she were alone together, Laddie, she said, be ye war of judging the Almighty, 
what looks to you all wrong may be all right but it's true enough at we do not ken a thing and he's no dead yet i do not believe it he is and he'll maybe win in yet here her voice failed her and robert had nothing to say now he had said all his say before pray robert pray for your father laddie she resumed for we have muckle reason to be anxious about him pray while there is life and hope give the lord no rest pray till him day and night as i do that he would lead him to see the error of his ways and turn to the lord who was ready to pardon if your mother had lived i would have had more hope i confess for she was a bra lady and a bonny and that sweet-tongued she could have wild a mawkin from its lair with her bonny highland speech i never like it to hear none of them spake the irish that is gaelic it was i so gloggy and baneless and i could not understand a word of it na more could your father hoot your grandfather i mean though his father could spake it well but to hear your mother mamma as ye used to all call her i after the new fashion to hear her spake english that was sweet to the ear for the broad scot she kent as little of as i do of the gaelic it was heart's care about him that shortened her days and all that'll be laid upon him he'll have it to bear and account for och hon och hon ha ah, robert my man be a good lad and serve the lord with all your heart and soul and strength and mind for giving ye gone wrong your own father'll have to bear nobody kens who muckle of the white of it for he's done nothing to bring ye up in the way ye should go on and hold ye out of the ill gate for the sake of your poor father hold ye to the right road it may spare him a pang or two in the ill place and given the lord would only take me and let him go on involuntarily and unconsciously the mother's love was adopting the hope which she had denounced in her grandson and robert saw it but he was never the man when i knew him to push a victory he said nothing only a tear or two at the memory of the way-worn man his recollection of whose visit i have already recorded rolled down his cheeks he was at such a distance from him such an impassable gulf yawned between them that was the grief not the gulf of death nor the gulf that divides hell from heaven but the gulf of abjuration by the good because of his evil ways his grandmother herself weeping fast and silently with scarce altered countenance took her neatly folded handkerchief from her pocket and wiped her grandson's fresh cheeks then wiped her own withered face and from that moment robert knew that he loved her then followed the sabbath evening prayer that she always offered with the boy whichever he was who kept her company they knelt down together side by side in a certain corner of the room the same i doubt not in which she knelt at her private devotions before going to bed there she uttered a long extempore prayer rapid in speech full of divinity and scripture phrases but not the less earnest and simple for it flowed from a heart of faith then robert had to pray after her loud in her ear that she might hear him thoroughly so that he often felt as if he were praying to her and not to god at all she had begun to teach him to pray so early that the custom reached beyond the confines of his memory at first he had to repeat the words after her but soon she made him construct his own utterances now and then giving him a suggestion in the form of a petition when he seemed likely to break down or putting a phrase into what she considered more suitable language but all such assistance she had given up long ago on the present occasion she had ended her petitions with those for jews and pagans and especially for the pope of rome in whom with a rare liberality she took the kindest interest she turned to robert with the usual new robert and robert began but after he had gone on for some time with the ordinary phrases he turned all at once into a new track and instead of praying in general terms for those that would not walk in the right way said o oh lord save my father and there paused if it be thy will suggested his grandmother but robert continued silent his grandmother repeated the subjunctive clause i'm trying grandmother said robert but i cannot say it i dare not say an if about it it would be like glean in 
till his damnation. We mount have him saved, Granny. Laddie, laddie, hold your tongue, said Mrs. Falconer in a tone of distressed awe. Oh, Lord, forgive him. He's young and does not know better yet. He cannot understand thy ways, nor for that matter can I pretend to understand them myself. But thou art a light, and in thee is no darkness at all, and thy light comes into our blind eye and makes them blinder yet. But, O oh Lord, if it would please thee to hear our prayer, eh, who he, we would praise thee, and my Andrew would praise thee more, nor ninety and nine of them at need nay repentance. A long pause followed, and then the only words that would come were, For Christ's sake, Amen. When she said that God was light, instead of concluding therefrom, that he could not do the deeds of darkness, she was driven from a faith in the teaching of Jonathan Edwards as implicit as that of any lay papist of Loretto, to doubt whether the deeds of darkness were not, after all, deeds of light, or at least to conclude that their character depended not on their own nature, but on who did them. They rose from their knees, and Mrs. Falconer sat down by her fire, with her feet on her little wooden stool, and began, as was her wont in that household twilight, ere the lamp was lighted, to review her past life, and follow her lost son through all conditions and circumstances to her imaginable. And when the world to come arose before her, clad in all the glories which her fancy, chilled by education and years, could supply, it was but to vanish in the gloom of the remembrance of him with whom she dared not hope to share its blessedness, This at least was how Falconer afterwards interpreted the sudden changes from gladness to gloom which he saw at such times on her countenance. But while such a small portion of the universe of thought was enlightened by the glow-worm lamp of the theories she had been taught, she was not limited for light to that fuel source. While she walked on her way, the moon, unseen herself behind the clouds, was illuminating the whole landscape so gently and evenly that the glow-worm being the only visible point of radiance, to it she attributed all the light. But she felt bound to go on believing as she had been taught. For some time the most original mind has the strongest sense of law upon it, and will, in default of a better, obey a beggarly one, only till the higher law that swallows it up manifests itself. Obedience was as essential an element of her creed as of that of any purest-minded monk, neither being sufficiently impressed with this, that, while obedience is the law of the kingdom, it is of considerable importance that that which is obeyed should be in very truth the will of God. It is one thing, and a good thing, to do for God's sake that which is not his will. It is another thing, and altogether a better thing, how much better no words can tell, to do for God's sake that which is his will. Mrs. Falconer's submission and obedience led her to accept as the will of God, lest she should be guilty of opposition to him, that which it was anything but giving him honor to accept as such. Therefore her love to God was too like the love of the slave or the dog, too little like the love of the child, with whose obedience the father cannot be satisfied until he cares for his reason as the highest form of his will. True, the child who most faithfully desires to know the inward will or reason of the Father will be the most ready to obey without it. Only for this obedience it is essential that the apparent command at least be such as he can suppose attributable to the Father. Of his own self he is bound to judge what is right, as the Lord said. Had Abraham doubted whether it was in any case right to slay his son, he would have been justified in doubting whether God really required it of him, and would have been bound to delay action until the arrival of more light. True, the will of God can never be other than good, but I doubt if any man can ever be sure that a thing is the will of God, save by seeing into its nature and character and beholding its goodness. Whatever God does must be right, but are we sure that we know what he does? That which men say he does may be very wrong indeed. This burden she in her turn laid upon Robert, not unkindly, but as needful for his training towards well-being. Her way with him was shaped after that which she recognized as God's way with her. Spare nay questions, but go on, do as you tell it. And it was anything but a bad lesson for the boy. It was one of the best he could have had, that of authority. It is a grand thing to obey without asking questions, so long as there is nothing evil in what is commanded. 
Only Granny concealed her reasons without reason, and God makes no secrets. Hence she seemed more stern and less sympathetic than she really was. She sat with her feet on the little wooden stool, and Robert sat beside her, staring into the fire, till they heard the outer door open and Shargar and Betty come in from church. End chapter 12book one chapter thirteen of robert falconer by george macdonald this librivox recording is in the public domain robert falconer by george macdonald chapter thirteen robert's mother early on the following morning while mrs falconer robert and shargar were at breakfast mr lammie came he had delayed communicating the intelligence he had received till he should be more certain of its truth. Older than Andrew, he had been a great friend of his father, and likewise of some of Mrs. Falconer's own family. Therefore he was received with a kindly welcome. But there was a cloud on his brow, which, in a moment, revealed that his errand was not a pleasant one. "'I had not seen ye for a long time, Mr. Lammy. Go about the hoose, lads, or I'm thinking it maun be school time.' Sit ye doin', Mr. Lammie, and let's hear your news. I came from Aberdeen last night, Mistress Falconer, he began. Ye have not been home since, sign, she rejoined. Nay, I sleep it at the boar's head. What for did ye that? What gart ye be at that expense, when ye ken I had a bed in the gale room? Well, ye see, they're old friends of mine, and I like to go on to them when I'm in the gate of it. Well, they're a fine family, the Miss Napiers, and I wot, sin they mount sell drink, they do it with discretion. That's well kent. Possibly Mr. Lammy, remembering what then occurred, may have thought the discretion a little in excess of the drink, but he had other matters to occupy him now. For a few moments both were silent. There's been some ill news, they tell me, Mrs. Faulkner, he said at length, when the silence had grown painful. Humph, returned the old lady, her face becoming stony with the effort to suppress all emotion. Nay, but Andrew. Deed is it, ma'am, an ill news, I'm sorry to say. Is he taken? Ay, is he, by a jailer that will not loose the grip. He's no dead, John Lammy. Do not say it. I mount say it, Mrs. Faulkner. I had it from Dr. Anderson, your own cousin. He hinted at it afore, but his last letter leaves nay room to do it upon the subject. I'm uncle sorry to be bearer of such ill news, Mrs. Faulkner, but I had no choice. Ahon, ahon, the day of grace is by at last. My poor Andrew, exclaimed Mrs. Falconer, and sat dumb thereafter. Mr. Lammy tried to comfort her with some of the usual comfortless commonplaces. She neither wept nor replied, but sat with stony face, staring into her lap, till seeing that she was as one that heareth not, he rose and left her alone with her grief. A few minutes after he was gone, she rang the bell and told Betty in her usual voice to send Robert to her. "'He's gone to the school, ma'am. Run after him and tell him to come home.' When Robert appeared, wondering what his grandmother could want with him, she said, Close the door, Robert. I cannot let you go on to the school today. We may not leave him out new. Leave what out? Granny. Him, him, Andrew, your father, laddie. I think my heart will break. Leave him out of what, Granny? I do not understand ye. Leave him out of our prayers, laddie, and I cannot bide it. What for that? He's dead. Are you sure? I or sure, or sure, laddie. Well, I did not believe it. What for that? Because I will not believe it. I'm no born to believe it, am I? What's the good of that? What for no believe it? Dr. Anderson sent home word of it to John Lammy. Ach, hon, ach, hon. I tell you, I will not believe it, Granny, except God himself tells me. 
As long as I did not believe that he's dead, I can keep him in my prayers. I'm no going to leave him oot, I tell you, Granny. Well, laddie, I cannot argue with ye. I have nae heart till it. I do it I mount great. Come away. She took him by the hand and rose, then let him go again, saying, Shut the door, laddie. Robert bolted the door, and his grandmother, again taking his hand, led him to the usual corner. There they knelt down together, and the old woman's prayer was one great and bitter cry for submission to the divine will. She rose a little strengthened, if not comforted, saying, "Ye maun pray your lawn, laddie, but oh, be a good lad, for ye're all that I have left, and if ye gone wrong too, ye'll bring doon my grey hairs with sorrow to the grave. They're grey enough, and they're near enough to the grave, but if ye turn oot well, I'll maybe hold up my head a bit yet. But oh, Andrew, my son, my son, would to God I had died for thee. And the words of her brother, in grief, the king of Israel, opened the floodgates of her heart, and she wept. Robert left her weeping, and closed the door quietly, as if his dead father had been lying in the room. He took his way up to his own garret, closed that door too, and sat down upon the floor with his back against the empty bedstead. There were no more castles to build now. It was all very well to say that he would not believe the news, and would pray for his father, but he did believe them, enough at least to spoil the praying. His favorite employment, seated there, had hitherto been to imagine how he would grow a great man, and set out to seek his father, and find him, and stand by him, and be his son and servant. Oh, to have the man stroke his head, and pat his cheek, and love him! One moment he imagined himself his indignant defender, the next he would be climbing on his knee as if he were still a little child, and laying his head on his shoulder. For he had had no fondling his life long, and his heart yearned for it. But all this was gone now. A dreary time lay before him, with nobody to please, nobody to serve, with nobody to praise him. Granny never praised him. She must have thought praise something wicked. And his father was in misery forever and ever. Only, somehow, that thought was not quite thinkable. It was more the vanishing of hope from his own life than a sense of his father's fate that oppressed him. He cast his eyes, as in a hungry despair, around the empty room, or rather, I should have said, in that faintness which makes food at once essential and loathsome, for despair has no proper hunger in it. The room seemed as empty as his life. There was nothing for his eyes to rest upon but those bundles and bundles of dust-brown papers on the shelves before him. What were they all about? He understood that they were his father's now, that he was dead. It would be no sacrilege to look at them. Nobody cared about them. He would see at least what they were. It would be something to do in this dreariness. Bills and receipts and everything ephemeral, to feel the interest of which a man must be a poet indeed, was all that met his view. Bundle after bundle he tried, with no better success. But as he drew near the middle of the second shelf, upon which lay several rows deep, he saw something dark behind, hurriedly displaced the packets between, and drew forth a small work-box. His heart beat like that of the prince in the fairy tale when he comes to the door of the sleeping beauty. This at least must have been hers. It was a common little thing, probably a childish possession, and kept to hold trifles worth more than they looked to be. He opened it with bated breath. The first thing he saw was a half-finished reel of cotton, a pern, he called it. Beside it was a gold thimble. He lifted the tray. A lovely face in miniature, with dark hair and blue eyes, lay looking earnestly upward. At the lid of this coffin those eyes had looked for so many years. The picture was set all round with pearls in an oval ring. How Robert knew them to be pearls he could not tell, for he did not know that he had ever seen any pearls before, but he knew they were pearls, and that pearls had something to do with the new Jerusalem. But the sadness of it all at length overpowered him, and he burst out crying, for it was awfully sad that his mother's portrait should be in his own mother's box. He took a bit of red tape off a bundle of papers, put it through the eye of the setting, and hung the picture round his neck. Inside his clothes, for Granny must not see it. She would take that away as she had taken his fiddle. He had a nameless something now for which he had been longing for years. 
Looking again in the box, he found a little bit of paper, discoloured with antiquity, as it seemed to him, though it was not so old as himself. Unfolding it, he found written upon it a well-known hymn, and at the bottom of the hymn the words, O Lord, my heart is very sore. The treasure upon Robert's bosom was no longer the symbol of a mother's love, but of a woman's sadness, which he could not reach to comfort. In that hour the boy made a great stride towards manhood. Doubtless his mother's grief had been the same as Granny's, the fear that she would lose her husband forever. The hourly fresh griefs from neglect and a wrong did not occur to him, only the never, never more. He looked no farther, took the portrait from his neck, and replaced it with the paper, put the box back, and walled it up in solitude once more with the dusty bundles. Then he went down to his grandmother, sadder and more desolate than ever. He found her seated in her usual place. Her New Testament, a large print octavo, lay on the table beside her, unopened, for where within those boards could she find comfort for a grief like hers? That it was the will of God might well comfort any suffering of her own, but would it comfort Andrew? And if there was no comfort for Andrew, how was Andrew's mother to be comforted? Yet God had given his firstborn to save his brethren, how could he be pleased that she should dry her tears and be comforted? True, some awful unknown force of a necessity with which God could not cope came in to explain it, but this did not make God more kind, for he knew it all every time he made a man, nor man less sorrowful, for God would have his very mother forget him, or worse, still, remember him and be happy. Read a chapter to me, laddie, she said. Robert opened and read till he came to the words, I pray not for the world. He was of the world, said the old woman, and if Christ would not pray for him, what for should I? Already so soon after her son's death would her theology begin to harden her heart. The strife which results from believing that the higher love demands the suppression of the lower is the most fearful of all discords, the absolute love slain love, the house divided against itself, one moment all given up for the will of him, the next the human tenderness rushing back in a flood. Mrs. Falconer burst into a very agony of weeping. From that day, for many years, the name of her lost Andrew never passed her lips in the hearing of her grandson, and certainly in that of no one else. But in a few weeks she was more cheerful. It is one of the mysteries of humanity that mothers in her circumstances and holding her creed, do regain not merely the faculty of going on with the business of life, but in most cases even cheerfulness. The infinite truth, the love of the universe, supports them beyond their consciousness, coming to them like sleep from the roots of their being, and having nothing to do with their opinions or beliefs, and hence spring those comforting subterfuges of hope to which they all fly. Not being able to trust the Father entirely, they yet say, who can tell what took place at the last moment? Who can tell whether God did not please to grant them saving faith at the eleventh hour? And so they might pass from the very gates of hell, the only place for which their life had fitted them, into the bosom of love and purity. This God could do for all. This for the son beloved of his mother perhaps he might do. O oh, rebellious mother heart, dearer to God than that which beats laboriously solemn under Genevan gown or Lutheran surplice. If thou wouldst read by thine own large light, instead of the glimmer from the phosphorescent brains of theologians, thou mightest even be able to understand such a simple word as that of the Saviour, when, wishing his disciples to know that he had a nearer regard for them as his brethren in holier danger than those who had not yet partaken of his light, and therefore praying for them not merely as human beings, but as the human beings they were, he said to his father in their hearing, I pray not for the world, but for them. Not for the world now, but for them, a meaningless utterance. If he never prayed for the world, a word of small meaning. If it was not his very want and custom to pray for the world, for men as men. Lord Christ, not alone from the pains of hell or of conscience, not alone from the outer darkness of self and all that is mean and poor and low, do we fly to thee but from the anger that arises within us at the wretched words spoken in thy name, at the degradation of thee and of thy father in the mouths of those that claim especially to have found thee, do we seek thy feet. Pray thou for them also.
for they know not what they do. End chapter 13book one chapter fourteen of robert falconer by george macdonald this librivox recording is in the public domain robert falconer by george macdonald chapter fourteen mary st john after this day followed day in calm dull progress Robert did not care for the games through which his schoolfellows forgot the little they had to forget, and had therefore few, in any sense, his companions. So he passed his time out of school in the society of his grandmother in Shargar, except that spent in the garret, and the few hours a week occupied by the lessons of the shoemaker. For he went on, though half-heartedly, with those lessons, given up upon Sandy's redeemed violin, which he called his old wife, and made a little progress even, as we sometimes do when we least think it. He took more and more to brooding in the garret, and as more questions presented themselves for solution, he became more anxious to arrive at the solution, and more uneasy as he failed in satisfying himself that he had arrived at it, so that his brain, which needed quiet for the true formation of its substance, as a cooling liquefaction or an evaporating solution for the just formation of its crystals, became in danger of settling into an abnormal arrangement of the cellular deposits. I believe that even the newborn infant is, in some of his moods, already grappling with the deepest metaphysical problems, in forms infinitely too rudimental for the understanding of the grown philosopher, as far, in fact, removed from his ken on the one side, that of intelligential beginning, the germinal subjective, as his abstrusest speculations are from the final solutions of absolute entity on the other. If this be the case, it is no wonder that at Robert's age the deepest questions of his coming manhood should be in active operation, although so surrounded with the yoke of common belief, and the shell of accredited authority, that the embryo faith which in minds like his always take the form of doubt could not be defined any more than its existence could be disproved i have given a hint at the tendency of his mind already in the fact that one of the most definite inquiries to which he had yet turned his thoughts was whether god would have mercy upon a repentant devil an ordinary puzzle had been if his father were to marry again and it should turn out after all that his mother was not dead what was his father to do but this was over now. A third was, why, when he came out of church, sunshine always made him miserable, and he felt better able to be good when it rained or snowed hard. I might mention the inquiry whether it was not possible somehow to elude the omniscience of God, but that is a common question with thoughtful children, and indicates little that is characteristic of the individual. That he puzzled himself about the perpetual motion may pass for little likewise but one thing that is worth mentioning for indeed it caused him considerable distress was that in reading the paradise lost he could not help sympathizing with satan and feeling i do not say thinking that the almighty was pompous scarcely reasonable and somewhat revengeful he was recognized amongst his schoolfellows as remarkable for his love of fair play so much so that he was their constant referee. Add to this that, notwithstanding his sympathy with Satan, he almost invariably sided with his master in regard of any angry reflection or seditious movement, and even when unjustly punished himself, the occasional result of a certain backwardness in self-defense, never showed any resentment, a most improbable statement, I admit, but nevertheless true, and I think the rest of his character may be left to the gradual dawn of its historical manifestation. He had long ere this discovered who the angel was that had appeared to him at the top of the stair upon that memorable night, but he could hardly yet say that he had seen her, for except one dim glimpse he had had of her at the window as he passed in the street, she had not appeared to him save in the vision of that night. During the whole winter she scarcely left the house, partly from the state of her health, affected by the sudden change to a northern climate, 
partly from the attention required by her aunt to aid in nursing whom she had left the warmer south indeed it was only to return the visits of a few of mrs forsyth's chosen that she had crossed that threshold at all and those visits were paid at a time when all such half-grown inhabitants as robert were gathered under the leathery wing of mr innes but long before the winter was over rothieden had discovered that the stranger the english lady mary st john outlandish almost heathenish as her lovely name sounded in its ears had a power as altogether strange and new as her name for she was not only an admirable performer on the pianoforte but such a simple enthusiast in music that the man must have had no music or little heart in him in whom her playing did not move all that there was of the deepest occasionally there would be quite a small crowd gathered at night by the window of mrs forsyth's drawing-room which was on the ground floor listening to music such as had never before been heard in rothieden more than once when robert had not found sandy elshender at home on the lesson night and had gone to seek him he had discovered him lying in wait like a fowler to catch the sweet sounds that flew from the opened cage of her instrument he leaned against the wall with his ear laid over the edge and as near the window as he dared to put it his rough face gnarled and blotched and hirsute with the stubble of neglected beard his whole face transfigured by the passage of the sweet sounds through his chaotic brain which they swept like the wind of god when of old it moved on the face of the waters that clothed the void and formless world hold your tongue he would say in a hoarse whisper when robert sought to attract his attention hold your tongue man and hearken if yon bonny leddy at your granny keeps lock it up in the armory war to take to the piano that's just who she would play lord man pit your soul in your ears and hearken the shoemaker was all wrong in this for if old mr falconer's violin had taken woman shape it would have been that of a slight worn swarthy creature with wild black eyes great and restless a voice like a bird's and thin fingers that clawed the music out of the wires like the quills of an old harpsichord not that of mary st john who was tall and could not help being stately was large and well fashioned as full of repose as handel's music with a contralto voice to make you weep and eyes that would have seemed but for their maidenliness to be always ready to fold you in their lucid grey depths robert stared at the shoemaker doubting at first whether he had not been drinking but the intoxication of music produces such a different expression from that of drink that robert saw at once that if he had indeed been drinking at least the music had got above the drink as long as the playing went on elshender was not to be moved from the window but to many of the people of rothieden the music did not recommend the musician for every sort of music except the most unmusical of psalm singing was in their minds of a piece with dancing and play acting and other worldly vanities and abominations and robert being as yet more capable of melody than harmony grudged to lose a lesson on sandy's old wife of a fiddle for any amount of miss st john's playing End chapter 14book 1 chapter 15 of robert falconer by george macdonald this librivox recording is in the public domain robert falconer by george macdonald chapter 15 eric ericson one gusty evening it was of the last day in march robert well remembered both the date and the day a bleak wind was driving up the long street of the town and robert was standing looking out of one of the windows in the gable room the evening was closing into night he hardly knew how he came to be there but when he thought about it he found it was play wednesday and that he had been all the half-holiday trying one thing after another to interest himself with all but in vain he knew nothing about east winds but not the less did this weary wind of the dreary march world prove itself upon his soul for such a wind has a shadow wind along with it that blows in the minds of men 
There was nothing genial, no growth in it. It killed, and killed most dogmatically. But it is an ill wind that blows nobody good. Even an east wind must bear some blessing on its ugly wings. And, as Robert looked down from the gable, the wind was blowing up the street before it half a dozen foot-faring students from Aberdeen on their way home at the close of the session, probably to the farm labours of the spring. This was a glad sight, as that of the returning storks in Denmark. Robert knew where they would put up, sought his cap, and went out. His grandmother never objected to his going to see Miss Napier. It was in her house that the weary men would this night rest. It was not without reason that Lord Rothy had teased his hostess about receiving foot passengers, for to such it was her invariable custom to make some civil excuse, sending Meg or Peggy to show them over the way to the hostelry next in rank, a proceeding recognized by the inferior hostess as both just and friendly, for the good woman never thought of measuring the star against the boar's head. More than one comical story had been the result of this law of the boar's head, unalterable almost as that of the Medes and the Persians. I say almost, for to one class of the foot-faring community, the official ice about the hearts of the three women did thaw, yielding passage to a full river of hospitality and generosity, and that was the class to which these wayfarers belonged. Well may Scotland rejoice in her universities, for whatever may be said against their system, I have no complaint to make. They are divine in their freedom. Men who follow the plough in the spring and reap the harvest in the autumn may, and often do, frequent their sacred precincts when the winter comes, so fierce yet so welcome, so severe yet so blessed, opening for them the doors to yet harder toil and yet poorer fare. I fear, however, that of such there will be fewer and fewer, seeing one class which supplied a portion of them has almost vanished from the country, that class which was its truest, simplest, and noblest strength, that class which at one time rendered it something far other than ridicule to say that Scotland was preeminently a God-fearing nation. I mean the class of cotters. Of this class were some of the foot-faring company, but there were others of more means than the men of this lowly origin, who either could not afford to travel by the expensive coaches, or could find none to accommodate them. Possibly some preferred to walk. However, this may have been, the various groups which at the beginning and close of the session passed through Rothenden, weary and footsore, were sure of a hearty welcome at the boar's head. And much the men needed it, some of them would have walked between one and two hundred miles before completing their journey. Robert made a circuit, and fleet of foot was in Miss Napier's parlour before the travellers made their appearance on the square. When they knocked at the door, Miss Letty herself went and opened it. "'Can you take us in, ma'am?' was on the lips of their spokesman, but Miss Letty had the first word. "'Come in, come in, gentlemen. This is the first of ye, and ye're the more welcome.' It's like seeing the first of the swallows, and sich a day as ye have had for your long travel. She went on, leading the way to her sister's parlour, and followed by all the students of whom the one that came hindmost was the most remarkable of the group, at the same time the most weary and downcast. Miss Napier gave them a similar welcome, shaking hands with every one of them. She knew them all but the last. To him she involuntarily showed a more formal respect, partly from his appearance and partly that she had never seen him before. The whisky bottle was brought out, and all partook save still the last. Miss Lizzie went to order their supper. "'No, gentlemen,' said Miss Letty, "'would only of ye like to go on and change your hollows and put on a pair of slippers?' Several declined, saying that they would wait until they had had their supper. The roads had been quite dry, etc., etc. One said he would, and another said his feet were blistered. Hotawa! An exclamation of pitiful sympathy, inexplicable to the understanding. Thus the author covers his philological ignorance of the cross-breeding of the phrase. Here, Peggy, she cried, going to the door. 
Take a pail of hot water up to the jacket room. Just ye go on up, Mr. Cameron, and Peggy'll see to your feet. No, sir, will ye go on to your room and make yourself comfortable, just as if ye were at home, for so ye are. She addressed the stranger thus. He replied in a low, indifferent tone. No, thank you. I must be off again directly. He was from Caithness and talked no Scotch. Deed, sir, ye'll do nothing of the kind. Here ye to bide, though I should lock the door. Come, come, Ericson, none of your nonsense, said one of his fellows. You know your feet are so blistered ye can hardly put one by the other. It was all we could do, mem, to get him along the last mile. That's be my business, then, concluded Miss Letty. She left the room and returning in a few minutes, said as a matter of course, but with authority, Mr. Erickson, you maun come with me. Then she hesitated a little. Was it maidenliness in the waning woman of five and forty? It was, I believe, for how can a woman always remember how old she is? If ever there was a young soul in God's world, it was Letty Napier. And the young man was tall and stately, and a Scandinavian chief with a look of command, tempered with patient endurance in his eagle face, for he was more like an eagle than any other creature, and in his countenance signs of suffering. Miss Letty, seeing this, was moved, and her heart swelled, and she grew conscious and shy, and turning to Robert said, Come up the stair with us, Robert, I may want ye. Robert jumped to his feet. His heart, too, had been yearning towards the stranger. As if yielding to the inevitable, Ericson rose and followed Miss Letty. But when they had reached the room, and the door was shut behind them, and Miss Letty pointed to a chair beside which stood a little wooden tub full of hot water, saying, Sit you doing there, Mr. Ericson. He drew himself up all but his graciously bowed head, and said, Ma'am, I must tell you that I followed the rest in here from the very stupidity of weariness. I have not a shilling in my pocket. God bless me, said Miss Letty, and God did bless her, I am sure. We mount see to the feet first. What would ye do with a shilling if ye had it? Would ye clap one upon Ilka Blister? Ericson burst out laughing and sat down, but still he hesitated. Off with your shoon, sir. Do ye think I can wash your feet through Ben leather? said Miss Letty, not disdaining to advance her fingers to a shoe tie. But I'm ashamed. My stockings are all in holes. Well, ye's get a clean pair to put on in the morn, and I'll darn them at ye have on, if they be worth darning afore ye gone. And what are ye so unmanageable for? A body would think ye had a cloven fit in ilk one of the bits of shoon of yours. I will not promise to please your mother with my darning, though. I have no mother to find fault with it, said Ericson. We all a sister's war. I have no sister either. This was too much for Miss Letty. She could keep up the bravado of humour no longer. She fairly burst out crying. In a moment more the shoes and stockings were off, and the blisters in the hot water. Miss Letty's tears dropped into the tub, and the salt in them did not hurt the feet with which she busied herself more than was necessary to hide them. But no sooner had she recovered herself than she resumed her former tone. A shillin, said ye, and all thy greedy kites of professors to pay that live upon the very blood and bones of sarvrocked students. Who could ye have a shillin' o'er, troth, it's nay wonder ye have not on left, and all the merchants there just leaving upon ye. Lord, have a care of us sich bonny feet, with blisters, I mean. I never saw such a sight of raw puddings in my life. You're no fit to come doin' the stair again. All the time she was tenderly washing and bathing the weary feet. When she had dressed them and tied them up, she took the tub of water and carried it away, but turned at the door. You'll just make up your mind to bide a twa three days, she said, for thou feet could not bide to be carried, no, to say, to carry a weight like you. There's nobody to look for you, you know, and you're not to come doin' the night. I'll send up your supper, and Robert they will bide and keep you company. She vanished, and a moment after Peggy appeared, 
with a salamander, that is, a huge poker ending not in a point, but a red-hot ace of spades, which she thrust between the bars of the grate into the heart of a nest of brushwood. Presently a cheerful fire illuminated the room. Ericson was seated on one chair, with his feet on another. His head sunk on his bosom, and his eyes thinking. There was something about him almost as powerfully attractive to Robert as it had been to Miss Letty. So he sat gazing at him and longing for a chance of doing something for him. He had reverence already, and some love, but he had never felt at all as he felt towards this man, nor was it as the Chinese puzzlers, called Scotch metaphysicians, might have represented it, a combination of love and reverence, it was the recognition of the eternal brotherhood between him and one nobler than himself, hence a lovely eager worship. Seeing Ericson look about him as if he wanted something, Robert started to his feet. "'Is there anything you want, Mr. Ericson?' he said, with service standing in his eyes. "'A small bundle, I think, I brought up with me,' replied the youth. "'It was not there.' Robert rushed downstairs and returned with it, a nightshirt and a hairbrush or so, tied up in a blue cotton handkerchief. This was all that Robert was able to do for Ericson that evening. He went home and dreamed about him. He called at the boar's head the next morning before going to school, but Ericson was not yet up. When he called again as soon as morning school was over, he found that they had persuaded him to keep his bed. But Miss Letty took him up to his room. He looked better, was pleased to see Robert, and spoke to him kindly. Twice yet Robert called to inquire after him that day, and once more he saw him, for he took his tea up to him. The next day Ericson was much better, received Robert with a smile, and went out with him for a stroll, for all his companions were gone, and of some students who had arrived since he did not know any. Robert took him to his grandmother, who received him with stately kindness. Then they went out again and passed the windows of Captain Forsyth's house. Mary St. John was playing. They stood for a moment, almost involuntarily, to listen. She ceased. "'That's the music of the spheres,' said Ericson in a low voice as they moved on. "'Will you tell me what that means?' asked Robert. "'I've come upon it, or an oar in Milton.' Thereupon Ericson explained to him what Pythagoras had taught, about the stars moving in their great orbits with sounds of awful harmony, too grandly loud for the human organ to vibrate in response to their music, hence unheard of men. And Ericsson spoke as if he believed it, but after he had spoken his face grew sadder than ever, and as if to change the subject he said abruptly, "'What a fine old lady your grandmother is, Robert.' "'Is she?' returned Robert. "'I don't mean to say she's like Miss Letty.' said Ericson. She's an angel. A long pause followed. Robert's thoughts went roaming in their usual haunts. Do you think, Mr. Ericson, he said at length, taking up the old question still floating unanswered in his mind, do you think if a devil was to repent, God would forgive him? Ericson turned and looked at him. Their eyes met. The youth wondered at the boy. He had recognized in him a younger brother, one who had begun to ask questions, calling them out into the deaf and dumb abyss of the universe. If God was as good as I would like him to be, the devils themselves would repent, he said, turning away. Then he turned again, and looking down upon Robert like a sorrowful eagle from a crag over its harried nest, said, If I only knew that God was as good as that woman, I should die content. Robert heard words of blasphemy from the mouth of an angel, but his respect for Ericson compelled a reply. "'What woman, Mr. Ericson?' he asked. "'I mean Miss Letty, of course.' "'But surely you do not think God's nay as good as she is. Surely he's as good as he can be. He is good, ye know.' "'Oh, yes, they say so. And then they tell you something about him that isn't good, and go on calling him good all the same.' But calling anybody good doesn't make him good, you know. Then you did not believe that God is good, Mr. Ericson, said Robert, choking with a strange mingling of horror and hope. I didn't say that, my boy. 
but to know that god was good and fair and kind heartily i mean not half ways and with ifs and buts my boy there would be nothing left to be miserable about in a momentary flash of thought robert wondered whether this might not be his old friend the repentant angel sent to earth as a man that he might have a share in the redemption and work out his own salvation and from this very moment the thoughts about god that had hitherto been moving in formless solution in his mind began slowly to crystallize the next day eric ericson not without a piece in a pouch and money in another took his way home if home it could be called where neither father mother brother nor sister awaited his return for a season robert saw him no more as often as his name was mentioned miss letty's eyes would grow hazy and as often she would make some comical remark poor fellow she would say he was over long-legged for this world or again ay he was a brow child but he cannot live his feet are small or yet again saw ye ever such a gowk to make such a work about sitting down and having his feet washed as if that cost a body anything End, chapter fifteen Book One, Chapter Sixteen of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Chapter Sixteen Mr. Lammy's Farm. One of the first warm mornings in the beginning of summer, the boy woke early and lay awake, as was his custom, thinking. The sun, in all the indescribable purity of its morning light, had kindled a spot of brilliance just about where his granny's head must be lying asleep in its sad thoughts on the opposite side of the partition. He lay looking at the light. There came a gentle tapping at his window, a long streamer of honeysuckle not yet in blossom, but alive with the life of the summer, was blown by the air of the morning against his window pane, as if calling him to get up and look out he did get up and look out but he started back in such haste that he fell against the side of his bed within a few yards of his window bending over a bush was the loveliest face he had ever seen the only face in fact he had ever yet felt to be beautiful for the window looked directly into the garden of the next house its honeysuckle tapped at his window its sweet peas grew against his window sill it was the face of the angel of that night but how different when illuminated by the morning sun from then when lighted up by a chamber candle the first thought that came to him was the half ludicrous all fantastic idea of the shoemaker about his grandfather's violin being a woman a vaguest dream vision of her having escaped from his grandmother's store closet and wandering free amidst the wind and among the flowers crossed his mind before he had recovered sufficiently from his surprise to prevent fancy from cutting any more of those two ridiculous capers in which she indulged at will and sleep and as often besides as she could get away from the spectacles of old granny judgment but the music of her revelation was not that of the violin and robert vaguely felt this though he searched no further for a fitting instrument to represent her if he had heard the organ indeed but he knew no instrument save the violin the piano he had only heard through the window for a few moments her face brooded over the bush and her long finely modelled fingers travelled about it as if they were creating a flower upon it probably they were assisting the birth or blowing of some beauty and then she raised herself with a lingering look and vanished from the field of the window but ever after this when the evening grew dark robert would steal out of the house leaving his book open by his granny's lamp that its patient expansion might seem to say he will come back presently and dart round the corner with quick quiet step to hear if miss st john was playing if she was not he would return to the sabbath stillness of the parlour where his grandmother sat meditating or reading and shargar sat brooding over the freedom of the old days ere miss falconer had begun to reclaim him there he would seat himself once more at his book to rise again ere another hour had gone by and hearken yet again at her window whether the 
stream might not be flowing now. If he found her at her instrument, he would stand listening in earnest delight, until the fear of being missed drove him in. This secret, too, might be discovered, and this enchantress, too, sent by the decree of his grandmother into the limbo of vanities. Thus strangely did his evening life oscillate between the two peaceful negations of Granny's parlour and the vital gladness of the unknown lady's window. And skilfully did he manage his retreats and returns, curtaining his absences with such moderation that, for a long time, they awoke no suspicion in the mind of his grandmother. I suspect myself that the old lady thought he had gone to his prayers in the garret, and I believe she thought that he was praying for his dead father, with which most papistical and therefore most unchristian observance she yet dared not interfere, because she expected Robert to defend himself triumphantly with the simple assertion that he did not believe his father was dead. Possibly the mother was not sorry that her poor son should be prayed for, in case he might be alive after all, though she could no longer do so herself. Not merely dared not, but persuaded herself that she would not. Robert, however, was convinced enough, and hopeless enough, by this time, and had even less temptation to break the twentieth commandment by praying for the dead than his grandmother had, for with all his imaginative outgoings after his father, his love to him was as yet compared to that father's mother's, as moonlight unto sunlight and as water unto wine. Shargar would glance up at him with a queer look as he came in from these excursions, drop his head over his task again, look busy and miserable, and all would glide on as before. When the first really summer weather came, Mr. Lammy one day paid Mrs. Falconer a second visit. He had not been able to get over the remembrance of the desolation in which he had left her. But he could do nothing for her, he thought, till it was warm weather. He was accompanied by his daughter, a woman approaching the further verge of youth, bulky and florid, and as full of tenderness as her large frame could hold. After much, and, for a long time, apparently useless persuasion, they at last believed they had prevailed upon her to pay them a visit for a fortnight. But she had only retreated within another of her defences. I cannot leave thy twa laddies alone. They would be up to a mischief. "'There's Betty to look after them,' suggested Miss Lammy. "'Betty,' returned Mrs. Falconer with scorn. "'Betty's naething but a bairn herself, muckler and worse favoured. "'But what for should not ye fest the lads with ye?' suggested Mr. Lammy. "'I have no right to burden you with them.' "'Well, I have often wondered what made ye burden yourself with that Shargar, "'as I understand they call him,' said Mr. Lammy. "'Just nothing but a bit of greed,' returned the old lady, with the nearest approach to a smile that had shown itself upon her face since Mr. Lammy's last visit. "'I did not understand that, Mistress Faulkner,' said Miss Lammy. "'I'm so sure of having it back again, you can, with interest,' returned Mrs. Falconer. "'Who's that? His father will not con ye any thanks for holding him in life.' "'He that giveth to the poor lendeth to the Lord, you know, Miss Lammy.' At will, if you like to lip into that bank, may do it I will, or another, it'll go on to your account, said Miss Lammy. It would ill become us any way, said her father, nay to give him shelter for your sake, Mrs. Faulkner, not to mention other names, since it's your will to make the poor lad on of the family. They say his own mother's run away and left him. Deed, she's done that. Can you make anything of him? He's quiet enough, and Robert says he does nae doubt ill at the school. Well, just fess him with ye. We'll have some place or other to put him until, if it should be only a shake doon upon the floor. Nay, nay, there's the schoolin'. What's to be done with that? They can go on in the morning and get their dinner with Betty here, and sign come home to their four o'clock tea when the school's o'er in the afternoon. Indeed, ma'am, ye maun just come for the sake of the old friendship between the families. Well, if it maun be so, it maun be so, yielded Mrs. Falconer with a sigh. She had not left her own house for a single night for ten years. 
nor is it likely she would have now given in for immovableness was one of the most marked of her characteristics had she not been so broken by mental suffering that she did not care much about anything least of all about herself innumerable were the instructions in propriety of behaviour which she gave the boys in prospect of this visit the probability being that they would behave just as well as at home these instructions were considerably unnecessary for mrs falconer was a strict enforcer of all social rules scarcely less unnecessary were the directions she gave as to the conduct of betty who received them all in erect submission with her hands under her apron she ought to have been a young girl instead of an elderly woman if there was any propriety in the way her mistress spoke to her it proved at least her own belief in the description she had given of her to miss lammie no betty ye maun be quiet and do not stand at the door in the gloamin and do not stand clakin and jawin with the other lasses when ye go on to the wall for water and when ye go on until a chop do not have them sayin ahind your back as soon as you're out again she's her own mistress by way of our such like and mind ye have worship with yourself when i'm nae here to have it with ye ye can come to the parlour if ye like and there's my muckle testament and do not give the lads anything they want give them plenty to eat but nor over muckle folks should i leave off with an appetite mr lammie brought his gig at last and took granny away to body fauld when the boys returned from school at the dinner hour it was to exult in a freedom which robert had never imagined before but even he could not know what a relief it was to shargar to eat without the awfully calm eyes of mrs falconer watching as it seemed to him the progress of every mouthful down that capacious throat of his the old lady would have been shocked to learn how the imagination of the ill-mothered lad interpreted her care over him but she would not have been surprised to know that the two were merry in her absence she knew that in some of her own moods it would be a relief to think that the awful eye of god was not upon her but she little thought that even in the lawless proceedings about to follow her robert who now felt such a relief in her absence would be walking straight on though blindly towards a sunrise of faith in which he would know that for the eye of his god to turn away from him for one moment would be the horror of the outer darkness merriment however was not in robert's thoughts and still less was mischief for the latter whatever his grandmother might think he had no capacity the world was already too serious and was soon to be too beautiful for mischief after that it would be too sad and then finally until death too solemn glad the moment he heard of his grandmother's intended visit one wild hope and desire and intent had arisen within him when betty came to the parlour door to lay the cloth for their dinner she found it locked open the door she cried but cried in vain from impatience she passed to passion but it was no avail there came no more response than from the shrine of the death veil for to the boys it was an opportunity not at any risk to be lost dull betty never suspected what they were about they were ranging the place like two tiger cats whose whelps had been carried off in their absence questing with nose to earth and tail in the air for the scent of their enemy my simile has carried me too far it was only a dead old gentleman's violin that a couple of boys were after but with what eagerness and on the part of robert what alternations of hope and fear and shargar was always the reflex of robert so far as shargar could reflect robert sometimes robert would stop stand still in the middle of the room cast a mathematical glance of survey over its cubic contents and then dart off in another inwardly suggested direction of search shargar on the other hand appeared to rummage blindly without a notion of casting the illumination of thought upon the field of search yet to him fell the success when hope was growing dim after an hour and a half of vain endeavour a scream of utter discordance heralded the resurrection of the lady of harmony taught by his experience of his wild mother's habits to guess at those of quiet mrs falconer shargar had found the instrument in her bed at the foot between the feathers and the mattress for one happy moment shargar was the benefactor and robert the grateful recipient of favour nor i do believe was this thread of the still thickening cable that bound them ever forgotten broken it could not be 
Robert drew the recovered treasure from its concealment, opened the case with trembling eagerness, and was stooping, with one hand on the neck of the violin and the other on the bow, to lift them from it when Shargar stopped him. His success had given him such dignity that for once he dared to act from himself. "'Betty'll hear ye,' he said. "'What care I for Betty? She dare not tell. I know who to manage her. But would not it be better at she did not know?' She's sure to find out when she makes the bed. She turns o'er and o'er just like a muckle dog were in a rat. Devil a bit of hers be a hour wiser. You did not play tunes upon the boxy man. Robert caught at the idea. He lifted the bonny laddie from her coffin, and while he was absorbed in the contemplation of her risen beauty, Shargar laid his hands on Boston's fourfold state, the torment of his life on the Sunday evenings, which it was his turn to spend with Mrs. Falconer, and threw it as an offering to the powers of Hades into the case, which he then buried carefully with the feather-bed for mould, the blankets for sod, and the counterpane studiously arranged for stone over it. He took heed, however, not to let Robert know of the substitution of Boston for the fiddle, because he knew Robert could not tell a lie. Therefore, when he murmured over the volume some of its own words, which he had read the preceding Sunday, it was in quite inaudible whisper. Now is it good for nothing but to cumber the ground, and furnish fuel for Tophet. Robert must now hide the violin better than his granny had done, while at the same time it was a more delicate necessity, seeing it had lost its shell, and he shrunk from putting her in the power of the shoemaker again. It cost him much trouble to fix on the place that was least unsuitable. First he put it into the well of the clock case, but instantly bethought him what the awful consequence would be if one of the weights should fall from the gradual decay of its cord. He had heard of such a thing happening. Then he would put it into his own place of dreams and meditations. But what if Betty should take a fancy to change her bed, or some friend of his granny's should come to spend the night? How would the bonny lady like it? What a risk she would run! If you put her under the bed, the mice would get at her strings, nay, perhaps gnaw a hole right through her beautiful body. On the top of the clock, the brass eagle with outspread rings might scratch her, and there was not space to conceal her. At length he concluded, wrapped her in a piece of paper, and placed her on the top of the chintz tester of his bed, where there was just room between it and the ceiling. That would serve till he bore her to some better sanctuary. In the meantime she was safe, and the boy was the blessedest boy in creation. These things done, they were just in the humour to have a lark with Betty. So they unbolted the door, rang the bell, and when Betty appeared red-faced and wrathful, asked her very gravely and politely whether they were not going to have some dinner before they went back to school. They had now but twenty minutes left. Betty was so dumbfoundered with their impudence that she could not say a word. She did make haste with the dinner, though, and revealed her indignation only in her manner of putting the things on the table. As the boys left her, Robert contented himself with the single hint. Betty's body falls in the Paris of Kettledrum. Mind ye that. Betty glowered and said nothing. But the delight of the walk of three miles over hill and dale and moor and farm to Mr. Lammy's. The boys, if not as wild as colts, that is, as wild as most boys would have been, were only the more deeply excited. That first summer walk with the goal before them in all the freshness of the perfecting year was something which to remember in after days was to Falconer nothing short of ecstasy. The westering sun threw long shadows before them as they trudged away eastward, lightly laden with the books needful for the morrow's lessons, once beyond the immediate purlieus of the town and the various plots of land occupied by its inhabitants they crossed a small river and entered upon a region of little hills some covered to the top with trees chiefly larch others cultivated and some bearing only heather now nursing in secret its purple flame for the outburst of the autumn the road wound between now swampy and worn into deep ruts now sandy and broken with large stones down to its edge would come the dwarfed oak, or the mountain ash, or the silver birch, single and small, but lovely and fresh, and now green fields fenced with walls of earth as green as themselves, 
or of stones overgrown with moss, would stretch away on both sides, sprinkled with busily feeding cattle. Now they would pass through a farm steading, perfumed with the breath of cows and the odour of burning peat, so fragrant, though not yet so grateful to the inner sense as it would be when encountered in after years and in foreign lands. For the smell of burning and the smell of earth are the deepest underlying sensuous bonds of the earth's unity, and the common brotherhood of them that dwell thereon. Now the scent of the larches would steal from the hill, or the wind would waft the odour of the white clover, beloved of his grandmother, to Robert's nostrils, and he would turn aside to pull her a handful. Then they climbed a high ridge, on the top of which spread a moorland, dreary and desolate, brightened by nothing save the canna's hoary beard, waving, and making it look even more desolate from the sympathy they felt with the forsaken grass. This cross they descended between young plantations of firs and rowan trees and birches, till they reached a warm house on the side of the slope, with farm offices and ricks of corn and hay all about it, the front overgrown with roses and honeysuckle, and a white flowering plant unseen of their eyes hitherto, and therefore full of mystery. From the open kitchen door came the smell of something good. But beyond all to Robert was the welcome of Miss Lammy, whose small fat hand closed upon his like a very love pudding, after partaking of which even his grandmother's stately reception, followed immediately by the words, New be quiet, could not chill the warmth in his bosom. I know but one writer whose pen would have been able worthily to set forth the delights of the first few days at Bodyfold, John Paul. Nor would he have disdained to make the gladness of a country schoolboy the theme of that pen. Indeed, often has he done so. If the writer has any higher purpose than the amusement of other boys, he will find the life of a country boy richer for his ends than that of a town boy. For example, he has a deeper sense of the marvel of nature, a tenderer feeling of her feminality. I do not mean that the other cannot develop this sense, but it is generally feeble, and there is consequently less chance of it surviving. As far as my experience goes, town girls and country boys love nature most. I have known town girls love her as passionately as country boys. Town boys have too many books and pictures. They see nature in mirrors, invaluable privilege, after they know herself, not before. They have greater opportunity of observing human nature, but here also the books are too many and various. They are cleverer than country boys, but they are less profound. Their observation may be quicker, their perception is shallower. They know better what to do on an emergency, they know worse how to order their ways. Of course, in this, as in a thousand other matters, nature will burst out laughing in the face of the would-be philosopher, and bringing forward her town boy will say, Look here. For the town boys are nature's boys after all, at least so long as doctrines of self-preservation and ambition have not turned them from children of the kingdom into dirt-worms. But I must stop, for I am getting up to the neck in a bog of discrimination. As if I did not know the nobility of some townspeople, compared with the worldliness of some country folk. I give it up. We are all good and all bad. God mend all. Nothing will do for Jew or Gentile, Frenchman or Englishman, Negro or Circassian, town boy or country boy, but the kingdom of heaven which is within him and must come thence to the outside of him. To a boy like Robert, the changes of every day, from country to town, with the gay morning from the town to the country with the sober evening for country as rotherden might be to edinburgh much more was body fault contrary to rotherden were a source of boundless delight instead of houses he saw the horizon instead of streets or walled gardens he roamed over fields bathed in sunlight and wind here it was good to get up before the sun for then he could see the sun get up and of all things those evening shadows lengthening out over the grassy wilderness, for fields of a very moderate size appeared, such to an imagination, ever ready at the smallest hint to ascend its solemn throne, were a deepening marvel. Town to country is what a ceiling is to a Salem. End chapter 16
one chapter seventeen of robert falconer by george macdonald this librivox recording is in the public domain robert falconer by george macdonald chapter seventeen adventures granny's first action every evening the moment the boys entered the room was to glance up at the clock that she might see whether they had arrived in reasonable time this was not pleasant because it admonished robert how impossible it was for him to have a lesson on his own violin so long as the visit to bodyfold lasted if they had only been allowed to sleep at rothaden what a universe of freedom would have been theirs as it was he had but two hours to himself paired at both ends in the middle of the day Dual Sanny might have given him a lesson at that time, but he did not dare to carry his instrument through the streets of Rothaden, for the proceeding would be certain to come to his grandmother's ears. Several days passed, indeed, before he made up his mind as to how he was to reap any immediate benefit from the recovery of the violin, for after he had made up his mind to run the risk of successive midday solos in the old factory, he was not prepared to carry the instrument through the streets, or be seen entering the place with it but the factory lay at the opposite corner of a quadrangle of gardens the largest of which belonged to itself and the corner of this garden touched the corner of captain forsyth's which had formerly belonged to andrew falconer he had had a door made in the walls at the point of junction so that he could go from his house to his business across his own property if this door were not hooked and robert could pass without offence what a northwest passage it would be for him the little garden belonging to his grandmother's house had only a slight wooden fence to divide it from the other and even in this fence there was a little gate he would only have to run along captain forsyth's top walk to reach the door the blessed thought came to him as he lay in his bed at bodyfold he would attempt the passage the very next day with his violin in its paper under his arm he sped like a hare from gate to door found it not even latched only pushed to and rusted into such rest as it was dangerous to the hinges to disturb he opened it however without any accident and passed through then closing it behind him took his way more leisurely through the tangled grass of his grandmother's property when he reached the factory he judged it prudent to search out a more secret nook one more full of silence, that is, whence the sounds would be less certain to reach the ears of the passers-by, and came upon a small room near the top, which had been the manager's bedroom, and which, as he judged from what seemed the signs of ancient occupation, a cloak hanging on the wall and the ashes of a fire lying in the grate, nobody had entered for years. It was the safest place in the world. He undid his instrument carefully, tuned its strings tenderly and soon found that his former facility such as it was had not ebbed away beyond recovery hastening back as he came he was just in time for his dinner and narrowly escaped encountering betty in the trance he had been tempted to leave the instrument but no one could tell what might happen and to doubt would be to be miserable with anxiety he did the same for several days without interruption not however without observation when returning from his fourth visit he opened the door between the gardens he started back in dismay for there stood the beautiful lady robert hesitated for a moment whether to fly or speak he was a lowland country boy and therefore rude of speech but he was three parts a celt and those who know the address of the irish or the highlanders know how much that involves as to manners and bearing he advanced the next instant and spoke i beg your pardon mem i thought naebody would see me i have not done na ill i had not the least suspicion of it i assure you returned miss st john but tell me what makes you go through here always at the same hour with the same parcel under your arm you will not tell naebody will ye mem if i tell you miss st john amused and interested besides in the contrast between the boy's oddly noble face and good bearing on the one hand and on the other the drawl of his bluntly articulated speech and the coarseness of his tone both seeming to her in the extreme of provincialism promised 
and robert entranced by all the qualities of her voice and speech and nothing disenchanted by the nearer view of her lovely face confided in her at once you see ma'am he said i came upon my grandfather's fiddle but my grandmother thinks the fiddle is no good and say she took and she had it but i found it again and i dar not play it in the hoose though my granny's in the country for betty hearin me and tellin her and so i go on to the old factory there it belongs to my granny and so does the garden and this hoose and yard was once my father's and so he had that door through they tell me and i thought if i should be open it would be a fine thing for me to hold folk on seeing me but it was very ill-bred to you ma'am i can to come through your yard on spirit leave i beg your pardon ma'am and i'll just go on back and ruin by the road this is my fiddle i have aneath my arm bud to put back the case of it war it was afore my granny's bed to hold her on kent as she had tint the grup of it certainly miss st john could not have understood the half of the words robert used but she understood his story notwithstanding herself an enthusiast in music her sympathies were at once engaged for the awkward boy who was thus trying to steal an entrance into the fairy halls of sound but she forbore any further allusion to the violin for the present and contented herself with assuring robert that he was hardly welcome to go through the garden as often as he pleased she accompanied her words with a smile that made robert feel not only that she was the most beautiful of all princesses in fairy tales but that she had presented him with something beyond price in the most self-denying manner he took off his cap thanked her with much heartiness if not with much polish and hastened to the gate of his grandmother's little garden a few years later an encounter might have spoiled his dinner i have to record no such evil result of the adventure with miss st john music was the highest form of human expression as must often be the case with those whose feeling is much in advance of their thought and to whom therefore what may be called mental sensation is the highest known condition music to such is poetry in solution and generates that infinite atmosphere common to both musician and poet which the latter fills with shining worlds but if my reader wishes to follow out for himself the idea here and suggested he must be careful to make no confusion between those who feel musically or think poetically and the musician or the poet one who can only play the music of others however exquisitely is not a musician any more than one who can read verse to the satisfaction or even expound it to the enlightenment of the poet himself is therefore a poet when miss st john would worship god it was in music that she found the chariot of fire in which to ascend heavenward hence music was the divine thing in the world for her and to find any one loving music humbly and faithfully was to find a brother or sister believer but she had been so often disappointed in her expectations from those she took to be such that of late she had become less sanguine still there was something about this boy that roused once more her musical hopes and however she may have restrained herself from the full indulgence of them certain it is that the next day when she saw robert pass this time leisurely along the top of the garden she put on her bonnet and shawl and allowing him time to reach his den followed him in the hope of finding out whether or not he could play i do not know what proficiency the boy had attained very likely not much for a man can feel the music of his own bow or of his own lines long before any one else can discover it he had already made a path not exactly worn one but trampled one through the neglected grass and miss st john had no difficulty in finding his entrance to the factory she felt a little eerie as robert would have called it when she passed into the waste silent place for besides the wasteness and the silence motionless machines have a look of death about them at least when they bear such signs of disuse as those that filled these rooms hearing no violin she waited for a while in the ground floor of the building but still hearing nothing she ascended to the first floor here likewise all was silent she hesitated but at length ventured up the next stair beginning however to feel a little troubled as well as eerie the silence was so obstinately persistent was it possible that there was no violin in that brown paper 
but that boy could not be a liar passing shelves piled up with the stores of old thread she still went on led by a curiosity stronger than her gathering fear at last she came to a little room the door of which was open and there she saw robert lying on the floor with his head in a pool of blood now mary st john was both brave and kind and therefore though not insensible to the fact that she too must be in danger where violence had been used to a boy she set about assisting him at once his face was death-like but she did not think he was dead she drew him out into the passage for the room was close and did all she could to recover him but for some time he did not even breathe at last his lips moved and he murmured sandy sandy you've broken my bonny leddy then he opened his eyes and seeing a face to dream about bending in kind consternation over him closed them again with a smile and a sigh as if to prolong his dream the blood now came fast into his forsaken cheeks and began to flow again from the wound in his head the lady bounded up with her handkerchief after a little he rose though with difficulty and stared wildly about him saying with imperfect articulation father father then he looked at miss st john with a kind of dazed inquiry in his eyes tried several times to speak and could not can you walk at all asked miss st john supporting him for she was anxious to leave the place yes ma'am we will enough he answered come along then i will help you home nay nay he said as if he had just recalled something do not mind me run home ma'am or he'll see ye who will see me robert stared more wildly put his hand to his head and made no reply she half led half supported him down the stairs as far as the first landing when he cried out in a tone of anguish my bonny laddie what is it asked miss st john thinking he meant her my fiddle my fiddle she'll be all in bits he answered and turned to go up again sit down here said miss st john and i'll fetch it though not without some tremor she darted back to the room then she turned faint for the first time but determinedly supporting herself she looked about saw a brown paper parcel on a shelf took it and hurried out with a shudder robert stood leaning against the wall he stretched out his hands eagerly give me her give me her you had better let me carry it you are not able nay nay ma'am you did not ken who easy she is to hurt oh yes i do returned miss st john smiling and robert could not withstand the smile we'll take care of her as you would of your own self ma'am he said yielding he was now much better and before he had been two minutes in the open air insisted that he was quite well when they reached captain forsyth's garden he again held out his hands for his violin no no said his new friend you wouldn't have betty see you like that would you no ma'am but i'll put in the fiddle at my own window and she shall not have a chance of seeing it answered robert not understanding her for though he felt a good deal of pain he had no idea what a dreadful appearance he presented don't you know that you have a wound on your head asked miss st john nay have i said robert putting up his hand but i'm on gone there's nae help for it he added if i could only win to my own room on betty seen me eh ma'am i have spoiled all your bonny goon that's a sore vex never mind it returned miss st john smiling it is of no consequence but you must come with me i must see what i can do for your head poor boy eh ma'am but you are kind if you speak like that you'll gar me great naebody ever spake to me like that afore maybe you knew my mamma you're so like her this word mamma was the only remnant of her that lingered in his speech had she lived he would have spoken very differently they were now walking towards the house no i did not know your mamma is she dead long sign ma'am and so they tell me is yours yes and my father too your father is alive i hope robert made no answer miss st john turned 
The boy had a strange look, and seemed struggling with something in his throat. She thought he was going to faint again, and hurried him into the drawing-room. Her aunt had not yet left her room, and her uncle was out. "'Sit down,' she said so kindly, and Robert sat down on the edge of a chair. Then she left the room, but presently returned with a little brandy. "'There,' she said, offering the glass, "'that will do you good.' "'What is it, ma'am?' brandy there's water in it of course i dare not touch it granny could not abide me to touch it so determined was he that miss st john was forced to yield perhaps he wondered that the boy who would deceive his grandmother about a violin should be so immovable in regarding her pleasure in the matter of a needful medicine but in this fact i begin to see the very falconer of my manhood's worship eh ma'am if you would play something upon her he resumed, pointing to the piano, which, although he had never seen one before, he at once recognized by some hidden mental operation as the source of the sweet sounds heard at the window. It would do me more good than a whole bottle of brandy or whisky either. "'How do you know that?' asked Miss St. John, proceeding to sponge the wound. "'Cause many's the time I have stood out there in the street hearkening. Double Sanny says that you play just as if you were my grandfather's fiddle herself, turned into the bonniest crater ever God made. How did you get such a terrible cut? She had removed the hair and found that the injury was severe. The boy was silent. She glanced round in his face. He was staring as if he saw nothing, heard nothing. She would try again. Did you fall, or how did you cut your head? Yes, yes, ma'am, I fell, he answered hastily, with an air of relief, and possibly with some tone of gratitude for the suggestion of a true answer. What made you fall? Utter silence again. She felt a kind of turn. I do not know another word to express what I mean. The boy must have fits, and either could not tell or was ashamed to tell what had befallen him. Thereafter she too was silent, and Robert thought she was offended. Possibly he felt a change in the touch of her fingers. Ma'am, I would like to tell you, he said, but I dar not. Oh, never mind, she returned kindly. Would you promise nae to tell naebody? I don't want to know, she answered, confirmed in her suspicion and at the same time ashamed of the alteration of feeling which the discovery had occasioned. An uncomfortable silence followed, broken by Robert. If you be not pleased with me, ma'am, he said, I cannot bide you to go on with sicken a job as that. How Miss St. John could have understood him, I cannot think, but she did. Oh, very well, she answered, smiling, just as you please. Perhaps you had better take this piece of plaster to Betty and ask her to finish the dressing for you. Robert took the plaster mechanically, and, sick at heart and speechless, rose to go forgetting even his bonny laddie in his grief. "'You had better take your violin with you,' said Miss St. John, urged to the cruel experiment by a strong desire to see what the strange boy would do. He turned. The tears were streaming down his odd face. They went to her heart, and she was bitterly ashamed of herself. "'Come along, do sit down again. I only wanted to see what you would do. I am very sorry.' she said in a tone of kindness such as Robert had never imagined. He sat down instantly, saying, "'Eh, hey, ma'am, it's sore to bide,' meaning, no doubt, the conflict between his inclination to tell her all and his duty to be silent. The dressing was soon finished, his hair combed down over it, and Robert looking once more respectable. "'Now I think that will do,' said his nurse. "'Eh, hey, thank you, ma'am,' answered Robert, rising." When I'm able to play upon the fiddle as well as ye play upon the piano, I'll come and play at your window ilka night as long as ye like to hearken. She smiled, and he was satisfied. He did not dare again ask her to play to him, but she said of herself, Now I will play something to you, if you like, and he resumed his seat devoutly. When she had finished the lovely little air, which sounded to Robert like the touch of her hands, and her breath on his forehead. She looked round, and was satisfied from the rapt expression of the boy's countenance, 
that at least he had plenty of musical sensibility. As if despoiled of volition, he stood motionless till she said, Now you had better go, or Betty will miss you. Then he made her a bow in which awkwardness and grace were curiously mingled, and, taking up his precious parcel and holding it to his bosom, as if it had been a child for whom he felt an access of tenderness, he slowly left the room in the house. Not even to Shargar did he communicate his adventure, and he went no more to the deserted factory to play there. Fate had again interposed between him and his bonny lady. When he reached Bodyfold, he fancied his grandmother's eyes more watchful of him than usual, and he strove the more to resist the weariness and even faintness that urged him to go to bed. Whether he was able to hide as well a certain trouble that clouded his spirit, I doubt. His wound he did manage to keep a secret, thanks to the care of Miss St. John, who had dressed it with court plaster. When he woke the next morning, it was with the consciousness of having seen something strange the night before, and only when he found that he was not in his own room at his grandmother's was he convinced that it must have been a dream and no vision. For in the night he had awaked there, as he thought, and the moon was shining with such clearness that although it did not shine into his room, he could see the face of the clock and that the hands were both together at the top. Close by the clock stood the bureau, with its end against the partition forming the head of his granny's bed. All at once he saw a tall man in a blue coat and bright buttons about to open the lid of the bureau. The same moment he saw a little elderly man in a brown coat and a brown wig by his side who sought to remove his hand from the lock. Next appeared a huge stalwart figure in shabby old tartans and laid his hand on the head of each. But the wonder widened and grew, for now came a stately highlander with his broadsword by his side and an eagle's feather in his bonnet, who laid his hand on the other highlander's arm. When Robert looked in the direction whence this had appeared, the head of his granny's bed had vanished, and a wild hillside covered with stones and heather sloped away into the distance. Over it passed man after man, each with an ancestral air, while on the grey sea to the left galleys covered with Norsemen tore up the white foam and dashed one after the other up to the strand. How long he gazed he did not know, but when he withdrew his eyes from the extended scene, there stood the figure of his father, still trying to open the lid of the bureau, his grandfather resisting him, the blind piper with his hand on the head of both, and the stately chief with his hand on the piper's arm. Then a mist of forgetfulness gathered over the hall, till at last he awoke and found himself in the little wooden chamber at Bodyfold, and not in the visioned room. Doubtless his loss of blood the day before had something to do with the dream or vision, whichever the reader may choose to consider it. He rose, and after a good breakfast found himself very little the worse, and forgot all about his dream, till a circumstance which took place not long after recalled it vividly to his mind. The enchantment of body falls soon wore off. The boys had no time to enter into the full enjoyment of country ways, because of those weary lessons over the getting of which Mrs. Falconer kept as strict a watch as ever, while to Robert the evening journey, his violin, and Miss St. John left at Rotherden, grew more than tame. The return was almost as happy an event to him as the first going. Now he could resume his lessons with the shoemaker. With Shargar it was otherwise. The freedom for so much longer from Mrs. Falconer's eyes was in itself so much of a positive pleasure that the walk twice a day, the fresh air, and the scents and sounds of the country only came as supplementary. But I do not believe the boy even then had so much happiness as when he was beaten and starved by his own mother. And Robert, growing more and more absorbed in his own thoughts and pursuits, paid him less and less attention as the weeks went on, till Shargar at length judged it for a time an evil day on which he had first slept under old Ronald Falconer's kilt. End Chapter 17「Book One, Chapter Eighteen of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Chapter eighteen. Nature puts in a claim. Before the day of return arrived, Robert had taken care to remove the violin from his bedroom and carry it once more to its old retreat in Shargar's garret. The very first evening, however, that Granny again spent in her own armchair, he hid from the house as soon as it grew dusk and made his way with his brown paper parcel to Sandy L. Shender's. Entering the narrow passage from which his shop door opened, and hearing him hammering away at his soul, he stood and unfolded his treasure, then drew a low sigh from her with his bow, and awaited the result. He heard the lapstone fall thundering on the floor, and like a spider from his cavern, Dubal Sani appeared in the door with the bend leather in one hand and the hammer in the other. "'Lord's sake, man, have you gotten her again? Give us a grup of her,' he cried, dropping leather and hammer. "'Na, na, returned Robert, retreating towards the outer door. "'Ye mount swear upon her that when I want her, I shall have her on demur, or I shall not let ye lay Rosette upon her. I swear it, Robert, I swear it upon her, said the shoemaker hurriedly, stretching out both his hands as if to receive some human being into his embrace. Robert placed the violin in those grimy hands. A look of heavenly delight dawned over the hirsute and dirt besmeared countenance which drooped into tenderness as he drew the bow across the instrument, and wild from her a thin wail as of sorrow at their long separation. He then retreated into his den, and was soon sunk in a trance, deaf to everything but the violin, from which no entreaties of Robert, who longed for a lesson, could rouse him, so that he had to go home grievously disappointed and unrewarded for the risk he had run in venturing the stolen visit. Next time, however, he fared better, and he contrived so well that, from the middle of June to the end of August, he had two lessons a week, mostly upon the afternoon of holidays. For these his master thought himself well paid by the use of the instrument between, and Robert made great progress. Occasionally he saw Miss St. John in the garden, and once or twice met her in the town, but her desire to find in him a pupil had been greatly quenched by her unfortunate conjecture as to the cause of his accident. She had, however, gone so far as to mention the subject to her aunt, who assured her that old Mrs. Falconer would as soon consent to his being taught gambling as music. The idea, therefore, passed away, and beyond a kind word or two when she met him, there was no further communication between them. But Robert would often dream of waking from a swoon, and finding his head lying on her lap, and her lovely face bending over him full of kindness and concern. By the way, Robert cared nothing for poetry. Virgil was too troublesome to be enjoyed, and in English he had met with nothing but the dried leaves and gum flowers of the last century. Miss Letty once lent him the Lady of the Lake, but before he had read the first canto through, his grandmother laid her hands upon it, and without saying a word dropped it behind a loose skirting board in the pantry where the mice soon made it a ruin sad to behold. For Miss Letty, having heard from the woeful Robert of its strange disappearance, and guessing its cause, applied to Mrs. Falconer for the volume, who forthwith, with tongs aiding, extracted it from its hole, and without shade of embarrassment held it up like a drowned kitten before the eyes of Miss Letty, intending thereby, no doubt, to impress her with the fate of all seducing spirits that should attempt an entrance into her kingdom. Miss Letty only burst into merry laughter over its fate, so the load of poetry failed for the present from Robert's life. Nor did it matter much, for had he not his violin? I have, I think, already indicated that his grandfather had been a linen manufacturer. Although that trade had ceased, his family had still retained the bleachery belonging to it, commonly called the bleach field, devoting it now to the service of those large calico manufacturers which had ruined the trade in linen and to the whitening of such yarn as the country housewives still spun at home and the webs they got woven of it in private looms to robert and shargar it was a wondrous pleasure when the pile of linen which the week had accumulated at the office under the gale room was on saturday heaped high upon the base of a broad-wheeled cart to get up on it and be carried to the said bleach field 
which lay along the bank of the river. Soft laid and high born, gazing into the blue sky, they traversed the streets in a holiday triumph. And although once arrived the manager did not fail to get some labour out of them, yet the store of amusement was endless. The great wheel which drove the whole machinery, the plash mill, or more properly, walk mill, a word Robert derived from the resemblance of the mallets to two huge feet and of their motion to walking, with the water plashing and squirting from the blows of their heels, the beetles thundering in the arpeggio upon the huge cylinder round which the white cloth was wound. Each was haunted in its turn and season. The pleasure of the water itself was inexhaustible. Here sweeping in a mass along the race, there divided into branches and hurrying through the walls of the various houses. Here sliding through a wooden channel across the floor to fall into the river in a half-concealed cataract, there bubbling up through the bottom of a huge wooden cave or vat, there resting placid in another, here gurgling along a spout, there flowing in a narrow canal through the green expanse of the well-mown bleach field, or lifted from it in narrow curved wooden scoops, like fairy canoes with long handles and flung in showers over the outspread yarn. The water was an endless delight. It is strange how some individual broidery or figure upon nature's garment will delight a boy long before he has ever looked nature in the face or begun to love herself. But Robert was soon to become dimly conscious of a life within these things, a life not the less real that its operations on his mind had been long unrecognized. On the grassy bank of the gently flowing river, at the other edge of whose level the little canal squabbled along, and on the grassy brae which rose immediately from the canal, were stretched, close behind each other, with scarce a stripe of green betwixt, the long white webs of linen, fastened down to the soft, mossy ground with wooden pegs whose tops were twisted into their edges. Strangely would they billow in the wind, sometimes, like sea waves, frozen and enchanted, flat, seeking to rise and wallow in the wind with conscious depth and whelming mass. But generally they lay supine, saturated with light at its cleansing power. Falconer's jubilation in the white and green of a little boat as we lay one bright morning on the banks of the Thames, between Richmond and Twickenham, led to such a description of the bleach field that I can write about it as if I had known it myself. One Saturday afternoon, in the end of July, when the westering sun was hotter than at midday, he went down to the lower end of the field where the river was confined by a dam, and plunged from the bank into deep water. After a swim of half an hour he ascended the higher part of the field, and lay down upon a broad web to bask in the sun. In his ears was the hush rather than rush of the water over the dam, the occasional murmur of a belt of trees that skirted the border of the field, and the dull continuous sound of the beetles at their work below, like a persistent growl of thunder on the horizon. Had Robert possessed a copy of Robinson Crusoe, or had his grandmother not cast the Lady of the Lake, mistaking it for an idol, if not to the moles and the bats, yet to the mice and the black beetles, he might have been lying reading it, blind and deaf to the face and the voice of nature, and years might have passed before a response awoke in his heart. It is good that children of faculty, as distinguished from capacity, should not have too many books to read, or too much of early lessening. The increase of examinations in our country will increase its capacity and diminish its faculty. We shall have more compilers and reducers and fewer thinkers, more modifiers and completers and fewer inventors. He lay gazing up into the depth of the sky, rendered deeper and bluer by the masses of white cloud that hung almost motionless below it, until he felt a kind of bodily fear lest he should fall off the face of the round earth into the abyss. A gentle wind, laden with pine odors from the sun-heated trees behind him, flapped its light wing in his face. The humanity of the world smote his heart, the great sky towered up over him, and its divinity entered his soul. A strange longing after something, he knew not nor could name, awoke within him, followed by the pang of a sudden fear that there was no such thing as that which he sought, that it was all a fancy of his own spirit. And then the voice of Shargar broke the spell, calling to him from afar to come and see a great salmon that lay by a stone in the water. But, once aroused, the feeling was never stilled, the desire never left him. 
something growing even to a passion that was relieved only by a flood of tears. Strange as it may sound to those who have never thought of such things save in connection with Sundays and Bibles and churches and sermons, that which was now working in Falconer's mind was the first dull and faint movement of the greatest need that the human heart possesses, the need of the God-man. There must be truth in the scent of that pine wood. Someone must mean it. There must be a glory in those heavens that depends not upon our imagination. Some power greater than they must dwell in them. Some spirit must move in that wind that haunts us with a kind of human sorrow. Some soul must look up to us from the eye of that starry flower. It must be something human, else not to us divine. Little did Robert think that such was his need, that his soul was searching after one whose form was constantly presented to him, but as constantly obscured and made unlovely by the words without knowledge spoken in the religious assemblies of the land, that he was longing without knowing it on the Saturday for that from which on the Sunday he would be repelled without knowing it. Years passed before he drew nigh to the knowledge of what he sought. For weeks the mood broken by the voice of his companion did not return, though the forms of nature were henceforth full of a pleasure he had never known before. He loved the grass, the water was more gracious to him. He would leave his bed early, that he might gaze on the clouds of the east, with their borders gold-blasted with sunrise. He would linger in the fields, that the amber and purple and green and red of the sunset might not escape after the sun unseen. And as long as he felt the mystery, the revelation of the mystery lay before and not behind him. And Shargar? Had he any soul for such things? Doubtless. But how could he be other than lives behind Robert? For the latter had ancestors. That is, he came of people with a mental and spiritual history. While the former had been born the birth of an animal, of a noble sire whose family had for generations filled the earth with fire, famine, slaughter, and licentiousness, and of a wandering outcast mother who blindly loved the fields and woods, but retained her affection for her offspring scarcely beyond the period while she suckled them. The love of freedom and of wild animals that she had given him, however, was far more precious than any share his male ancestor had borne in his mental constitution. After his fashion, he as well as Robert enjoyed the sun and the wind and the water and the sky, but he had sympathies with the salmon and the rooks and the wild rabbits even stronger than those of Robert. End chapter 18book 1 chapter 19 of robert falconer by george macdonald this librivox recording is in the public domain robert falconer by george macdonald chapter 19 robert steals his own the period of the hairst play that is of the harvest holiday time drew near and over the north of Scotland thousands of half-grown hearts were beating with glad anticipation. Of the usual devices of boys to cheat themselves into the half-belief of expediting a blessed approach by marking its rate, Robert knew nothing. Even the notching of sticks was unknown at Rothenden, but he had a mode notwithstanding. Although indifferent to the games of his schoolfellows, there was one amusement, a solitary one, nearly, and therein not so good as most amusements, into which he entered with the whole energy of his nature. It was kite-flying. The moment that the hairst play approached near enough to strike its image through the eyes of his mind, Robert proceeded to make his kite, or dragon, as he called it. Of how many pleasures does pocket-money deprive the unfortunate possessor? What is the going into a shop and buying what you want, compared with the gentle delight of hours and days filled with gaining effort after the attainment of your end? Never boy that bought his kite, even if the adornment thereafter lay in his own hands, and the pictures were gorgeous with colour and gilding, could have half the enjoyment of Robert from the moment he went to the coopers to ask for an old gird or hoop, to the moment when he said, No, Shargar, and the kite rose slowly from the depth of the aerial flood. The hoop was carefully examined, the best portion cut away from it, that pair to a light strength, 
its ends confined in the proper curve by a string. And then away went Robert to the Wright's shop. There a slip of wood of proper length and thickness was readily granted to his request, free as the daisies of the field. Oh, those horrid town conditions where nothing is given for the asking, but all sold for money. In Robert's kite the only thing that cost money was the string to fly it with, and that the grandmother willingly provided, for not even her ingenuity could discover any evil, direct or implicated, in kite-flying. Indeed, I believe the old lady felt not a little sympathy with the exultation of the boy when he saw his kite far aloft, diminished to a speck in the vast blue. A sympathy, it may be, rooted in the religious aspirations which she did so much at once to rouse and to suppress in the bosom of her grandchild. But I have not yet reached the kite-flying, for I have said nothing of the kite's tail, for the sake of which principally I began to describe the process of its growth. As soon as the body of the dragon was completed, Robert attached to its spine the string which was to take the place of its caudal elongation, and at a proper distance from the body joined to the string the first of the cross pieces of folded paper which in this animal represent the continued vertebral processes. Every morning, the moment he issued from his chamber, he proceeded to the garret, where the monster lay, to add yet another joint to his tail, until at length the day should arrive when, the lessons over for a blessed eternity of five or six weeks, he would tip the hole with a piece of wood, to which grass, quantum suff, might be added from the happy fields. Upon this occasion the dragon was a monster one. With a little help from Shargar he had laid a skeleton of a six-foot specimen, and had carried the body to a satisfactory completion. The tail was still growing, having as yet only sixteen joints. When Mr. Lammy called, with an invitation for the boys to spend their holidays with him, it was fortunate for Robert that he was in the room when Mr. Lammy presented his petition, otherwise he would never have heard of it till the day of departure arrived, and would thus have lost all the delights of anticipation. In frantic effort to control his ecstasy, he sped to the garret, and with trembling hands tied the second joint of the day to the tail of the dragon, the first time he had ever broken the law of its accretion. Once broken, that law was henceforth an object of scorn, and the tail grew with frightful rapidity. It was indeed a great dragon, and none of the paltry fields about Rothaden should be honoured with its first flight. But from body falled should the majestic child of earth ascend into the regions of upper air. My reader may here be tempted to remind me that Robert had been only too glad to return to Rothaden from his former visit. But I must in my turn remind him that the circumstances were changed. In the first place the fiddle was substituted for Granny, and in the second the dragon for the school. The making of this dragon was a happy thing for Shargar, and a yet happier thing for Robert, in that it introduced again for a time some community of interest between them. Shargar was happier than he had been for many a day, because Robert used him, and Robert was yet happier than Shargar, in that his conscience, which had reproached him for his neglect of him, was now silent. But not even his dragon had turned aside his attention from his violin, and many were the consultations between the boys as to how best she might be transported to Bodyfold, where endless opportunities of holding communion with her would not be wanting. The difficulty was only how to get her clear of Rothaden. The play commenced on a Saturday, but not till the Monday were they set at liberty. Wearily the hours of mental labor and bodily torpidity, which the Scots called the Sabbath, passed away, and at length the millennial morning dawned. Robert and Shargar were up before the sun, but strenuous were the efforts they made to suppress all indications of excitement, lest Granny, fearing the immoral influence of gladness, should give orders to delay their departure for an awfully indefinite period, which might be an hour, a day, or even a week. Horrible conception! Their behavior was so decorous that not even a hinted threat escaped the lips of Mrs. Falconer. They set out three hours before noon, carrying the great kite, and Robert's school bag of green buys, full of sundries, a cart from Bodyfold was to fetch their luggage later in the day. As soon as they were clear of the houses, Shargar lay down behind a dyke with the kite, 
and Robert set off at full speed for Dubal Sanny's shop, making a half-circuit of the town to avoid the chance of being seen by Granny or Betty. Having given due warning before, he found the brown paper parcel ready for him, and carried it off in fearful triumph. He joined Shargar in safety, and they set out on their journey as rich and happy a pair of tramps as ever tramped, having six weeks of their own in their pockets to spend and not spare. A hearty welcome awaited them, and they were soon revelling in the glories of the place, the first instalment of which was in the shape of curds and cream, with oat-cake and butter, as much as they liked. After this they would, even to it like French falconers, with their kite, for the wind had been blowing bravely all the morning, having business to do with the harvest. The season of stubble not yet arrived, they were limited to the pasturage and moorland, which, however, large as their kite was, were spacious enough. Slowly the great-headed creature arose from the hands of Shargar, and ascended about twenty feet, when, as if seized with a sudden fit of wrath or fierce indignation, it turned right round and dashed itself with headlong fury to the earth, as if sooner than submit to such influences a moment longer, it would beat out its brains at once. "'It has not half tail enough,' cried Robert. "'It's queer at things will not go on up on holding them down. "'Put a good hand full of clover, Shargar. "'She's had her fall, and knew she'll go on up all right. "'She's none the worse of it.' "'Upon the next attempt, the kite rose triumphantly. "'But just as it reached the length of the string, "'it shot into a faster current of air, "'and Robert found himself first dragged along in spite of his efforts, "'and then lifted from his feet.' After carrying him a few yards, the dragon broke its string, dropped him in a ditch, and drifting away, went fluttering and waggling downwards in the distance. "'Look where she gone, Shargar,' cried Robert from the ditch. Experience coming to his aid, Shargar took landmarks of the direction in which it went, and ere long they found it with its tail entangled in the topmost branches of a hawthorn tree, and its head beating the ground at its foot. It was at once agreed that they would not fly it again till they got some stronger string. Having heard the adventure, Mr. Lammy produced a shilling from the pocket of his corduroys, and gave it to Robert to spend upon the needful string. He resolved to go to the town the next morning and make a grand purchase of the same. During the afternoon he roamed about the farm with his hands in his pockets, revolving, if not many memories, yet many questions while Shargar followed like a pup at the heels of Miss Lammy, to whom, during his former visit, he had become greatly attached. In the evening, resolved to make a confidant of Mr. Lammy, and indeed to cast himself upon the kindness of the household generally, Robert went up to his room to release his violin from its prison of brown paper. What was his dismay to find? Not his bonny laddie, but her poor cousin, the shoemaker's old wife. It was too bad. Dubal sanny indeed. He first stared, then went into a rage, and then came out of it to go into a resolution. He replaced the unwelcome fiddle in the parcel, and came downstairs gloomy and still wrathful, but silent. The evening passed over, and the inhabitants of the farmhouse went early to bed. Robert tossed about, fuming on his. He had not undressed. About eleven o'clock, after all had been still for more than an hour, he took his shoes in one hand and the brown parcel in the other, and descending the stairs like a thief, undid the quiet wooden bar that secured the door, and let himself out. All was darkness, for the moon was not yet up, and he felt a strange sensation of ghostliness in himself, awake and out of doors, when he ought to be asleep and unconscious in bed. He had never been out so late before, and felt as if walking in the region of the dead, existing when and where he had no business to exist for it was the time nature kept for her own quiet and having once put her children to bed hidden them away with the world wiped out of them and closed them in her ebony box as george herbert says she did not expect to have her hours of undress and meditation intruded upon by a venturesome schoolboy yet she let him pass he put on his shoes and hurried to the road he heard a horse stamp in the stable and saw a cat dart across the corn-yard as he went through. These were all the signs of life about the place. It was a cloudy night and still. Nothing was to be heard but his own footsteps. The cattle in the fields were all asleep. 
the larch and spruce trees on the top of the hill by the foot of which his road wound were still as clouds he could just see the sky through their stems it was washed with the faintest of light for the moon far below was yet climbing towards the horizon a star or two sparkled where the clouds broke but so little light was there that until he had passed the moorland on the hill he could not get the horror of moss holes and deep springs covered with treacherous green out of his head but he never thought of turning when the fears of the way at length fell back and allowed his own thoughts to rise the sense of a presence or of something that might grow to a presence was the first to awaken him the stillness seemed to be thinking all around his head but the way grew so dark where it lay through a corner of the pine wood that he had to feel the edge of the road with his foot to make sure that he was keeping upon it and the sense of the silence vanished then he passed a farm and the motions of horses came through the dark and a doubtful crow from a young inexperienced cock who did not yet know the moon from the sun then a sleepy low in his ears startled him and made him quicken his pace involuntarily by the time he reached rothaden all the lights were out and this was just what he wanted the economy of dubal sanny's abode was this the outer door was always left on the latch at night because several families lived in the house the shoemaker's workshop opened from the passage close to the outer door therefore its door was locked but the key hung on a nail just inside the shoemaker's bedroom all this robert knew arrived at the house he lifted the latch closed the door behind him took off his shoes once more like a housebreaker as indeed he was although a righteous one and felt his way to and up the stair to the bedroom there was a sound of snoring within the door was a little ajar he reached the key and descended his heart beating more and more wildly as he approached the realization of his hopes gently as he could he turned it in the lock in a moment more he had his hands on the spot where the shoemaker always laid his violin but his heart sank within him there was no violin there a blank of dismay held him both motionless and thoughtless nor had he recovered his senses before he heard footsteps which he well knew approaching in the street he slunk at once into a corner elshender entered feeling his way carefully and muttering at his wife he was tipsy most likely but that had never yet interfered with the safety of his fiddle robert heard its faint echo as he laid it gently down nor was he too tipsy to lock the door behind him leaving robert incarcerated amongst the old boots and leather and rosin for one moment only did the boy's heart fail him the next he was in action for a happy thought had already struck him hastily that he might forestall sleep in the brain of the shoemaker he undid his parcel and after carefully enveloping his own violin in the paper took the old wife of the shoemaker and proceeded to perform upon her a trick which in a merry moment his master had taught him and which not without some feeling of irreverence he had occasionally practised upon his own bonny laddie the shoemaker's room was overhead its thin floor of planks was the ceiling of the workshop ere dubal sanny was well laid by the side of his sleeping wife he heard a frightful sound from below as of some one tearing his beloved violin to pieces no sound of rending coffin planks or rising dead would have been so horrible in the ears of the shoemaker he sprang from his bed with a haste that shook the crazy tenement to its foundation the moment robert heard that he put the violin in its place and took his station by the door check the shoemaker came tumbling down the stair and rushed at the door but found that he had to go back for the key when with uncertain hand he had opened at length he went straight to the nest of his treasure and robert slipping out noiselessly was in the next street before dubal sanny having found the fiddle uninjured and not discovering the substitution had finished concluding that the whisky in his imagination had played him a very discourteous trick between them and retired once more to bed and not till robert had cut his foot badly with a piece of glass did he discover that he had left his shoes behind him he tied it up with his handkerchief and limped home the three miles too happy to think of consequences before he had gone far the moon floated up on the horizon large and shaped like the broad side of a barrel she stared at him in amazement to see him out at such a time of the night but he grasped his violin and went on 
He had no fear now, even when he passed again over the desolate moss, although he saw the stagnant pools glimmering about him in the moonlight. And ever after this he had a fancy for roaming at night. He reached home in safety, found the door as he had left it, and ascended to his bed, triumphant in his fiddle. In the morning bloody prints were discovered on the stair and traced to the door of his room. Miss Lammy entered in some alarm and found him fast asleep on his bed, still dressed with the brown paper parcel in his arms, and one of his feet evidently enough the source of the frightful stain. She was too kind to wake him, and inquiry was postponed till they met at breakfast, to which he descended barefooted, save for a handkerchief on the injured foot. "'Robert, my lad,' said Mr. Lammy kindly, "'who came ye by that bloody foot?' Robert began the story, and guided by a few questions from his host, at length told the tale of the violin from beginning to end, omitting only his adventure in the factory. Many a gouffoy from Mr. Lammy greeted its progress, and Miss Lammy laughed till the tears rolled unheeded down her cheeks, especially when Shargar, emboldened by the admiration Robert had awakened, imparted his private share in the comedy, namely the entombment of Boston in a fifth-fold state for the Lammies were none of the unco good to be censorious upon such exploits. The whole business advanced the boys in favour at Bodyfold, and the entreaties of Robert that nothing should reach his grandmother's ears were entirely unnecessary. After breakfast Miss Lammy dressed the wounded foot, but what was to be done for shoes, for Robert's Sunday pair had been left at home? Under ordinary circumstances it would have been no great hardship to him to go barefoot for the rest of the autumn, but the cut was rather a serious one, so his feet were cased in a pair of Mr. Lammy's Sunday boots, which from their size made it so difficult for him to get along that he did not go far from the doors, but revelled in the company of his violin in the cornyard, amongst last year's ricks, in the barn and in the hayloft, playing all the tunes he knew, and trying over one or two more from a very dirty old book of Scotch airs, which his teacher had lent him. In the evening, as they sat together after supper, Mr. Lammy said, "'Weel, Robert, who is the fiddle?' "'Fine, I thank ye, sir,' answered Robert. "'Let's hear what ye can do with it.' Robert fetched the instrument and complied. "'That's no that ill,' remarked the farmer. "'But, eh, man, ye should—' have heard your grandfather handle the bow. That was something to hear. Once in a body's life, he would have just thought the strings had been drawn from his own inside, he kent them so well, and handled them so fine. He just felt them like with his fingers through the bow, and the horsehair and all, and all the time he was drawing the sound like the soul from them, and they just did anything that he liked it. Eh, to hear him play the flures of the forest, would have guard ye great. Could my father play? asked Robert. Ay, well enough for him. He could do anything he liked it to try better nor Midland. I never saw such a man. He played upon the bagpipes and the flute and the bugle, and I cannot what all, but altogether they came now within sight of his father upon the old fiddle. Let's have a look at her. He took the instrument in his hands reverently, turned it over and over, and said, Ay, ay, it's the same old mole, and I wot it ground bonny meal. That smart creature knew it'll be worth a hundred pounds, I warrant, he added as he restored it carefully into Robert's hands, to whom it was honey and spice, to hear his bonny lady paid her due honours. Can you play the floors of the forest, new? he added yet again. Ay, can I, answered Robert with some pride, and laid the bow on the violin, and played the air through without blundering a single note. "'Weel, that's very weel,' said Mr. Lammy. "'But it's nae more like as your grandfather played it than given there were two sawyers at it, one at ilka lug of the bow with the fiddle atween them in a saw-pit.' Robert's heart sank within him, but Mr. Lammy went on. "'To hear the bow cooing and wailing and grating o'er the strings,' would have just guard ye see the lands of broad Scotland with all the lassies greeting for the lads that lay upon red flood and side. Lasses to cut and lasses to gather and lasses to bind and lasses to stook and lasses to lead and knew a lad among them all. It's just a morning of women doing men's work as well as their own, 
for the men that should have been there to do it, and I was warrant ye no word to the exceptional overall lad that did not go on with the rest. Robert had not hitherto understood it, this wail of a pastoral and ploughing people over those who had left their side to return no more from the field of battle. But Mr. Lammy's description of his grandfather's rendering laid hold of his heart. "'I would rather be grotten for nor kissed,' he said, simply. "'Hold ye to that, my lad,' returned Mr. Lammy. "'Let the lassies greet for ye, given they like, but hold oot o'er from the kissin.' I would not mail with it. Hoot, father, did not put such nonsense in the bairn's heads, said Miss Lammy. Quilk's the nonsense, Aggie, asked her father slyly. But I do it, he added. He'll never play the floors of the forest as it should be played till he's had a taste of the kissin, lass. Weel, it's a queer instructor of youth at says and on says in the same breath. Never ye mind, I have not contradicted myself yet, for I have said nothing. But, Robert, my man, ye mount pit more soul into your fiddling. Ye cannot play the fiddle till ye can gar it great. It's uncle ready to that of its own self, and it's my opinion that there is no another instrument but the fiddle fit to play the floors of the forest upon, for that very risen in all his majesty's dominions. My father played the fiddle, but no like your grandfather. Robert was silent. He spent the whole of the next morning in reiterated attempts to alter his style of playing, the air in question, but in vain, as far at least as any satisfaction to himself was the result. He laid the instrument down in despair and sat for an hour disconsolate upon the bedside. His visit had not as yet been at all so fertile in pleasure as he had anticipated. He could not fly his kite. He could not walk. He had lost his shoes. Mr. Lammy had not approved of his playing, and, although he had his will of the fiddle, he could not get his will out of it. He could never play so as to please Miss St. John. Nothing but manly pride kept him from crying. He was sorely disappointed and dissatisfied, and the world might be dreary even at body fall. Few men can wait upon the bright day in the midst of the dull one, nor can many men even wait for it. End chapter 19book 1 chapter 20 of robert falconer by george macdonald this librivox recording is in the public domain robert falconer by george macdonald chapter 20 jesse hewson the wound on robert's foot festered and had not yet healed when the sickle was first put to the barley he hobbled out, however, to the reapers, for he could not bear to be left alone with his violin. So dreadfully oppressive was the knowledge that he could not use it after its nature. He began to think whether his incapacity was not a judgment upon him for taking it away from the shoemaker, who could do so much more with it, and to whom, consequently, it was so much more valuable. The pain in his foot, likewise, had been very depressing, and but for the kindness of his friends, especially of Miss Lammy, he would have been altogether a weary white forlorn. Shargar was happier than ever he had been in his life. His white face hung on Miss Lammy's looks, and haunted her steps from storeroom to milk-house, and from milk-house to chessel, surmounted by the glory of his red hair, which a farm-servant declared he had once mistaken for a wind-bush on fire. This day she had gone to the field to see the first handful of barley cut, and Shargar was there, of course. It was a glorious day of blue and gold, with just wind enough to set the barley heads a talkin'. But whether from the heat of the sun, or the pain of his foot operating on the general discouragement under which he laboured, Robert turned faint all at once, and dragged himself away to a cottage on the edge of the field. It was the dwelling of a cotter, whose family had been settled upon the farm of Bodyfold from time immemorial. They were, indeed, like other cotters, a kind of feudal dependence, occupying an acre or two of the land, in return for which they performed certain stipulated labor, called cotter work. The greater part of the family was employed in the work of the farm, at the regular wages. 
Alas for Scotland that such families are now to seek. Would that the parliaments of our country held such a proportion of noble-minded men as was once to be found in the clay huts on a hillside or grouped about a central farm, huts whose wretched look would move the pity of many a man as inferior to their occupants as a King Charles's lapdog is to a shepherd's collie. The utensils of their life were mean enough. The life itself was often elixir vitae, a true family life, looking up to the high divine life. But well for the world that such life has been scattered over it, east and west, the seed of fresh growth in new lands. Out of offence to the individual, God brings good to the whole, for he pets no nation, but trains it for the perfect globular life of all nations, of his world, of his universe. As he makes families mingle to redeem each from its family selfishness, so will he make nations mingle and love and correct and reform and develop each other, till the planet world shall go singing through space one harmony to the God of the whole earth. The excellence must vanish from one portion, that it may be diffused through the whole. The seed ripens on one favoured mound, and is scattered over the plain. We console ourselves with the higher thought that, if Scotland is worse, the world is better. Yea, even they by whom the offence came, and who have first to reap the woe of that offence, because they did the will of God to satisfy their own avarice in laying land to land and house to house, shall not reap their punishment in having their own will, and standing therefore alone in the earth when the good of their evil deeds returns upon it. But the tears of men that ascend to heaven in the heat of their burning dwellings shall descend in the dew of blessing even on the hearts of them that kindled the fire. Something too much of this. Robert lifted the latch and walked into the cottage. It was not quite so strange to him as it would be to most of my readers. Still, he had not been in such a place before. A girl who was stooping by the small peat fire on the hearth looked up, and seeing that he was lame, came across the heights and hollows of the clay floor to meet him. Robert spoke so faintly that she could not hear. "'What's your will?' she asked, then changing her tone. "'Eh, you're no weel, she said. "'But come into the fire, take hold of me, and come your ways, boot. She was a pretty, indeed graceful girl of about eighteen, with the elasticity rather than undulation of movement which distinguishes the peasant from the city girl. She led him to the ear of the chimney, carefully levelled a wooden chair to the inequalities of the floor, and said, "'Sit ye doon, will I fess a drappy of milk?' "'Give me a drink of water, given ye please,' said Robert. She brought it. He drank and felt better. A baby woke in a cradle on the other side of the fire and began to cry. The girl went and took him up, and then Robert saw what she was like. Light brown hair clustered about a delicately coloured face and hazel eyes. Later in the harvest her cheeks would be ruddy. Now they were peach-coloured. A white neck rose above a pink print jacket called a wrapper, and the rest of her visible dress was a blue petticoat. She ended in pretty brown bare feet. Robert liked her and began to talk. If his imagination had not been already filled, he would have fallen in love with her, I dare say at once, for except Miss St. John he had never seen anything he thought so beautiful. The baby cried now and then. "'What ails the barony? he asked. "'Ow, oh, it's just cutting its teeth. Given it great smuckle, I mount just take it oot to my mother. She'll soon quiet it. Are you holding better? Put I, I'm a right new. Is your mother Sharon? Nay, nee, she's gathering. The Sharon's some sore work for her e'en now. I should have been Sharon, but my mother would fain have a day of the harst. She thought it would do her good. But I's warrant a day of it to satisfy her, and I's be at it in the morn. She's been on Ailin all the summer, and so has the barony. He might have had a sore time of it then. Ay, some. But I got some sleep. I just took the string unto the bed with me, and when the barony grate, I woke it and rock it till it fall asleep again. But whiles nothing would do but take him till his mommy. All the time she was hushing and fondling the child, who went on fretting, when not actually crying. Is he your brother, then? asked robert 
Ay, what other? I maun take him, I see. But ye can sit here as long as ye like, and gin ye go on afore I come back, just turn the key in the door to let onybody know that there's nobody in the hoose. Robert thanked her and remained in the shadow by the chimney, which was formed of two smoke-brown planks fastened up the wall, one on each side of an inverted wooden funnel above to conduct the smoke through the roof. He sat for some time gloomily gazing at a spot of sunlight which burned on the brown clay floor. All was still as death, and he felt the whitewashed walls even more desolate than if they had been smoke begrimed. Looking about him, he found over his head something which he did not understand. It was as big as the stump of a great tree. Apparently it belonged to the structure of the cottage, but he could not, in the imperfect light and the dazzling of the sunspot at which he had been staring, make out what it was or how it came to be up there, unsupported as far as he could see. He rose to examine it, lifted a bit of tarpaulin, which hung before it, and found a rickety box suspended by a rope from a great nail in the wall. It had two shelves in it full of books. Now, although there were more books in Mr. Lammy's house than in his grandmother's, the only one he had found that in the least enticed him to read was a translation of George Buchanan's History of Scotland. This he had begun to read faithfully, believing every word of it, but had at last broken down at the fiftieth king or so, Imagine then the moon that arose on the boy when, having pulled a ragged and thumb-worn book from among those of James Hewson, the cotter, he for the first time found himself in the midst of the Arabian Nights. I shrink from all attempt to set forth in words the rainbow-colored delight that coruscated in his brain. When Jessie Hewson returned, she found him seated where she had left him, so buried in his volume that he did not lift his head when she entered. "'Ye have gotten a book,' she said. "'Ay, have I,' answered Robert decisively. "'It's a fine book, that. Did you ever see it before?' "'Nay, never. "'There's three volumes of it aboot here and there,' said Jessie, and with the child on one arm she proceeded with the other hand to search for them on the top of the wall where the rafters rest." There she found two or three books, which, after examining them, she placed on the dresser beside Robert. "'There's none of them there,' she said, "'but maybe you would like to look at that ones. Robert thanked her, but was too busy to feel the least curiosity about any book in the world but the one he was reading. He read on, heart and soul and mind absorbed in the marvels of the eastern scald, the stories told in the streets of Cairo, amidst gorgeous costumes and camels, and white-veiled women vibrating here in the heart of a Scotch boy, in the darkest corner of a mud cottage, at the foot of a hill of cold loving pines, with a barefoot girl and a baby for his companion. But the pleasure he had been having was of a sort rather to expedite than to delay the subjective arrival of dinner-time. There was, however, happily, no occasion to go home in order to appease his hunger. He had but to join the men and women in the barley-field. There was sure to be enough, for Miss Lammy was at the head of the commissariat. When he had had as much milk porridge as he could eat, and a good slice of cheese with a wooden bowl of ale, all of which he consumed as if the good of them lay in the haste of their appropriation, he hurried back to the cottage and sat there reading The Arabian Nights, till the sun went down in the orange-hued west, and the gloaman came, and with it the reapers, John and Elspeth Hewson, and their son George, to their supper and early bed. John was a cheerful, rough, Roman-nosed, black-eyed man, who took snuff largely and was not careful to remove the traces of the habit. He had a loud voice and an original way of regarding things, which, with his vivacity, made every remark sound like the proclamation of a discovery. "'Are you there, Robert?' said he as he entered. Robert rose, absorbed and silent. "'He's been here all day reading like a colliginer said Jessie. "'What are you reading, say diligent, man?' asked John. "'A book of stories here,' answered Robert carelessly, shy of being supposed so much engrossed with them as he really was. "'I should never expect much of a young poet who was not rather ashamed of the distinction which yet he chiefly coveted. There is a modesty in all young delight. It is wild and shy, and would hide itself like a boy's or maiden's first love from the gaze of the people.' 
Something like this was Robert's feeling over the Arabian Nights. Ay, said John, taking snuff from a small bone spoon. It's a grand book, that. But my son Charlie, him that's dead and gone home, would have tell it ye it was idle time reading that, was such a book as that either lying at your elbow. He pointed to one of the books Jessie had taken, and laid down beside him on the well-scoured dresser. Robert took up the volume and opened it. There was no title page. The Tempest, he said. What is it? Poetry? Ay, is it? It's Shakespeare. I have heard of him, said Robert. What was he? A player kind of a chill with an uncle sight of brains, answered John. He could not have had muckle time to go on sculpin' and sornin' about the country like most of the cattle, given he wrote all that, I'm thinking. Where did he bide? Away in England, mostly about London, I'm thinking. There's the place for a by ordinary folk, they tell me. How long is it since he died? I did not ken. A hundred year or twa, as warrant. It's a long time. But I'm thinking folk then was just something like what they are new. But I ken uncle little about him, for the prince some smart, and I'm some ill for losing my characters, and so I do not win that far been with him. Geordie he, there'll tell you more about him. But George Hewson had not much to communicate, for he had but lately landed in Shakespeare's country, and had got but a little way inland yet. Nor did Robert much care, for his head was full of the Arabian Nights. This, however, was his first introduction to Shakespeare. Finding himself much at home, he stopped yet a while, shared in the supper, and resumed his seat in the corner when the book was brought out for worship. The iron lamp, with its wick of rush pith, which hung against the side of the chimney, was lighted, and John sat down to read. But as his eyes, and the print too, had grown a little dim with years, the lamp was not enough, and he asked for a fir candle. A splint of fir dug from the peat bog was handed to him. He lighted it at the lamp, and held it in his hand over the page. Its clear, resinous flame enabled him to read a short psalm. Then they sang a most wailful tune, and John prayed. If I were to give the prayer as he uttered it, I might make my reader laugh. Therefore I abstain, assuring him only that, although full of long words, amongst the rest, aspiration and ravishment, the prayer of the cheerful, joke-loving cotter contained evidence of a degree of religious development rare, I doubt, among bishops. When Robert left the cottage, he found the sky partly clouded and the air cold. The nearest way home was across the barley stubble of the day's reaping, which lay under a little hill covered with various species of the pine. His own soul, after the restful day he had spent, and under the reaction from the new excitement of the stories he had been reading, was like a quiet, moonless night. The thought of his mother came back upon him, and her written words, O oh Lord, my heart is very sore, and the thought of his father followed that, and he limped slowly home, laden with mournfulness. As he reached the middle of the field, the wind was suddenly there with a low sough from out of the northwest. The heads of barley in the sheaves leaned away with a soft rustling from before it, and Robert felt for the first time the sadness of a harvest field. Then the wind swept away to the pine-covered hill, and raised a rushing and a wailing amongst its thin-clad branches, and to the ear of Robert the trees were singing over again, in their night solitudes the air sung by the cotter's family. When he looked to the northwest whence the wind came, he saw nothing but a pale cleft in the sky. The meaning, the music of the night awoke in his soul. He forgot his lame foot and the weight of Mr. Lammy's great boots, ran home and up the stair to his own room, seized his violin with eager haste, nor laid it down again till he could draw from it at will a sound like the moaning of the wind over the stubble field. Then he knew that he could play the flowers of the forest, the wind that shakes the barley, cannot have been named from the barley after it was cut, but while it stood in the field, the flowers of the forest was of the gathered harvest. He tried the air once over in the dark, and then carried his violin down to the room where Mr. and Miss Lammy sat. I think I can play it, no, Mr. Lammy, he said abruptly. Play what, Callant? asked his host. The flowers of the forest. Play away, then. And Robert played. 
not so well as he had hoped. I dare say it was a humble enough performance, but he gave something at least of the expression Mr. Lammie desired. For the moment the tune was over, he exclaimed, "'Well done, Robert, man. You'll be a fiddler some day yet.' And Robert was well satisfied with the praise. "'I wish your mother had been alive,' the farmer went on. "'She would have been real prude to hear ye play like that, as she liketh the fiddle wheel. And she could play bonny upon the piano herself. It was something to hear the twa of them playing together, him on the fiddle, that very fiddle of his father's at ye have in your hand, and her on the piano. Eh, but she was a bonny woman as ever I saw, and that quiet. It's my belief she never thought aboot her own beaute from week's end to week's end, and that's no saying little, is it, Aggie? I never pretended only right to think about such, returned Miss Lammy with a mild indignation. That's right, lass. Odd, your eye in the right, though I say it at Sudna. Miss Lammy must indeed have been good-natured to answer only with a genuine laugh. Shargar looked explosive with anger, but Robert would fain hear more of his mother. What was my mother like, Mr. Lammy? he asked. Eh, my man, ye should have seen her upon a bonny bay mare that your father gave her. Faith, she sat as straight as a rash with just a hint in the head of her like the head of a halm of wild oats. My father was not that ill till her then, suggested Robert. Why ever dared say such a thing, returned Mr. Lammy, but in a tone so far from satisfactory to Robert that he inquired no more in that direction. I need hardly say that from that night Robert was more than ever diligent with his violin. End chapter 20book one chapter twenty one of robert falconer by george macdonald this librivox recording is in the public domain robert falconer by george macdonald chapter twenty one the dragon next day his foot was so much better that he sent shargar to rothenden to buy the string taking with him Robert's school-bag in which to carry off his Sunday shoes. For as to those left at Dubal Sanny's, they judged it unsafe to go in quest of them. The shoemaker could hardly be in a humour fit to be intruded upon. Having procured the string, Shargar went to Mrs. Falconer's. Anxious not to encounter her, but, if possible, to bug the boots quietly, he opened the door, peeped in, and seeing no one made his way towards the kitchen. He was arrested, however, as he crossed the passage by the voice of Mrs. Falconer, calling, "'What's that?' There she was at the parlour door. It paralysed him. His first impulse was to make a rush and escape. But the boots, he could not go without at least an attempt upon them. So he turned and faced her with inward trembling. "'What's that?' repeated the old lady, regarding him fixedly. "'Ow, oh, it's you. What do ye want?' Ye came not to see me, I'm thinking. What have ye in that bag? I came to buy twine for the dragon, answered Shargar. Ye had twine enough afore. It broke. It was not strong enough. War got ye the siller to buy more. Let's see it. Shargar took the string from the bag. Sitch a sight of twine. What paid ye for it? A shillin'. War got ye the shillin'. Mr. Lammy gave it to Robert. I will not have ye take siller from nobody. It's ill manners. Ha! said the old lady, putting her hand in her pocket and taking out a shilling. Ha! she said. Give Mr. Lammy back his shilling and tell him I, I would not have ye learn such ill customs as take silver. It's enough to go on exacting free quarters as ye do on begging for siller. Are they all weel? Ay, brawly, answered Shargar, putting the shilling in his pocket. In another moment Shargar had, without a word of adieu, embezzled the shoes and escaped from the house without seeing Betty. He went straight to the shop he had just left, and bought another shilling's worth of string. 
When he got home, he concealed nothing from Robert, whom he found seated in the barn with his fiddle, waiting his return. Robert started to his feet. He could appropriate his grandfather's violin, to which, possibly, he might have shown as good a right as his grandmother, certainly his grandfather would have accorded it him, but her money was sacred. Shargai, ye bratch, he cried, fess that shillin' here directly. Take the twine with ye, and gar them give ye back the shillin'. They would not break the bargain, cried Shargar, beginning almost to whimper, for a savoury smell of dinner was coming across the yard. Tell them it's stone siller, and they'll be in hot water aboot it, given they did not give it ye back. I won't have my dinner first, remonstrated Shargar. But the spirit of his grandmother was strong in Robert, and in a matter of rectitude there must be no temporizing. Therein he could be as tyrannical as the old lady herself. Dell a bite, or a sup's gone, or your thrapple, till I see that shillin'. There was no help for it. Six hungry miles must be trudged by Shargar ere he got a morsel to eat. Two hours and a half passed before he reappeared. But he brought the shilling. As to how he recovered it, Robert questioned him in vain. Shargar, in his turn, was obstinate. "'She's a some unmanageable wife, that granny o' yours,' said Mr. Lammy, when Robert returned the shilling with Mrs. Falconer's message. "'But I reckon I mount put it in my pooch, for she will have her own gait, and I did not want to strive with her. But given any of ye be in want of shilling any day, lads, as long as I'm a boon in the yard, this on will be grown twa, or maybe more, given that time.' So saying, the farmer put the shilling into his pocket and buttoned it up. The dragon flew splendidly now, and its strength was mighty. It was Robert's custom to drive a stake into the ground, slanting against the wind, and thereby tether the animal, as if it were up there grazing in its own natural region. Then he would lie down by the stake and read the Arabian Nights, every now and then casting a glance upward at the creature alone in the waste air, yet all in his power by the string at his side. Somehow the high-flown dragon was a bond between him and the blue. He seemed nearer to the sky while it flew, or at least the heaven seemed less far away and inaccessible. While he lay there gazing all at once, he would find that his soul was up with the dragon, feeling as it felt, tossing about with it in the torrents of the air. Out at his eyes it would go, traverse the dim stairless space, and sport with the wind-blown monster. Sometimes, to aid his aspiration, he would take a bit of paper, make a hole in it, pass the end of the string through the hole, and send the messenger scudding along the line athwart the depth of the wind. If it stuck by the way, he would get a telescope of Mr. Lammy's, and therewith watch its struggle till it broke loose, then follow it careering up to the kite. Away, with each successive paper, his imagination would fly, and a sense of air and height and freedom settled from his play into his very soul, a germ to sprout hereafter and enrich the forms of his aspirations. And all his after-memories of kite-flying were mingled with pictures of eastern magnificence. Far from the airy height of the dragon, his eyes always came down upon the enchanted pages of John Hewson's book. Sometimes again he would throw down his book, and sitting up with his back against the stake, lift his bonny leddy from his side, and play as he had never played in Rotherden, playing to the dragon aloft to keep him strong in his soaring, and fierce in his battling with the winds of heaven. Then he fancied that the monster swooped and swept in arcs, and swayed curving to and fro, in rhythmic response to the music floating up through the wind. What a full globated symbolism lay then around the heart of the boy in his book, his violin, his kite. End chapter 21
Mr. Lammy started to his feet. "'Bless my soul, Aggie! That's Anderson!' he cried, and hurried to the door. His daughter followed. The boys kept their seats. A loud and hearty salutation reached their ears, but the voice of the farmer was all they heard. Presently he returned, bringing with him the tallest and slenderest man Robert had ever seen. He was considerably over six feet, with a small head and delicate, if not fine, features, a gentle look in his blue eyes, and a slow, clear voice, which sounded as if it were thinking about every word it uttered. The hot sun of India seemed to have burned out everything self-assertive, leaving him quietly and rather sadly contemplative. "'Come in, come in,' repeated Mr. Lammy, overflowing with glad welcome. "'What'll ye have? That's a friend of your own,' he continued, pointing to Robert, "'and a fine lad.' Then, lowering his voice, he added, "'A son of poor Andrews, ye can, doctor.' The boys rose, and Dr. Anderson, stretching his long arms across the table, shook hands kindly with Robert and Shargar. Then he sat down and began to help himself to the cakes, oat cake, at which Robert wondered, seeing there was white bread on the table. Miss Lammy presently came in with the teapot and some additional dainties, and the boys took the opportunity of beginning at the beginning again. Dr. Anderson remained for a few days at Bodyfall, sending Shargar to Rothedon for some necessaries from the boar's head, where he had left his servant and luggage. During this time Mr. Lammy was much occupied with his farm affairs, anxious to get his harvest in as quickly as possible, because a change of weather was to be dreaded, so the doctor was left a good deal to himself. He was fond of wandering about, but thoughtful as he was, did not object to the companionship which Robert implicitly offered him. Before many hours were over, the two were friends. Various things attracted Robert to the doctor. First, he was a relation of his own, older than himself, the first he had known except his father, and Robert's heart was one of the most dutiful. Second, or perhaps I ought to have put this first, he was the only gentleman, except Eric Erickson, whose acquaintance he had yet made. Third, he was kind to him, and gentle to him, and above all, respectful to him, and to be respected was a new sensation to Robert altogether. And lastly, he could tell stories of elephants and tiger hunts and all the Arabian nights of India. He did not volunteer much talk, but Robert soon found that he could draw him out. But what attracted the man to the boy? Ah, Robert, said the doctor one day sadly, it's a sore thing to come home after being thirty years away. He looked up at the sky, then all round at the hills, the face of nature alone remained the same. Then his glance fell on Robert, and he saw a pair of black eyes looking up at him, brimful of tears, and thus the man was drawn to the boy. Robert worshipped Dr. Anderson. As long as he remained their visitor, kite and violin and all were forgotten, and he followed him like a dog. To have such a gentleman for a relation was grand indeed. What could he do for him? He ministered to him in all manner of trifles, a little to the amusement of Dr. Anderson, but more to his pleasure, for he saw that the boy was both large-hearted and lowly-minded. Dr. Anderson had learned to read character, else he would never have been the honour to his profession that he was. But all the time Robert could not get him to speak about his father. He steadily avoided the subject. When he went away, the two boys walked with him to the boar's head, caught a glimpse of his Hindu attendant, much to their wonderment, received from the doctor a sovereign apiece and a kind good-bye, and returned to Bodyfeld. Dr. Anderson remained a few days longer at Rothedon, and amongst others visited Mrs. Falconer, who was his first cousin. What passed between them Robert never heard, nor did his grandmother even allude to the visit. He went by the mail-coach from Rothedon to Aberdeen, and whether he should ever see him again Robert did not know. He flew his kite no more for a while, but betook himself to the work of the harvest field, in which he was now able for a share, but his violin was no longer neglected. Day after day passed in the delights of labour, broken for Robert by the Arabian Nights and the violin, and for Shargar by attendance upon Ms. Lammy, till the fields lay bare of their harvest, and the night wind of autumn moaned everywhere over the vanished glory of the country, and it was time to go back to school. End 
Chapter Twenty Two. Book One, Chapter Twenty Three, of Robert Falconer by George Macdonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George Macdonald, Chapter Twenty Three, An Auto de Fe. The morning at length arrived when Robert and Shargar must return to Rothaden. A keen autumnal wind was blowing far off feathery clouds across a sky of pale blue. The cold freshened the spirits of the boys and tightened their nerves and muscles till they were like bowstrings. No doubt the winter was coming, but the sun, although his day's work was short and slack, was still as clear as ever. So gladsome was the world that the boys received the day as a fresh holiday and strenuously forgot tomorrow. The wind blew straight from Rothaden, and between sun and wind a bright thought awoke in Robert. The dragon should not be carried. He should fly home. After they had said farewell, in which Shargar seemed to suffer more than Robert, and had turned the corner of the stables, they heard the good farmer shouting after them, There'll be another harst naste year, boys, which wonderfully restored their spirits. When they reached the open road, Robert laid his violin carefully into a broom bush. Then the tail was unrolled, and the dragon ascended steady as an angel whose work is done. Shargar took the stick at the end of the string, and Robert resumed his violin. But the creature was hard to lead in such a wind, so they made a loop on the string and passed it round Shargar's chest, and he tugged the dragon home. Robert longed to take his share in the struggle, but he could not trust his violin to Shargar, and so had to walk beside ingloriously. On the way they laid their plans for the accommodation of the dragon. But the violin was the greater difficulty. Robert would not hear of the factory for reasons best known to himself, and there were serious objections to taking it to Dual Sanny. It was resolved that the only way was to seize the right moment and creep upstairs with it before presenting themselves to Mrs. Falconer. Their intended manoeuvres with the kite would favour the concealment of this stroke. Before they entered the town, they drew in the kite a little way and cut off a dozen yards of the string, which Robert put in his pocket with a stone tied to the end. When they reached the house, Shargar went into the little garden and tied the string of the kite to the paling between that and Captain Forsyth. Robert opened the street door and, having turned his head on all sides like a thief, darted with his violin up the stairs. Having laid his treasure in one of the presses in Shargar's garret, he went to his own and from the skylight threw the stone down into the captain's garden, fastening the other end of the string to the bedstead. Escaping as cautiously as he had entered, he passed hurriedly into the neighbor's garden, found the stone, and joined Shargar. The ends were soon united, and the kite let go. It sunk for a moment, then, arrested by the bedstead, towered again to its former pride of place, sailing over Rothed in grand and unconcerned in the wastes of air. But the end of its tether was in Robert's garret, and that was to him a sense of power, a thought of glad mystery. There was henceforth, while the dragon flew, a relation between the desolate little chamber in that lowly house, buried among so many more aspiring abodes, and the unmeasured depths and spaces, the stars, and the unknown heavens. And in the next chamber lay the fiddle, free once more, yet another tragical power whereby his spirit could forsake the earth and mount heavenwards. All that night, all the next day, all the next night, the dragon flew. Not one smile broke over the face of the old lady as she received them. Was it because she did not know what acts of disobedience, what breaches of the moral law the two children of possible perdition might have committed while they were beyond her care, and she must not run the risk of smiling upon iniquity? I think it was rather that there was no smile in her religion, which, while it developed the power of a darkened conscience, overlaid and half-smothered all the lovelier impulses of her grand nature. How could she smile? Did not the world lie under the wrath and curse of God? Was not her own son in hell forever? Had not the blood of the Son of God been shed for him in vain? 
had not God meant that it should be in vain, for by the gift of his spirit could he not have enabled him to accept the offered pardon, and for anything she knew was not Robert going after him to the place of misery. How could she smile? No, be quiet, she said the moment she had shaken hands with them, with her cold hands so clean and soft and smooth. With the volcanic heart of love, her outside was always so still and cold. Snow on the mountainsides, hot, vein-covering lava within. For her highest duty was submission to the will of God. Ah, if she had only known the God who claimed her submission. But there is time enough for every heart to know him. No, be quiet, she repeated, and sit down and tell me about the folk at Bodyfall. I hope ye thank it them, or ye left, for their muckle kindness to ye. The boys were silent. Did not ye thank them? No, Granny, I did not think that we did. Well, that was ill fart of ye. Eh, but the heart is deceitful aboon the thing, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Come away, come away. Robert, fastened the door. And she led them to the corner for prayer, and poured forth a confession of sin for them and for herself, such as left little that could have been added by her own profligate son, had he joined in the prayer. Either there are no degrees in guilt, or the Scotch language was equal only to the confession of children and holy women, and could provide no more awful words for the contrition of the prodigal or the hypocrite. But the words did little harm, for Robert's mind was full of the kite and the violin, and was probably nearer God thereby than if he had been trying to feel as wicked as his grandmother told God that he was. Shargar was even more divinely employed at the time than either, for though he had not had the manners to thank his benefactor, his heart had all the way home been full of tender thoughts of Miss Lammy's kindness, and now, instead of confessing sins that were not his, he was loving her over and over, and wishing to be back with her instead of with this awfully good woman, in whose presence there was no peace, for all the atmosphere of silence and calm in which she sat. Confession over, and the boys at liberty again, a new anxiety seized them. Granny must find out that Robert's shoes were missing, and what account was to be given of the misfortune, for Robert would not, or could not, lie. In the midst of their discussion, a bright idea flashed upon Shargar, which, however, he kept to himself. He would steal them, and bring them home in triumph, emulating thus Robert's exploit in delivering his bonny lady. The shoemaker sat behind his door to be out of the drought. Shargar might see a great part of the workshop without being seen, and he could pick Robert's shoes from among a hundred. Probably they lay just where Robert had laid them, for Dubal Sandy paid attention to any job only in proportion to the persecution accompanying it. So the next day Shargar contrived to slip out of school just as the riding lesson began, for he had great skill in conveying himself unseen, and, with his book bag, slunk barefooted into the shoemaker's entry. The shop door was a little way open, and the red eyes of Shargar had only the corner next it to go, peering about in. But there he saw the shoes. He got down on his hands and knees and crept nearer. Yes, they were beyond a doubt Robert's shoes. He made a long arm like a beast of prey, seized them, and losing his presence of mind upon possession, drew them too hastily towards him. The shoemaker saw them as they vanished through the door and darted after them. Shargar was off at full speed and Sandy followed with hue and cry. Every idle person in the street joined in the pursuit, and all who were too busy or too responsible to run crowded to doors and windows. Shargar made instinctively for his mother's old lair, but bethinking himself when he reached the door, he turned, and, knowing nowhere else to go, fled in terror to Mrs. Falconer's, still, however, holding fast by the shoes, for they were Robert's. As Robert came home from school, wondering what could have become of his companion, he saw a crowd about his grandmother's door, and, pushing his way through it in some dismay, found Dubal Sanny and Shargar confronting each other before the stern justice of Mrs. Falconer. "'You're a leer, the shoemaker was panting out. "'I had not had a pair of shoon o' Robert's in my hands this three months. "'That shoon, 
Let me see them. There, here's Robert himself. Are they shoon yours, new Robert? Ay, are they? Ye made them yourself. Who came they in my shop, then? Spare nae more questions, nor is worth answering, said Robert, with a look meant to be significant. They're my shoon, and I'll keep them. Ablins, ye did not I ken what shoon ye have, or what they came into ye. What for did not Shargar come and spare after them, then, in place of making a thief of himself that gate? Ye may hold your tongue, returned Robert, with yet more significance. I was I an idiot, said Shargar, in apologetic reflection, looking awfully white, and afraid to lift an eye to Mrs. Falconer, yet reassured a little by Robert's presence. Some glimmering seemed now to have dawned upon the shoemaker, for he began to prepare a retreat. Meantime Mrs. Falconer sat silent, allowing no word that passed to escape her. She wanted to be at the bottom of the mysterious affair, and therefore held her peace. "'Weel, I'm sure, Robert, you never tellt me aboot the shoon," said Alexander. i us just take them back with me, and do what's wanted to them. And I'm sorry that I have given ye this trouble, Mistress Falconer, but it was all that fool's white there. I did not even ken it was him till we were near hand the hoose. Let me see the shoon, said Mrs. Falconer, speaking almost for the first time. What's the matter with them? Examining the shoes, she saw they were in a perfectly sound state, and this confirmed her suspicion that there was more in the affair than had yet come out. Had she taken the straightforward measure of examining Robert, she would soon have arrived at the truth. But she had such a dread of causing a lie to be told, that she would adopt any roundabout way, rather than ask a plain question of a suspected culprit. So she laid the shoes down beside her, saying to the shoemaker, There's nothing amiss with the shoon. You can leave them. Thereupon Alexander went away, and Robert and Shargar would have given more than their dinner to follow him. Granny neither asked any questions, however, nor made a single remark on what had passed. Dinner was served and eaten, and the boys returned to their afternoon school. No sooner was she certain that they were safe under the schoolmaster's eye than the old lady put on her black silk bonnet and her black woolen shawl, took her green cotton umbrella, which served her for a staff, and refusing Betty's proffered assistance, set out for Dual Sanny's shop. As she drew near, she heard the sound of his violin. When she entered, he laid his old wife carefully aside and stood in an expectant attitude. Mr. Elshender, I want to be at the bottom of this, said Mrs. Falconer. Well, ma'am, gone to the bottom of it, returned Dougal Sanny, dropping on his stool and taking his stone upon his lap and stroking it as if it had been some quadrupedal pet. Full of rough but real politeness to women when in good humour, he lost all his manners along with his temper upon the slightest provocation, and her tone irritated him. Who came Robert Shoon to be in your shop? Somebody bud till have brought them, ma'am. In all my experience, and that's no small, I never can't pair of Shoon go on on a pair of feet in the wane of them. Oh, it's what kind of gate's that to spake to the body? Whose feet was inside the shoon? Devil a bit ein kens, ma'am. Do not swear whatever ye do. Devil, but I will swear, ma'am, and given ye anger me, I'll just swear awful. I'm sure I have nae was to anger ye, man. Cannot ye help a body to win at the bottom of a thing, on angered and sworn? Will, I cannot what brought the shoon, as I tell it ye already. But they wanted nae mendin'. I might have meant them and forgotten it, ma'am. No, ye're lean. Do ye go on at that gate, ma'am, I will not spake a word of trowth from this moment for it. Just tell me what ye can about the shoon, and I'll no say another word. Well, ma'am, I'll tell ye the trowth. The devil brought them in on day in long tains, and says he, I'll send her, man, thy shoon for poor Robbie Faulkner, and double sold them for the life of ye, for that old lucky mini of his ill soon have him doon our gate, and the ground is hot in the new, and I did not want to be o'er sore upon him, 
for he's a fine shield, and I'll make a fine fiddler given he live long enough. Mrs. Falconer left the shop without another word, but with an awful suspicion which the last heedless words of the shoemaker had aroused in her bosom. She left him bursting with laughter over his lapstone. He caught up his fiddle and played the devils in the women, lustily and with expression, but he little thought what he had done. As soon as she reached her own room, she went straight to her bed and disinterred the bonny lady's coffin. She was gone, and in her stead, horror of horrors, lay in the unhallowed chest that body of divinity known as Boston's fourfold state. Vexation, anger, disappointment, and grief possessed themselves of the old woman's mind. She ranged the house like the questing beast of the round table, but failed in finding the violin before the return of the boys. Not a word did she say all that evening, and their oppressed hearts foreboded ill. They felt that there was thunder in the clouds, a sleeping storm in the air, but how or when it would break they had no idea. Robert came home to dinner the next day, a few minutes before Shargar. As he entered his grandmother's parlour, a strange odour greeted his sense. A moment more and he stood, rooted with horror, and his hair began to rise on his head. His violin lay on its back on the fire, and a yellow tongue of flame was licking the red lips of a hole in its belly. All its strings were shriveled up save one, which burst as he gazed, and besides, stern as a druidess, sat his grandmother in her chair, feeding her eyes with grim satisfaction on the detestable sacrifice. At length the rigidity of Robert's whole being relaxed in an involuntary howl like that of a wild beast, and he turned and rushed from the house in a helpless agony of horror. Where he was going he knew not, only a blind instinct of modesty drove him to hide his passion from the eyes of men. From her window Miss St. John saw him tearing like one demented along the top walk of the captain's garden, and watched for his return. He came far sooner than she expected. Before he arrived at the factory Robert began to hear strange sounds in the desolate place. When he reached the upper floor, he found men with axe and hammer destroying the old woodwork, breaking the old jennies, pitching the balls of lead into baskets, and throwing the spools into crates. Was there nothing but destruction in the world? There, most horrible, his bonny lady dying of flames, and here the temple of his refuge torn to pieces by unhallowed hands. What could it mean? Was his grandmother's vengeance here, too? But he did not care. He only felt like the doves sent from the ark, that there was no rest for the sole of his foot, that there was no place to hide his head in his agony, that he was naked to the universe, and like a heartless wild thing, hunted till its brain is of no more use, he turned and rushed back again upon his track. At one end was the burning idol, at the other the desecrated temple. No sooner had he entered the captain's garden than Miss St. John met him, "'What is the matter with you, Robert?' she asked kindly. "'Oh, ma'am,' gasped Robert, and burst into a very storm of weeping. It was long before he could speak. He cowered before Miss St. John, as if conscious of an unfriendly presence, and seeking to shelter himself by her tall figure from his grandmother's eyes. For who could tell but at the moment she might be gazing upon him from some window, or even from the blue vault above? There was no escaping her. She was the all-seeing eye personified, the eye of the god of the theologians of his country, always searching out the evil and refusing to acknowledge the good. Yet so gentle and faithful was the heart of Robert that he never thought of her as cruel. He took it for granted that somehow or other she must be right, only what a terrible thing such righteousness was. He stood and wept before the lady. Her heart was sore for the despairing boy. She drew him to a little summer seat. He entered with her and sat down, weeping still. She did her best to soothe him. At last, sorely interrupted by sobs, he managed to let her know the fate of his bonny lady. But when he came to the words, She's burning in there upon Granny's fire, he broke out once more with that wild howl of despair, and then, ashamed of himself, ceased weeping altogether, though he could not help the intrusion of certain chokes and sobs upon his otherwise even, though low and sad speech. 
Knowing nothing of Mrs. Falconer's character, Miss St. John set her down as a cruel and heartless, as well as a tyrannical and bigoted old woman, and took the mental position of enmity towards her. In a gush of motherly indignation, she kissed Robert on the forehead. From that chrism he arose a king. He dried his eyes, not another sob even broke from him. He gave one look, but no word of gratitude, to Miss St. John, bade her good-bye, and walked composedly into his grandmother's parlour, where the neck of the violin yet lay upon the fire only half consumed. The rest had vanished utterly. "'What do they doin' doin' at the factory, Granny?' he asked. "'What's what doin', laddie?' returned his grandmother, curtly. "'They're takin' it doin'.' "'Takin' what doin'?' she returned with raised voice. "'Takin' doin' the hoose. The old woman rose. "'Robert, ye may have spite in your heart for what I have done this morning, but I could do no other. And it's an ill thing to take such amends of me as given I had done wrong, by garin' me trow at your grandfather's property was to go on the gate of his old, useless, ill-mannered scratch of a fiddle. She was the bonniest fiddle in the countryside, Granny, and she never gave a scratch in her life, except when she was handled in a manner unbecoming. But we say nae more aboot her, for she's gone, and no by a fair death on one's own straw either. She had nae blood to cry for vengeance, but the snapping of her strings and the cracking of her bones may have made a cry to go on far enough notwithstanding. The old woman seemed for one moment rebuked under her grandson's eloquence. He had made a great stride towards manhood since the morning. The fiddle's my own, she said, in a defensive tone, and so is the factory, she added, as if she had not quite reassured herself concerning it. The fiddle's yours nae more, Granny, and for the factory you would not believe me. Go on and see yourself. Therewith Robert retreated to his garret. When he opened the door of it, the first thing he saw was the string of his kite, which, strange to tell, so steady had been the wind, was still up in the air, still tugging at the bedpost. Whether it was from the stinging thought that the true sky soar, the violin, having been devoured by the jaws of the fire-devil, there was no longer any significance in the outward invisible sign of the dragon, or from a dim feeling that the time of kites was gone by and manhood on the threshold, I cannot tell. But he drew his knife from his pocket, and with one downstroke cut the string in twain. Away went the dragon, free like a prodigal, to his ruin, and with the dragon afar into the past flew the childhood of Robert Falconer. He made one remorseless dart after the string as it swept out of the skylight, but it was gone beyond remedy, and never more save in twilight dreams did he lay hold on his childhood again. But he knew better and better as the years rolled on, that he approached a deeper and holier childhood, of which that had been but the feeble and necessarily vanishing type. As the kite sank in the distance, Mrs. Falconer issued from the house and went down the street towards the factory. Before she came back, the cloth was laid for dinner, and Robert and Shargar were both in the parlour awaiting her return. She entered heated and dismayed, went into Robert's bedroom, and shut the door hastily. They heard her open the old bureau. In a moment, after she came out with a more luminous expression upon her face than Robert had ever seen it bear, it was as still as ever, but there was a strange light in her eyes, which was not confined to her eyes, but shone in a measure from her colourless forehead and cheeks as well. It was long before Robert was able to interpret that change in her look, and that increase of kindness towards himself and Shargar, apparently such a contrast with the holocaust of the morning. Had they both been Benjamins, they could not have been more abundant platefuls than she gave them that day. And when they left her to return to school, instead of the usual, no be quiet, she said in gentle, almost loving tones, no be good lads, both of ye. The conclusion at which Falconer did arrive was that his grandmother had hurried home to see whether the title deeds of the factory were still in her possession, and had found that they were gone, taken doubtless by her son Andrew. At whatever period he had appropriated them, he must have parted with them but recently, and the hope rose luminous that her son had not yet passed into the region where all life dies, death lives. Terrible consolation! 
terrible creed which made the hope that he was still on this side of the grave working wickedness light up the face of the mother and open her hand in kindness is it suffering or is it wickedness that is the awful thing ah but they are both combined in the other world and in this world too i answer only according to mrs falconer's creed in the other world god for the sake of the suffering renders the wickedness eternal the old factory was in part pulled down and out of its remains a granary constructed nor did the old lady interpose a word to arrest the alienation of her property End. chapter twenty three Book One, Chapter Twenty Four of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Chapter Twenty Four Boot or Bail. Mary St. John was the orphan daughter of an English clergyman who had left her money enough to make her at least independent. Mrs. Forsythe, hearing that her niece was left alone in the world, had concluded that her society would be a pleasure to herself and a relief to the housekeeping. Even before her father's death, Miss St. John, having met with a disappointment and concluded herself dead to the world, had been looking about for some way of doing good. The prospect of retirement, therefore, and of being useful to her sick aunt, had drawn her northwards. She was now about six and twenty, filled with two passions, one for justice, the other for music. Her griefs had not made her selfish, nor had her music degenerated into sentiment. The gentle style of the instruction she had received had never begotten a diseased self-consciousness, and if her religion lacked something of the intensity without which a character like hers could not be evenly balanced, its force was not spent on the combating of unholy doubts and selfish fears, but rose on the wings of her music in gentle thanksgiving. Tears had changed her bright-hued hopes into a dove-colored submission, through which her mind was passing towards a rainbow dawn such as she had never dreamed of. To her as yet the Book of Common Prayer contained all the prayers that human heart had need to offer. What things lay beyond its scope must lie beyond the scope of religion. All such things must be parted with one day and if they had been taken from her very soon, she was the sooner free from the painful necessity of watching lest earthly love should remove any of the old landmarks dividing what was God's from what was only man's. She had now retired within the pale of religion, and left the rest of her being, as she thought, to dull forgetfulness a prey. She had little comfort in the society of her aunt. Indeed, she felt strongly tempted to return again to England, the same month, and seek a divine service elsewhere. But it was not at all so easy then as it is now for a woman to find the opportunity of being helpful in the world of suffering. Mrs. Forsythe was one of those women who got their own way by the very vis inertia of their silliness. No argument could tell upon her. She was so incapable of seeing anything noble that her perfect satisfaction with everything she herself thought said or did remained unchallenged she had just illness enough to swell her feeling of importance she looked down upon mrs falconer from such an immeasurable height that she could not be indignant with her for anything she only vouchsafed a laugh now and then at her oddities holding no further communication with her than a condescending bend of the neck when they happened to meet which was not once a year but indeed she would have patronized the angel Gabriel if she had had a chance, and no doubt given him a hint or two upon the proper way of praising God. For the rest she was good-tempered, looked comfortable, and quarrelled with nobody but her rough, honest old bear of a husband, whom, in his seventieth year, she was always trying to teach good manners, with the frequent result of a storm of swearing. But now Mary St. John was thoroughly interested in the strange boy whose growing musical pinions were ever being clipped by the shears of unsympathetic age and crabbed religion, and the idea of doing something for him to make up for the injustice of his grandmother awoke in her a slight glow of that interest in life which she sought only in doing good. 
But although ere long she came to love the boy very truly, and although Shargar's life was bound up in the favour of Robert, yet neither stooping angel nor foot-following dog ever loved the lad with the love of that old grandmother, who would for him have given herself to the fire to which she had doomed his greatest delight. For some days Robert worked hard at his lessons, for he had nothing else to do. Life was very gloomy now. If he could only go to sea or away to keep sheep on the stormy mountains, if there were only some war going on that he might list, any fighting with the elements or with the oppressors of the nations would make life worth having, a man worth being. But God did not heed. He leaned over the world, a dark care, an immovable fate, bearing down with the weight of the presence of all aspirations, all budding delights of children and young persons, all must crouch before him and uphold his glory with the sacrificial death of every impulse, every admiration, every lightness of heart, every bubble of laughter, or, which to a mind like Robert's was as bad, if he did not punish for those things, it was because they came not within the sphere of his condescension, were not worth his notice. Of sympathy could be no question. But his gloom did not last long. When souls like Robert's have been ill-taught about God, the true God will not let them gaze too long upon the Moloch which men have set up to represent him. He will turn away their minds from that which men call him, and fill them with some of his own lovely thoughts or works, such as may by degrees prepare the way for the vision of the Father. One afternoon Robert was passing the shoemaker's shop. He had never gone near him since his return, but now almost mechanically he went in at the open door. Weel, Robert, ye are a stranger. But what's the matter with ye? Faith, yon was an ill plisky ye played me to break into my shop and steal the money lady. Sandy, said Robert solemnly, ye did not ken what ye have done by that trick ye played me. Do not ever mention her again in my hearing. The old witch has not gotten a grip of her again, cried the shoemaker, starting half up in alarm. She came here to me about the shoon, but I reckon I sorted her. I will not spare what you said, returned Robert. It's no matter new. And the tears rose to his eyes. His bonny lady. The Lord guides us, exclaimed the shoemaker. What is the matter with the bonny lady? There's nae bonny lady on him more. I saw her burnt to death before my very own eye. The shoemaker sprang to his feet and caught up his paring knife. For God's sake, say it you're lean, he cried. I wish I were lean, returned Robert. The shoemaker uttered a horrible oath and swore. I'll murder the old... The epitaph he ended with is too ugly to write. Dar to say such a word in a breath with my granny, cried Robert, snatching up the lapstone, and I'll brain ye upon your own shop floor. Sandy threw the knife on his stool and sat down beside it. Robert dropped the lapstone. Sandy took it up and burst into tears, which, before they were half down his face, turned into tar with the blackness of the same. I'm an awful sinner, he said, and vengeance has o'ertaken me. Go on out to my shop. I was not worthy of her. Go on out, I say, or I'll kill ye. Robert went. Close by the door he met Miss St. John. He pulled off his cap and would have passed her, but she stopped him. I am going for a walk a little way, she said. Will you go with me? She had come out in the hope of finding him, for she had seen him go up the street. That I will, returned Robert, and they walked on together. When they were beyond the last house, Miss St. John said, Would you like to play on the piano, Robert? Eh, ma'am said robert with a deep suspiration then after a pause but do you think i could there's no fear of that let me see your hands there's some black i doubt ma'am he remarked rubbing them hard upon his trousers before he showed them for i was a most con with the brains of dual sandy with his own lapstone he's an ill-tongued child but eh, ma'am you should hear him play upon the fiddle He's great in his eyne oot, even new for the bonny lady. Not discouraged by her inspection of his hands, black as they were, Miss St. John continued. But what would your grandmother say? She asked. She maun ken nothing aboot it, ma'am. I ken 
not tell her anything. She would grate and pray awful and lock me up, I dare say. Ye see, she thinks all kind of music, except psalm singing, comes of the devil himself. And I cannot believe that. For I, when I see anything by ordinary bonnie such like as the moon was last night, it I gars me great for my burnt fiddle. Well, you must come to me every day for half an hour at least, and I will give you a lesson on my piano. But you can't learn by that, and my aunt could never bear to hear you practicing. So I'll tell you what you must do. I have a small piano in my room. Do you know there is a door from your house into my room? I said Robert. That house was my father's afore your uncle bought it. My father built it. Is it long since your father died? I did not ken. Where did he die? I did not ken. Do you remember it? No, ma'am. Well, if you will come to my room, you shall practice there. I shall be downstairs with my aunt, but perhaps I may look up now and then to see how you are getting on. I will leave the door unlocked so that you can come in when you like. If I don't want you, I will lock the door. You understand? You mustn't be handling things, you know. Deed, ma'am, ye may trust to me, but I'm just feared to let ye hear me lay a finger upon the piano, for it's a little I could do with my fiddle, and for the piano, I'm feared I'll just disgust ye. If you really want to learn, there will be no fear of that, returned Miss St. John. I don't think I am doing anything wrong, she added half to herself in a somewhat doubtful tone. Deed no, ma'am, you're just an angel unawares, for I most think sometimes that my granny will drive me mad, for there's nothing to read but good books, and nothing to sing but psalms, and there's nae phone about the host but Betty, and poor Shargar's near hand demented with it, and we mount pray till her whether we will or no and there's no comfort in the place but plenty to ate and that could not be good for anybody she likes flowers though and would like me to gar them grow but i did not care about it they take such a time before they come to anything then miss st john inquired about shargar and began to feel rather differently towards the old lady when she had heard the story but how she laughed at the tale and how light-hearted robert went home are neither to be told the next Sunday, the first time for many years, Dubal Sanny was at church with his wife, though how much good he got by going would be a serious question to discuss. End chapter 24this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald Chapter 25 The Gates of Paradise Robert had his first lesson the next Saturday afternoon. Eager and undismayed by the presence of Mrs. Forsythe, good-natured and contemptuous, for had he not a protecting angel by him, he hearkened for every word of Miss St. John, combated every fault and undermined every awkwardness with earnest patience. Nothing delighted Robert so much as to give himself up to one greater. His mistress was thoroughly pleased, and even Mrs. Forsythe gave him two of her soft fingertips to do something or other with. Robert did not know what, and let them go. About eight o'clock that same evening, his heart beating like a captured bird's, he crept from Granny's parlor, past the kitchen and up the low stair to the mysterious door. He had been trying for an hour to summon up courage to rise, feeling as if his grandmother must suspect where he was going. Arrived at the barrier, twice his courage failed him, twice he turned and sped back to the parlor. A third time he made the essay, a third time stood at the wondrous door, so long as blank as a wall to his careless eyes now like the door of the magic sesame that led to the treasure cave of ali baba he laid his hand on the knob withdrew it thought he heard some one in the trance rushed up the garret stair and stood listening hastened down and with a sudden influx of determination opened the door saw that the trap was raised closed the door behind him and standing with his head on the level of the floor gazed into the paradise of miss st john's room 
To have one peep into such a room was a kind of salvation to the half-starved nature of the boy. All before him was elegance, richness, mystery. Womanhood radiated from everything. A fire blazed in the chimney. A rug of long white wool lay before it. A little way off stood the piano. Ornaments sparkled and shone upon the dressing table. The door of a wardrobe had swung a little open and discovered the sombre shimmer of a black silk dress. Something gorgeously red, a china crepe shawl, hung glowing beyond it. He dared not gaze any longer. He had already been guilty of an immodesty. He hastened to ascend and seated himself at the piano. Let my reader aid me for a moment with his imagination, reflecting what it was to a boy like Robert, and in Robert's misery, to open a door in his own meagre dwelling and gaze into such a room, free to him. If he will aid me so, then let him aid himself by thinking that the house of his own soul has such a door into the infinite beauty, whether he has yet found it or not. Just think, Robert said to himself, of me in such a place. It's a palace. It's a fairy palace. And that angel of all lady bides here and sleeps there. I wonder given she ever dreams about anything as bonny as herself. Then his thoughts took another turn. I wonder if the room was anything like this when my mamma sleeped in it. I could not have been born in such a grand place, but my mamma might have wheel lying here. The face of the miniature and the sad words written below the hymn came back upon him, and he bowed his head upon his hands. He was sitting thus when Miss St. John came behind him and heard him murmur the one word, Mama. She laid her hand on his shoulder. He started and rose. I beg your pardon, ma'am. I have no business to be here except to play, but I could not help thinking about my mother, for I was born in this room, ma'am. Will I go on away again? He turned towards the door. No, no, said Miss St. John. I only came to see if you were here. I cannot stop now, but tomorrow you must tell me about your mother. Sit down and don't lose any more time. Your grandmother will miss you. And then what would come of it? Thus was the rough diamond of a Scotch boy, rude in speech but full of delicate thought, gathered under the modelling influence of the finished, refined, tender, sweet-tongued and sweet-thoughted Englishwoman, who, if she had been less of a woman, would have been repelled by his uncouthness, if she had been less of a lady, would have mistaken his commonness for vulgarity. But she was just like the type of womankind, a virgin mother. She saw the nobility of his nature through its homely garments, and had been, indeed, sent to carry on the work from which his mother had been too early taken away. There's just one thing, ma'am, that vexes me a wee, and I did not ken what to think about it, said Robert, as Miss St. John was leaving the room. Maybe you could bide a minute till I tell ye. Yes, I can. What is it? I'm near hand sure that when I leave the parlour, Granny'll think I'm away to my prayers, and so she'll think better of me nor I deserve, and I cannot bide that. What should make you suppose that she will think so? Folk knows what one another's about, you know, ma'am. Then she'll know you are not at your prayers. Nay, nee, for sometimes I div go on to my prayers for a while, like, but nay nee for long, for I'm nay nee like one of them at he would care to hear saying a long screed of a prayer till him. I have but a thing to pray about. And what's that, Robert? One of his silences had seized him. He looked confused and turned away. Never mind, said Miss St. John, anxious to relieve him and establish a comfortable relation between them. You will tell me another time. I don't know, ma'am, answered Robert, with what most people would think in excess of honesty. But Miss St. John made a better conjecture as to his apparent closeness. At all events, she said, don't mind what your granny may think, so long as you have no wish to make her think it. Good night. Had she been indeed an angel from heaven, Robert could not have worshipped her more. And why should he? Was she less God's messenger that she had beautiful arms instead of less beautiful wings? He practiced his scales till his unaccustomed fingers were stiff, then shut the piano with reverence and departed carefully, 
peeping into the disenchanted region without the gates to see that no enemy lay in wait for him as he passed beyond them he closed the door gently and in one moment the rich lovely room and the beautiful lady were behind him and before him the bare stair between two whitewashed walls and the long flag trance that led to a silent grandmother seated in her armchair gazing into the red coals for somehow granny's fire always glowed and never blazed with her round-toed shoes pointed at them from the top of her little wooden stool he traversed the stair and the trans entered the parlour and sat down to his open book as though nothing had happened but his grandmother saw the light in his face and did think he had just come from his prayers and she blessed god that he had put into her heart to burn the fiddle the next night robert took with him the miniature of his mother and showed it to miss st john who saw at once that whatever might be his present surroundings his mother must have been a lady a certain fancied resemblance in it to her own mother likewise drew her heart to the boy then robert took from his pocket the gold thimble and said this thimble was my mamma's will ye take it ma'am for ye ken it's of no use to me miss st john hesitated for a moment i will keep it for you if you like she said for she could not bear to refuse it na ma'am i want ye to keep it to yourself for i'm sure my mamma would have liked it you to have it better nor any other body well i will use it some time for your sake but mind i will not take it from you i will only keep it for you weel weel ma'am if you'll keep it till i spare for it that'll do well enough answered robert with a smile he laboured diligently and his progress corresponded to his labour it was more than intellect that guided him falconer had genius for whatever he cared for meantime the love he bore his teacher and the influence of her beauty began to mould him in his kind and degree after her likeness so that he grew nice in his person and dress and smoothed the roughness and moderated the broadness of his speech with the amenities of the english which she made so sweet upon her tongue he became still more obedient to his grandmother and more diligent at school gathered to himself golden opinions without knowing it and was gradually developing into a rustic gentleman nor did the piano absorb all his faculties every divine influence tends to the rounded perfection of the whole his love of nature grew more rapidly hitherto it was only in summer that he had felt the presence of a power in her and yet above her in winter now the sky was true and deep though the world was waste and sad and the tones of the wind that roared at night about the goddess haunted house and moaned in the chimneys of the lowly dwelling that nestled against it woke harmonies within him which already he tried to spell out falteringly Miss St. John began to find that he put expressions of his own into the simple things she gave him to play, and even dreamed a little at his own will when alone with the passive instrument. Little did Mrs. Falconer think into what a seventh heaven of a cursed music she had driven her boy. But not yet did he tell his friend, much as he loved and much as he trusted her, the little he knew of his mother's sorrows and his father's sins or whose the hand that had struck him when she found him lying in the waste factory for a time almost all his trouble about god went from him nor do i think that this was only because he rarely thought of him at all god gave him of himself in miss st john but words dropped now and then from off the shelves where his old difficulties lay and they fell like seeds upon the heart of miss st john took root and rose in thoughts in the heart of a true woman the talk of a child even will take life one evening robert rose from the table not unwatched of his grandmother and sped swiftly and silently through the dark as was his custom to enter the chamber of enchantment never before had his hand failed to alight sure as a lark on its nest upon the brass handle of the door that admitted him to his paradise it missed it now and fell on something damp and rough and repellent instead horrible but true suspicion while he was at school that day his grandmother moved by what doubt or by what certainty she never revealed had had the doorway walled up 
He felt the place all over. It was to his hands the living tomb of his mother's vicar on earth. He returned to his book, pale as death, but said never a word. The next day the stones were plastered over. Thus the door of bliss vanished from the earth, and neither the boy nor his grandmother ever said that it had been. End Chapter 25 End Book 1book two chapter one of robert falconer by george macdonald this librivox recording is in the public domain robert falconer by george macdonald part two his youth chapter one robert knocks and the door is not opened the remainder of that winter was dreary indeed. Every time Robert went up the stair to his garret, he passed the door of a tomb. With that grey mortar, Mary St. John was walled up, like the nun he had read of in the Marmion she had lent him. He might have rung the bell at the street door and been admitted into the temple of his goddess, but a certain vague terror of his granny, combined with equally vague qualms of conscience, for having deceived her, and the approach in the far distance of a ghastly suspicion that violins, pianos, moonlight, and lovely women were distasteful to the overruling fate, and obnoxious to the vengeance stored in the grey cloud of his providence, drove him from the awful entrance of the temple of his Isis. Nor did Miss St. John dare to make any advances to the dreadful old lady. She would wait, for Mrs. Forsyth, she cared nothing about the whole affair. It only gave her fresh opportunity for smiling condescensions about poor Mrs. Falconer. So paradise was over and gone. But though the loss of Miss St. John and the piano was the last blow, his sorrow did not rest there, but returned to brood over his bonny laddie. She was scattered to the winds. Would any of her ashes ever rise in the corn and moan in the ripening wind of autumn? Might not some atoms of the bonny laddy creep into the pines on the hill whose soft and soul-like sounds had taught him to play the flowers of the forest on those strings which, like the nerves of an amputated limb, yet thrilled through his being? Or might not some particle find its way by winds and waters to sycamore forest of Italy, there creep up through the channels of its life to some finely rounded curve of noble trees on the side that ever looks sunwards and be chosen once again by the violin hunter to be wrought into a new and fame-gathering instrument could it be that his bonny lady had learned her wondrous music in those forests from the shine of the sun and the sighing of the winds through the sycamores and pines for Robert knew that the broad-leaved sycamore and the sharp needle leaved pine had each its share in the violin. Only as the wild innocence of human nature, uncorrupted by wrong, untaught by suffering, is to that nature struggling out of darkness into light, such and so different is the living wood, with its sweetest tones of obedient impulse, answering only to the wind which bloweth where it listeth to that wood chosen separated individualized tortured into strange almost vital shape after a law to us nearly unknown strung with strings from animal organizations and put into the hands of man to utter the feelings of a soul that has passed through a like history this robert could not yet think and had to grow able to think it by being himself made an instrument of god's music what he could think was that the glorious mystery of his bonny lady was gone for ever, and alas, she had no soul. Here was an eternal sorrow. He could never meet her again. His affections, which must live for ever, were set upon that which had passed away. But the child that weeps because his mutilated doll will not rise from the dead shall yet find relief from his sorrow, a true relief, both human and divine. He shall know that that which in the doll made him love the doll has not passed away, and Robert must yet be comforted for the loss of his bonny lady. 
If she had had a soul, nothing but her own self could ever satisfy him. As she had no soul, another body might take her place, nor occasion reproach of inconstancy. But in the meantime, the shears of fate, having cut the string of the sky soaring kite of his imagination, had left him with the stick in his hand, and thus the rest of that winter was dreary enough. The glow was out of his heart, the glow was out of the world. The bleak, kindless wind was hissing through those pines that clothed the hill above Body Fall and over the dead garden where in the summer time the rose had looked down so lovingly on the heart's ease. If he had stood once more at gloaming in the barley stubble, not even the wail of flodden field would have found him there, but a keen sense of personal misery and hopeless cold. Was the summer a lie? Not so. The winter restrains that the summer may have the needful time to do its work well, for the winter is but the sleep of summer. Now in the winter of his discontent, and in nature finding no help, Robert was driven inwards, into his garret, into his soul. There the door of his paradise being walled up, he began vaguely, blindly, to knock again other doors, sometimes against stone walls and rocks, taking them for doors, as travel-worn and hence brain-sick men have done in a desert of mountains. A door, out or in, he must find or perish. It fell, too, that Miss St. John went to visit some friends who lived in a coast town twenty miles off, and a season of heavy snow followed by frost setting in. She was absent for six weeks, during which time, without a single care to trouble him from without, Robert was in the very desert of desolation. His spirits sank fearfully. He would pass his old music-master in the street with scarce a recognition, as if the bond of their relation had been utterly broken, had vanished in the smoke of the martyred violin, and all their affection had gone into the dust-heap of the past. Dubal Sandy's character did not improve. He took more and more whiskey, his bouts of drinking alternating as before with fits of hopeless repentance. His work was more neglected than ever, and his wife, having no money to spend, even upon necessaries, applied in desperation to her husband's bottle for comfort. This comfort, to do him justice, he never grudged her, and sometimes before midday they would both be drunk a condition expedited by the lack of food. When they began to recover, they would quarrel fiercely, and at last they became a nuisance to the whole street. Little did the whiskey-hating old lady know to what god she had really offered up that violin, if the consequences of the Holocaust can be admitted as indicating the power which had accepted it. But now began to appear in Robert the first signs of a practical outcome of such truth as his grandmother had taught him, operating upon the necessities of a simple and earnest nature. Reality, however lapped in vanity or even in falsehood, cannot lose its power. It is. The other is not. She had taught him to look up, that there was a God. He would put it to the test. Not that he doubted it yet. He only doubted whether there was a hearing God. But was not that worse? It was, I think. For it is of far more consequence what kind of a God than whether a God or not. Let not my reader suppose I think it possible there could be other than a perfect God. Perfect, even to the vision of his creatures, the faith that supplies the lack of vision being yet faithful to that vision. I speak from Robert's point of outlook. But indeed, whether better or worse is no great matter so long as he would see it or what there was. He had no comfort, and without reasoning about it, he felt that life ought to have comfort, from which point he began to conclude that the only thing left was to try whether the God in whom his mother believed might not help him. If the God would but hear him, it was all he had yet learned to require of his godhood. And that must ever be the first thing to require. More demands would come, and greater answers he would find. But now, if God would but hear him, if he spoke to him but one kind word, it would be the very soul of comfort. He could no more be lonely. A fountain of glad imaginations gushed up in his heart at the thought. 
What if, from the cold winter of his life, he had but to open the door of his garret room, and kneeling by the bare bedstead, enter into the summer of God's presence? What if God spoke to him face to face? He had so spoken to Moses. He sought him from no fear of the future, but from present desolation. And if God came near to him, it would not be with storm and tempest, but with the voice of a friend. And surely if there was a God at all, that is, not a power greater than man, but a power by whose power man was, he must hear the voice of the creature whom he had made, a voice that came crying out of the very need which he had created. Younger people than Robert are capable of such divine metaphysics. Hence he continued to disappear from his grandmother's parlour at much the same hour as before. In the cold, desolate garret he knelt and cried out into the that which lay beyond the thought that cried, the unknowable infinite, after the God that may be known as surely as a little child knows his mysterious mother. And from behind him the pale blue star-crowded sky shone upon his head through the window that looked upward only. Mrs. Falconer saw that he still went away as he had been wont, and instituted observations the result of which was the knowledge that he went to his own room her heart smote her and she saw that the boy looked sad and troubled there was scarce room in her heart for increase of love but much for increase of kindness and she did increase it in truth he needed the smallest crumb of comfort that might drop from the table of god's feastful friends night after night he returned to the parlour cold to the very heart God was not to be found, he said then. He said afterwards that even then God was with him, though he knew it not. For the very first night, the moment that he knelt and cried, O oh, Father in heaven, hear me, and let thy face shine upon me. Like a flash of burning fire, the words shot from the door of his heart. I do not care for him to love me if he does not love Ilka body. And no more prayer went from the desolate boy that night, although he knelt in hour of agony in the freezing dark. Loyal to what he had been taught, he struggled hard to reduce his rebellious will to what he supposed to be the will of God. It was all in vain. Ever a voice within him, surely the voice of that God who he thought was not hearing, told him that what he wanted was the love belonging to his human nature, his human needs, not the preference of a court favorite. He had a dim consciousness that he would be a traitor to his race if he accepted a love even from God given him as an exception from his kind but he did not care to have such a love it was not what his heart yearned for it was not love he could not love such a love yet he strove against it all fought for religion against right as he could struggled to reduce his rebellious feelings to love that which was unlovely to choose that which was abhorrent until nature almost gave way under the effort Often would he sink moaning on the floor, stretch himself like a corpse, save that it was face downwards, on the boards of the bedstead. Night after night he returned to the battle, but with no permanent success. What a success would have been! Night after night he came pale and worn from the conflict, found his grandmother and Shargar composed, and in the quietness of despair sat down beside them to his Latin version. He little thought that every night at the moment when he stirred to leave the upper room a pale-faced red-eyed figure rose from its seat on the top of the stair by the door and sped with long-legged noiselessness to resume its seat by the grandmother before he should enter shargar saw that robert was unhappy and the nearest he could come to the sharing of his unhappiness was to take his place outside the door within which he had retreated Little, too, did Shargar on his part think that Robert, without knowing it, was pleading for him inside, pleading for him and for all his race in the weeping that would not be comforted. Robert had not the vaguest fancy that God was with him, the spirit of the father groaning with the spirit of the boy in intercession that could not be uttered. If God had come to him then, and comforted him with the assurance of individual favor, but the very supposition is a taking of his name in vain. Had Robert found comfort in the fancied assurance that God was his friend in especial, that some private favor was granted to his prayers, that indeed would have been to be left to his own inventions, 
to bring forth not fruits meet for repentance, but fruits for which repentance alone is meet. But God was with him, and was indeed victorious in the boy, when he rose from his knees for the last time, as he thought, saying, I cannot yield, I will pray no more. With a burst of bitter tears he sat down on the bedside till the loudest of the storm was over, then dried his dull eyes in which the old outlook had withered away, and trod unknowingly in the silent footsteps of Shargar, who was ever one corner in advance of him, down to the dreary lessons and unheeded prayers. But thank God not to the sleepless night, for some grief springs sleep the sooner. My reader must not mistake my use of the words especial and private, or suppose that I do not believe in an individual relation between every man and God, yes, a peculiar relation differing from the relation between every other man and God. But this very individuality and peculiarity can only be founded on the broadest truths of the Godhood and the manhood. Mrs. Falconer, ere she went to sleep, gave thanks that the boys had been at their prayers together, and so in a very deep sense they had. And well they might have been, for Shargar was nearly as desolate as Robert, and would certainly, had his mother claimed him now, have gone on the tramp with her again. Wherein could this civilized life show itself to him better than that to which he had been born? For clothing he cared little, and he had always managed to kill his hunger or thirst, if at longer intervals, then with greater satisfaction. Wherein is the life of that man who merely does his eating and drinking and clothing after a civilized fashion better than that of the gypsy or tramp? If the civilized man is honest to boot and gives good work in return for the bread or turtle on which he dines, and the gypsy, on the other hand, steals his dinner, I recognize the importance of the difference. But if the rich man plunders the community by exorbitant profits or speculation with other people's money, while the gypsy adds a fowl or two to the produce of his tinkering, or once again if the gypsy is as honest as the honest citizen, which is not so rare a case by any means as people imagine, I return to my question, wherein, I say, are the warm house, the windows hung with purple, and the table covered with fine linen, more divine than the tent or the blue sky, and the dipping in the dish? Why should not Shargar prefer a life with the mother God had given him to a life with Mrs. Falconer? Why should he prefer geography to rambling, or Latin to Romany? His purposelessness and his love for Robert alone kept him where he was. The next evening, having given up his praying, Robert sat with his salust before him. But the fount of tears began to swell and the more he tried to keep it down, the more it went on swelling, till his throat was filled with a lump of pain. He rose and left the room. But he could not go near the garret. That door, too, was closed. He opened the house door instead, and went out into the street. There nothing was to be seen but faint blue air, full of moonlight, solid houses, and shining snow. Bareheaded he wandered round the corner of the house to the window whence first he had heard the sweet sounds of the pianoforte. Fire within lighted up the crimson curtain, but no voice of music came forth. The window was as dumb as the pale, faintly befogged moon overhead, itself seeming but a skylight through which shone the sickly light of the passionless world of the dead. Not a form was in the street. The eyes of the houses gleamed here and there upon the snow. He leaned his elbow on the window sill behind which stood that sealed fountain of lovely sound, looked up at the moon, careless of her or of aught else in heaven or on earth, and sunk into a reverie in which nothing was consciously present but a stream of fog smoke that flowed slowly, listlessly across the face of the moon like the ghost of a dead cataract. All at once a wailful sound arose in his head. He did not think for some time whether it was born in his brain or entered it from without. At length he recognized the flowers of the forest, played as only the shoemaker could play it. But alas, the cry responsive to his bow came only from the old wife, no more from the bonny lady. Then he remembered that there had been a humble wedding that morning on the opposite side of the way. 
In the street department of the jollity of which Shargar had taken a small share by firing a brass cannon, subsequently confiscated by Mrs. Falconer. But this was a strange tune to play at a wedding. The shoemaker, halfway to his goal of drunkenness, had begun to repent for the fiftieth time that year, had with his repentance mingled the memory of the bonny lady ruthlessly tortured to death for his wrong, and had glided from a strathspey into that sorrowful moaning. The lament interpreted itself to his disconsolate pupil as he had never understood it before, not even in the stubble field, for it now spoke his own feelings of waste, misery, forsaken loneliness. Indeed, Robert learned more of music in those few minutes of the foggy winter night and open street, shut out of all doors, with the tones of an ancient grief and lamentation floating through the blotted moonlight over his ever-present sorrow than he could have learned from many lessons even of miss st john he was cold to the heart yet went in a little comforted things had gone ill with him outside of paradise deserted of his angel in the frost and the snow the voice of the despised violin once more the source of a sad comfort but there is no better discipline than an occasional descent from that we count well-being to a former despised or less happy condition one of the results of this taste of damnation in robert was that when he was in bed that night his heart began to turn gently towards his old master how much did he not owe him after all had he not acted ill and ungratefully in deserting him his own vessel filled to the brim with grief had he not let the waters of its bitterness overflow into the heart of the shoemaker the wail of that violin echoed now in robert's heart not for Flodden, not for himself, but for the debased nature that drew forth the plaint. Comrades in misery, why should they part? What right had he to forsake an old friend and benefactor because he himself was unhappy? He would go and see him the very next night, and he would make friends once more with the much-suffering instrument he had so wrongfully despised. End. Chapter 1book two chapter two of robert falconer by george macdonald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the stroke the following night he left his books on the table and the house itself behind him and sped like a greyhound to dubal sandy's shop lifted the latch and entered by the light of a single dip set on a chair, he saw the shoemaker seated on his stool, one hand lying on the lap of his leather apron, the other hand hanging down by his side, and the fiddle on the ground at his feet. His wife stood behind him, wiping her eyes with her blue apron. Through all its accumulated dirt, the face of the shoemaker looked ghastly, and they were eyes of despair that he lifted to the face of the youth as he stood holding the latch in his hand. Mrs. Alexander moved towards Robert, drew him in, and gently closed the door behind him, resuming her station like a sculptured mourner behind her motionless husband. "'What on arse the matter with ye, Sandy?' said Robert. "'Eh, Robert,' returned the shoemaker, and a tone of affection tinged the mournfulness with which he uttered the strange words. "'Eh, Robert, the Almighty will go on his own gate, and I'm in his group now.' He's had a stroke, said his wife, without removing her apron from her eyes. I have gotten my blows, resumed the shoemaker, in a despairing voice, which gave yet more effort to the fantastic eccentricity of conscience, which, from the midst of so many grave faults, chose such a one as especially bringing the divine displeasure upon him. I have gotten my blows for crying doing my own old wife to set up your bonny lady. The one's gone all to ashes and dust, and from the other, he went on looking down on the violin at his feet, as if it had been something dead in its youth, and from the other, I cannot draw a sound, for my right hand has forgotten her cunning. Man, Robert, I cannot lift it from my side. 
"'You mount go on to your bed,' said Robert, greatly concerned. "'Oh, ay, I mount go on to my bed, and sign to the kirkyard, and sign to hell. Can that wheel enough? "'Robert, I leave my fiddle to you. Be good to the old wife, man, better nor I have been, and old wife's better nor nay fiddle.' He stooped, lifted the violin with his left hand, gave it to Robert, rose, and made for the door. They helped him up the creaking stair, got him half undressed, and laid him in his bed. Robert put the violin on the top of a press, within sight of the sufferer, left him groaning, and ran for the doctor. Having seen him set out for the patient's dwelling, he ran home to his grandmother. Now, while Robert was absent, occasion had arisen to look for him. Unusual occurrence, a visitor had appeared, no less a person than Mr. Innes, the schoolmaster. Shargar had been banished in consequence from the parlor, and had seated himself outside Robert's room, never doubting that Robert was inside. Presently he heard the bell ring, and Betty came up the stair, and said Robert was wanted. Thereupon Shargar knocked at the door, and as there was neither voice nor hearing, opened it, and found with the well-known horror that he had been watching an empty room. He made no haste to communicate the fact. Robert might return in a moment, and his absence from the house not be discovered. He sat down on the bedstead and waited. But Betty came up again, and before Shargar could prevent her, walked into the room with her candle in her hand. In vain did Shargar entreat her to go and say that Robert was coming. Betty would not risk the danger of discovery and connivance, and descended to open afresh the fountain of the old lady's anxiety. She did not, however, betray her disquietude to Mr. Innes. She had asked the schoolmaster to visit her, in order that she might consult him about Robert's future. Mr. Innes expressed a high opinion of the boy's faculties and attainments, and strongly urged that he should be sent to college. Mrs. Falconer inwardly shuddered at the temptation to which this course would expose him, but he must leave home or be apprenticed to some trade. She would have chosen the latter, I believe, but for religion towards the boy's parents, who would never have thought of other than a profession for him. While the schoolmaster was dwelling on the argument that he was pretty sure to gain a good bursary, and she would thus be relieved for four years, probably forever, from further expense on his account, Robert entered. Where have ye been, Robert? asked Mrs. Falconer. At Dubal Sanny's, answered the boy. What have ye been at there? Helping him till his bed. What come o'er him? A stroke. That's what comes of playing the fiddle. I never heard of a stroke coming from a fiddle, Granny. It comes from a clued whiles. If he had holden to his fiddle, he would have been playing her the night in place of arm lying at his side and shoemaker's thread. Hm, said his grandmother, concealing her indignation at this freedom of speech. He did not believe in God's judgments. Not upon fiddles, returned Robert. Mr. Innes sat and said nothing, with difficulty, concealing his amusement at the passage of arms. It was within the last few days that Robert had become capable of speaking thus. His nature had at length arrived at the point of so far casting off the incubus of his grandmother's authority as to assert some measure of freedom and act openly. His very hopelessness of a hearing in heaven had made him indifferent to things on earth, and therefore bolder. Thus, strange as it may seem, the blessing of God descended on him in the despair which enabled him to speak out and free his soul from the weight of concealment. But it was not despair alone that gave him strength. On his way home from the shoemakers, he had been thinking what he could do for him, and had resolved, come of it what might, that he would visit him every evening and try whether he could not comfort him a little by playing upon his violin so that it was loving-kindness towards man as well as despair towards god that gave him strength to resolve that between him and his grandmother all should be above board from henceforth not upon fiddles robert had said but upon them at plays them returned his grandmother nay nor upon them at burns them returned robert impudently 
it must be confessed, for every man is open to commit the fault of which he is the least capable. But Mrs. Falconer had too much regard to her own dignity to indulge her feelings. Possibly, too, her sense of justice, which Falconer always said was stronger than that of any other woman he had ever known, as well as some movement of her conscience, interfered. She was silent, and Robert rushed into the breach which his last discharge had effected. "'And I want to tell ye, Granny, that I mean to go on and play the fiddle to poor Sanny ilka night for the best part of an oor, and except ye lock the door and hide the key, I will go on. The poor sinner shall not be deserted by God and man both.' He scarcely knew what he was saying before it was out of his mouth, and as if to cover it up he hurried on. "'And there's more in it. Dr. Anderson gave Shargar and me a sovereign the piece, and double Sanny have them to hold him on dead of hunger and cold. What for did not ye tell me at Dr. Anderson had given ye such a sight of silver? It was ill far to ye, and him as weel. Cause ye would have sent it back to him, and Shargar and me thought we would rather keep it. Considering that I'm at same muckle expense with ye both, it would not have been ill contrived to have brought the silver to me, and let me do with it as I thought fit. Go on now away, laddie, she added, as she saw Robert about to leave the room. I'll be back in a minute, Granny, returned Robert. He's a fine lad, that, said Mr. Innes, and good'll come of him, and that'll be heard, tell of. If he had but the grace of God, there would not be muckle to complain of, acquiesced his grandmother. There's time enough for that, Mrs. Falconer. You cannot get old heads upon young shoulders, ye can. Deed, for that matter, you may get money an old head upon old shoulders, and nae a spark of grace in it, to let it see who to lay itself down in the grave. Robert returned before Mr. Innes had made up his mind as to whether the old lady intended a personal rebuke. Hey, Granny he said, going up to her and putting the two sovereigns in her white palm. He had found some difficulty in making Shargar give up his, else he would have returned sooner. "'What's this of it, laddie?' said Mrs. Falconer. "'Oh, it's I'm not going to take your siller. Let the poor shoemaker creatures have it, but do not give them more nor a shilling or two at once, just to hold them in life. They deserve have more, but they ma not starve. And just ye tell them, laddie, as if they spend a sixpence of it upon whiskey, they's getting nae more. Ay, ay, Granny, responded Robert, with a glimmer of gladness in his heart. And what about the fiddling, Granny? he added, half playfully, hoping for some kind concession therein as well. But he had gone too far. She vouchsafed no reply, and her face grew stern with offence. It was one thing to give bread to eat, another to give music and gladness. No music but that which sprung from effectual calling and the perseverance of the saints could be lawful in a world that was under the wrath and curse of God. Robert waited in vain for a reply. "'Go on your ways,' she said at length. "'Mr. Innes and me has some business to make and end of, and we want nae assistance.' Robert rejoined Shargar, who was still bemoaning the loss of his sovereign. His face brightened when he saw its well-known yellow shine once more, but darkened again as soon as Robert told him to what service it was now devoted. "'It's my own,' he said with a suppressed expostulatory growl. Robert threw the coin on the floor. "'Take your filthy lucre,' he exclaimed with contempt, and turned to leave Shargar alone in the garret with his sovereign. Pob! Shargar almost screamed, Take it, or I'll cut my throat. This was his constant threat when he was thoroughly in earnest. Cut it and have done with it, said Robert cruelly. Shargar burst out crying. Lend me your knife then, Bob, he sobbed, holding out his hand. Robert burst into a roar of laughter, caught up the sovereign from the floor, sped with it to the bakers, who refused to change it because he had no knowledge of anything representing the sum of twenty shillings except a pound note, succeeded in getting silver for it at the bank, and then ran to the shoemakers. After he left the parlour, the discussion of his fate was resumed, and finally settled between his grandmother and the schoolmaster. 
the former in regard of the boy's determination to befriend the shoemaker in the matter of music as well as of money would now have sent him at once to the grammar school in old aberdeen to prepare for the competition in the month of november but the latter persuaded her that if the boy gave his whole attention to latin till the next summer and then went to the grammar school for three months or so he would have an excellent chance of success as to the violin the schoolmaster said wisely enough he that will to cupar mount to cupar and if ye intercept him upon the shore road he'll take to the hill road and i was warrant a braw lad like robert to get money an own in aberdeen will be ready enough to give him a lift with the fiddle and maybe take him into war company nor the poor bedridden shoemaker and will you on me to hang on to the tail of him like he cannot go on o'er the cliff afore he learns wit hm <clears throat> was the old lady's comprehensive response it was further arranged that robert should be informed of their conclusion and so roused to effort in anticipation of the trial upon which his course in life must depend nothing could have been better for robert than the prospect of a college education but his first thought at the news was not of the delights of learning nor of the honourable course that would ensue but of eric ericson the poverty-stricken friendless descendant of jarls and sea rovers he would see him the only man that understood him not until the passion of this thought had abated did he begin to perceive the other advantages before him but so practical and thorough was he in all his proposals and means that ere half an hour was gone he had begun to go over his rudiments again he now wrote a version or translation from english into latin five times a week and read caesar virgil or tacitus every day he gained permission from his grandmother to remove his bed to his own garret and there from the bedstead at which he no longer kneeled he would often rise at four in the morning even when the snow lay a foot thick on the skylight kindle his lamp by means of a tinder-box and a splinter of wood dipped in a sulphur and sitting down in the keen coal turned half a page of addison into something as near ciceronian latin as he could effect this would take him from an hour and a half to two hours when he would tumble again into bed blue and stiff and sleep till it was time to get up and go to the morning school before breakfast his health was excellent, else it could never have stood such treatment. End Book Two, Chapter Two. Book Two, Chapter Three of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by george macdonald chapter three the end crowns all his sole relaxation almost lay in the visit he paid every evening to the shoemaker and his wife their home was a wretched place but notwithstanding the poverty in which they were now sunk robert soon began to see a change like the dawning of light an alba as the italians called the dawn in the appearance of something white here and there about the room robert's visits had set the poor woman trying to make the place look decent it soon became at least clean and there is a very real sense in which cleanliness is next to godliness if the people who want to do good among the poor would give up patronizing them would cease from trying to convert them before they have gained the smallest personal influence with them would visit them as those who have just as good a right to be here as they have it would be all the better for both perhaps chiefly for themselves for the first week or so alexander unable either to work or play and deprived of his usual consolation of drink was very testy and unmanageable if robert who strove to do his best in the hope of alleviating the poor fellow's sufferings chiefly those of the mind happened to mistake the time or to draw a false note from the violin sandy would swear as if he had been the grand turk and robert one of his slaves but robert was too vexed with himself when he gave occasion to such an outburst to mind the outburst itself 
and invariably when such had taken place the shoemaker would ask forgiveness before he went holding out his left hand from which nothing could efface the stains of rosin and lamp black and heel ball save the sweet cleansing of mother earth he would say robert ye'll just pit the swearin doon with the rest and score it oot altogether i'm an ill-tongued wretch and i'm beginning to see it but man you're just behaving to me like god himself and if it war not for you i would just lie here roaring and gratin and dammin from morning to night ye will be in the morn's night will not ye he would always end by asking with some anxiety of course i will robert would answer good night then good night I'll try and set a sight of my sins once more, he added one evening. If I could only be a wee bit sorry for them, I reckon he would forgive me. Do not you think he would, Robert? Ne doot, ne doot, answered Robert hurriedly. They all say that if a man repents the right gate, he'll forgive him. He could not say more than they say, for his own horizon was all dark, and even in saying this much he felt like a hypocrite a terrible waste heaped thick with the potsherds of hope lay outside that door of prayer which he had as he thought nailed up for ever and what is the right gate asked the shoemaker deed that's more nor i know sandy answered robert mournfully weel if ye do not know what's to come of me said alexander anxiously ye mount spare it himself returned robert and just tell him at ye do not know, but ye'll do anything at he likes. With these words he took his leave hurriedly, somewhat amazed to find that he had given the shoemaker the strange advice to try just what he had tried so unavailingly himself. And, stranger still, he found himself, before he reached home, praying once more in his heart, both for Dubal Sanny and for himself. From that hour a faint hope was within him, that some day he might try again, though he dared not yet encounter such effort and agony. All this time he had never doubted that there was a God, nor had he ventured to say within himself that perhaps God was not good. He had simply come to the conclusion that for him there was no approach to the fountain of his being. In the course of a fortnight or so, when his system had covered over its craving after whiskey, the irritability of the shoemaker almost vanished. It might have been feared that his conscience would then likewise relax its activity, but it was not so. It grew yet more tender. He now began to give Robert some praise and make allowances for his faults, and Robert dared more in consequence and played with more spirit. I do not say that his style could have grown fine under such a master, but at least he learned the difference between slovenliness and accuracy, and between accuracy and expression which last is all of original that the best mere performer can claim one evening he was scraping away at tolach gorham when mr mccleary walked in robert ceased the minister gave him one searching glance and sat down by the bedside robert would have left the room do not go on robert said sandy and robert remained the clergyman talked very faithfully as far as the shoemaker was concerned, though whether he was equally faithful towards God might be questioned. He was one of those prudent men who are afraid of dealing out the truth freely, lest it should fall on thorns or stony places. Hence, of course, the good ground came in for a scanty share, too. Believing that a certain precise condition of mind was necessary for its proper reception, he would endeavor to bring about that condition first. He did not know that the truth makes its own nest in the ready heart, and that the heart may be ready for it before the priest can perceive the fact, seeing that the imposition of hands confers, nowadays at least, neither love nor common sense. He therefore dwelt upon the sins of the shoemaker, magnifying them and making them hideous in the idea that thus he magnified the law and made it honorable, while of the special tenderness of God to the sinner he said not a word. Robert was offended, he scarcely knew what, with the minister's mode of treating his friend, and after Mr. McClary had taken a far kinder leave of them than God could approve, if he resembled his representation, Robert sat still, oppressed with darkness. "'It's all true,' said the shoemaker. "'But, man, Robert, did not you think the minister was some sore upon me?' "'I do think it,' 
answered Robert. Something bears it in upon me, at he would not be so sore upon me himself. There is something in the New Testament, some thought at spitting it into my head, though faith I did not know where to look for it. Cannot ye help me with, with it, man? Robert could think of nothing but the parable of the prodigal son. Mrs. Alexander got him the New Testament, and he read it. She sat at the foot of the bed listening. There, cried the shoemaker triumphantly, I tell it ye so. Not a word about the poor lad's sins. It was all a hurry and a scurry to get the new shoon upon him, and win at the caffy and the fiddlin' and the dancin'. Oh, Lord, he broke out, I'm comin' home as fast as I can, but my sins are just like shoes down at heel upon my feet, and will not let me. I expect nae ring and nae robe, but I would fain have a fiddle in my group when the nest prodigal comes home, and if I do not fiddle well, it's no be my white. Eh, man, but that is what I call good on, the minister said, honest man, just blather till it. Oh, Lord, I swear if ever I went up again, I'll put in ilka stitch as if the shoon were for the feet of the prodigal himself. It shall be good work, O oh Lord, and I'll never let taste of whiskey into my mouth, nor smell of whiskey into my nose, if so be it I can help it. I swear it, O oh Lord, and if I be not raised up again. Here his voice trembled and ceased, and silence ensued for a short minute. Then he called his wife. Come here, Bell. Give me a kiss, my bonny lass. I have been an ill man to you. Nay, nay, Sandy, ye have I been good to me, better nor I deserve. Ye have been naebody's enemy but your own. Hold your tongue, your spaken war blathers, nor the minister, honest man. I tell ye I have been a scoundrel to ye. I have not ever holden my hands off of ye, and eh, ye were a bonny lass when I married ye. I have spoiled ye altogether. But if I were up, see, if I would not give ye a new goon, and that would be something to make ye like yourself again. I'm affronted with myself, and I have been such a brute of a man to ye. But ye mount forgive me, noo, for I do believe in my heart at the Lord's forgiven me. Give me another kiss, lass. God be praised, and many thanks to you. Ye might have run away from me long or new, and anybody would have said ye did right. Robert, play a spring. Absorbed in his own thoughts, Robert began to play the e way with the crooked horn. Hoots, hoots, cried Sandy angrily. What are ye aboot? Nay more that, I have done with that. What's in the head of ye, man? What'll I play then, Sandy? asked Robert meekly. Play the land of the leal, or my nan is away, or something of that kind. I'll be leal to ye, new bell, and ye will not pre of the wusky nor more lass cannot bide the smell of it cried bell sobbing robert struck in with the land of the leal when he had played it over two or three times he laid the fiddle in its place and departed able just to see by the light of the neglected candle that bell sat on the bedside stroking the rosiny hand of her husband the rhinoceros hide of which was yet delicate enough to let the love through to his heart after this the shoemaker never called his fiddle his old wife Robert walked home with his head sunk on his breast. Dual Sanny, the drinking, ranting, swearing shoemaker, was inside the wicked gate, and he was left outside, for all his prayers with the arrows from the castle of Beelzebub sticking in his back. He would have another try some day, but not yet. He dared not. Henceforth Robert had more to do in reading the New Testament than in playing the fiddle to the shoemaker, though they never parted without an error or two. Sandy continued hopeful and generally cheerful, with alternations which the reading generally fixed on the right side for the night. Robert never attempted any comments, but left him to take from the word what nourishment he could. There was no return of strength to the helpless arm, and his constitution was gradually yielding. The rumor got abroad that he was a changed character. How is not far to seek, for Mr. McCleary fancied himself the honored instrument of his conversion, whereas paralysis and the New Testament were the chief agents, and even the violin had more share in it than the minister. For the Spirit of God lies all about the spirit of man like a mighty sea, ready to rush in at the smallest chink in the walls that shut him out from his own. 
walls which even the tone of a violin afloat on the wind of that spirit is sometimes enough to rend from battlement to base as the blast of the ram's horns rent the walls of jericho and now to the day of his death the shoemaker had need of nothing food wine and delicacies were sent him by many who while they considered him outside of the kingdom would have troubled themselves in no way about him what with visits of condolence and flattery inquiries into his experience and long prayers by his bedside they now did their best to send him back among the swine the shoemaker's humour however aided by his violin was a strong antidote against these evil influences i do it i'm going to be robert he said at length one evening as the lad sat by his bedside weel that will not do ye na ill answered robert adding with just a touch of bitterness ye need not care about that i do not care about the dean of it but i just want to live long enough to let the lord know at i'm in doon right earnest about it i have nay chance of drinking as long as i'm lying here never ye fret your head about that ye can trust that to him for it's his own business he'll see it ye're all right not ye think it he'll let ye off the lord forbid responded the shoemaker earnestly it mount be a pit and right it would be dreadful to be lotten off i would not have him content with cobbler's work i have it he resumed after a few minutes pause the lord's easy pleased but ill to satisfy i'm sore pleased with your playing robert but it's naething like the right thing yet it does me good to hear ye though for all that the very next night he found him evidently sinking fast robert took the violin and was about to play but the shoemaker stretched out his one left hand and took it from him laid it across his chest and his arm over it for a few moments as if he were bidding it farewell then held it out to robert saying "Ha, hey, robert she's yours that's a sore divorce maybe they'll have an extra fiddle where i'm going though think of all Rotherden shoemaker playing afore his grace. Robert saw that his mind was wandering and mingled the paltry honors of earth with the grand simplicities of heaven. He began to play the land of the leal. For a little while Sandy seemed to follow and comprehend the tones, but by slow degrees the light departed from his face. At length his jaw fell, and with a sigh the body parted from dual Sandy, and he went to God. His wife closed mouth and eyes without a word, laid the two arms equally powerless now straight by his sides, then seating herself on the edge of the bed, said, Do not bide, Robert. It's all over now. He's gone home, if I were only with him, wherever he is. She burst into tears, but dried her eyes a moment after, and seeing that Robert still lingered, said, Go on, Robert, and send Mistress Downey to me. Do not grieve, there's a good lad but take your fiddle and go on ye can be no more use robert obeyed with his violin in his hand he went home and with his violin still in his hand walked into his grandmother's parlour how dare ye bring such a thing into my house she said roused by the apparent defiance of her grandson how dare ye after what's come and gone cause dual sandy's come and gone granny and left nothing but this ahind him and this one's mine, whatsoever the other might be. His wife's left with, with a plaque, and I's warrant the good folk of Rotherden will not make so muckle of her new at her man's away, for she never was such a randy as he was, and the triumph of grace in her is but small, therefore. So I maun make the best at I can of the fiddle for her, and ye maun not touch this one, Granny, for though ye may think it right to burn fiddles, other folk does not and this has to do with other folk granny it's no atween you and me ye know robert went on fearful lest she might consider herself divinely commissioned to extirpate the whole race of stringed instruments for i mount sell it for her take it out of my sight said mrs falconer and said no more he carried the instrument up to his room laid it on his bed locked his door put the key in his pocket and descended to the parlour He's dead, is he? said his grandmother, as he re-entered. Ay, he is, granny, answered Robert. He died a repentant man. And a believin', asked Mrs. Falconer. 
Weel, Granny, I cannot say at he believed a thing at ever was, for a body might not know a thing. Toots, laddie, was it saving faith? I do not rightly know what you mean by that, but I'm thinking it was muckle the same kind of faith that the prodigal had, for they both turned and go home. Deed, maybe you're right, laddie, returned Mrs. Falconer after a moment's thought. We'll hope the best. All the remainder of the evening she sat motionless, with her eyes fixed on the rug before her, thinking, no doubt, of the repentance and salvation of the fiddler, and what hope there might yet be for her own lost son. The next day being Saturday, Robert set out for body fall, taking the violin with him. He went alone, for he was in no mood for Shargar's company. It was a fine spring day, the woods were budding, and the fragrance of the larches floated across his way. There was a lovely sadness in the sky, and in the motions of the air, and in the scent of the earth, as if they all knew that fine things were at hand, which never could be so beautiful as those that had gone away. And Robert wondered how it was that everything should look so different. Even body fault seemed to have lost its enchantment, though his friends were as kind as ever. Mr. Lammy went into a rage at the story of the lost violin, and Miss Lammy cried from sympathy with Robert's distress at the fate of his bonny laddie. Then he came to the occasion of his visit, which was to beg Mr. Lammy, when next he went to Aberdeen, to take the shoemaker's fiddle and get what he could for it to help his widow. Poor Sandy, said Robert, it never came into his head to sell her, no more nor if she had been the old wife that he called her. Mr. Lammy undertook the commission, and the next time he saw Robert handed him ten pounds as the result of the negotiation. It was all Robert could do, however, to get the poor woman to take the money. She looked at it with repugnance, almost as if it had been the price of blood. But Robert, having succeeded in overcoming her scruples, she did take it, and therewith provide a store of sweeties and reels of cotton and tobacco for sale in Sandy's workshop. She certainly did not make money by her merchandise, for her anxiety to be honest rose to the absurd, but she contrived to live without being reduced to prey upon her own gingerbread and rock. End Chapter 3book two chapter four of robert falconer by george macdonald this librivox recording is in the public domain robert falconer by george macdonald chapter four the aberdeen garret miss st john had long since returned from her visit but having heard how much robert was taken up with his dying friend she judged it better to leave her intended proposal of renewing her lessons alone for the present. Meeting him, however, soon after Alexander's death, she introduced the subject, and Robert was enraptured at the prospect of the reopening of the gates of his paradise. If he did not inform his grandmother of the fact, neither did he attempt to conceal it, but she took no notice, thinking probably that the whole affair would be effectually disposed of by his departure. Till that period arrived, he had a lesson almost every evening, and Miss St. John was surprised to find how the boy had grown since the door was built up. Robert's gratitude grew into a kind of worship. The evening before his departure for Bodyfold, whence his grandmother had arranged that he should start for Aberdeen, in order that he might have the company of Mr. Lammy, whom business drew thither about the same time, as he was having his last lesson, Mrs. Forsyth left the room. Thereupon Robert, who had been dejected all day at the thought of the separation from Miss St. John, found his heart beating so violently that he could hardly breathe. Probably she saw his emotion, for she put her hand on the keys as if to cover it by showing him how some movement was to be better effected. He seized her hand and lifted it to his lips, but when he found that instead of snatching it away she yielded it, nay, gently pressed it to his face, he burst into tears and dropped on his knees as if before a goddess. Hush, Robert, don't be foolish, she said quietly and tenderly. Here is my aunt coming. The same moment he was at the piano again playing My Bonny Lady Anne, so as to astonish Miss St. John and himself as well. 
Then he rose, bade a hasty good night, and hurried away. A strange conflict arose in his mind at the prospect of leaving the old place, on every house of whose streets, on every swell of whose surrounding hills, he left the clinging shadows of thought and feeling. A faintly purpled mist arose and enwrapped all the past, changing even his gayest troubles into tales of fairyland and his deepest griefs into songs of a sad music. Then he thought of Shargar and what was to become of him after he was gone. The lad was paler and his eyes were redder than ever, for he had been weeping in secret. He went to his grandmother and begged that Shargar might accompany him to Body Falls. He mount bide at home and mine his books, she answered, for he will not have them that muckle longer. He mount be doing something for himself. So the next morning the boys parted, Shargar to school and Robert to Body Falls. Shargar left behind with his desolation, his sun gone down in a west that was not even stormy, only grey and hopeless, and Robert moving towards an east which reflected, like a faint prophecy, the west behind him tinged with love, death, and music, but mingled the colours with its own saffron of coming dawn. When he reached Bodyfold, he marvelled to find that all its glory had returned. He found Miss Lammy busy among the rich yellow pools in her dairy, and went out into the garden now in the height of its summer. Great cabbage roses hung heavy-headed splendors towards purple-black heart's eases, and thin filmed silvery pods of honesty. Tall white lilies mingled with the blossoms of current bushes, and at their feet the narcissi of old classic legend pressed their warm-hearted paleness into the plebeian thicket of the many striped gardener's garters. It was a lovely type of commonwealth indeed, of the garden of the kingdom of God. His whole mind was flooded with the sense of sunny wealth. The farmer's neglected garden blossomed into higher glory in his soul. The bloom and the richness and the use were all there, but instead of each flower was a delicate, ethereal sense of feeling about that flower. Of these, how gladly would he have gathered a posy to offer Miss St. John. But alas, he was no poet. Or rather, he had but the half of the poet's inheritance. He could see. He could not say. But even if he had been full of poetic speech, he would yet have found that the half of his posy remained ungathered. For although we have speech enough now to be cousin to the deed, as Chaucer says, it must always be we have not yet enough speech to cousin the tenth part of our feelings let him who doubts recall one of his own vain attempts to convey that which made the oddest of dreams entrancing in loveliness to convey that aroma of thought the conscience absence of which made him a fool in his own eyes when he spoke such silly words as alone presented themselves for the service I can no more describe the emotion aroused in my mind by a grey cloud parting over a grey stone, by the smell of a sweet pea, by the sight of one of those long upright pennons of striped grass with the homely name, than I can tell what the glory of God is who made these things. The man whose poetry is like nature in this, that it produces individual, incommunicable moods and conditions of mind, a sense of elevated, tender, marvellous, and effervescent existence, must be a poet indeed. Every dawn of such a feeling is a light-brushed bubble, rendering visible for a moment the dark, unknown sea of our being, which lies beyond the lights of our consciousness, and is the stuff and the region of our eternal growth. But think what language must become before it will tell dreams, before it will convey the delicate shades of fancy, that come and go in the brain of a child before it will let a man know wherein one face differeth from another face in glory i suspect however that for such purposes it is rather music than articulation that is needful that with the hope of these finer results the language must rather be turned into music than logically extended the next morning he awoke at early dawn hearing the birds at his window he rose and went out the air was clear and fresh as a new-made soul. Bars of mottled cloud were bent across the eastern quarter of the sky, which lay like a great ethereal ocean ready for the launch of the ship of glory that was now gliding towards its edge. Everything was waiting to conduct him across the far horizon to the south, where lay the stored-up wonder of his coming life. 
The lark sang of something greater than he could tell. The wind got up, whispered at it, and lay down to sleep again. The sun was at hand to bathe the world in the light and gladness, alone fit to typify the radiance of Robert's thoughts. The clouds that formed the shore of the upper sea were already burning from saffron into gold. A moment more and the first insupportable sting of light would shoot from behind the edge of that low blue hill, and the first day of his new life would be begun. He watched, and it came. The wellspring of day, fresh and exuberant, as if now first from the holy will of the Father of Lights, gushed into the basin of the world, and the world was more glad than tongue or pen can tell. The supernal light alone, dawning upon the human heart, can exceed the marvel of such a sunrise. And shall life itself be less beautiful than one of its days? Do not believe it, young brother. Men called the shadow, thrown upon the universe, where their own dusky souls come between it and the eternal sun, life, and then mourn that it should be less bright than the hopes of their childhood. Keep thou thy soul translucent, that thou mayest never see its shadow, at least never abuse thyself with the philosophy which calls that shadow life. Or rather, would I say, become thou pure in heart, and thou shalt see God, whose vision alone is life. Just as the sun rushed across the horizon, he heard the tramp of a heavy horse in the yard, passing from the stable to the cart that was to carry his trunk to the turnpike road, three miles off, where the coach would pass. Then Miss Lammy came and called him to breakfast, and there sat the farmer in his Sunday suit of black already busy. Robert was almost too happy to eat, yet he had not swallowed two mouthfuls before the sun rose unheeded, the lark sang unheeded, and the roses sparkled with the dew that bowed yet lower their heavy heads, all unheeded. By the time they had finished, Mr. Lammy's gig was at the door, and they mounted and followed the cart. Not even the recurring doubts and fear that hollowness was at the heart of it all, for that God could not mean such rainless gladness, prevented the truth of the present joy from sinking deep into the lad's heart. In his mind he saw a boat moored to a rock, with no one on board, heaving on the waters of a rising tide and waiting to bear him out on the sea of the unknown. The picture arose of itself. There was no paradise of the West in his imagination, as in that of a boy of the sixteenth century to authorize its appearance. It rose again and again. The dew glittered as if the light were its own. The sun shone as he had never seen it shine before. The very mare that sped them along held up her head and stepped out as if she felt it the finest of mornings. Had she also a future, poor old mare? Might there not be a paradise somewhere? And if in the furthest star instead of next-door America, why so much the more might the Atlantis of the nineteenth century surpass Manoa, the golden of the seventeenth? The gig and the cart reached the road together. One of the men who had accompanied the cart took the gig, and they were left on the roadside with Robert's trunk and box, the latter a present from Miss Lammy. Their places had been secured, and the guard knew where he had to take them up. Long before the coach appeared, the notes of his horn, as like the color of his red coat as the blindest of men could imagine, came echoing from the side of the heathery, stony hill under which they stood, so that Robert turned wondering, as if the chariot of his desires had been coming over the top of Drumsnag, to carry him into a heaven where all labor was delight. But round the corner in front came the four-in-hand red mail instead. She pulled up gallantly. The wheelers lay on their hind quarters, and the leaders parted theirs from the pole. The boxes were hoisted up. Mr. Lammy climbed, and Robert scrambled to his seat. The horn blew. The coachman spake oracularly. The horses obeyed, and away went the gorgeous symbol of sovereignty careering through the submissive region. Nor did Robert's delight abate during the journey certainly not when he saw the blue line of the sea in the distance a marvel and yet a fact mrs falconer had consulted the mrs napier who had many acquaintances in aberdeen as to a place proper for robert and suitable to her means upon this point miss letty not without a certain touch of design as may appear in the course of my story had been able to satisfy her in a small house of two floors and a garret in the old town, Mr. Lammy took leave of Robert. 
It was from a garret window still, but a storm window now, that Robert looked, eastward, across fields and sandhills, to the blue expanse of waters, not blue like southern seas, but slaty blue, like the eyes of northmen. It was rather dreary. The sun was shining from overhead now, casting short shadows and much heat. The dew was gone up, and the lark had come down. He was alone. The end of his journey was come, and was not anything very remarkable. His landlady interrupted his gaze to know what he would have for dinner, but he declined to use any discretion in the matter. When she left the room, he did not return to the window, but sat down upon his box. His eye fell upon the other, a big wooden cube. Of its contents he knew nothing. He would amuse himself by making inquisition. It was nailed up. He borrowed a screwdriver and opened it. At the top lay a linen bag full of oatmeal. Underneath that was a thick layer of oat cake. Underneath that two cheeses, a pound of butter, and six pots of jam, which ought to have tasted of roses, for it came from the old garden where the roses lived in such sweet companionship with the currant bushes. Underneath that, etc., and underneath etc., a box which strangely recalled Shargar's garret and one of the closets therein. With beating heart he opened it, and lo, to his marvel, and with the restoration of all the fair day, there was the violin which Dubal Sandy had left him when he forsook her for some one or other of the queer instruments of Fra Angelico's angels. In a flutter of delight he sat down on his trunk again and played the most mournful tunes. Two white pigeons, which had been talking to each other in the heat of the roof, came one on each side of the window and peeped into the room, and out between them, as he played, Robert saw the sea and the blue sky above it. Is it any wonder that, instead of turning to the lying pages and contorted sentences of the Livy, which he had already unpacked from his box, he forgot all about school and college, and went on playing till his landlady brought up his dinner, which he swallowed hastily that he might return to the spells of his enchantress. End chapter 4book two chapter five of robert falconer by george macdonald this librivox recording is in the public domain robert falconer by george macdonald chapter five the competition i could linger with gladness even over this part of my hero's history if the school work was dry it was thorough if that academy had no sweetly shadowing trees, if it did stand within a parallelogram of low stone walls containing a roughly gravelled court, if all the region about suggested hot stones and sand, beyond still was the sea and the sky, and that court morning and afternoon was filled with the shouts of eager boys kicking the football with mad rushings to and fro, and sometimes with wounds and faintings, fit symbol of the equally resultless ambition with which many of them would follow the game of life in the years to come shock-headed highland colts and rough lowland steers as many of them were out of that group out of the roughest of them would emerge in time a few gentlemen not of the type of your trim self-contained clerical exquisite but large-hearted courteous gentlemen for whom a man may thank god and if the master was stern and hard, he was true. If the pupils feared him, they yet cared to please him. If there might be found not a few more widely read scholars than he, it would be hard to find a better teacher. Robert leaned to the collar and labored, not greatly moved by ambition, but much by the hope of the bursary and the college life in the near distance. Not unfrequently he would rush into the thick of the football game, fight like a maniac for one short burst, and then retire and look on. He oftener regarded than mingled. He seldom joined his fellows after school hours, for his work lay both upon his conscience and his hopes. But if he formed no very deep friendships among them, at least he made no enemies, for he was not selfish, and in virtue of the Celtic blood in him, was invariably courteous. His habits were in some things altogether irregular, he never went out for a walk, but sometimes looking up from his Virgil or his Latin version, and seeing the blue expanse in the distance breaking into white under the viewless wing of the summer wind, 
he would fling down his dictionary or his pen, rush from his garret and fly in a straight line like a seagull weary of lake and river down to the waste shore of the great deep. This was all that stood for the Arabian nights of moon-blossomed marble. All the rest was Aberdeen days of Latin and labor. Slowly the hours went, and yet the dreaded, hoped-for day came quickly. The quadrangle of the stone-crowned college grew more awful in its silence and emptiness every time Robert passed it, and the professor's houses looked like the sentry-boxes of the angels of learning, soon to come forth and judge the feeble mortals who dared present a claim to their recognition. October faded softly by with its keen, fresh mornings and cold memorial green horizon evenings, whose stairs fell like the stray blossoms of a more heavenly world from some ghostly wind of space that had caught them up on its awful shoreless sweep november came chill and dear with its heartless hopeless nothingness but as if to mock the poor competitors rose after three days of scotch mist in a lovely halcyon day of st martin's summer through whose long shadows anxious young faces gathered in the quadrangle or under the arcade, each with his Ainsworth dictionary, the sole book allowed under his arm. But when the sacrist appeared and unlocked the public school, and the black-gowned professor walked into the room, and the door was left open for the candidates to follow, then indeed a great awe fell upon the assembly, and the lads crept into their seats as if to a trial for life before a bench of the incorruptible. They took their places, a portion of Robertson's History of Scotland was given them to turn into Latin, and soon there was nothing to be heard in the assembly but the turning of the leaves of dictionaries and the scratching of pens constructing the first rough copy of the Latinized theme. It was done. Four weary hours, nearly five, one or two of which passed like minutes, the others as if each minute had been an hour, went by. And Robert, in a kind of desperation after a final reading of the Latin, gave in his paper and left the room. When he got home, he asked his landlady to get him some tea. Till it was ready, he would take his violin. But even the violin had grown dull and would not speak freely. He returned to the torture, took out his first copy, and went over it once more. Horror of horrors, a maxi, that is, a maximus error. Mary, Queen of Scots, had been left so far behind in the beginning of the paper that she forgot the rights of her sex in the middle of it, and in the accusative of a future participle passive, I do not know if more modern grammarians have a different name for the growth, had submitted to be doom, and her rightful dom was henceforth and forever debarred. He rose, rushed out of the house, down through the garden, across two fields and a wide road, across the links, and so did the moaning lip of the sea, for it was moaning that night, from the last bulwark of the sand hills he dropped upon the wet sands, and there he paced up and down. How long God only who was watching him knew, with the low limitless form of the murmuring lip lying out and out into the sinking sky like the life that lay low and hopeless before him, for the want at most of twenty pounds a year, that was the highest bursary then, to lift him into a region of possible well-being. Suddenly a strange phenomenon appeared within him. The subject hitherto became the object to a new birth of consciousness. He began to look at himself. There's a sair bit in there, he said, as if his own bosom had been that of another mortal. What's to be done with it? I doot it, maun bite it. Weel, that creature had better bite it quietly and new cry out. Lie doon and hold your tongue. Sorrow to a hod meritrex ask ye brute. He burst out laughing after a doubtful and ogulent fashion, I dare say, but he went home, took up his old wife, and played Tulocorum some fifty times over with extemporized variations. The next day he had to translate a passage from Tacitus, after executing which somewhat heartlessly he did not open a Latin book for a whole week. The very sight of one was disgusting to him. He wandered about the new town, along Union Street, and up and down the stairs that led to the lower parts, haunted the quay, watched the vessels, learned their forms, their parts, and capacities, made friends with a certain Dutch captain whom he heard playing the violin in his cabin, and on the whole, notwithstanding the wretched prospect before him, 
contrive to spend the week with considerable enjoyment nor does an occasional episode of lounging hurt a life with any true claims to the epic form the day of decision at length arrived again the black-robed powers assembled and again the hoping fearing lads some of them not lads men and mere boys gathered to hear their fate name after name was called out a twenty-pound bursary to the first one of seventeen to the next three or four of fifteen and fourteen and so on for about twenty and still no robert falconer at last lagging wearily in the rear he heard his name went up listlessly and was awarded five pounds he crept home wrote to his grandmother and awaited her reply it was not long in coming for although the carrier was generally the medium of communication miss letty had contrived to send the answer by coach it was to the effect that his grandmother was sorry that he had not been more successful but that mr innes thought it would be quite worth while to try again and he must therefore come home for another year this was mortifying enough though not so bad as it might have been robert began to pack his box but before he had finished it he shut the lid and sat upon it to meet miss st john thus disgraced was more than he could bear if he remained he had a chance of winning prizes at the end of the session and that would more than repair his honour the five-pound bursars were privileged in paying half-fees and if he could only get some teaching he could manage but who would employ a bijan when a magistrand might be had for next to nothing besides who would recommend him the thought of dr anderson flashed into his mind and he rushed from the house without even knowing where he lived End chapter five Book two chapter six of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Robert Falconer by George MacDonald Chapter six Dr. Anderson again At the post office he procured the desired information at once. Dr. Anderson lived in Union Street towards the western end of it away went robert to find the house that was easy what a grand house of smooth granite and wide approach it was the great door was opened by a man-servant who looked at the country boy from head to foot is the doctor in asked robert yes i would like to see him what will i say wants him say the laddie he saw at body fall the man left robert in the hall which was spread with tiger and leopard skins and had a bright fire burning in a large stove returning presently he led him through noiseless swing doors covered with cloth into a large library never had robert conceived such luxury but with turkey carpet crimson curtains easy chairs grandly bound books and morocco covered writing table it seemed the very ideal of comfort but robert liked the grandeur too much to be abashed by it sit ye doin there said the servant and the doctor will be with ye in a minute he was hardly out of the room before a door opened in the middle of the books and the doctor appeared in a long dressing-gown he looked inquiringly at robert for one moment then made two long strides like a pair of eager compasses holding out his hand i'm robert falconer said the boy ye will mind maybe doctor at ye were very kind to me once and tell it me lots of stories at bodyfall ye can i'm very glad to see you robert said dr anderson of course i remember you perfectly but my servant did not bring your name and i did not know but it might be the other boy i forget his name ye mean shargar sir it's no him i can see that said the doctor laughing although you are altered you have grown quite a man i am very glad to see you he repeated shaking hands with him again when did you come to town i have been at the grammar school in the old tune for the last three months said robert three months exclaimed dr anderson and never came to see me till now that was too bad of you robert well you see sir i did not know better 
and I had a heap to do, and all for naething after all. But if I had known that you would like to see me, I would have liked it weel to come to you. I have been away most of the summer, said the doctor, but I have been at home for the last month. You haven't had your dinner, have you? Weel, I did not exactly know what to say, sir. You see, I was not that sharp set the day, so I had just a mouthful of bread and cheese. I'm turning hungry now, I'm on confess. The doctor rang the bell. You must stop and dine with me. Johnston, he continued, as his servant entered, tell the cook that I have a gentleman to dinner with me today, and she must be liberal. Good sake, sir, said Robert, do not set the woman again me. He had no intention of saying anything humorous, but Dr. Anderson laughed heartily. Come into my room till dinner time, he said, opening the door by which he had entered. To Robert's astonishment, he found himself in a room bare as that of the poorest cottage, a small square window, small as the window in John Hewson's, looked out upon a garden neatly kept, but now, having no adorning but cleanliness, the place was just the end of a cottage, the walls were whitewashed, the ceiling was of bare boards, and the floor was sprinkled with a little white sand. The table and chairs were of common deal, white and clean, save that the former was spotted with ink. A greater contrast to the soft, large, richly colored room they had left could hardly be imagined. A few bookshelves on the wall were filled with old books. A fire blazed cheerily in the little grate. A bed with snow-white coverlets stood in a recess. This is the nicest room in the house, Robert, said the doctor. When I was a student like you, Robert shook his head. I'm no student yet, he said, but the doctor went on. I had the bend end of my father's cottage to study in, for he treated me like a stranger gentleman when I came home from college. The father respected the son, for whose advantage he was working like a slave from morning till night. My heart is sometimes sore with the gratitude I feel to him, though he has been dead for thirty years. Would you believe it, Robert? Well, I can't talk more about him now. I made this room as like my father's as I could and I am happier here than anywhere in the world. By this time Robert was perfectly at home. Before the dinner was ready, he had not only told Dr. Anderson his present difficulty, but his whole story as far back as he could remember. The good man listened eagerly, gazed at the boy with more and more of interest, which deepened till his eyes glistened as he gazed, and when a ludicrous passage intervened, welcomed the laughter as an excuse for wiping them. When dinner was announced, he rose without a word and led the way to the dining room. Robert followed, and they sat down to a meal simple enough for such a house, but which to Robert seemed a feast followed by a banquet. For after they had done eating, on the doctor's part a very meagre performance, they retired to his room again, and then Robert found the table covered with a snowy cloth and wine and fruits arranged upon it. It was far into the night before he rose to go home. As he passed through a thick rain of pinpoint drops, he felt that although those cold granite houses with glimmering dead face stood like rows of sepulchres, he was in reality walking through an avenue of homes. Wet to the skin long before he reached Mrs. Fivey's in the old tune, he was notwithstanding as warm as the underside of a bird's wing, for he had to sit down and write to his grandmother, informing her that Dr. Anderson had employed him to copy for the printers a book of his upon the medical boards of India, and that as he was going to pay him for that and other work at a rate which would secure him ten shillings a week, it would be a pity to lose a year for the chance of getting a bursary next winter. The doctor did want the manuscript copied, and he knew that the only chance of getting Mrs. Falconer's consent to Robert's receiving any assistance from him was to make some business arrangement of that sort. He wrote to her the same night, and, after mentioning the unexpected pleasure of Robert's visit, not only explained the advantage to himself of the arrangement he had proposed, but set forth the greater advantage to Robert, inasmuch as he would thus be able in some measure to keep a hold of him. He judged that although Mrs. Falconer had no great opinion of his religion, she would yet consider his influence rather on the side of good than otherwise in the case of a boy else abandoned to his own resources. The end of it all was that his grandmother yielded, and Robert was straightway a Bichon, or yellow beak. Three days had he clothed 
in the red gown of the Aberdeen student, and had attended the humanity and Greek classrooms. On the evening of the third day he was seated at his table, preparing his Virgil for the next, when he found himself growing very weary, and no wonder, for except the walk of a few hundred yards to and from the college, he had had no open air for those three days. It was raining, in a persistent November fashion, and he thought of the sea away through the dark and the rain, tossing uneasily. Should he pay it a visit? He sat for a moment. This way and that dividing the swift mind. Tennyson's Morte Arthur. Atque animum nunc quot celerum nunc dividit illit. Aeneid 4, 2, 85. When his eye fell on his violin, he had been so full of his new position and its requirements that he had not touched it since the session opened. Now it was just what he wanted. He caught it up eagerly and began to play. The power of the music seized upon him, and he went on playing, forgetful of everything else, till a string broke. It was all too short for further use. Regardless of the rain or the depth of darkness to be traversed before he could find a music shop, he caught up his cap and went to rush from the house. His door opened immediately on the top step of the stair without any landing. There was a door opposite to which likewise a few steps led immediately up. The stairs from the two doors united a little below. So near were the doors that one might stride across the fork. The opposite door was open, and in it stood Eric Erickson. End chapter 6「Book Two, Chapter Seven of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Chapter Seven. Eric Erickson. Robert sprang across the dividing chasm, clasped Erickson's hand in both of his, looked up into his face, and stood speechless. Erickson returned the salute with a still kindness, tender and still. His face was like a grey morning sky of summer, from whose level cloud fields rain will fall before noon. So it was you, he said, playing the violin so well. I was doing my best, answered Robert. But eh, Mr. Erickson, I would have done better if I had known you was hearkening. You couldn't do better than your best, returned Eric, smiling. Ay, but your best might I grow better, you know, persisted Robert. Come into my room, said Erickson. This is Friday night, and there is nothing but chapel tomorrow, so we'll have talk instead of work. In another moment they were seated by a tiny coal fire in a room, one side of which was the slope of the roof, with the large low skylight in it looking seawards. The sound of the distant waves, unheard in Robert's room, beat upon the drum of the skylight, through all the world of mist that lay between it and them, dimly, vaguely, but ever and again with the swell of gathered force that made the distant tumult doubtful no more. "'I am sorry I have nothing to offer you,' said Erickson. "'You remind me of Peter and John at the beautiful gate of the temple,' returned Robert, attempting to speak English like the northerner, but breaking down as his heart got the better of him. "'Eh, Mr. Erickson, if ye knew what it is to me to see the face of ye, ye would not spake like that. Just let me sit and look at ye. I want nae more. A smile broke up the cold, sad, grey light of the young eagle face. Stern at once and gentle when in repose, its smile was as the summer of some lovely land where neither the heat nor the sun shall smite them. The youth laid his hand upon the boy's head, then withdrew it hastily, and the smile vanished like the sun behind a cloud. Robert saw it, and, as if he had been David before Saul, rose instinctively and said, I'll go on for my fiddle. Hoots, I have broken on of the strings. We mount by till the morn. But I want na fiddle myself when I hear the great water with there. You're young yet, my boy, or you might hear voices in that water. I've lived in the sound of it all my days. When I can't rest at night, I hear a moanin' and cryin' in the dark, 
and I lie and listen till I can't tell whether I'm a man or some godforsaken sea in the sunless north. Sometimes I believe in naething but my fiddle, answered Robert. Yes, yes, but when it comes into you, my boy, you won't hear much music in the cry of the sea after that. As long as you've got it at arm's length, it's all very well. It's interesting, then, and you can talk to your fiddle about it and make poetry about it, said Ericson with a smile of self-contempt. But as soon as the real earnest comes, that is all over. The sea moan is the cry of a tortured world, then. Its hollow bed is the cup of the world's pain, ever rolling from side to side and dashing over its lip. Of all that might be, ought to be, nothing to be had. I could get music out of it once. Look here, I could trifle like that once. He half rose and dropped on his chair. But Robert's believing eyes justified confidence, and Ericsson had never had any one to talk to. He rose again, opened a cupboard at his side, took out some papers, threw them on the table, and, taking his hat, walked towards the door. Which of your strings is broken? he asked. The third, answered Robert. I will get you one, said Ericsson, and before Robert could reply he was down the stair. Robert heard him cough, then the door shut, and he was gone in the rain and fog. Bewildered, unhappy, ready to fly after him, yet irresolute, Robert almost mechanically turned over the papers upon the little deal table. He was soon arrested by the following verses, headed, A Noonday Melody. Everything goes to its rest. The hills are asleep in the noon, and life is as still in its nest as the moon when she looks on a moon. In the depths of the calm river's breast, as it steals through a midnight in June, the streams have forgotten the sea, in the dream of their musical sound, the sunlight is thick on the tree, and the shadows lie warm on the ground. So still you may watch them and see every breath that awakens around. The churchyard lies still in the heat, with its handful of mouldering bone, as still as the long stalk of wheat in the shadow that sits by the stone, as still as the grass at my feet when I walk in the meadows alone. The waves are asleep on the main, and the ships are asleep on the wave, and the thoughts are as still in my brain as the echo that sleeps in the cave. I'll rest from their labor and pain, then why should not I in my grave? His heart ready to burst with the sorrow, admiration, and devotion which no criticism interfered to qualify, Robert rushed out into the darkness and sped, fleet-footed, along the only path which Ericsson could have taken. He could not bear to be left in the house while his friend was out in the rain. He was sure of joining him before he reached the new town, for he was fleet-footed, and there was a path only on one side of the way, so that there was no danger of passing him in the dark. As he ran, he heard the moaning of the sea. There must be a storm somewhere, away in the deep spaces of its dark bosom, and its lips muttered of its far unrest. When the sun rose, it would be seen misty and gray, tossing about under the one rain cloud that like thinner ocean overspread the heavens, tossing like an animal that would fain lie down and be at peace, but could not compose its unwieldy strength. Suddenly Robert slackened his speed, ceased running, stood, gazed through the darkness at a figure a few yards before him. An old wall bowed out with age and weight behind it flanked the road in this part. Doors in this wall, with a few steps in front of them and more behind, led up into gardens upon a slope, at the top of which stood the houses to which they belonged. Against one of these doors the figure stood with its head bowed upon its hands. When Robert was within a few feet it descended and went on. "'Mr. Erickson,' exclaimed Robert, "'you'll get your death if you stand that way in the wheat.' "'Amen,' said Erickson, turning with a smile that glimmered wan through the misty night. Then changing his tone, he went on. "'What are you after, Robert?' "'You,' answered Robert. "'I could not bide to be left alone when I might be with ye all the time, if you would let me. You were out of the house afore I well knew what you was aboot. It's no a fit night for ye to be out at a moor by the taken, but you're no the ablest to stand cold and wheat. I've stood a great deal of both in my time, returned Ericson, 
But come along, we'll go and get that fiddle string. Did not you think it would be fully better to go on home? Robert ventured to suggest. What would be the use? I'm in no mood for Plato tonight, he answered, trying hard to keep from shivering. You have an ill cold upon you, persisted Robert, and you mount be as weet as a dish cloak. Ericson laughed, a strange hollow laugh. Come along, he said. A walk will do me good. We'll get the string, and then you shall play to me. That will do me more good yet. Robert ceased opposing him, and they walked together to the new town. Robert bought the string, and they set out, as he thought, to return. But not yet did Ericson seem inclined to go home. He took the lead, and they emerged upon the quay. There was not many vessels. One of them was the Antwerp tub, already known to Robert. He recognized her even in the dull light of the quay lamps. Her captain, being a prudent and well-to-do Dutchman, never slept on shore. He preferred saving his money, and therefore, as the friends passed, Robert caught sight of him walking his own deck and smoking a long clay pipe before turning in. "'A fine night, Captain,' said Robert. "'It does rain,' returned the Captain. "'Will you come on board and have one schnapps before you turn in?' "'I have a friend with me here,' said Robert, feeling his way. "'Let him come and be welcomed.' Ericson making no objection, they went on board and down into the neat little cabin, which was all the roomier for the straightness of the vessel's quarter. The captain got out a square, coffin-shouldered bottle, and having respect to the condition of the garments, neither of the young men refused his hospitality, though Robert did feel a little compunction at the thought of the horror it would have caused his grandmother. Then the Dutchman got out his violin and asked Robert to play a Scotch air but in the middle of it his eyes fell on ericson and he stopped at once ericson was sitting on a locker leaning back against the side of the vessel his eyes were open and fixed and he seemed quite unconscious of what was passing robert fancied at first that the hollands he had taken had gone to his head but he saw at the same moment from his glass that he had scarcely tasted the spirit in great alarm they tried to rouse him and at length succeeded he closed his eyes opened them again, rose up, and was going away. "'What's the matter with ye, Mr. Erickson?' said Robert in distress. "'Nothing, nothing,' answered Erickson, in a strange voice. "'I fell asleep, I believe. It was very bad manners, Captain. I beg your pardon. I believe I am overtired.' The Dutchman was as kind as possible, and begged Erickson to stay the night and occupy his berth. But he insisted on going home, although he was clearly unfit for such a walk. They bade the skipper good night, went on shore, and set out, Ericson leaning rather heavily upon Robert's arm. Robert led him up Mariscal Street. The steep ascent was too much for Ericson. He stood still upon the bridge and leaned over the wall of it. Robert stood beside, almost in despair, about getting him home. "'Have patience with me, Robert,' said Ericson, in his natural voice. "'I shall be better presently.' I don't know what's come to me. If I had been a Celt now, I should have said I had a touch of the second sight. But I am, as far as I know, pure Northman. What did you see? asked Robert, with a strange feeling that miles of the spirit world, if one may be allowed such a contradiction in words, lay between him and his friend. Ericson returned no answer. Robert feared he was going to have a relapse, but in a moment more he lifted himself up and bent again to the work. They got on pretty well till they were about the middle of the gallow gate. I can't, said Ericson feebly, and half leaned, half fell against the wall of a house. Come into this shop, said Robert. I know the man. He'll let you sit down. He managed to get him in. He was as pale as death. The bookseller got a chair, and he sank into it. Robert was almost at his wit's end. There was no such thing as a cab in Aberdeen for years and years after the date of my story. He was holding a glass of water to Ericsson's lips when he heard his name in a low, earnest whisper from the door. There, round the door cheek, peered the white face and red head of Shargar. "'Robert! Robert!' said Shargar. "'I hear ye,' returned Robert coolly. He was too anxious to be surprised at anything. "'Hold your tongue. I'll come to ye in a minute.' Ericsson recovered a little, refused the whiskey offered by the bookseller, rose, and staggered out. If I were only home, he said. But where is home? 
We'll try to make on, returned Robert. Take a hold of me. Lay your weight upon me. If it were not for your length, I could carry you wheel enough. Where's that Shargar? he muttered to himself, looking up and down the gloomy street. But no Shargar was to be seen. Robert peered in vain into every dark court they crept past, till at length he all but came to the conclusion that Shargar was only fantastical. When they had reached the hollow, and were crossing the canal bridge by Mount Hooley, Ericson's strength again failed him, and again he leaned upon the bridge. Not had he leaned long before Robert found that he had fainted. In desperation he began to hoist the tall form upon his back, when he heard the quick step of a runner behind him and the words, "'Give him to me, Robert, give him to me. I can carry him fine.' "'Hold away with ye,' returned Robert, and again Shargar fell behind. For a few hundred yards he trudged along manfully, but his strength, more from the nature of his burden than its weight, soon gave way. He stood still to recover. The same moment Shargar was by his side again. "'No, Robert,' he said pleadingly. Robert yielded, and the burden was shifted to Shargar's back. How they managed it they hardly knew themselves, but after many changes they at last got Ericson home and up to his own room. He had revived several times, but gone off again. In one of his faints Robert undressed him and got him into bed. He had so little to cover him that Robert could not help crying with misery. He himself was well provided, and would gladly have shared with Ericson, but that was hopeless. He could, however, make him warm in bed. Then, leaving Shargar in charge, he sped back to the new town to Dr. Anderson. The doctor had the carriage out at once, wrapped Robert in a plaid, and brought him home with him. Ericson came to himself, and seeing Shargar by his bedside, tried to sit up, asking feebly, "'Where am I?' "'In your own bed, Mr. Ericson,' answered Shargar. "'And who are you?' asked Ericson, again bewildered. Shargar's pale face no doubt looked strange under his crown of red hair. Ow, oh, I'm naebody. You must be somebody, or else my brain's in a bad state, returned Ericson. Nay, nay, I'm naebody. Naething at all. Robert'll be home in a minute. I'm Robert's dog, concluded Shargar with a sudden inspiration. This answer seemed to satisfy Ericson, for he closed his eyes and lay still, nor did he speak again till Robert arrived with the doctor. Poor food, scanty clothing, undue exertion, in travelling to and from the university, hard mental effort against weakness, disquietude of mind, all born with an endurance unconscious of itself, had reduced Eric Erickson to his present condition. Strength had given way at last, and he was now lying in the low border wash of a dead sea of fever, the last of an ancient race of poor men, he had no relative but a second cousin, and no means except the little he advanced him, chiefly in kind, to be paid for when Eric had a profession. This cousin was in the herring trade, and the chief assistance he gave him was to send him by sea, from Wick to Aberdeen, a small barrel of his fish every session. One herring with two or three potatoes formed his dinner as long as the barrel lasted but at Aberdeen or elsewhere no one carried his head more erect than Eric Erickson, not from pride, but from simplicity and inborn dignity, and there was not a man during the curriculum more respected than he. An excellent classical scholar, as scholarship went in those days, he was almost the only man at the university who made his knowledge of Latin serve towards an acquaintance with the Romance languages. He had gained a small bursary and gave lessons when he could. But having no level channel for the outgoing of the waters of one of the tenderest hearts that ever lived, those waters had sought to break a passage upwards. Herein his experience corresponded in a considerable degree to that of Robert. Only Eric's more fastidious and more instructed nature bred a thousand difficulties which he would meet one by one, whereas Robert, less delicate and more robust, would break through all the oppositions of theological science, falsely so called, and take the kingdom of heaven by force. But indeed the ruins of the ever-falling temple of theology had accumulated far more heavily over Robert's well of life than over that of Ericsson. The obstructions to his faith were those that rolled from the disintegrating mountains of humanity, rather than the rubbish heaped upon it by the careless masons who take the quarry whence they hew the stones for the temple, 
build without hands, eternal in the heavens. When Dr. Anderson entered, Ericson opened his eyes wide. The doctor approached and, taking his hand, began to feel his pulse. Then first Ericson comprehended his visit. I can't, he said, withdrawing his hand. I am not so ill as to need a doctor. My dear sir, said Dr. Anderson courteously, there will be no occasion to put you to any pain. Sir, said Eric, I have no money. The doctor laughed. And I have more than I know how to make a good use of. I would rather be left alone, persisted Ericson, turning his face away. Now, my dear sir, said the doctor with gentle decision, that is very wrong. With what face can you offer a kindness when your turn comes, if you won't accept one yourself? Ericson held out his wrist. Dr. Anderson questioned, prescribed, and having given directions, went home to call again in the morning. And now Robert was somewhat in the position of the old woman who had so many children she didn't know what to do. Dr. Anderson ordered nourishment for Ericson, and here was Shargar upon his hands as well. Shargar and he could share, to be sure, and exist. But for Ericson, not a word did Robert exchange with Shargar till he had gone to the druggist and got the medicine for Ericson, who, after taking it, fell into a troubled sleep. Then, leaving the two doors opened, Robert joined Shargar in his own room. There he made up a good fire, and they sat and dried themselves. "'No, Shargar,' said Robert at length, "'who came ye here?' His question was too like one of his grandmother's to be pleasant to Shargar. "'Do not spake to me that way, Robert, or I'll cut my throat,' he returned. "'Hoots, I mount know all about it,' insisted Robert, but with much modified and partly convicted tone. "'Weel, I never said I would not tell ye all about it. "'The fact is this, and I'm no up to the line as I used to be, Robert. "'I have tried it o'er and o'er, but a lie comes rough throw my windpipe new. "'Faith, I could have lied once with anybody barring the devil. "'I will not lie. I nay lying. "'The fact is just this. I could not bide ahind ye any longer.' "'But what, the muckle-long tail devil am i to do with ye returned robert in real perplexity though only pretended displeasure give me something to eat and i'll tell you what to do with me answered shargar i do not care a scratch what it is robert rang the bell and ordered some porridge and while it was preparing shargar told the story how having heard a rumour of apprenticeship to a tailor he had the same night dropped from the gable window to the ground and with three halfpence in his pocket had wandered and begged his way to Aberdeen, arriving with one half-penny left. "'But what am I to do with ye?' said Robert once more, in as much perplexity as ever. "'By till I have telt ye, as I said I would,' answered Shargar. "'Do not ye think I'm the careless and therefore helpless creature I used to be? I have been in Aberdeen three days, I, and I have seen you ilk a day in your red goon and right brow it is. Look ye here.' He put his hand in his pocket and pulled out what amounted to two or three shillings, chiefly in coppers, which he exposed with triumph on the table. "'Where got ye all that siller, man?' asked Robert. "'Here and there I cannot war, but I have given the weight of it for it all the same, running here and running there, carrying boxes till and fray from the smacks and doing all things whether they bade me or no.' Yesterday morning I got threepence by hanging about the royal afore the coaches started. I looked up and down the street till I saw somebody hine away with the pork manty. Till em I ran, and he was an old man, and most at last gasped with the weight of it gone me to carry. And what do ye think gave me a shilling the very first night? What but my brother Sandy? Lord Rothy? I faith, I knew him weel enough but little he knew me. There he was upon Black Geordie. He's turning old new. Your brother? Nay, he's young enough for any mischief, but Black Geordie. What on earth guards him go on stravagin about upon that devil? I doot he's a kelpie or a hell horse or something no canny of that kind. For faith, brother Sandy's no or canny himself, I'm thinking. But Geordie, the older the war inclined, and so I'm thinking with his master. 
Did you ever see your father, Shargar? Nay, nor I do not want to see him. I'm upon my mother's side, but that's naething to the point. All that I want of you is to let me come home at night and lie upon the floor here. I swear I'll lie in the street if you do not let me. I'll sleep as sounds Peter McGinnis when McCleary's preaching, and I will not ate muckle. I have dreadful poor of aitin, and all that I gather I'll fess home to you to do with as ye like. Man, I carried a heap of things today till the skipper of that boat at ye goed into with Mr. Erickson that night. He's a fine child, that skipper. Robert was astonished at the change that had passed upon Shargar. His departure had cast him upon his own resources, and allowed the individuality repressed by every event of his history, even by his worship of Robert, to begin to develop itself. Miserable for a few weeks, he had revived in the fancy that to work hard at school would give him some chance of rejoining Robert. Thence, too, he had watched to please Mrs. Falconer, and had indeed begun to buy golden opinions from all sorts of people. He had a hope in prospect. But into the midst fell the whisper of the apprenticeship like a thunderbolt out of the clear sky. He fled at once. "'Weel, ye can have my bed the night,' said Robert, "'for I mount sit up with Mr. Erickson.' "'Deed, I'll have nothing of the kind. "'I'll sleep upon the floor or else upon the door stand. "'Man, I'm no clean enough after what I've come through "'since I drop it from the window sill in the gale room. "'But just lend me your plaid, "'and I'll sleep upon the rug here as if I were in paradise. "'And face so I am, Robert. "'You might go on to your bed some time the night besides, "'or you will not be fit for your work the morn. "'You can just give me a kick.' and i'll be up afore ye can give me another the supper arrived from below and each on the one side of the fire they ate the porridge conversing all the while about old times for the youngest life has its old times its golden age and old adventures dubal sanny betty etc etc there were but two subjects which robert avoided miss st john and the bonny lady Shargar was at length deposited upon the little bit of hearth rug which adorned rather than enriched the room, with Robert's plaid of shepherd tartan around him, and an Ainsworth dictionary under his head for a pillow. Man, I find myself just like a muckle sheep dog, he said. When I close my eye, I'm no sure at I'm no in the inside of your old lucky daddy's kilt. The Lord preserve me from ever such a fright again as your granny and Betty gave me the night they found me in it. I do not believe it is nature to have such a fright twice in a lifetime, so I'll fall asleep at once and say no more. But as muckle of my prayers as I can mind upon new at Granny's no at my leg. Hold your impotence in your tongue together, said Robert. Mine at my Granny's been the best friend ye ever had. Except my own mother, returned Shargar with a sleepy doggedness in his tone. During their conference, Ericsson had been slumbering. Robert had visited him from time to time, but he had not awakened. As soon as Shargar was disposed of, he took his candle and sat down by him. He grew more uneasy. Robert guessed that the candle was the cause and put it out. Ericsson was quieter, so Robert sat in the dark. But the rain had now ceased. Some upper wind had swept the clouds from the sky, and the whole world of stars was radiant over the earth and its griefs. "'O oh God, where art thou?' he said in his heart, and went to his own room to look out. There was no curtain, and the blind had not been drawn down, therefore the earth looked in at the storm window. The sea neither glimmered nor shone. It lay across the horizon like a low level cloud, out of which came a moaning. Was this moaning all of the earth, or was there trouble in the starry places too? thought Robert, as if already he had begun to suspect the truth from afar that save in the secret place of the Most High, and in the heart that is hid with the Son of Man in the bosom of the Father, there is trouble, a sacred unrest everywhere, the moaning of a tide setting homewards even towards the bosom of that Father. End Chapter 7《of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. 
Chapter Eight A Human Providence. Robert kept himself thoroughly awake the whole night, and it was well that he had not to attend classes in the morning. As the gray of the world's reviving consciousness melted in at the window, the things around and within him looked and felt ghastly. Nothing is liker the gray dawn than the soul of one who has been watching by a sick bed all the long hours of the dark, except indeed it be the first glimmerings of truth on the mind lost in the dark of a godless life. Ericson had waked often, and Robert had administered his medicine carefully, but he had been mostly between sleeping and waking, and had murmured strange words whose passing shadows rather than glimmers roused the imagination of the youth as with messages from regions unknown. As the light came he found his senses going, and went to his own room again to get a book that he might keep himself awake by reading at the window. To his surprise, Shargar was gone, and for a moment he doubted whether he had not been dreaming all that had passed between them the night before. His plaid was folded up and laid upon a chair, as it had been there all night, and his Ainsworth was on the table. But beside it was the money Shargar had drawn from his pockets. About nine o'clock Dr. Anderson arrived, found Ericson not so much worse as he had expected, comforted Robert, and told him he must go to bed. "'But I cannot leave Mr. Erickson,' said Robert. "'Let your friend, what's his odd name, watch him during the day.' "'Shargar, you mean, sir, but that's his nickname. His real name, they say, his mother says, is George Moray, with an O and no, no a U R. Do you see?' concluded Robert significantly. "'No, I don't,' answered the doctor. They say he's the son of an old marquis, that's it. His mother's a randy wife that goes about the country, a gypsy, they say. There's no doubt about her, and by all accounts, the father's likely enough. And how on earth did you come to have such a questionable companion? Shargar's as fine a creature as God made, said Robert warmly. You'll allude at God made him, doctor, though his father and mother thought not muckle about him, or God either, when they got him between them. And Shargar could not help it. It might have been you or me, for that matter, doctor. I beg your pardon, Robert, said Dr. Anderson quietly, although delighted with the fervor of his young kinsman. I only wanted to know how he came to be your companion. I beg your pardon, doctor, but I thought you was some scunner at it, and I cannot bide Shargar to be looked down upon. Look here, he continued, going to his box and bringing out Shargar's little heap of coppers, in which two sixpence obscurely shone. He brought all that home last night, and signed, Slip it upon the rug in my room there. We'll want all it he can make, and me too, afore we get Mr. Erickson up again. But ye have not Tell me yet, said the doctor, so pleased with the lad that he had relapsed into the dialect of his youth. Ho oh, ye came to foregather with him. I'll tell ye all about it, doctor. It was all my granny's doing, God bless her, for weel he may and muckle she needs it. Oh, yes, I remember now all your grandmother's part in the story, returned the doctor, but I still want to know how he came here. She was going on to make a tailor of him, and he just ran away and came to me. It was too bad of him that, after all she had done for him. Ow, deed no, doctor. Even when ye bought a man and paid for him according to the Jewish law, ye could not make a slave of him for altogether on him seeking it himself. Eh, if she could only get my father home, sighed Robert after a pause. What should she want him home for? asked Dr. Anderson, still making conversation. I did not mean home to Rothen then. I believe she could by never seeing him again, if only he was not in the ill place. She has awful notions about burning ill souls forever and ever. But it's no herself. It's the white of the ministers. Doctor, I do believe she would go on and be burnt herself with a great thanksgiving if it would let only poor creature out of it not to say my father and i saw miss doot if money of them at put it in her head would do as muckle i'm some feared they're like paul afore he was converted 
He would not lift a stone himself, but he liked it weel to stand oot by and look on. A deep sigh, almost a groan from the bed, reminded them that they were talking too much and too loud for a sick room. It was followed by the words, muttered but articulate, What's the good when you don't know whether there's a God at all? Deed, that's very true, Mr. Erickson, returned Robert. I wish you would find oot and tell me. I would be blithe to hear what you had to say on it. If it was I, you can. Erickson went on murmuring, but inarticulately now. This won't do at all, Robert, my boy, said Dr. Anderson. You must not talk about such things with him, or indeed about anything. You must keep him as quiet as ever you can. I thought he was coming to himself, returned Robert. But I will take care, I assure you, doctor. Only I'm feared I may fall asleep the night, for I was so sleepy this morning. I will send Johnston as soon as I get home, and you must go to bed when he comes. Dear doctor, that will not do at all. It would be our money strange faces altogether. We'll get Mrs. Fivey to look till him the day, and Shargar cannot work the morn, being Sunday, and I'll go on to my bed for fear of doing war, though I do it I will not sleep in the daylight. Dr. Anderson was satisfied and went home, cogitating much. This boy, this cousin of his, made a vortex of good about him into which whoever came near it was drawn. He seemed at the same time quite unaware of anything worthy in his conduct. The good he did sprung from some inward necessity, with just enough in it of the salt of choice to keep it from losing its savour. To these cogitations of Dr. Anderson, I add that there was no conscious exercise of religion in it, for there his mind was all at sea. Of course, I believe notwithstanding that religion had much, I ought to say everything, to do with it. Robert had not yet found in God a reason for being true to his fellows, but if God was leading him to be the man he became, how could any good results of this leading be other than religious? All good is of God. Robert began where he could. The first table was too high for him. He began with the second. If a man love his brother whom he hath seen, the love of God whom he hath not seen is not very far off. These results in Robert were the first outcome of divine facts and influences. They were the buds of the fruit thereafter to be gathered in perfect devotion. God be praised by those who know religion to be truth of humanity, its own truth that sets it free, not binds and lops and mutilates it who see God to be the father of every human soul, the ideal father, not an inventor of schemes or the upholder of a court etiquette for whose use he has chosen to desecrate the name of justice. To return to Dr. Anderson, I have had little opportunity of knowing his history in India. He returned from it halfway down the hill of life, sad, gentle, kind, and rich. Whence his sadness came, we need not inquire. Some woman out in that fervid land may have darkened his story, darkened it wrongly, it may be, with coldness, or only with death. But to return home without wife to accompany him or child to meet him, to sit by his riches like a man over a fire of straws in a Siberian frost, to know that old faces were gone and old hearts changed, that the pattern of things in the heavens had melted away from the face of the earth, that the chill evenings of autumn were settling down into longer and longer nights, and that no hope lay any more beyond the mountains. Surely this was enough to make a gentle-minded man sad, even if the individual sorrows of his history had gathered into gold and purple in the West. I say West advisedly, for we are journeying like our globe ever towards the East. Death and the West are behind us, ever behind us, and settling into the unchangeable. It was natural that he should be interested in the fine promise of Robert, in whom he saw revive the hopes of his own youth, but in a nature at once more robust and more ideal. Where the doctor was refined, Robert was strong. Where the doctor was firm with the firmness he had cultivated, Robert was imperious with an imperiousness time would mellow. Where the doctor was generous and careful at once, Robert gave his might and forgot it. He was rugged in the simplicity of his truthfulness, and his speech betrayed him as altogether of the people. But the doctor knew the whole of the pit whence he had been himself digged. All that would fall away as the spiky shell from the polished chestnut, 
and be reabsorbed in the growth of the grand cone flowering tree to stand up in the sun and wind of the years a very altar of incense it is no wonder i repeat that he loved the boy and longed to further his plans but he was too wise to overwhelm him with a cataract of fortune instead of blessing him with the merciful dew of progress the fellow will bring me in for no end of expense he said smiling to himself as he drove home in his chariot the less he means it the more unconscionable he will be there's that ericson but that isn't worth thinking of i must do something for that queer protege of his though that shargar the fellow is as good as a dog and that's saying not a little for him i wonder if he can learn or if he takes after his father the marquis who never could spell well it's a comfort to have something to do worth doing i did think of endowing a hospital but i'm not sure that it isn't better to endow a good man than a hospital i'll think about it i won't say anything about shargar either till i see how he goes on i might give him a job though now and then but where to fall in with him prowling about after jobs he threw himself back in his seat and laughed with a delight he had rarely felt he was a providence watching over the boys who expected nothing of him beyond advice for ericson might there not be a providence that equally transcended the vision of men shaping to nobler ends the blocked out designs of their rough hewn marbles his thoughts wandered back to his friend the brahmin who died longing for the absorption into deity which had been the dream of his life might not the brahmin find the grand idea shaped to yet finer issues than his aspiration had dared contemplate might he not inherit in the purification of his will such an absorption as should intensify his personality End. Chapter 8book two chapter nine of robert falconer by george macdonald this librivox recording is in the public domain robert falconer by george macdonald chapter nine a human soul ericson lay for several weeks during which time robert and shargar were his only nurses they contrived by abridging both rest and labor to give him constant attendance shargar went to bed early and got up early so as to let robert have a few hours sleep before his classes began robert again slept in the evening after shargar came home and made up for the time by reading while he sat by his friend mrs fivey's attendance was in requisition only for the hours when he had to be at lectures by the greatest economy of means consisting of what shargar brought in by jobbing about the quay and the coach offices and what robert had from dr anderson for copying his manuscript they contrived to procure for ericson all that he wanted the shopping of the two boys in their utter ignorance of such delicacies as the doctor told them to get for him the blunders they made as to the shops at which they were to be bought and the consultations they held especially about the preparing of the prescribed nutriment afforded them many an amusing retrospect in after years for the house was so full of lodgers that robert begged mrs fivey to give herself no trouble in the matter her conscience however was uneasy and she spoke to dr anderson but he assured her that she might trust the boys what cooking they could not manage she undertook cheerfully and refused to add anything to the rent on shargar's account dr anderson watched everything the two boys as much as his patient he allowed them to work on sending only the wine that was necessary from his own cellar the moment that supplies should begin to fail or the boys to look troubled he was ready to do more about robert's perseverance he had no doubt shargar's faithfulness he wanted to prove robert wrote to his grandmother to tell her that shargar was with him working hard her reply was somewhat cold and offended but was enclosed in a parcel containing all shargar's garments and ended with the assurance that as long as he did well she was ready to do what she could few english readers will like mrs falconer but her grandchild considered her one of the noblest women ever god made and i from his account am of the same mind her care was fixed to fill her odorous lamp with deeds of light 
and hope that reaps not shame. And if one must choose between the how and the what, let me have the what come of the how what may. I know of a man so sensitive that he shuts his ears to his sister's griefs, because it spoils his digestion to think of them. One evening Robert was sitting by the table in Ericsson's room. Dr. Anderson had not called that day, and he did not expect to see him now, for he had never come so late. He was quite at his ease, therefore, and busy with two things at once, when the doctor opened the door and walked in. I think it is possible that he came up quietly with some design of surprising him. He found him with a stocking on one hand, a darning needle in the other, and a Greek book open before him. Taking no apparent notice of him, he walked up to the bedside, and Robert put away his work. After his interview with his patient was over, the doctor signed to him to follow him to the next room. There Shargar lay on the rug, already snoring. It was a cold night in December, but he lay in his underclothing with a single blanket round him. Good training for a soldier, said the doctor. And so was your work a minute ago, Robert. I answered Robert, colouring a little. I was reading a bit of the Anabasis. The doctor smiled a far-off, sly smile. I think it was rather the catabasis, if one might venture to judge from the direction of your labours. Weel, answered Robert, what would ye have me do? Would ye have me let Mr. Erickson go on with holes in the heels of his hose, when I can make them whole and learn my Greek at the same time? Hoots, doctor, do not laugh at me. I was doing nae ill. A body may please themselves, which surely is no sin. But it's such a waste of time. Why don't you buy him new ones? Be that's easier said than done. I have enough ado with my cellar as tis, and if it war not for you, doctor, I do not know what would come of us, for, you see, I have no right to call upon my granny for other folk. There would be nay end to that. But I could lend you money to buy him some stockings. And when would I be able to pay you, do you think, doctor? In another world, maybe, where the currency might be so different, there would be no possibility of reckoning the rate of exchange. Nay, nay. But I will give you the money if you like. Nay, nay. Ye have done enough already, and money thanks. Siller's now so easy come by to be wasted, as long as a darn'll do. For by if you begin with his clays, ye would not know where to hold. For it would just be the new cloth upon the old garment. Ye might as well new clad him at once. And why not, if I choose, Mr. Falconer? Spare ye that at him, and see what ye'll get. A look at wood fess a carrying crow from the sky. I would not have you try that. Some folks' poverty mount be handled just like a sore place, doctor. He cannot wheel complain of a bit darnin'. He cannot take that ill, repeated Robert, in a tone that showed he yet felt some anxiety on the subject. But new ones. I would not like to be by when he found that wood. Maybe he might take them from a woman, but from a man, body, nay, nay, I am just darn away. But I'll make them decent enough afore I have done with them. A fiddler has fingers. The doctor smiled a pleased smile, but when he got into his carriage again, he laughed heartily. The evening deepened into night. Robert thought Erickson was asleep, but he spoke. Who is that at the street door? he said. They were at the top of the house, and there was no window to the street. But Ericsson's senses were preternaturally acute, as is often the case in such illnesses. I did not hear anybody, answered Robert. There was somebody, returned Ericsson. From that moment he began to be restless, and was more feverish than usual throughout the night. Up to this time he had spoken little, was depressed with the suffering to which he could give no name, not pain, he said, but such that he could rouse no mental effort to meet it. His endurance was passive altogether. This night his brain was more affected. He did not rave, but often wandered, never spoke nonsense, but many words that would have seemed nonsense to ordinary people. To Robert they seemed inspired. His imagination, which was greater than any other of his fine faculties, was so roused that he talked in verse probably verse composed before and now recalled. 
He would even pray sometimes in measured lines, and go on murmuring petitions till the words of the murmur became undistinguishable and he fell asleep. But even in his sleep he would speak, and Robert would listen in awe, for such words, falling from such a man, were to him as dim breaks of coloured light from the rainbow walls of the heavenly city. If God were thinking me, said Ericson, ah, but if he be only dreaming me, I shall go mad. Ericson's outside was like his own northern clime, dark, gentle, and clear, with grey-blue seas, and a sun that seems to shine out of the past, and know nothing of the future. But within glowed a volcanic angel of aspiration, fluttering his half-grown wings, and ever reaching towards the heights whence all things are visible and where all passions are safe because true, that is, divine. Iceland herself has her Hecla. Robert listened with keenest ear. A mist of great meaning hung about the words his friend had spoken. He might speak more. For some minutes he listened in vain, and was turning at last towards his book in hopelessness, when he did speak yet again. Robert's ear soon detected the rhythmic motion of his speech. Come in the glory of thine excellence, rive the dense gloom with wedges of clear light, and let the shimmer of thy chariot wheels burn through the cracks of night, so slowly, Lord, to lift myself to thee with hands of toil, climbing the slippery cliff of unheard prayer, lift up a hand among my idle days, one beckoning finger, I will cast aside the clogs of earthly circumstance and run up the broad highways where the countless worlds sit ripening in the summer of thy love. Breathless for fear of losing a word, Robert yet remembered that he had seen something like these words in the papers Ericsson had given him to read on the night when his illness began. When he had fallen asleep and silent, he searched and found it. But I prefer giving another of his poems, which Robert read at the same time, revealing another of his moods when some one of the clouds of holy doubt and questioning love which so often darkened his sky did at length turn forth her silver lining on the night song they are blind and they are dead we will wake them as we go there are words have not been said there are sounds they do not know we will pipe and we will sing with the music and the spring set their hearts a-wondering they are tired of what is old we will give it voices new for the half hath not been told of the beautiful and true drowsy eyelids shut and sleeping heavy eyes oppressed with weeping flashes through the lashes leaping ye that have a pleasant voice hither come without delay ye will never have a choice like to that ye have to-day Round and wide world we will go, singing through the frost and snow, till the daisies are in blow. Ye that cannot pipe or sing, ye must also come with speed. Ye must come and with you bring weighty words and weightier deed. Helping hands and loving eyes, these will make them truly wise. Then will be our paradise. As Robert read, the sweetness of the rhythm seized upon him and almost unconsciously he read the last stanza aloud. Looking up from the paper with a sigh of wonder and delight, there was the pale face of Ericsson gazing at him from the bed. He had risen on one arm, looking like a dead man called to life against his will, who found the world he had left already stranger to him than the one into which he had but peeped. Yes, he murmured, I could say that once. It's all gone now. Our world is but our moods. He fell back on his pillow. After a little he murmured again, I might fool myself with faith again. So it is better not. I would not be fooled. To believe the false and be happy is the very belly of misery. To believe the true and be miserable is to be true and miserable. If there is no God, let me know it. I will not be fooled. I will not believe in a God that does not exist better be miserable because i am and cannot help it oh god yet in his misery he cried upon god these words came upon robert with such a shock of sympathy that they destroyed his consciousness for the moment 
and when he thought about them, he almost doubted if he had heard them. He rose and approached the bed. Ericson lay with his eyes closed and his face contorted as if by inward pain. Robert put a spoonful of wine to his lips. He swallowed it, opened his eyes, gazed at the boy as if he did not know him, closed them again, and lay still. Some people take comfort from the true eyes of a dog, and a precious thing to the loving heart is the love of even a dumb animal. Why should Sir Walter Scott, who felt the death of camp, his bull terrier, so much that he declined a dinner engagement in consequence, say on the death of his next favorite, a greyhound bitch, rest her body since I dare not say soul? Where did he get that dare not? Is it well that the daring of genius should be circumscribed by an unbelief so commonplace as to be capable only of subscription? What comfort, then, must not such a boy as Robert have been to such a man as Ericsson? Often, and often when he was lying asleep, as Robert thought, he was watching the face of his watcher. When the human soul is not yet able to receive the vision of the God-man, God sometimes, might I not say always, reveals himself, or at least gives himself, in some human being whose face, whose hands, are the ministering angels of his unacknowledged presence, to keep alive the fire of love on the altar of the heart until God hath provided the sacrifice, that is, until the soul is strong enough to draw it from the concealing thicket. Here were two, each thinking that God had forsaken him, or was not to be found by him, and each the very love of God commissioned to tend the other's heart. In each was he present to the other, the one thought himself the happiest of mortals in waiting upon the big brother, whose least smile was joy enough for one day. The other wondered at the unconscious goodness of the boy, and while he gazed at his ruddy brown face, believed in God. For some time after Ericsson was taken ill, he was too depressed and miserable to ask how he was cared for. But by slow degrees it dawned upon him that a heart deep and gracious like that of a woman watched over him true robert was uncouth but his uncouthness was that of a half-fledged angel the heart of the man and the heart of the boy were drawn close together long before ericson was well he loved robert enough to be willing to be indebted to him and would lie pondering not how to repay him but how to return his kindness how much Robert's ambition to stand well in the eyes of Miss St. John contributed to his progress, I can only imagine. But certainly his ministrations to Ericsson did not interfere with his Latin and Greek. I venture to think that they advanced them, for difficulty adds to result as the ramming of the powder sends the bullet the further. I have heard indeed that when a carrier wants to help his horse uphill, he sets a boy on his back. Ericsson made little direct acknowledgment to Robert. His tones, his gestures, his looks all thanked him, but he shrunk from words with the maidenly shamefacedness that belongs to true feeling. He would even assume the authoritative and send him away to his studies, but Robert knew how to hold his own. The relation of elder brother and younger was already established between them. Shargar, likewise, took his share in the love and the fellowship worshipping in that he believed. End chapter 9。Book 2, Chapter 10 of Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Robert Falconer by George MacDonald. Chapter 10 a father and a daughter. The presence at the street door of which Ericsson's over-acute sense had been aware on a past evening was that of Mr. Lindsay, walking home with bowed back and bowed head from the college library, where he was privileged to sit after hours as long as he pleased over books too big to be comfortably carried home to his cottage. He had called to inquire after Ericsson, whose acquaintance he had made in the library, and cultivated, until almost any Friday evening Ericsson was to be found seated by Mr. Lindsay's parlour fire. 
As he entered the room that same evening, a young girl raised herself from a low seat by the fire to meet him. There was a faint, rosy flush on her cheek, and she held a volume in her hand as she approached her father. They did not kiss. Kisses were not a legal tender in Scotland then. Possibly there had been a depreciation in the value of them since they were. "'I've been to ask after Mr. Ericson,' said Mr. Lindsay. "'And how is he?' asked the girl. "'Very poorly, indeed,' answered her father. "'I am sorry. You'll miss him, Papa.' "'Yes, my dear. Tell Jenny to bring my lamp. "'Won't you have your tea first, Papa?' "'Oh, yes, if it's ready. "'The kettle has been boiling for a long time, "'but I wouldn't make the tea till you came in.' Mr. Lindsay was an hour later than usual, but Mysie was quite unaware of that. She had been absorbed in her book, too much absorbed even to ring for better light than the fire afforded. When her father went to put off his long bifurcated greatcoat, she returned to her seat by the fire and forgot to make the tea. It was a warm, snug room, full of dark, old-fashioned spider-legged furniture, low-pitched with a bay window, open like an ear to the cries of the German Ocean at night and like an eye during the day to look out upon its wide expanse. This ear or eye was now curtained with dark crimson, and the room in the firelight, with the young girl for a soul to it, affected one like an ancient book in which he reads his own latest thought. Mysie was nothing over the middle height, delicately fashioned, at once slender and round, with extremities neat as buds. Her complexion was fair and her face pale, except when a flush like that of a white rose overspread it. Her cheek was lovelily curved, and her face rather short, but at first one could see nothing for her eyes. They were the largest eyes, and their motion reminded one of those of Sordello in the Purgatorio. Et nel muove degle occhi onesta et tarda. They seemed too large to move otherwise than with a slow turning like that of the heavens, at first they looked black, but if one ventured inquiry, which was as dangerous as to gaze from the battlements of Elsinore, he found them a not very dark brown. In her face, however, especially when flushed, they had all the effect of what Milton describes as Quel sereno fulgor de amabil Nero. A wise observer would have been a little troubled in regarding her mouth. The sadness of a morbid sensibility hovered about it, the sign of an imagination wrought upon from the centre of self. Her lips were neither thin nor compressed. They closed lightly and were richly curved, but there was a mobility almost tremulous about the upper lip that gave sign of the possibility of such an oscillation of feeling as might cause the whole fabric of her nature to rock dangerously. The moment her father re-entered, she started from her stool on the rug and proceeded to make the tea. Her father took no notice of her neglect, but drew a chair to the table, helped himself to a piece of oat cake, hastily loaded it with as much butter as it could well carry, and while eating it forgot it and everything else in the absorption of a volume he had brought in with him from his study, in which he was tracing out some genealogical thread of which he fancied he had got a hold. Mysie was very active now, and lost the expression of far-offness which had hitherto characterized her countenance till having poured out the tea she too plunged at once into her novel and like her father forgot everything and everybody near her mr lindsay was a mild gentle man whose face and hair seemed to have grown grey together he was very tall and stooped much he had a mouth of much sensibility and clear blue eyes whose light was rarely shed upon any one within reach except his daughter they were so constantly bent downwards, either on the road as he walked or on his book as he sat. He had been educated for the church, but had never risen above the position of a parish schoolmaster. He had little or no impulse to utterance, was shy, genial, and save in reading, indolent. Ten years before this point of my history, he had been taken up by an active lawyer in Edinburgh from information accidentally supplied by Mr. Lindsay himself as the next heir to a property to which claim was laid by the head of a county family of wealth. Probabilities were altogether in his favor when he gave up the contest upon the offer of a comfortable annuity from the disputant. 
to leave his schooling and his possible estate together and sit down comfortably by his own fireside with the means of buying books and within reach of a good old library that of king's college by preference was to him the sum of all that was desirable the income offered him was such that he had no fear of laying aside enough for his only child mysie but both were so ill-fitted for saving he from looking into the past she from looking into what shall i call it i can only think of negatives what was neither past present nor future neither material nor eternal neither imaginative in any true sense nor actual in any sense that up to the present hour there was nothing in the bank and only the money for impending needs in the house he could not be called a man of learning he was only a great bookworm for his reading lay all in the nebulous regions of history old family records wherever he could lay hold upon them were his favourite dishes old musty books that looked as if they knew something everybody else had forgotten made his eyes gleam and his white taper-fingered hand tremble with eagerness with such a book in his grasp he saw something ever beckoning him on a dimly precious discovery a wonderful fact just the shape of some missing fragment in the mosaic of one of his pictures of the past to tell the truth however his discoveries seldom rounded themselves into pictures though many fragments of the minutely dissected map would find their places whereupon he rejoined like a mild giant refreshed with soda water but i have already said more about him than his place justifies therefore although i could gladly linger over the portrait i will leave it he had taught his daughter next to nothing being his child he had the vague feeling that she inherited his wisdom and that what he knew she knew so she sat reading novels generally trashy ones while he knew no more of what was passing in her mind than of what the admirable Crichton might at the moment be disputing with the angels i would not have my reader suppose that mysie's mind was corrupted it was so simple and childlike leaning to what was pure and looking up to what was noble that anything directly bad in the book she happened for it was all haphazard to read glided over her as a black cloud may glide over a landscape leaving it sunny as before i cannot therefore say however that she was nothing the worse if the darkening of the sun keep the fruits of the earth from growing the earth is surely the worse though it be blackened by no deposit of smoke and where good things do not grow the wild and possibly noxious will grow more freely there may be no harm in the yellow tansy there is much beauty in the red poppy but they are not good for food the result in mysie's case would be this not that she would call evil good and good evil but that she would take the beautiful for the true and the outer shows of goodness for goodness itself not the worst result but bad enough and involving an awful amount of suffering and possibly of defilement he who thinks to climb the hill of happiness thus will find himself floundering in the blackest bog that lies at the foot of its precipices i say he not she advisedly all will acknowledge it of the woman it is as true of the man though he may get out easier will he i say checking myself i doubt it much in the world's eye yes but in god's let the question remain unanswered when he had eaten his toast and drunk his tea apparently without any enjoyment mr lindsay rose with his book in his hand and withdrew to his study he had not long left the room when mysie was startled by a loud knock at the back door which opened on a lane leading along the top of a hill but she had almost forgotten it again when the door of the room opened and a gentleman entered without any announcement for jenny had never heard of the custom when she saw him mysie started from her seat and stood in visible embarrassment the colour went and came on her lovely face and her eyelids grew very heavy she had never seen the visitor before whether he had never seen her before i cannot certainly say she felt herself trembling in his presence while he advanced with perfect composure he was a man no longer young but in the full strength and show of manhood the baron of rothie since the time of my first description of him he had grown a moustache which improved his countenance greatly by concealing his upper lip with its tusky curves on a girl like mysie with an imagination so cultivated and with no opportunity of comparing its fancies with reality such a man would make an instant impression i beg your pardon miss lindsay i presume for intruding upon you so abruptly 
I expected to see your father, not one of the graces. She blushed all the colour of her blood now. The baron was quite enough like the hero of whom she had just been reading to admit of her imagination jumbling the two. Her book fell. He lifted it and laid it on the table. She could not speak even to thank him. Poor Mysie was scarcely more than sixteen. "'May I wait here till your father is informed of my visit?' he asked. Her only answer was to drop again upon her low stool. Now Jenny had left it to Mysie to acquaint her father with the fact of the baron's presence, but before she had time to think of the necessity of doing something, he had managed to draw her into conversation. He was as great a hypocrite as ever walked the earth, although he flattered himself that he was not, because he never pretended to cultivate that which he despised, namely religion. But he was a hypocrite nevertheless, for the falser he knew himself, the more honour he judged it to persuade women of his truth. It is unnecessary to record the slight, graceful, marrowless talk into which he drew Mysie, and by which he both bewildered and bewitched her. But at length she rose, admonished by her inborn divinity, to seek her father. As she passed him, the baron took her hand and kissed it. She might well tremble, even such contact was terrible. Why? Because there was no love in it. When the sense of beauty which God had given him that he might worship awoke in Lord Rothie, he did not worship but devoured, and he might, as he thought, possess. The poison of asps was under those lips. His kiss was as a kiss from the grave's mouth, for his throat was an open sepulchre. This was all in the past, reader. Baron Rothie was a foam flake of the court of the Prince Regent. There are no such men nowadays. It is a shame to speak of such, and therefore they are not. Decency has gone so far to abolish virtue. Would to God that a writer could be decent and honest. St. Paul counted it a shame to speak of some things, and yet he did speak of them, because those to whom he spoke did them. Lord Rothie had, in five minutes, so deeply interested Mr. Lindsay in a question of genealogy that he begged his lordship to call again in a few days, when he hoped to have some result of research to communicate. One of the antiquarian's weaknesses, cause and result both of his favourite pursuits, was an excessive reverence for rank. Had its claims been founded on mediated revelation, he could not have honoured it more. Hence, when he communicated to his daughter the name of their visitor, it was, with bated breath and whispering humbleness, which deepened greatly the impression made upon her by the presence and conversation of the baron. Mysie was in danger. Shargar was late that evening, for he had a job that detained him. As he handed over his money to Robert, he said, I saw Black Geordie the night again standing at the back door, and Jock Mitchell upon Red Rory hawed in him. What's Jock Mitchell? asked Robert. My brother Sandy's ill-far groom, answered Shargar. Whatever mischief Sandy's up till, Jock comes in in the head or tail of it. I wonder what he's up till new. Faith, nay good. But I, I like war to meet Sandy by himself upon the reeked devil of his. Man, it's awful when Black Shorty turns the white of his eye in the white of his teeth upon ye. It's all the white there is about him. Is not your brother in the army, Shargar? Ow, oh, deed I. They tell me he was at Waterloo. He's a cornell or something like that. What tellt ye all that? My mother, Wiles, answered Shargar. End. Chapter 10